I don't think I need to tell anyone that Fallout New Vegas has some of the most impressive writing of any video game ever created. It's pretty unanimously agreed on that its societal commentary, world building, and character work make for some genuinely profound storytelling. New Vegas is an absolute masterclass as a literary work, to the point that I would argue it has the best writing of any western video game ever produced. But I find one of the most fascinating parts of the New Vegas experience is in fact with the DLC. More specifically, Dead Money. Dead Money is a very polarizing piece of content with many praising it for both its storytelling and brutally challenging blend of RPG mechanics and survival horror gameplay, and many others writing it off as a frustrating and linear experience. It's a piece of content that I'm sure many of you watching have rather strong opinions on, but for the uninitiated, what exactly is Dead Money? Dead Money was New Vegas' first piece of downloadable content that sees the player struggling to survive a dreadfully overwhelming environment, all the while partaking in a very taxing set of encounters and objectives that require a fair amount of forethought, as well as an understanding of the characters met along the way. The goal is to break into the vault of the Sierra Madre Casino and access a stockpile of one-of-a-kind pre-war treasure and technology so that you may be allowed to escape this hellish place. Sounds exciting, right? You'd certainly think so, but surprisingly enough, not as many people seem to talk about New Vegas' various expansions as they do the base game. It's bizarre to me too, because New Vegas has some pretty damn interesting additional content that I think could host hours upon hours of discussion. And that's exactly why I'm here. So here's a brief outline of what you can expect from this series beyond this introductory video. Part 1 will be an exploration into combat, dissecting how various builds fare combatively in this DLC, how the companions add or detract from the experience, and a mechanics-based study of the ghost people. Part 2 will be dedicated to the exploration of the villa, and the various events that unfold as we seek out our companions. I'll also be taking a thorough look at how the supplementary mechanics, such as hardcore mode and crafting, are utilized for this expansion. Part 3 will be dedicated to the Gala event and the various quests leading up to it, as well as the final run to the Sierra Madre Casino. Part 4 will cover the entirety of the casino, and Part 5 will take us into the vault where the finale of Dead Money takes place. Following this will be an exploration into the world-building and lore of the Sierra Madre. Once all of that's over with, I'll be providing a concluding piece where I summarize both my subjective takes on Dead Money as well as an attempted objective scoring of it as an expansion to New Vegas. As a simple preface, I absolutely adore this piece of content, but it's not at all without its flaws, even in regards to storytelling. So I guess without further ado, it's time to start talking about Dead Money. While traveling through the wastes, we pick up a transmission on our Pip-Boy titled The Sierra Madre Broadcast. The broadcast is of a woman speaking of a casino where one can begin again. Has your life taken a turn? Do troubles beset you? Has fortune left you behind? If so, the Sierra Madre Casino, in all its glory, is inviting you to begin again. Come to a place where wealth, excitement, and intrigue await around every corner. Stroll along the winding streets of our beautiful resort. Make new friends or rekindle old flames. Let your eyes take in the luxurious expanse of the open desert under clear, starlit skies. Gaze straight on into the sunset from our villa rooftops. Countless diversions await. Gamble in our casino, take in the theater, or stay in one of our exclusive executive suites that will shelter you and cater to your every whim. So if life's worries have weighed you down, if you need an escape from your troubles, or if you just need an opportunity to begin again, join us. Let go and leave the world behind at the Sierra Madre Grand Opening this October. We'll be waiting. Right off the bat, the broadcast is effectively mysterious. When the woman mentions the grand opening being in October, any player with the most basic knowledge of Fallout's canon will almost definitely catch on that this must be a pre-war broadcast. This would also imply the woman speaking is most likely dead, ghoulified, or preserved in some way like Mr. House or, God forbid, Herbert. The broadcast also promises the listener a chance to begin again. What could this possibly mean in a pre-war context? The place sounds rather extravagant, so I doubt it's something anyone living in poverty during pre-war times would have been able to get into, 
Maybe it's purely metaphorical? After all, how does one begin again upon visiting a casino other than, I guess, going broke and quite literally having to begin again financially? Or maybe the place was in fact intended to be some sort of haven from the looming threat of nuclear Armageddon. There's so many questions already and all we've done is listen to a broadcast. These questions prompt the player to want to explore for reasons beyond just wanting to play the DLC they purchased, and there's a genuine intrigue as to what this place could be. It's a pretty strong setup. Upon examining the map, we find the Sierra Madre reopening quest leads us to a Brotherhood of Steel bunker northeast of Nelson. I think Obsidian did a great job with the location of this bunker. Even though the broadcast itself seems borderline seductive in how it promises the listener all these wonders, it's more than likely that the majority of people in the Mojave that wanted to get to this bunker wouldn't even be able to reach it, were they able to track the signal in the first place. The bunker itself is located deep in the heart of Legion territory between the Colorado River and Camp Nelson. It's also north of Cottonwood Cove, one of the Legion's most notable territories. North of the bunker itself is Camp Forlorn Hope, an NCR-occupied territory that probably isn't about to let anyone wander down south to Legion territory. This area of the map is also located amongst several cliffs, making it isolated from the rest of the Mojave, and thus extremely difficult to reach for any single wanderer. It takes an exceptional and determined individual to make it this far. Upon arriving at the bunker, we see a decapitated corpse wearing a jumpsuit that we can't take for some reason, Anyways, as the player goes downstairs, they might see some writing that says Sierra Madre with an arrow pointing to the door beneath it, which should set off a number of red flags at this point. But nevertheless, we press on. If the player's science skill is high enough, they'll be able to open a locked door inside the bunker, leading them to a personal chamber of sorts. It's quite a mess, but the most interesting thing in the room is no doubt Father Elijah's chemistry set. For those who've encountered the Brotherhood of Steel in the base game, this name should be very familiar. The Mojave chapter of the Brotherhood of Steel is a broken mess, primarily due to a spat that occurred between them and the New California Republic two years prior to the events of the base game. Prior to the NCR's occupation of the Mojave, the Brotherhood of Steel, then headed by Elder Elijah, had taken notice of the Helios Solar Power Plant. As you can imagine, a solar power plant smack dab in the middle of the fucking desert is a pretty valuable asset to have in the post-nuclear world. It wasn't long before Elder Elijah discovered evidence of a superweapon housed within Helios that would give him the advantage of the looming threat of other factions, most notably the NCR, whom he'd failed to seize the Hoover Dam from in a prior conflict. Elder Elijah soon became obsessed with unlocking the secrets of Helios, but time was beginning to run out before the NCR would show up and want to claim it for themselves. However, despite his vast knowledge regarding pre-war tech, Elijah wasn't able to unlock the secrets in time, and the NCR had found their way to the power plant. This led to a conflict between the Brotherhood and NCR, however the power plant was, in the tactical persuasion, more than vulnerable, to say the least. To their credit, the Brotherhood managed to hold off the NCR for two whole years. Initially, the Brotherhood completely overpowered the NCR with their significantly more advanced technology and weapons. However, unlike the Brotherhood, who had no reinforcements to call upon, the NCR had more than enough warm bodies to throw at their opponents. The Brotherhood was limited on manpower, resources, and tactical advantage. Their loss was inevitable. Eventually, the NCR began to overwhelm the Brotherhood, leading to a final conflict that would later become known as Operation Sunburst. But Elijah was too obsessed to leave. The Brotherhood mutinied, with the soon-to-be Elder McNamara leading their escape into Hidden Valley. Former Elder Elijah, humiliated and defeated, retreated far out east, supposedly never being seen or heard from again. So now the player is left wondering if they might be meeting Elijah on this journey to the Sierra Madre. The second most notable thing you can find in this bunker is this bizarre device, the Sierra Madre vending machine. It's inoperable at the moment, but nevertheless intriguing. What does it even dispense? And how? There doesn't seem to be much in the ways of storage in this device, at least from what we can tell. What kind of currency does it even take? It doesn't take caps, legion currency, NCR currency, or even pre-war money, so what's the deal? At the moment the player knows nothing, but all these questions will be answered in due time. After looking around a bit, it's finally time to approach the radio in the next part of the bunker. Upon approaching it, the player is hit with some kind of gas agent that causes the courier to pass out. What follows is a brief slideshow cutscene, something that happens at the start of every New Vegas DLC, and this is where Dead Money officially begins.
You've heard of the Sierra Madre Casino. We all have. The legend, the curses, foolishness about it lying in the middle of the city of the dead, buried beneath a blood-red cloud, a bright, shining monument luring treasure hunters to their doom. The world's most famous stars and entertainers were invited to its grand opening. An invitation was a sign of exclusiveness. The opening was supposed to symbolize a road to a brighter future, not just for the world, but for all who came to its doors. A chance for anyone to begin again. Except the Sierra Madre never opened. The war froze it in time, like a big flashbulb going off. The grand opening, one big ending of humanity. It's still out there, in the wastes, preserved, just waiting for someone to crack it open. But getting to it, that's not the hard part. It's letting go. This slideshow presents several key pieces of information. It's confirmed that the Sierra Madre was in fact intended to be this incredibly lavish and luxurious place that would protect those who made it in from the Great War. We learn that the only people invited were the biggest stars and celebrities of the time, meaning this was not something many people would have been given the privilege of indulging in. And finally, it's said that it never got to open because of the Great War. This means that everything within the Sierra Madre has been more or less frozen in time, making it a bountiful source of resources like food, water, and perhaps more. After the intro, the courier wakes up in the villa. The clouds are a pitch dark red and orange, and the town looks to be in ruin. Regardless of what time it is, the whole location appears to be locked in a perpetual state of red twilight. We have arrived at the Sierra Madre, and somebody would like to speak with us. Father Elijah has loads to say here, and the player needs to take it all in because the Sierra Madre is a cruel and unforgiving mistress. On top of immediately making it clear to the player what their objective is, Elijah warns of the numerous threats throughout the villa, such as the speakers and radios, ghost people, holograms, and perhaps above all, the cloud. I'll go into more depth about all of these as they come up, but it's important to note that Elijah isn't being entirely forthcoming with what he knows about the Sierra Madre, let alone the circumstances of this heist. After the player decides they've heard enough, Elijah sends them on their way with an audio log of a basic reminder of the objective. This has a very particular use later on, but for now I think I've said enough. So that about does it for the introduction to Dead Money. It's a brilliant setup that effectively presents the main conflict of the story while also providing a great deal of foreshadowing. No doubt there are a number of questions that can be running through the player's mind at this point, so hopefully as we progress we'll be able to find the answers we seek. Our journey through Dead Money will pick up as we explore the gameplay in the next part. This is a series I've been really excited about making, and now that we're here, I plan to take my time exploring everything the Sierra Madre has to offer. Once again, I sincerely appreciate all of your support and look forward to more of our journeying through the Sierra Madre. Remember, the hard part isn't getting there. Good evening and welcome to the Sierra Madre. I do hope you're enjoying your stay thus far. Today we're going to be taking a look at the combat within Dead Money and what players can expect to experience within this expansion. To be clear, this won't be a review of New Vegas' combat as a whole, though I may reference its quality or lack thereof when I feel it's appropriate. Most of the discussion here is going to center around three things, the courier and the various builds that the player might be invested in, companions, and the ghost people. Let's start with the Ghost People, as they're very much the foundation on which the combat of this DLC is built. The Ghost People are a fascinating bunch, and their core gimmick revolves around the dismemberment of limbs, not too much unlike the Necromorphs from Dead Space. However, unlike the Necromorphs, Ghost People will never die from attacks to their torsos, excluding attacks with splash damage that would simultaneously damage limbs. Dismemberment isn't just a suggestion, it's a requirement, otherwise they'll just keep getting back up. I've always loved this because it makes them feel so distinctly alien. There really is nothing else like them in Fallout. It's sort of a mystery if dismembering them even kills them at all. 
If you don't dismember their heads, you can actually still hear them breathing, which, not gonna lie, really fucking creepy. What makes fighting the ghost people so interesting mechanically, though, is how when it comes to dismembering their limbs, the requirement is actually just to cripple the limb, rather than have to reduce the overall health to zero. You can actually kill ghost people regardless of how much overall health they have by reducing the health of one of their limbs to zero. There is one way to kill ghost people normally, though, and that's by obtaining the Ghost Hunter perk. The player can get this perk by talking to Dog after watching him devour a ghost person, and the way it functions is when a ghost person's health reaches zero, one of their limbs will, most likely, explode. Canonically, it's explained by Dog showing the courier the best places to strike them, but mechanically it just means that you can kill them without crippling limbs. Personally, I find this perk rather immersion-breaking, and I think it's way too easy to obtain given how it outright negates having to participate in the core gimmick of Dead Money's combat. But it's also quite easy for this perk to go completely under the player's nose. I mean, for what it's worth, I didn't actually know about this perk until like three years after I first played Dead Money, so at least there's that, but it doesn't really feel like much of an excuse. So let's take a moment to talk about the different types of ghost people. There are three variants that you'll come across, and while they're not too particularly distinct from one another, there's enough variety in how they engage with the player to keep the gameplay fresh for the time you spend fighting them. The first and most common variety of ghost people is the Harvester. Harvesters will throw knife spears at the player when at a distance and wield knife spear melee weapons for CQC. Their attack patterns are simple, but what they lack in complexity they more than make up for in ferocity. These things hit hard, especially with their throwing knife spears. Even with my toughest character build, a single spear would take a sizable chunk of health away. There's not a lot of downtime between each toss, so you're going to have to find a way to either dispose of them from a distance or close the gap as safely as possible. This is of course depending on your build. Players utilizing firearms will have to time their shots accordingly and those utilizing melee will have to learn to bob and weave until they've closed the gap between themselves and the harvester. That or you could use your own throwing knife spears, but they can be difficult to aim. Even more so when dealing with a pack of ghost people where multiple harvesters are chucking knife spears at you. At that point you're gonna need to time your attacks properly so as to avoid taking as much damage as possible. This can get pretty overwhelming, but it never feels too unfair. The time between their spear tosses is just long enough that you'll have a moment to plot your next move, but just short enough to keep you on your toes and having to think fast. If you're utilizing firearms, the matter is as simple as timing your shots accordingly. The only real issue with that being that New Vegas' gunplay... Uh, how do I put this delicately? It's shit. But at least Vats makes it more manageable. For melee, however, once you manage to close the distance, you'll need to maintain environmental awareness so as to save yourself from being attacked from behind or being flanked by a ghost person you completely forgot about. Or you could just throw your own spears. God knows you'll have plenty to spare. Next up is the Trapper. Trappers use bear trap fists to deal pretty heavy unarmed damage that can cripple your limbs really easily. Their movesets are pretty simple, and they don't really hop around as much as the other types of ghost people, so on paper, you could say they're the easiest variants to dispose of. However, they're also typically encountered in areas littered with tripwires and bear traps, so even though they're a pretty basic enemy variant, players would be wise not to take them as an easy encounter. They're usually encountered alone, but should you find one in a pack of ghost people, they'll rank pretty low on your list of priorities. They're the slowest of the ghost people and have no ranged attacks whatsoever, so unless you're just positioned in a way that has you positioned immediately before one of these guys, you can afford to save them for last, provided you're maintaining your distance. The environment is also something that will need to be considered when dealing with the trappers. This could be said for any variant of the ghost people, but it's especially true for the trappers given that they're only able to deal damage at close range. Maintaining a distance is ideal for fighting trappers, however the Sierra Madre isn't exactly known for its massive open areas. So understanding the layout of the map as well as where nearby traps are becomes especially imperative when dealing with these things. It's a nice, more subtle way of making the location itself feel more memorable, while also giving the player more to consider for each combat scenario. And finally, there are the Seekers. Seekers are very similar to Harvesters, but instead of throwing knife spears, they come equipped with gas bombs which not only deal hefty damage but can very easily cripple the player's limbs. After throwing a bomb or two at the player, Seekers will close the distance with lunging attacks and proceed to attack with their knife spears. There's one thing I find particularly frustrating about Seekers though, and it's that you can't shoot their gas bombs while in vats. We've been able to use vats to target grenades and countless other explosives, so why can't these things be fired at? What's especially bizarre is that they can be fired at while the Seeker is still holding them, but unless I've just got the worst luck in the world, it seems like they can't actually be exploded. 
How awesome would it be to fire at a gas bomb in the middle of a pack of ghost people and just watch them all explode? Maybe that's what Obsidian was trying to avoid because it could make some encounters too easy? But why would Dean Domino himself suggest doing this then? Well, you seem like you know how to handle yourself. All right. Once I fired a lucky shot, hit a gas tank one was holding, blew his arm off at the shoulder. And he didn't get back up after that. So if you're that good, don't aim for the head, aim for their bombs. And if you can wait until his buddies are close by, even better. And why not just design the levels and encounters in a way that accounts for this possibility? It's just such a basic piece of game design that they've outright denied to the player, and I can't make any sense of it. Otherwise, I like the Seekers. They're a bit samey in comparison to the Harvesters, but their more aggressive behavior and the use of gas bombs make them stand out adequately enough. It's just really bizarre that you can't shoot the gas bombs. Like, seriously, what the fuck? It's a nice reprieve that several weapons in Dead Money, such as the Knife, Spear, and Police Pistol, deal bonus damage to limbs. But it's a reasonable way of offsetting their otherwise highly durable dispositions. I think it's safe to say that most New Vegas players with builds that rely on firearms will go for headshots, so the focus on limb dismemberment will make for a healthy incentive to perhaps experiment with focus firing different limbs. And this side effect can bleed over into how the player approaches combat in the main game, and other expansions. I can actually say from experience that following Dead Money, I was far more inclined to fire at enemy limbs rather than just going for headshots all the time. So thanks, Dead Money. This also applies to those utilizing melee builds. Let's face it, melee builds may be powerful in New Vegas, but the combat itself isn't exactly complex. However, thanks to the focus on limb dismemberment, suddenly melee players will find themselves being more tactical and focused in their strikes, rather than just wailing away until the enemy's health reaches zero. This is great because now the player is doing a lot more thinking, which feels natural given the simplistic nature of New Vegas' melee combat. But that isn't the only way melee is improved upon in Dead Money. Even with my melee build that had 10 endurance with tier 2 toughness, these things would eat right through my health in a matter of seconds, especially when dealing with packs of them. So given just how much damage these things are capable of dealing, it's very important to learn to time your blocks when using melee weapons. Timing your blocks just right will cause a momentary staggering, not too much unlike what you might expect when using a parry. Nailing a perfect block against ghost people is a very satisfying reward for more skilled gameplay. The blocking animation itself is a bit clunky, so it's not exactly in the same tier as Dark Souls or Devil May Cry, but it's still reasonably satisfying and rewarding nonetheless. Melee isn't just a great build to use for dead money because of, say, the inherent advantages when it comes to resource management. It's great because these enemies are designed in a way that brings out the best in what the melee combat has to offer. Even if the best of the melee combat is more or less simplistic, that's not at all to say that it isn't satisfying and rewarding to get good with. So how about explosive builds? How did these fare against the ghost people? I'll say, decently. Explosive builds inherently have a huge advantage over other builds in that explosives generally deal damage to all limbs, meaning you don't really have to focus on the limbs so much as just making sure that your bombs land relatively close to your enemies. That alone could make explosive builds inherently top tier when it comes to handling the ghost people, but there are several very clever design choices that offset this. For starters, the environment. The villa is very cramped, with pillars and corners aplenty. Open areas are few and far between, meaning that not only will the player be at huge risk of harming themselves and their companions, but it's possible that your explosive will roll around a corner, or a ghost person will jump just out of your explosive's reach, or maybe even around a corner. The second thing that offsets the inherent advantage in an explosive build is the sheer lack of resources. You really don't have a lot of gear to work with, and on the highest difficulty settings, it's rare that you'll find yourself able to kill a ghost person with a single bomb. So not only do you have to be tactical with your use of explosive weaponry, but you cannot afford to waste even a single bomb. And sometimes you will genuinely have to weigh your options as to whether or not an encounter is even worth getting into. Sometimes you just can't afford to go through with it. Honestly, my explosive build playthrough was one of the most enjoyable I've ever done of this DLC. It felt reminiscent of the very first playthrough I ever had of Dead Money, where I was really scraping by for supplies and had to think out every single encounter. So while explosive builds may be in the lower tier of Dead Money builds, they still make for some damn enjoyable runs all the same. 
More specialized builds can offer up some unique advantages and disadvantages depending on how you've spec'd your character. For instance, energy weapon builds have a huge advantage against packs of ghost people thanks to the meltdown perk which causes explosions that deal significant splash damage to other enemies. However, that also presents a risk of damaging your companions or possibly even yourself. Stealth builds with perks like better criticals and ninja can work wonders against single enemies, but struggle against packs of ghost people as the denial of a stealth bonus can seriously hamper your ability to damage. It's interesting how such basic design choices can highlight the strengths and weaknesses of so many different potential character builds. But the courier is not the only one stuck in the Sierra Madre. Let's look at how the companions of Dead Money fare against the ghost people. There are three companions the courier will come across in the Sierra Madre, four if you consider that one of these companions can play in two distinct ways, and technically is, but also sort of not two characters. It's it's kind of weird. There's Dean Domino, who primarily uses a police pistol, Christine, who specializes in both energy weapons and melee combat, and Dog, who's a melee-focused super mutant. But let's start with Christine. I suppose the first issue of note is that, for story reasons, she's a mute, meaning that she has captions that'll pop up in the midst of battle on the player's screen. These suck. When you're approaching enemies or facing a pack of ghost people, it can be a real distraction to try and read several lines of text from a mute companion while also having to decipher just what in the hell she's even trying to convey to the courier. I mean, seriously, who has time for this? The only alternative is to, of course, just ignore her, but given that Christine's being mute is such an important aspect of her character, this ultimately feels like something the developers really should have thought out. And honestly, this is a real struggle to try and figure out. If they had Christine stopping you before combat engagements for the usual Fallout dialogue, that would be a major disruption to the pacing, and then there's the issue of whether or not you'd even have the time to read all of the text provided anyways, which itself is a prevalent issue in her dialogue. Aside from that, what's the alternative? Even if they had the time, budget, and engine to have Christine act out distinct animations, there's still the issue of deciphering what they even mean and the fact that your attention would have to be focused on her. If I'm being perfectly honest, I think it would have been best to just not have these captions at all. Have Christine play as this silent but deadly killer where her actions speak for themselves. While the courier focuses an enemy, Christine could take on the others. When the player turns around to see that Christine has already dispatched of two other enemies, that would tell them everything they need to know. Come to think of it, why is Christine focusing on these elaborate charades when I'm not even looking at her and she needs to be worrying about the ghost people anyways? Furthermore, why do I need text blurbs to tell me her expression as she attacks ghost people? I do appreciate the effort they put into making Christine's character possible, but when it comes to the captions that pop up prior to, following, and during combat, it just feels like an unnecessary addition that wasn't very well thought out. I'm alright with the text blurbs that indicate she's at low health because that's crucial information as her life is tied to the couriers, but why do I need a text blurb describing her being mad at a ghost person as she strikes? My advice? Just ignore these. They don't help. So, how does Christine actually fare against the ghost people herself? Well, she's pretty good. Her tag skills are sneak, energy weapons, and melee weapons, but she's adequate in every form of combat, which is great because regardless of what build you choose to go with, you'll always be able to make use of her. Of course, it's always best to focus on the tag skills of your companions for optimal damage output, but hey, you got options. That's pretty cool. If your courier focuses on energy weapons, you can give her a melee weapon like the knife spear. If your courier focuses on melee, you can give her the hollow rifle and any microfusion cells that you come across. Her ability to sneak is also pretty useful for starting encounters as she can potentially land a critical hit on a ghost person, thus lowering the pack number by one right off the bat. Seriously, repair your hollow rifle, give it to Christine, and just watch her obliterate ghost people at the start of every encounter. She is pretty decent with melee weapons, but the issue is that the AI tends to struggle with doing stealth and melee in conjunction with one another. This isn't a Christine exclusive issue, of course, as New Vegas' AI is, uh, it's not good. Next up is Dean Domino, and while I'd place him at a lower tier than Christine, by no means is he weak. He'll even point out little secrets and even traps every now and then, which is really useful. As for his tagged skills, he's got guns and explosives. 
Yeah, um, you're not getting my boom booms, Dino. So guns it is. Which is actually fine, because he packs his own police pistol and has unlimited ammo. So even if your build also focuses on guns, you'll never have to worry about splitting ammo with him or even supplying him with a firearm. This might seem a bit counterintuitive to the usual design philosophy of Dead Money, but I feel like it's a reasonable way of offsetting his otherwise unimpressive stats. He doesn't pack too much of a punch on his own, but he's very reliable as a source of additional damage output. And canonically, it makes sense that he would come pre-equipped with a firearm found in the Sierra Madre and be exceptionally skilled with it, having presided here for over 200 years. I mean, the guy survived that long in this place? Holy shit, dude. That's impressive no matter who you are. And finally, there's everyone's favorite nightkin, dog, or god, depending on your preferred pronouns. The player, of course, has the freedom to change between the two personalities at any point, which can present some interesting gameplay scenarios. God is the weakest companion in Dead Money when it comes to combat, but earning his trust can prove extremely valuable in the long run when it comes to the story. Dog is the strangest companion in Dead Money by a pretty significant margin, but taking advantage of Dog means that God won't trust you and it'll be much more difficult to make certain preferred outcomes possible later on. So do you make things easier on yourself now at the cost of a valuable ally? It's a unique scenario that does a great job at tying your choices in the gameplay to the consequences of the story, which is something I've always felt that New Vegas has excelled at. So let's start with God. God's a pussy. His melee is intentionally stilted and awkward, and his damage output is pretty weak. His health pool is pretty chonky, and he actually heals at a pretty decent rate, so at least he has some survivability. However, the damage resistance is pretty bog standard, and the ghost people can easily overwhelm him. Given that he'll always be charging enemies, after all he's a super mutant and he uses his fists, it can be pretty difficult to look after him at times. Honestly, God just sucks. I'm not saying that as a criticism, however. I like the idea of having the gameplay interwoven in such a way with the outcome of the story. Also, the In My Footsteps perk, which is basically just Diet Light Step, that he gives you while you're in his party is really awesome. Ensuring that you won't be triggering any traps while in stealth. Of course, being that he has to be in your party in order for this to work, and the sheer size of the big blue bastard, stealth isn't going to be particularly easy to pull off in certain areas, unless you decide to have him wait really far away. Dog, on the other hand, is a very good boy, at least in combat, and he will utterly demolish any ghost person that he comes across. Like God, he uses melee, but his attacks are faster and stronger. On top of this, he has a 30% boost in damage resistance. Combine that with the already massive health pool, and he can practically walk through packs of ghost people with little more than a scratch or two. He doesn't have God's regenerating health perk, but to be perfectly frank, he just doesn't need it. Dog is a walking apocalypse that can easily carry you even on the highest possible difficulty settings. In addition to this, Dog will chow down on any incapacitated ghost person that has yet to have one of their limbs severed, killing them permanently. Dog is insanely powerful, and a very good boy. 10 out of 10 would take for walks around the Sierra Madre. If there's one criticism I had for Dog and God both, it's that their dialogue becomes So, it's your own fault you're here. Couldn't leave well enough alone. So, it's your own fault you're here. Couldn't leave well enough alone. So repetitive. It's your own fault you're here. Couldn't leave well enough alone. Naturally, this problem doesn't extend to Christine as she doesn't speak, and Dean has so much dialogue that you'd have to be progressing incredibly slowly in order for his dialogue to get repetitive. But Dog and God only have a handful of lines each, so unless you're bouncing back and forth between the two, which you shouldn't be doing, then you're gonna hear several lines several times. Dead Money isn't particularly long, so this isn't too much of an issue, but it is noticeable and it can get really annoying. Speaking of criticisms, I'd like to take a moment to look at specific encounters and moments where I feel the combat fluctuates in quality. I think it's weird that Dog, God, and Christine get their own ghost people encounters, outside the station and clinic respectively, after initially recruiting them, but Dean Domino doesn't. When recruiting Dean, he shows the courier a shortcut straight back to the villa, which, I mean, that's fine, it's in line with his character, but on the way there is a single encounter with one ghost person, and it's in the middle of a thick pocket of the cloud, so the player's either going to be running right past it or killing it as fast as possible. With Dog, God, and Christine, the player got to see firsthand how they fare in combat, 
but with Dean, you don't really see what he can do until taking him to do something else later on. It just seems odd to have enemies spawn specifically for the purpose of showing the player what the other characters can do, only to not do the same for Dean. At the very least though, Dean is very forthcoming with what he specializes in, so at least the player won't feel as though this information just isn't being conveyed to them, unlike someone else. Also, I feel as though these encounters following Dog on and Christine's recruiting could have been a bit more interesting, especially Christine's. The player will most likely be recruiting Dog and God first, so having a couple of enemies spawn outside the station is adequate enough. It makes sense story-wise too, since God was using the radios that are now turned off to keep the ghost people away. I think they could have spawned at least two more ghost people, maybe another trapper or even a seeker, so as to highlight how strong Dog is and how weak God is, but unless they're killing these things insanely quickly, the player will more than likely get a good enough sense as to how Dog or God operates in battle. Upon meeting Christine, the player is likely to assume that she's unarmed, as she was trapped inside the autodoc for a very long time, meaning that it's likely the player will feel inclined to check her inventory, thus confirming she's unarmed. Checking a companion's inventory is something most Fallout players do anyways, however that extra little bit of story context incentive is always a plus. The player is free to equip her with whatever they like, but if they try talking to her and learning about her, she'll explain through her various charades that she's pretty much skilled with everything. This is both a positive and a negative. On the plus side, the player is free to equip her with whatever they like, so unused weapons will always get some use. On the negative, she never makes it expressly clear that her best skills, her tagged skills, are melee, energy weapons, and sneak. So aside from looking up her tagged skills, players don't really have any way of figuring out what she's actually best at. Let's go over a brief hypothetical. It's your first time playing Dead Money, you're using an energy weapons build, you come across Christine, and you figure that it would be best for her to use the police pistol since she's small, being below average height compared to the vast majority of New Vegas' NPCs, which typically share the exact same height, because, as some players know, the size of the character model actually correlates somewhat to their damage output and damage resistance. You're playing on a higher difficulty setting, and upon leaving the clinic, you find her skills with the police pistol rather subpar. That experience, plus the fact that she says that she can use any type of weaponry, might convey to the player that she's a jack of all trades, master of none. This is not the assumption that you want your players to be led to, and it could be potentially very detrimental to the experience, at least concerning specific instances with Christine as an ally. Now, bear in mind, that is a rather specific set of circumstances, and it's quite possible possible in this scenario that the player would choose to equip her with other types of weaponry, which would inevitably bring out what she's best at. It's just weird that Christine's dialogue doesn't make it particularly clear what she's best at. With Dog and God, they only have one method of attack, meaning that what you see is what you get, and the encounter with the ghost people outside the police station will show the player exactly what he can and will perform like when in combat. Christine, on the other hand, is capable of using and claims to be skilled with a variety of weaponry, so her first encounter with the ghost people can turn out any number of ways, depending on how much of her dialogue the player has exhausted. Whether or not the player chose to equip her and what the player chose to equip her with in the first place. I realize this probably seems like a bit of a tangent, but I feel like there's a lot to say about how Christine's skill set is so vaguely defined, while Dean, Dog, and Gods are all made abundantly clear even though with Dean it's more dialogue based than anything. Overall, I think that despite several issues, most more minor than others, the combat in Den Money is pretty well executed and it does a great job at feeling unique with its greater focus on strategic gameplay, and not to mention a few quirks that you generally only see in survival horror games. The Ghost People are a fantastic set of enemies. While some may feel that they are somewhat lacking in variety, I'd argue the core differences between their variants are enough to keep the gameplay fresh per encounter, and the fundamental elements of their overall design is so well realized that you'd be hard pressed to find an encounter that was anything but tense, at least on the higher difficulty settings. Companions fare reasonably well against the ghost people with enough differences between the four of them that they all manage to stand out in their own ways, and that's just when it comes to the combat. Some of the design choices pertaining to the companions are inconsistent, if not outright poorly realized, but there's little that I feel they do even with some rather glaring flaws that significantly detracts from the experience. Now that we've explored the combative side of the experience, we can begin to dissect the story, exploration, and how various supplementary mechanics come together to add or detract from the experience. But that'll have to wait until next time. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again soon. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to my critical analysis of Fallout New Vegas' first expansion pack, Dead Money. 
We just finished speaking with Father Elijah, so it's time to explore the villa, and boy is there a lot to say. I typically start by going in the order that the quests appear, which means the first stop will be the police station. It's not too far from the middle of the villa, which makes sense for the location of any law enforcement base of operations. On the way to the police station, we're introduced to some of the more baser elements of the Sierra Madre gameplay-wise. Just off to the side, the player will probably stumble across one of Dean Domino's stashes, and this is one of the best to come across in Dead Money, giving the player a generous mix of resources as well as a shotgun in decent condition with several rounds. This is a great way of immediately incentivizing the player to always be willing to explore off the beaten path. The Sierra Madre may be a more linear experience than Fallout players are generally accustomed to, but by no means does it fail in providing the player with rewarding exploration. I've often seen people express the notion that this is one of the weaker expansions due to its linearity. On one hand, I see where one could be coming from with this criticism. Fallout 3 had two very linear expansions, Operation Anchorage and Mothership Zeta, both of which bookended the game and are considered to be by far the weakest of that game's expansions. So following the launch of New Vegas for the very first expansion to turn out to be a more linear journey, I completely get how this would have rubbed anyone the wrong way. However, unlike Operation Anchorage and Mothership Zeta, Dead Money actually has a fair amount of exploration in it. In Operation Anchorage and Mothership Zeta, the secrets were simply data files and holotapes that were laying off to the side. It was the equivalent to Call of Duty Intel collectibles. Sure, you could get a cool perk by finding all the intel in Operation Anchorage, but that was about as far as it went. In Dead Money, the villa itself is constructed in a way that allows for a fair amount of rewarding exploration. And in many ways, the player will have to weigh the risk versus reward for exploring different parts of the Sierra Madre. That door over there might lead to some goodies, but is it worth fighting through a whole pack of ghost people? That pocket of cloud looks like it leads down an alleyway. Maybe there's something worth finding back there? There's a surprising amount of nooks and crannies littered throughout the villa, and it can be extremely rewarding to stumble across another of Dean Domino's stashes. Who knows, maybe you'll even come across the fabled Sierra Madre Snow Globe. Ooh. Also gives you 2,000 Sierra Madre tokens, it's fucking amazing. As well, Papa Eli's generous enough to let us partake in the quests in whatever order we feel like. This doesn't have any particularly noticeable consequences, which is a bit of a letdown, but it can be fun to try your luck in different sections of the villa however you please. It's a small way of allowing the player the freedom to go about questing however they like, and I'll always appreciate that. Still though, it would have been nice to see some kind of consequences for the order we do the quests. Perhaps if we took too long to get to Christine, she would be more apprehensive later on about going down the elevator shaft, as a result of her spending too much time in the auto dock. Or maybe Dean would get offended if we didn't go for him first, making it more difficult to get on his good side via dialogue. Stuff like that would have been really cool, I think. I enjoy the level of exploration granted to the player throughout the villa, and I think Obsidian did a really great job of pulling off the risk versus reward factor. As much as some players may have wanted the Sierra Madre to be this big open map, I think you can only go so far with that before it begins to clash with the plot. In the base game of New Vegas, it made sense that the player would have the freedom that they do because everything in the Mojave is basically at a stalemate. Benny won't be leaving Vegas anytime soon and he's literally digging a tunnel into the Lucky 38 from across New Vegas at the tops, which I can't even imagine how long of a process that would be, even with Yes Man. Hey! So it makes sense for him to always be there until confronted by the courier. Mr. House needs the Platinum Chip in order to proceed with his plan to upgrade the Securitron army, and he's also waiting for the NCR and Legion to go to war. Speaking of which, the NCR are too caught up in their bureaucratic paperwork to get any actual work done, which is reflected in what we see throughout the wastes in locations like Camp Forlorn Hope, Prim, and Camp Golf. They've also already got control of Hoover Dam, so the higher-ups see no incentive to jump into further conflict with Caesar's Legion, aside from the occasional skirmish and general defensive measures. Caesar needs to access the bunker beneath the Legion's camp so that he can use the artillery against the NCR when the Legion assaults Hoover Dam, but he can't do this without the Platinum Chip. Everything going on hinges on what the Courier, and technically Benny, decides to do regarding the Platinum Chip. Time is not necessarily of the essence. The same cannot be said for dead money. Father Elijah doesn't want anyone screwing around, and there's a toxic cloud that will eventually kill everyone there, assuming that the ghost people don't get to them first. The stakes are very clear, and it would be kind of bizarre if the player could just go exploring some area unrelated to the tasks at hand. 
don't misunderstand, there is exploration, but the exploration that takes place occurs in areas that the player is directed to explore in the first place, such as the Poesta del Sol and the Salida del Sol. It's very meticulously designed around the idea of linear style progression, and it fits within the narrative that Dead Money is trying to tell very well. Overall, I think it's very well executed. Upon arriving at the police station, the player will immediately notice the large cell across the room. Inside of it is the super mutant night Ken dog, who is sitting facing the corner and refuses to move. The door to the cage can only be opened with a key, so for now we'll just have to leave him be. Father Elijah mentioned earlier that we should explore the police station first because the super mutant is more docile and easy to command. This makes sense from his character, but it's also clear after doing just a little bit of exploration why Obsidian suggested the player to come here first. This is a great area to acquire a variety of resources to get us started on our journey through the Sierra Madre. There are multiple weapons that you can find here, from melee weapons including the Cosmic Knife, which has high DPS, to the Police Pistol, which does extra damage to limbs, again, really useful against the Ghost People, and even if you have high enough science or lockpicking, the Automatic Rifle, a powerful but inaccurate LMG. There's also a set of Sierra Madre security armor, and it's in pretty decent condition. The armor isn't really that great, but it's a significant step up from the jumpsuit that we start off with. There's also food, some water, beds to rest on, crafting supplies, and various other supplies. There are also several vending machine codes, hollow discs that allow for the player to access more items at the Sierra Madre vending machines, including weapon repair kits, 308 rifle rounds, 357 magnum rounds, and steady. I mentioned before that you can play the missions in the villa however you prefer, but aside from experimenting or roleplay specific player decisions, I can't really think of any reason not to come to the police station first. It's a complete goldmine for any player starting out, regardless of their build. There are also several radios that have been turned on around the station, and this will be most players' first introduction to this particular environmental hazard. Elijah mentioned earlier that the radios and speakers have corroded over the past two centuries, now emitting frequencies that will cause the callers to eventually explode. So the player will know, unless they just haven't been paying attention, in which case... <laughs> <laughs> oh shit. Sorry about your luck. They've got to get these things turned off. Elijah even reminds the player of this upon entering the station. When the player gets too close to a radio or speaker, they'll be notified that their caller is emitting a high-pitched beeping noise, and a beeping will begin to sound off, alerting the player that they need to either hurry up and shut down the source of the frequency, or get the hell out of Dodge. This shit has become known to many players as the epitome of raw, unfiltered anxiety. The longer the player is in range of foreign frequencies, the faster their color will begin to beep, and let me tell you that this will undoubtedly make for some of the most intense gameplay scenarios that you will find in any Fallout game. That goddamn beeping will get you on edge immediately, and you encounter it a lot. I love it. Dead Money is already known for being oppressively atmospheric and brutally difficult, but toss in the anxiety of dealing with these speakers and radios, and you've got an experience that expertly keeps the player on edge the entire time. When you're running around the villa, and you know you've got to push through a pocket of cloud or fight some ghost people, it can really add to the stress of the situation the moment you hear that beeping go off. It's a total monkey wrench that's meant to force the player to step back and think, and that's the best thing about it. It's a surprise mechanic, but it'll never immediately punish the player in an unfair way. Once you hear that beeping, you're given plenty of time to take a step back or just press onwards, either ultimately disabling the device or escaping its range. 
That being said, you still need to remain aware of it and try to find out where the beeping is coming from, as you'll often find yourself running through certain parts of the villa multiple times, meaning that every time you encounter a radio or speaker, you'll probably want to disable it as soon as possible. What's more impressive is that they found ways to implement this environmental hazard in a relatively balanced way. When you come across this hazard, you're not immediately punished. You'll really only ever be punished if you just charge in without thinking. You could get swarmed by ghost people, get lost in a cloud pocket, or even step into range of another radio or speaker, meaning you'll have to also escape its range in the short amount of time that you're allotted. On top of that, not every speaker is destructible. This doesn't really become relevant until we've entered the casino, but it's still worth noting that speakers emitting red lights instead of blue lights cannot be disabled, no matter what. They're few and far between, but they act as something of a double whammy where now, you've really got to plot out what it is that you're going to need to do in order to circumvent this hazard. Here in the police station, the player will need to seek out each radio, stepping back to the front entrance whenever that beep begins to pick up too much. There are only a handful of radios, and it's uncommon to have to deal with this many in one spot, at least within the villa, so it's an excellent tutorial in that it makes it abundantly clear to the player that once that beeping starts, you had better hurry up. There's also a basement in the police station where a rather bizarre message will play over the speakers. The voice instructs the player to use the command tape on Dog, the nightkin in the cage, so at that point the objective is clear, and this is where things begin to get interesting. Dog. Back in the cage. What have we here? You weren't who I was expecting. I'm disappointed. Upon playing the audio log, which tells Dog to get back in the cage, the Nightkin stands upright and begins to speak with a much more calculated and even sinister tone. He likens the courier's pit boy and bomb collar to his own chain around his neck and the bear trap stuck to his arm. He talks somewhat cryptically about how he sleeps in a cage, and when he's awake, that's when Dog goes back in the cage. He also refers to himself as Dog's conscience, as he tries to keep Dog from getting himself hurt. Though, judging by the various visible injuries that he's sustained, it's clear that Dog doesn't always listen. At this point, it's fairly apparent that this Nightkin has some type of multiple personality disorder, of which there are dialogue choices pertaining to medicine and science that guess that trauma and stealth boy usage respectively. He doesn't reveal exactly what caused the personality split, but he does reveal that Dog is willing to go as far as to inflict pain upon himself just to silence God. This information has a number of implications, but for now what's important to note is that it's clear neither of these personalities takes kindly to one another, and this will make a pretty big difference as the story proceeds. When asked why he's locked in the cage, God explains that he locks himself inside so as to protect himself and Dog from getting into trouble. Something we as the audience can see is rather imperative thanks to the bear trap and various other injuries sustained by the Nightkin. We also learn a rather curious piece of information regarding Dog, and it's that he swallowed a bomb collar. And this doesn't really make any sense. God explains that Dog once devoured a human with a bomb collar attached to them, and the way he was able to do this was by breaking it apart, claiming that any bomb collar is capable of being fragmented into individual pieces while still remaining active. That last bit I'm actually willing to buy, but how the fuck does the ravenous and notably stupid super mutant with massive hands break apart a bomb collar without causing it to explode? It's been established in prior Fallout games that the bomb collars can go off if they're tampered with, so there's no way that this big dumb brute could have chewed it apart without triggering it. Another issue is that it doesn't make sense to be able to hear Dog or God via their collar's radio signal with the pieces of their collar still inside of them. Where is Master? But did he go away? I guess the microphone piece got stuck in his teeth? No, but seriously, it's even weirder because God himself points out that it would be difficult to hear him with his collar in his stomach. So perhaps it's a good thing that Dog swallowed his collar. Anyone listening would find it difficult to hear past the digestion. Also, how the hell do the radios not trigger the explosive in his stomach when he's so close by? I mean, I know that super mutants are thick-skinned, but sound isn't something that can easily be blocked out, especially when there is so much of it surrounding you. 
This isn't even difficult to rewrite either, just say that this mutant swallowed a dude's entire head and make it to where we can't listen to him using the radio signal on our Pip-Boy. I can buy that this dude gulped down an entire head over him chewing a bomb collar in a way that miraculously did not detonate it, but that's not all he's got to say. Anyone looking to learn more about Elijah can ask God what he knows, but what he says just cryptically alludes to Sunburst, which many players will already know about from the base game. Although I will say that it would be kind of cool to learn about it in the opposite way, first hearing about Sunburst through Dead Money, then going back to the Brotherhood, meeting them and being like, oh that's the, that's the thing from Elijah, oh my god. But eventually the courier has had enough exposition and it's time to let Dog or God out of the cage. God explains that he has the key to the cell hanging from the back of his neck. Exactly how he managed to pull this off isn't explained, but it doesn't seem physically impossible. You know, like chewing a bomb collar. So I'll let that slide. The player now has two options. Either let Dog out of the mental cage by playing the holotape of Elijah's instructions, or convince God to step out of the cage by informing him that you don't intend to use Dog, playing to the ego of God. God tried to intimidate the player earlier on by saying Dog would devour them if let out hungry, but as it turns out, Dog is very easy to instruct, especially for anyone related in some way to his master. If the player commits to the latter, God will simply step out, at which point he becomes the player's squadmate, granting the handy companion perk in his footsteps. However, if the player lets the dog out, this will allow for the first true interaction with the big dumb doggo. He's an idiot, as expected. Some of you classic Fallout fans may have noticed Dog's use of the word master. When listening to Dog's idol audio, he mentions a church that he wants to return to. This, of course, is none other than the Cathedral, a location from the first Fallout game where worshippers of the Super Mutant Master gathered. As it turns out, Dog was once a servant of the Master. From this, we can infer that Dog's mental split likely occurred at some point following the death of the Master, where its psychic link to the Super Mutants would have been severed, thus fracturing the mind of Dog. It's a really cool nod to the original Fallout, and I appreciate the added background to Dog and God's character. Going back to the station's basement, there's a lot of junk here that the player can use for crafting purposes. However, I find that the standard New Vegas crafting is ultimately kind of redundant in Dead Money, thanks to the inclusion of the Sierra Madre vending machines. Why bother taking up inventory space and risking becoming over-encumbered with crafting materials when you can just rely on Sierra Madre chips to get you whatever you want? They're absolutely littered throughout Dead Money, they only take up one spot in the Miskillinous section of the Pit-Boy, and most importantly, they don't weigh a thing. And the vending machines offer a lot of supplies that either can't be crafted or would simply be far too difficult to craft, such as weapon repair kits and stim packs. Furthermore, there are far more vending machines than there are workbenches in the Sierra Madre. There's a total of 13 vending machines in the Sierra Madre and only four workbenches, two in the villa and two in the casino. Reloading stations where you craft ammo are equally as scarce. As for cooking, yeah. Have fun with that one. So even if you wanted to craft supplies at a workbench, you would need to have memorized the only two locations per area you can even find a workbench at and find your way back to them whenever you need to, which in itself could make for a risky journey depending on where you are in terms of progression. I wouldn't go as far as to say that the workbenches or reloading stations are useless. I often use them to craft ammo for my weapons using shells and casings I found lying around the environments, of which there are plenty. However, the only bench I really used was the one on the east side of the Villa Plaza. It is worth noting, however, that there is one particular exception to this criticism, and that applies to anyone using an explosive character build, where workbenches and reloading stations become key to managing your resources. Dead money does not offer a lot in the ways of explosives. Players might stumble across a decent amount of frag grenades and mines, but they'd be hard pressed on very hard difficulty, especially in hardcore mode, to be able to make these last. I was often starved for explosive weaponry. For explosive builds, the Mad Bomber perk is going to be absolutely critical because it allows the player to use the various junk items that litter the Sierra Madre to create powerful explosive weaponry. Nuka grenades and fat mines will not be possible to craft due to the absence of mini nukes and Nuka Cola quartz in the Sierra Madre, leaving explosive build couriers with five craftable explosive weapon options. If you have the Nuka Chemist perk, you can make some Nuka Cola quartz using three regular Nuka Colas. However, the Sierra Madre isn't exactly overflowing with Nuka Cola, so the amount that you'll be able to make is quite limited regardless. 
I don't even recall the last time I saw a bottle of Nuka-Cola in the Sierra Madre. There are several other weapons you'll be able to craft though thanks to the Mad Bomber perk, and since explosive builds will be relying so heavily on these, let's take a moment to talk about them. First there's the Time Bomb. This powerful explosive device has a huge area of effect and can deal quite a bit of damage. At first that might sound really great, but it's not the most practical weapon. The Time Bomb has a similar throwing animation to Fragmines, meaning you won't be throwing it very far. On top of this is the countdown timer, a whopping 15 seconds, meaning that in order to really be able to make use of this, you're gonna have to be able to toss it into a cluster of ghost people, get out of range very quickly, and not to mention remain undetected if you're on higher difficulties, as the ghost people can very easily kill you, especially if you're up in their face. Even with maxed out stealth, the ghost people are surprisingly perceptive, and if you're crouched, you'll typically be moving slower, meaning that it's going to be difficult to remove yourself from the time bomb's effective range in time. The only way I could see that working would be if you invested in the stealth perk Tunnel Runner and also had the implant M5, but even then you'd be running a major risk being caught by the ghost people and being killed very quickly, so the time bomb is just not practical at all. Then there's the microfusion cell grenade which is easily the greatest of the bunch. The only material required to craft this is three microfusion cells, which really isn't too bad, and it has a pretty wide blast radius. The damage is good, but not spectacular. It's basically a plasma grenade substitute. So if you're a fan of that, then you're probably going to be inclined to use as many MFC grenades as possible. There's also the much more powerful variant, the MFC grenade cluster, and yeah, this thing is insanely powerful. It's a strap of six MFC grenades, I mean, yeah, it deals six times the damage if an enemy is hit by all of them, all but guaranteeing a one-shot kill. It does function differently, however, acting as a proximity detonation explosive. Why it does this, I do not have a fucking clue. So when an enemy steps into range of one of the MFC grenades from the cluster, that MFC grenade will trigger. This will most likely cause a chain reaction, as the MFC grenades rarely bounce that far away from one another. Since the trigger is proximity detonation, it can't be used in VATS, however I find that I rarely use VATS when it comes to explosive weaponry anyways, so that negative impact is ultimately quite minimal. The one major drawback of course is that the MFC grenade cluster costs a whopping 18 microfusion cells to craft, so this is a weapon that you're going to want to craft very few of and be extremely sparing with. If you were to use one of these, I'd really only recommend using them on named NPCs or particularly threatening groups of ghost people, perhaps after triggering the Gala event. Ultimately though, I found myself sticking to the basic MFC grenade as the damage it dealt was adequate and the Sierra Madre is full of microfusion cells, provided you're exploring. If I had one complaint, it's that bulk microfusion cells crafted from drained MFCs can't be used to craft an MFC grenade, which, not gonna lie, it's kind of annoying as it made the bulk MFCs completely poor pointless, at least for this build. And finally there is the Tin Grenade, which will most likely be the second most crafted explosive weapon for any explosive build in Dead Money. The most noteworthy material needed to craft it is the Pistol Powder, which you can get tons of by breaking down the various ammo types littered throughout the Sierra Madre. It does require quite a bit of Pistol Powder, a rather demanding total of 50, but given how much ammo you stumble across, especially if you've got the Scrounger perk, this really won't be much of an issue. The only issue that I had as far as crafting materials, weirdly enough, was duct tape. I was genuinely ecstatic when I would stumble across duct tape, because I knew that it meant I could finally craft more tin grenades. In retrospect, it was kind of hilarious. The tin grenade's damage isn't particularly impressive unfortunately, but it does what you need it to. And again, bear in mind, I'm playing on the highest possible difficulty settings, so were I to use this build on lower settings, I'm sure it would perform more than adequately. So yeah, explosive builds will be relying on workbenches and reloading stations to a pretty great extent, but as I stated previously, this is an exception. No other build will really be seeing much use here, or at the very least they won't be that reliant on them. This is both a positive and a negative. On the positive end of the spectrum, it's important for an expansion like this to make sure that at least the majority of its players are relying on the mechanics that separate this content from the rest of the game, that being the Sierra Madre vending machines rather than the standard workbenches and trading with NPCs. It helps in building an identity for the expansion as well as the Sierra Madre location, and overall I think it does a great job at just that. However, on the negative end of things, making 
making so little use of the workbench in an environment that seems tailor-made for appealing to this type of mechanic does come off as wasted potential. I'll be the first to say that I rarely use workbenches as it is. I've just never been particularly engaged with New Vegas' crafting system, other than when it's necessary. Dead Money was certainly the first time I ever felt incentivized to use workbenches as much as I do, but by the end of the expansion I'm typically overflowing with items and resources even on the hardest modes. The amount that you'll find yourself capable of making just with the vending machines makes the crafting stations seem all but redundant. Granted, you won't be getting nearly as much from the vending machines if you don't get that precious Sierra Madre snow globe. Again, it gives you a whopping 2,000 Sierra Madre chips, but even then, if you just look around a bit, you'll be able to find plenty of chips, especially if you have the Fortune Finder perk. If I were to try to come up with a solution to this, I think what I would propose is a set of perks that you can unlock by doing certain things or reaching certain milestones in dead money. These perks would allow the player to do something different with the vending machines. Maybe a science related perk where the player can hack into the vending machines and make energy based ammo rather than the conventional ammo that it's restricted to. Maybe a repair oriented perk that allows the player to take relevant information from the vending machine holodisks and convert that into crafting recipes at the cost of breaking and not being able to use said hollow disk at the vending machines, thus preventing the acquisition of given items in the Sierra Madre machines. Maybe if the players already visited Big Mountain in Old World Blues, they could have figured out how to craft certain mechanical items that the vending machines have to offer, since the vending machines are entirely absent from Big Mountain. These are just a couple of ideas, and while I don't think the lack of incentive to use workbenches is a particular low point, it does feel like something of wasted potential. I guess it makes sense canonically as the vending machines are basically matter reconfiguration devices, whereas workbenches are just, well, workbenches, but I don't think that should necessarily hinder it on a mechanical level, at least not to the extent that it seems to. It also doesn't help that the workbenches are so hindered by the lack of availability of items needed to make certain important supplies. For those looking to cook, stem packs require brock flowers and xander roots, neither of which are available in dead money. Obviously, it would make little sense for these items to be in the Sierra Madre, and the vending machines make up for this, but wouldn't it have been interesting to stumble across a new recipe for making stem packs, thus making the cooking station serve more of a purpose? Again, I'm just spitballing ideas, but I do wish that a bit more thought and care had been placed into the crafting mechanics. Moving on from the police station, let's now check out the Sierra Madre clinic. The path to the clinic is actually pretty short, with little in the ways of note that we didn't already discuss going to and exploring the police station. There's another of Dean Domino's stashes, some speakers, a couple of ghost people, but really that's about it. It's mostly what's inside the clinic that makes things interesting. The first thing I feel inclined to point out would have to be the hologram security. The holograms have to be one of the most crucial aspects of dead money, both in terms of gameplay and also the story. Much like the ghost people that inhabit the villa, the holograms are, well, ghosts. They're electronic ghosts that are impossible to kill or damage because they're light-based digital projections. These things are fucking creepy. The hologram projections in the Sierra Madre are very purely mechanical in that they follow a very simple directive. For the hologram vendors, they facilitate trade. For the security holograms, they warn unauthorized personnel to turn the other way and kill trespassers on sight. No questions asked. But the hologram vendors are peculiar because they seem to have the capacity to understand, at least to some extent, the manner in which trade is handled in the post-nuclear world. Father Elijah has mentioned that he's tampered with the hologram technology, so it seems that he repurposed them to function this way. When going into trade with a hologram vendor, both you and the vendor will have zero caps on hand, as you were stripped of all resources prior to reaching the Sierra Madre. This would imply that anyone else brought here would have been stripped of their caps as well, so the vendors have no way of acquiring them either. The result here is pure trade. You give one item and based on its value, you're offered so many caps. If you want an item that the vendor carries, your traded items must exceed the understood value of the item that you're looking to get. It's really simple, but it makes for such an interesting spin on the usual economy of the game. Having a trade system completely without a standard of currency is genuinely fascinating, and I think future Fallout titles could really learn a thing or two from this. Imagine a settlement that doesn't use any form of currency, where what you trade must in some way share value with what you're wanting. It's simple, but it can make for really interesting trading scenarios. 
What's interesting about the hologram technology in the Villa Clinic is that it'll be set to a path on either the first floor or the upper office floor. I'm not really sure why the security is set to function this way though. The workers of the villa are established in the lore to have little understanding of the functions of the technology in the Sierra Madre, but this is one of those things that just kind of makes me scratch my head. What good is a security system that only covers one floor at a time, until manually switched over? I haven't found any text logs or environmental hits that explain this bizarre design choice. Even if there was a log explaining this, I'm not entirely sure if I'd be convinced of its utility. It's just really odd, but at least it works as a sort of gameplay tutorial for dealing with the holograms. When going up the steps to the offices, you'll notice the hologram is roaming the halls. The hologram can kill you very quickly, so you need to look for ways to disable it. Since it's a digital construction, your first thought will most likely be to check for nearby terminals. The wall-mounted terminal on the south side staircase will allow you to set the path of the hologram to either the top or bottom floor. This is something of a half measure, but any player with a pair of eyes will almost definitely notice the glowing blue device on the wall of the office floor. The device can either be smashed, destroying the hologram it's projecting, or it can be disabled with a high enough repair skill. This is the only way to completely eliminate a hologram. However, much like in the tutorial area, any hologram projector that you come across is going to require a few extra steps to reach safely. It's a solid way to introduce the player to the security holograms. I only wish it didn't come at the cost of Luda narrative dissonance, even if it was mostly very minor in the grand scheme of things. Regardless, that's not all that the clinic has to offer in terms of environmental design. There's a pretty neat little bit of environmental storytelling in the emergency room where you can find the assassin's suit. Why on earth would this be here? This armor couldn't have belonged to a villa inhabitant, so it must belong to one of Elijah's victims. The armor's in decent enough condition, so why wouldn't anyone else have taken it? These questions do have answers, but that will have to wait for later. Down the hall from the emergency room are various rooms containing autodocs. There's also a speaker emitting frequencies that can trigger your explosive collar, but we'll get to that in a moment. Autodocs are machines capable of performing numerous surgical procedures as well as injecting various types of medicine, most notably medex and adrenaline shots. These things aren't particularly effective when it comes to healing, which makes sense given that they're at least two centuries old and haven't exactly been preserved in pristine condition, but the adrenaline shots they provide on hardcore mode can be very useful for keeping your sleep gauge down to a healthy level without the cost of hunger and hydration that typical sleeping would lead to. However, this adrenaline shot only cures exhaustion, so if your sleep deprivation hasn't reached its first stage, your status will remain the same. That being said, the only other place that you'll find one of these is deep within the casino, so you need to make sure that you manage your time well. Otherwise, you'll have to journey back to the clinic or to the police station so as to manage your sleep. Personally speaking, I only found my character growing tired once per playthrough. You could hand wave that as my experience talking, but I would like to remind you that this also applies to my first playthrough I did when preparing for these videos, which was also my first time playing hardcore mode since I was in high school back in 2010. The point here is that dead money isn't exactly a million hour experience, so even though options for handling sleep are pretty limited, it's not as if you're going to be desperately tracking down a bed or an autodoc station. Not unless you've just been wasting a great deal of time. At that point, it really is your own fault though, so I don't know what to tell you. I actually think it's a pretty well balanced experience in that regard. Going into this little journey of mine, I was expecting hardcore mode to be a much more frustrating experience than it was. Handling hunger and hydration was equally as well balanced. The vending machines offer all you could ask for in the ways of food and water, and there's a relatively abundant degree of food and water to be looted if you've got a knack for exploring. Obsidian struck a fantastic balance here because even though you've got to maintain your hunger, hydration, and sleep at all times on hardcore mode, the rewards you're allotted for exploring, which has already been subtly incentivized as discussed earlier, make handling these factors much more feasible. I would say it leans a bit towards not even being much of an issue, but Again, I've got literally thousands of hours of experience in New Vegas. Even if 99.9% .9 of that was not in hardcore mode, I still have a pretty thorough grasp on exploration and such, so make of this what you will. At the very least, I can say that if the player knows what they're doing, even on the hardest possible difficulty settings, maintaining these stats shouldn't be too much of a problem. Much like the police station, the clinic has a basement. It's just smaller and has much less going on in terms of junk supplies. And if I'm being honest, it's just a little too low effort for my tastes. Down here is a terminal that doesn't require a passcode that will shut off the main power to the clinic. Doing this is required to shut off the speakers, but it doesn't turn off the clinic's lights, security holograms, autodocs, or upstairs terminals. 
I guess it could be explained as those things having backup generators that would prioritize them over the speakers, but... Eh, I don't know, Chef. It's a bit weird. There's also a couple of generators right next to the terminal, but destroying them has no discernible effect. I feel like the easy way to improve this is to give the terminal an easy lock, and if you do have to smash the generator, you do so risking missing out on lore notes from other terminals as well as the ability to use the autodocs. That could have made for an interesting gameplay scenario, at least I think. But now that the speakers are down, the player can now find the source of the pounding noise that's been going and going. This is Christine, and you may have noticed the scars on her head and throat. Alright, so Christine is mute. The autodoc performed some kind of surgery on her throat that fucked with her vocal cords. Do you see the problem here? Christine is wearing a bomb collar, but this machine has been able to perform a complex surgery on her throat, apparently multiple times, over the course of two weeks? How are you alive? The autodocs have adrenaline shots to cure exhaustion, but last I checked, they can't solve hunger and hydration, so... What the fuck? I mean, I guess I can buy that she kept some supplies on her person and it makes sense that she would know how to ration. I don't know, man. These are some mental gymnastics I'm having to make. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's nowhere near as fucking stupid and moronic as a kid being locked in a refrigerator for 200 plus years, but hey, it's still really far-fetched, even for Fallout. And even with those adrenaline shots? Yo, homie, your brain needs some sleep. I mean, I guess I can buy that she slept between the operations, but... I don't know, she developed claustrophobia from her time in this machine, so at a point she must have stopped sleeping, or at least sleeping healthily. She should be off her fucking rocker at this point. When she's released, she's a bit apprehensive as she doesn't even know who the courier is, but that's really about the extent of it. With a little convincing or intimidation if you're a fucking monster, she can be swayed to follow or rendezvous at the Villa Fountain. I'm really torn because I like Christine as a character. She's generally a really nice person and a real wholesome ray of sunshine in the fucking hellscape that is the Sierra Madre, but a lot of the riding around her just doesn't make any sense, or at least it doesn't here. Also, her being mute is a real problem. I've already talked about how it affects gameplay, but engaging in dialogue with her is a fucking pain in the ass. Unless you're just really good at understanding and interpreting charades, the dialogue options you're given following her various text blocks are going to carry you through the whole experience. Personally speaking, I'm not the best when it comes to interpreting her charades. There were times I had it figured out, for instance when she pantomimes the three circles inside of a large one to reveal that she was a scribe in the Brotherhood of Steel. That was something I caught onto and it felt pretty cool. But there's only so much that I can interpret without relying on the dialogue choices that follow to basically spell it out for me. And it really doesn't help that some of these text blocks just proceed way too fast for me to be able to read them. Without a voice to speak out the lines, Obsidian had to just leave the text block on a timer, and it really fucking shows. This is obnoxious. I'm sure one of you big brains that can speed read and speed interpret didn't have any fucking trouble with this, but I'm a fucking idiot, okay? I don't know what the hell half of the shit that she's doing is, and I've played this DLC like a million times. I don't necessarily think the text blocks themselves are a problem, I think they're described well writing-wise, but the way they're presented is less than adequate. That's really all I've got to say on the subject. I like Christine, but she is easily the weakest part of this DLC, and that's a real shame. Maybe if we ever got a remake they could give her some animations and stuff to compensate. I don't know. The player might also be wondering how this bomb collar got on her neck in the first place, but given that she doesn't remember much after arriving at the Sierra Madre, it makes sense that this wouldn't be fully understood for the time being. Oh, and one last thing, I like her companion perk. Basically, she causes a delay in how the speakers and other devices futz with the bomb collar. It's really cool. So that about covers the Villa Clinic, now let's move on to the Residential District. This is definitely where we get to see how the villa functioned as a shelter, and it has this tragic air of death to it, both figuratively and literally. It's not too often in Fallout that we get to see the ruins of people's homes, which sounds kind of weird now that I think about it. Let me explain. How many times in Fallout do you really get to explore the remains of a place that hasn't been picked apart by raiders and factions? A place where people lived before the war, and their remains still rest. It's a very specifically haunting aesthetic, and it's the kind of thing that I just eat up. Like the police station and the clinic, the residential district serves as something of a tutorial to introduce the player to certain aspects of dead money. In the police station, it was the radios. In the clinic, it was the hologram. 
Here in the residential district, the cloud is much more prevalent, with the streets being littered with concentrated pockets. There's also an abundance of traps placed very methodically throughout both the homes and the streets. Running recklessly through the pockets of cloud will often lead to unprepared players stepping onto bear traps or pressure plates wired with explosives or even rigged shotguns. The indoors are even more lined with traps from grenade bouquets to pressure plates to bear trap to trip wires. These houses are not at all safe for the player to just waltz into, and some of the placements of the traps are genuinely quite tricky. You need to be careful when navigating the Sierra Madre, and this area is intended to make that especially clear to the player. And of course, we can't forget our friends, the ghost people. On top of dealing with all of these traps and cloud pockets, we've got to deal with these fuckers. However, that also means that they have to contend with the traps as well. These things might not be affected by the cloud, but if they step onto a pressure plate or bump into a grenade bouquet, it's bye-bye Casper. It is, however, important to bear in mind that they will not set off tripwires. It's a very oddly specific immunity that they have. I don't know why it's a thing, but that's okay because setting a frag mine next to a grenade bouquet and baiting a trapper into it, so goddamn satisfying. After overcoming all of these obstacles, the player will speak with Dean Domino. And oh my god, he is the best character in this DLC. Get up without my permission. I'll blast your ass so far through your head, it'll turn the moon cherry pie red. That is the greatest line of dialogue ever written. He's such a fucking prick, but goddamn, he's so charismatic and enjoyable to listen to. He's voiced by Barry Denon, a voice actor with one hell of a background. He's best known for playing Pontius Pilate in Jesus Christ Superstar, but he portrayed Watson in The Shining, Mendel in Fiddler on the Roof, Adolf fucking Hitler in the original Wonder Woman TV series, and he also voiced Fat Man in Sons of Liberty and the Chancellor in Darksiders 2. They could not have picked a more perfect voice actor to play Dean Domino. So you meet Dean and he's like, hey bro, come take a seat. And you're like, okay, whatever. And that's when he goes, hey yo, so get this, lift that ass up. I blow that ass up. You now have a bomb on your neck and under your ass. Look, I'm into the kinky shit, but this is a little extreme. Domino basically wants to know what the fuck's going on and he wants out. He also wants into the Sierra Madre so the player can now either play along with him or talk him into a corner and intimidate him, pushing him to either follow or meet at the fountain. However, like Christine and God, it might be wise to play the cards close to the chest and not go too hard on the guy, just saying. At this point, all that's left is to return to the Villa Fountain, where the companions will have more to say should the player interact with them. God doesn't have too much to say, it's mostly just reiterating what he said about Elijah in the police station. Dean Domino talks a lot about the ghost people and previous captives of Elijah that he observed from a distance. Christine will mime out details of her past such as the fact that she was a Brotherhood of Steel scribe and that she was cut off from someone that she loves within the Brotherhood. I really like this particular point in the conversation where she explains, to the best of her abilities, why she's here in the Sierra Madre, then proceeds to turn the question around to us. This is great in regards to role-playing as it allows the player to decide for themselves why their courier came to the Sierra Madre. It's a great example of dialogue options in New Vegas that really make the player stop and consider what they want to say moving forward. It doesn't have any noticeable consequences, it's just a great instance where the player has been addressed almost directly, and it allows them to decide for themselves the context in which has led their character here. Christine also explains that the scars on her head and face, as well as her being bald, occurred prior to arriving at the Sierra Madre, leaving her backstory open to speculation for the time being. Also, the companions will talk amongst themselves at the fountain. I appreciate these smaller moments where we get some fun banter establishing how they feel about one another really helps to add some depth and further establish their characters in small but meaningful ways. But that's all I have to say for today. Once again, I hope all of you are enjoying your time here, and that you're looking forward to the next video. Until next time. Hello ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the Sierra Madre. You're just in time for the gala event, the grand reopening of the Sierra Madre Resort. After assembling our Madre's Quartet at the Villa Fountain, we now move on to Phase 2 of our heist, triggering the Gala event. This will require us to take our companions to two different spots around the Villa, the Salida del Sol and the Poesta del Sol. The Salida del Sol is a relatively confined area, utilizing environmental hazards that players will have already become accustomed to. It throws in a couple of speakers, but for the most part, the environment isn't anything new. 
The trick here, however, is just how cramped everything feels. There's not a lot of room to maneuver here, so it's a good thing the courier is required to bring Dog. After all, he specializes in CQC. At least, when he's Dog. As for the task, it's pretty simple. At the end of the Salida del Sol is a power station. However, due to the decay of the junction boxes over the past two centuries, the levers have become incredibly difficult to pull, meaning that it must be Dog or God who stays here to do the task. In order to convince God to do this, the player must go out and kill two freshly spawned ghost people and bring their entrails back to God so that he can consume them, thus keeping Dog at bay. That is fucking disgusting. There are two alternatives though. The player could bring out Dog's personality using the audio log from Father Elijah and just explain to him the task. Or they could trick God and leave him trapped behind the locked gate. Or they could trick Dog and leave him behind the gate. Needless to say, neither would be happy with either. Now that the player is entering a deeper thicket of the Sierra Madre, they're going to be encountering larger packs of ghost people. This can be pretty overwhelming in such close quarters environments. If the player gets any ideas about running, they're going to need to be extremely careful to avoid traps, and not to mention get through cloud pockets as quickly as possible. The player will also need to utilize stealth so as to avoid the ghost people, which can be difficult given how perceptive they are and how tightly packed this area is. The Salida del Sol may be relatively small, but it will be sure to put the player's skills to the test while they're here. Then there is the Poesta del Sol, which is by far the most elaborately constructed area of the villa. It's very similar to the residential district, in that it's a much more open environment, with many of the indoor locations being homes of the Sierra Madre's former residents. The majority of traps found here are located indoors, but outdoors there are several pockets of the cloud, and a number of ghost people to contend with. It's basically an expanded version of the Salida del Sol, where now things are much more spread out. The environmental hazards won't overwhelm the player as much as the packs of ghost people, but they are something that the player will have to keep an eye out for as long as they're here. It can be easy to get lost throughout the Puesta del Sol, especially since it's divided up in a north and south area. But once you've gotten used to it, it's really not that bad. For Dean Domino's part in the Gala event, we'll have to take him to the very end of the Poesta del Sol in order for him to connect some wires to turn on the power for the Gala event. This means having to turn on security holograms, which, as I discussed previously, are extremely lethal. It's not too difficult of a task, all the player really has to do is get to a couple of terminals and activate the security holograms. But there's always the alternative. The player could choose to use speech checks in order to bully Dean into staying here without any of the security from the ghost people. But as you can guess, this would leave him more than a little pissed off. There are a handful of other holograms that can be activated throughout the Puesta del Sol also, but unless the player has managed to effectively sneak around the ghost people, the holograms won't really be achieving much from a gameplay perspective. I guess that makes them act as sort of a reward for getting past the ghost people, but eh, I don't know. For Christine's job specifically, the player will have to take her into the Poesta del Sol switching station, a factory that can be somewhat difficult to navigate. In order to even get past the first room of the switching station, the player will need to either have a high repair skill or find three components located in toolboxes around the Poesta del Sol. There's even one in the switching station's first room, not far from the junction box, so as to help the player figure out where they'll be able to find them. It's a clever way of directing the player in a subtle way to figure out where the necessary items are without needing their pit boy to point them where to go. Once the junction box is repaired, the courier and Christine can proceed and that's when the player will immediately enter a hallway that's lined with those pesky speakers. The first one's quite easy to locate. As soon as the door's been opened, the player can plainly see text on the wall pointing it out. As they proceed through this hall, if they're struggling to find the speakers, they can always look for text along the walls. It's a pretty quick little segment, but I appreciate the way in which it was constructed. Christine also has her companion perk that'll delay the disruption frequencies from the speakers, allowing the player more time to analyze situations a bit more thoroughly than they would otherwise be able to. Upon entering the factory area, things begin to get pretty tricky. Now the player is dealing with a number of shielded speakers, as well as the bottom of the factory being flooded with the cloud, so the player needs to be extremely meticulous in plotting out how they'll navigate the environment. The player also needs to be quick in how they navigate this death maze. This can be pretty stressful, and the feeling of relief upon reaching points of safety feels very much earned and satisfying as a result. The second part of the factory is basically the same, but this time with the added fun of a sentry turret. Normally developers get lazy with introducing new threats to already well-constructed environments, and I think that could be argued here, but the turret does feel like a natural addition to this type of level design, as well as this particular setting. 
it's just kind of weird that this is literally the only place in the Sierra Madre, aside from the vault itself, that has a sentry turret. Of course, like every other scenario, it's possible to turn off speakers within the factory. However, doing so requires quite the know-how. The player may notice in the first part of the factory, peeking through the window into this office area, a computer terminal. One would be correct in guessing that this is how to disable the speakers, but getting there will not be so easy. This terminal is within the auditory range of a shielded speaker, meaning the player will have to be quick in getting to and disabling it. There's also a tripwire linked to a grenade bouquet within this very small room, so the player will need to be on the lookout for this also. And finally, there's the terminal itself. It's locked behind an easy password, meaning the player must have a science skill of 25 or more in order to even disable the speakers. I actually remember my first time playing Dead Money with a character whose science skill was lower than the requirement. After all of that work I had put into getting there, I could not disable the speaker. And by the time any player gets this far, there's simply no way they'll be able to get out of range of the speaker in time. At least, not without jumping off the walkway down into the pit of cloud, and I don't think I need to explain why that's a bad idea at this point. However, that does lead me to my next point. Both within the Puesta del Sol and the Solita del Sol, there are terminals that allow the player to activate ventilation systems that'll clear out various pockets of cloud. This is extremely useful for not only helping the player backtrack through the environment, but allowing the player the freedom to explore more easily, which is very much appreciated as a reward after all that you've had to do to reach these terminals. This section is capped off with a conversation with Christine where the player must either convince her to go down into the elevator shaft, remember she has claustrophobia, or intimidate her slash force her to do so. Considering that the former requires basically no effort on the player's part as all they need to do is hop on this terminal and click a couple of buttons, you would have to be an absolute fucking bastard to be bullying Christine. Shit, I can't blame her for wanting to kill you at that point, but I digress. When convincing her to stay, there's this really nice moment where she takes the courier's hand, and the player can reassure her that things are going to be okay. For female couriers, there's even a hint of romance to this scene. It's really sweet. For those of you wondering why it is that I love Christine, it's little moments like this. So finally, after all of that is the final task. At this point, the player will need to reach the bell tower in the Salida del Sol North in order to trigger the gala event. It's a pretty straight shot from there, one just needs to follow the marker on their pit boy but that's not to suggest that this will be easy, in fact it's far from it. The game has now taught the player everything that it can pertaining to the villa, but up to this point the player has almost always had a companion, the only exceptions being at the very start of the journey, as well as trips back to the fountain from where the player dropped off their companions for the gala. But even then the area would have been either cleared out, or mostly cleared out. But it's here in the Salida del Sol North that the player has to make an entire journey by themselves, and this will be by far the single most difficult part of dead money. Before we get to the journey to the bell tower though, one of the more interesting moments in the villa occurs upon stepping onto a rooftop here in the Salida del Sol North. Suddenly there's a new radio signal that's become available. Good thing I installed radios in the callers. Pit boys letting me pick them up. Running out of volunteers, last ones couldn't see beyond their own greed. There's no reason why it could have gone wrong. I had it all planned out. <laughs> Maybe it was the curse of the Sierra Madre. Wish I still had that damn holo rifle. It's been forever making it. I need to find it when this is all done. <clears throat> Sitting too long. Damned arthritis. Upon listening in, it turns out to be none other than Father Elijah. If it wasn't obvious enough already, Elijah isn't exactly, as Dean said it, playing with a full deck. And it's here that we get a glimpse into just that. Elijah is growing very desperate. He's legitimately struggling to think of what he'll do if the current heist fails. This radio transmission, which I assume is linked to the Pip-Boy that he uses to connect to the Villa Fountain, as well as our own Pip-Boy, paints a very clear picture of just how far gone this man is, and it's great for reinforcing just how relentless he is in his pursuits for the treasure of the Sierra Madre. It's not a major development or anything, but it's worth bearing in mind going forward, and it's really interesting to listen to on a first playthrough. Now, going back to the very start of the DLC, the player was unlikely to encounter more than a single ghost person, at least if they went for dog first, and generally did their best to avoid enemies. 
But now everyone is positioned for the gala event, and the player is going to find themselves completely alone. And this is where things begin to get brutal, even by dead money standards. The Salida Del Sol is already a pretty tough area, being close quarters and jam-packed with ghost people, but the last time the player will have been here would have been either with Dog or God. Even though God is the weakest companion, it's still helpful to have that additional damage output as well as the aggro draw. But that was then, and this is now. Now the player is all alone in the heart of Ghost People territory within the streets of the Sierra Madre. That is, of course, unless they took the time to clear out the Salida del Sol North with Dog or God. When bringing Dog or God to the Salida del Sol for the Gala event, the player is going to be directed south, as Dog's Gala event position is placed on the southmost side of the district. Because of this, it's more than likely that most players won't have a companion with them during their first trek to the Salida del Sol North. That is, unless they're a dedicated explorer, in which case the reprieve of having a companion to help fight through this brutally tough area can be a genuine reward. But what about when the player is all alone? Going through the Salida del Sol North alone is notoriously difficult. Here the player will be pitted against a large number of ghost people in very close quarters areas, with traps around every corner, and even some some speakers to have to steer clear from. The first fight occurs in the Clock Tower Plaza, meaning that most of, if not all of the ghost people in the area are going to be alerted to the player's presence, unless they are just incredible at stealth. Stealth builds will need to be extra cautious here and really take their time between encounters to get back into a hidden position. The encounter in the wine cellar is especially difficult though, and simply put, there's no sneaking past this bunch, at least not without a stealth boy or some major luck. The wine cellar is extremely close quarters, and there are pillars in the middle of the room that the multiple ghost people will hop around as they try to close the distance. There's also a seeker who's able to throw a gas bomb directly at you, which is damn near impossible to not get hit by, given just how cramped the area is. There's also a trapper attempting to close the distance, all the while with a harvester throwing knife spears at you, or also trying to close the distance. Are you beginning to see why people find this DLC so damn difficult? My advice here would be to try and bait the gas bomb, then try to take out the trapper as fast as possible, all the while making sure the harvester and the seeker are either behind pillars or far enough away. The player might get hit by the gas bomb, but they're unlikely to also get hit by a spear, at least as long as they're not dilly-dallying. After you get past this bunch, there's only a small handful of enemies left, and as long as the player is not being reckless, the ghost people here really aren't too difficult to get past. However, they are are placed along some pretty tight corridors and even near some traps, so to take them lightly would still be a costly error. But hey, we've made it to the gala event, we've triggered the show and we're about to enter the casino. Everyone, please, may I have your attention? Guests and residents of the villa alike, I ask you to step outside and look to the night sky. It's the moment you've been waiting for, the reason we're all here. The gala event, the grand opening of the Sierra Madre Casino. You are the ones who have made this momentous occasion possible, and for that, we thank you. So raise your glass in celebration, let music fill the streets, fireworks light the sky, and promise of new beginnings fill your hearts. No matter what your fortunes, no matter what your cares, let go this night, and begin again. I suggest you hurry, though. The gates of the Sierra Madre are open, but only for a brief time. After that, the doors will close for the evening's festivities, and won't open again until morning. Now all we gotta do is go back the way we came, and since we cleared out the ghost people, that shouldn't be too difficult. Right? Right? Yeah, no. We've only just begun. What's that there? Wiring? Looks... Looks like it's tied to the sound system in the villa. Except for that snipped section there. So, what? I stand here, hold the two ends in my hands and tap them together like symbols? Well, safely? Around here, that word doesn't come cheap. Because there's more beneath the streets, in the buildings, and now everywhere else. They hear anything out of the ordinary, especially music screaming through the speakers when I close the connection. They'll be here fast.
Dean Domino warned the Courier earlier that once the gala goes off, every ghost person within the Sierra Madre would make its presence known, and the game makes sure to show that to be the case. Once the gala is triggered, ghost people will spawn all around the villa, meaning that in order to reach the casino, the player will have to either fight like hell or run like hell. Right out, ghost people will close in on the clock tower and the player will be put into a state of caution, making stealth incredibly difficult to pull off here. Not only will the player find ghost people in spots they'd once cleared, there are several locations with newly spawned ghost people. The sheer numbers of these things during the sequence are utterly overwhelming, and it's pretty clear that the player is not intended to fight all of these things. I mean, hey, you're more than welcome to try, but unless you're one high-level motherfucker stocked to the brim with stim packs and ammo, I'd say it's best just to run for your life. Running past the numerous ghost people as you beeline to the casino can be legitimately thrilling and tense. The player knows at this point just how deadly these things can be, so leaving yourself vulnerable as you attempt to run past them is likely to get your ass cheeks clenched tighter than a fucking hydraulic press. And god help the players that get turned around during this run. Sweats doesn't even begin to describe the feeling of anxiety here, especially with all of these speakers going off that put the player at further risk of their bomb collar exploding. Yeah, because that's exactly what I fucking needed. It's also worth noting that players who try to go back to the spots they left their companions will find that they've already left for the casino. I mean, hey, your bomb collar's not exploding, so clearly they're still alive. At least for now. This is the escalation of everything the player has learned at this point, and they are expected to know how to handle every single bit of it. And after all of that, once the gala event is finally triggered, the player then has to backtrack through all of that with freshly spawned packs of ghost people, who've been awakened by the sounds of the gala event ringing throughout the villa. This is a nightmare scenario for players who opted to try and speedrun past everything on the way here. Typically what I'll do on the way back to the clock tower is clear out as much as I can. That way I can run past all the new packs of ghost people, no longer having to worry about traps along the way. It makes for a pretty effective escape plan, but even then the ghost people might get a few good attacks in. And that, my friends, was the gala event. This will unfortunately be the last time we see the villa until Dead Money has concluded. But I think the challenge of what they managed to pack into that short little while was pretty impressive. Next up will be our adventure through the casino. And though it may initially seem like a much safer place than the villa, it's definitely not without its dangers. Until next time. Welcome, dear viewer, to the Sierra Madre Casino, a resort far less luxurious than Frederick Sinclair perhaps ever intended. There's something about this place that makes one feel so... unwelcome. Like we're not supposed to be here. This isn't, however, a failure of the design. The casino is an interesting part of Dead Money because where the villa allowed the player a decent degree of exploration and survival horror even, the casino is more of a series of set pieces and story beats. The game is definitely becoming more focused at this point, however I don't really consider that a negative, at least not entirely. When it comes to dead money, it would be more than a little strange if the player could just go right back to the villa and explore to their heart's content, so I won't be giving it flack for choosing to have the remainder of the story occur within the casino. Though I do have to wonder why they chose not to have it to where, depending on the order the player chooses to partake in the quests, the scenarios would become more or less difficult, kind of like my pitch to add consequences to the order the player does the quests in the villa. Maybe taking longer to get to Dean Domino would have him questioning the player's loyalty, or maybe have Christine's recovering the ability to speak, being dependent upon how late the player chooses to see her, or maybe Dog or God could become more unhinged the longer it takes the player to reach them. There are a lot of scenarios the writers and designers could have set up here to make things more interesting, so it's weird especially in a game like Fallout, particularly New Vegas, to see things made so deliberately and strictly linear. Now, with that said, the scenarios we get with these characters are pretty damn good. At the moment, the casino's sound systems are interfering with the connections between the bomb callers, and everyone is beginning to see opportunities to perhaps get what they've been wanting all this time. Dog sees the opportunity to not only end his own suffering, but to destroy the Sierra Madre. He intends to do this by burning the casino down via igniting the leaking gas within the kitchen. As you can imagine, God's kind of freaking out. 
Dean Domino sees the opportunity to finally claim the Sierra Madre as his own, and finally, after 200 years, steal the treasure stored deep within the casino. Christine's voice has finally recovered, but she now speaks with the voice of Vera Keys, and she doesn't intend to let Father Elijah walk away from the Sierra Madre. In order to breach the vault of the Sierra Madre, the courier needs to enable the sound system so they can recreate a sample of Vera Keys speaking the passcode to access the elevator. The reason the audio can't be accessed in the hotel lobby is because the white noise from the bomb callers are also causing problems within the Sierra Madre's already malfunctioning and less than optimally powered sound system, so the lobby terminal can't retrieve the ambient tracks. So between the loose ends and the heist of the century, the player has got their play quite full. The stage is set, and it's time to deal with these characters. If... if other voice comes out, dog... Dog won't wake up. Dog doesn't want to sleep. Please don't make him. <sighs> Go to sleep. Good. Yes. Make him sleep. Please. The first encounter is with Dog and God, and he appears to be having a mental breakdown of sorts with Dog wanting to die free, but God wanting to live in control. Both want to be done with the Sierra Madre, but neither can agree on how to end things. The room is filled with leaking gas, and Dog will light a fire as soon as they detect the player, meaning the player will have to either stealthily repair all of the gas valves, or just do so very, very quickly. Since the valves are quite far from one another, I recommend the former, but I admit trying to shut them off really quickly does present something of a fun challenge. It's kind of like when you're trying to open the crawl space hatch in Resident Evil 7, where it feels like you're scrambling with shaky hands just trying to click the right button. You might be thinking to yourself that it would be clever to try and play the audio file of Father Elijah or the one of God so as to dissuade Dog, but that won't work this time. Dog is overwhelming God and will not listen to his former masters as he once did. God is fighting for his life, so he's not about to be swayed by this either. After fixing the valves, one of a few things will result from the dialogue that follows. With high enough skill checks, the player can talk Dog and God down. Failing that means putting Dog down once and for all. This, however, is by no means an easy enemy to take down. Dog and God are extremely tanky and hit like a truck, meaning the courier will need to make use of the environment to maintain a distance between themselves and the deranged Nightken. If you're running a melee build, good fucking luck. If the player kills Dog, they'll have a limited amount of time to escape the area before their bomb collapses. This also applies to all subsequent encounters that result in a companion dying. However, there are multiple instances where the Nightkin can survive. In fact, there's one ending per personality, making for a total of three. You might be thinking, wait a minute, there's only two personalities. But one of the endings allows the courier to basically become Dog and God's marriage counselor, convincing the two personalities to look into one another and become whole once again. This leads to a rebirth of a long dormant, but complete persona, meaning the Nightkin will no longer understand understand who the courier or anyone else here is, let alone why they're here in the first place. He does seem like a reasonable person though, and the courier advises the Nightkin to rest and mend his wounds, but also to be sure to get the hell out of Dodge. It's a really cool conclusion to his character arc, and honestly, I'd really love to see him in future content if at all possible. After escaping the kitchen, you'll notice that ghost people have infiltrated the casino lobby. At the start of the casino section, they were banging on the front entrance, but now, they've gotten in. The the player is still locked from leaving the casino though, which is… kinda weird? You'd think they'd set it up to where Elijah would kill you for trying to leave, you know, like he does if you try to leave through the villa's front gate, but no? It's funny too because, hell, give me a secret ending where if I try to open it three times, the courier is swarmed by ghost people and I get some funny little death animation like in the first Resident Evil game. It's funny too because he even says he'll kill you if you try to leave, but unlike in the villa's front gate, he just won't. It's a little weird. Definitely a nitpick, but you gotta admit, it's kinda weird. The casino entryway is locked for the courier, but no longer for the ghost people. Either that or they got in some other way, but considering how state-of-the-art this place is, and the 
the fact they've never gotten in until now, I'm inclined to doubt that. Plus, we're never presented with an alternative as to how they got in in the first place, so what else am I supposed to think exactly? This is also the only room in the casino that the ghost people will appear, and this is kind of a bizarre design choice to me. Earlier on in the villa, when setting up Dean Domino's part in the gala event, one of the paths we can take involves setting up security holograms to defend Dean Domino from the ghost people. Both Dean and Christine's encounters within the casino involve security holograms, so how cool would it be to have been able to run the risk of using the security holograms, which would also attack the courier, against the ghost people? You can even turn on a security hologram in the casino entrance, but it's just not enough. It's kind of a shame we never got a proper encounter using both the holograms and the ghost people. They even designed the ghost people to behave a certain way when dealing with the holograms. Hell, imagine the ghost people being smart enough to actually try and flee from the holograms, and how cool it would be to watch the holograms seek them out as you try to make your escape. Something like that would have gone a very long way in making the Dead Money experience even more memorable to individual players. Not that it isn't already, but there was definitely potential for more. Finally, a friendly face. Hey, partner, up here. In a bit of a predicament here, had to duck backstage, take a powder. The audience is a little murderous tonight. After clearing out or sneaking past the ghost people, it's time to deal with Domino. Domino has set up in the back of the theater so as to avoid the security holograms, and in order to reach him, the player will have to avoid security holograms and speakers. One thing that confuses me though is why the holograms disappeared, why Dean didn't make a move when they did, and why they suddenly reappear after the courier is done talking to Domino from across the stage. I mean, I know the casino's power is fluctuating, but it's just a little bit too convenient. The theater itself is lined with speakers, but once you're done talking to Domino, the security holograms will spawn. There are two doors leading to the backstage area, and if the player paid attention during the dialogue with Dean, they'll know that the door to stage right is locked. If you didn't pay attention, there's a 50-50 chance of things going south really quick. Basically, the goal is to go backstage, get a recording of Dean Domino, and bring it to the theater projector to play it, which will disable the security holograms by turning them into a crowd for the performance. Likely some showy crap that Sinclair had planned for the opening night of the casino. Navigating this area is not exactly a walk in the park though, thanks to the backstage area being so cramped and littered with speakers and radios. There are even small pockets of cloud, meaning there is very little room for error. The hall also has several turns, meaning every move needs to be executed with some proficiency. Thankfully, radios can always be disabled, and all of the speakers back here can be destroyed, meaning the player can freely navigate the backstage area once they overcome the various hazards. Which is worth doing because there is some good loot to find. Nothing crazy, but helpful items all the same, like Dean Domino's secret weapons stash in his room, or Vera's chems. It can also be nerve-wracking to have to go back out of the theater, running past the security holograms to reach the projector. Like I've said, these things can kill the player extremely quickly, typically after just a couple of zaps from their beams, even on the lower difficulties. Considering how many holograms there are, this leaves very little room for error. Thankfully, the holograms are somewhat slow to attack initially, and they can even be disabled. Thing is though, without a high enough repair skill, the only way to disable them is to completely destroy the devices that generate them. However, smashing one means the remaining holograms will instantly become hostile, meaning that momentary reprieve before they attack will no longer be granted to the player. So unless the player works to figure out where all of the hologram devices are, and these things are pretty well hidden, this would be an extremely risky approach to take. It's really impressive just how much Obsidian was capable of doing with a handful of radios and a couple of holograms. Like I said before, I do wish that we could have gotten some proper Ghost People v Hologram encounters, but what we got is still really good for the most part, at least by New Vegas standards. After disabling the holograms, it's time to have a chat with Dean. Whilst exploring the backstage area, the player might have stumbled across the blackmail tapes regarding him and Vera. Funny enough, when the player needs to go backstage, Dean is noticeably uncomfortable with the courier going through his own room. 
bringing this up will reveal quite a bit of information regarding Dean and how he's connected to the Sierra Madre. As it turns out, Dean was planning to use Vera to pull a heist on the casino, leaving Sinclair bankrupt and making off with his fortune. When asked why he would do this, the sheer fragility of this man's ego comes into full view. He thought that Sinclair thought he was better than Dean Domino, and the Sierra Madre was a personal insult. What a fucking bitch. I love him. I'll go into more detail regarding the history of the Sierra Madre in a later video, but it still doesn't fail to blow me away just how petty Dean is. This man's head was so far up his own ass that he was willing to sit around in the villa and survive for over two centuries just so he could rob a dead man that he felt had insulted him by building a resort. Not only that, but he used Vera and her chem addiction as leverage to get in. Oh, and as it turns out, it was Dean that shoved Christine into the auto dock, planning to use her in his own heist on the Sierra Madre. What a piece of work. Much like Dog and God, Dean will either side with or against the courier at the end of the encounter, and there are a number of factors that play into this encounter and how Dean will ultimately behave towards the courier. You see, Dean, if you couldn't tell, has an extremely fragile ego. If the player let it slip when they first met that they had the upper hand on him, this would permanently affect his ability to trust the courier. The player needs to have cooperated with Dean, gone along with exactly what he has said, all just so that Dean will be comfortable with siding with the courier. And if he does side with the courier, great, the player can just walk right out. However, if the player was a big ol' meanie head, talking down to Dean or threatening to break his legs to keep him in the spot for the gala, he won't be quite as enthusiastic to let the courier go. In fact, he'll want the courier dead. Remember, this guy has been waiting for over two centuries to get the treasure of the Sierra Madre. He's not above killing you if that's what it takes. If Dean is killed, that means the player will have to be able to get out as quick as possible. On a completely random note, there's also this door that, I always seem to forget, opens towards the theater, leading me to sometimes get stuck due to my own incompetence. And this has led to some pretty funny moments of panic. It's never screwed me over though, just an inconvenience at worst. Overall, this was a really well done section of the casino. Begin again, but no one to let go. And last, but probably not least, is Christine. Upon taking the elevator to the suites, the player will have to navigate a labyrinth of rooms, sometimes moving between the rooms through the broken down walls. It's a very well designed area that feels like a hotel would. The hallways are kind of cramped and the rooms themselves are very standard. The decor is very lavish, but despite its preservation, the two centuries of aging show. The center of the floor is host to a kitchen and storage area where the player can find a host of useful items as well as a workbench to craft some goodies. There's some cloud littered throughout random spots of the hall, but it's hardly the greatest threat. The real danger comes from the holograms. This time, the holograms take on the appearance of one Vera Keys, speaking on a loop and repeating the last recorded words of the once famous starlet. It's really creepy, especially when they detect you and go into their attack mode. They just keep going with this audio loop and it's unnerving to say the least. However, something doesn't make sense to me. Why and how do the holograms take on the appearance of people that were in the Sierra Madre? It's established that they do and the story runs with it, but I still don't get how it actually works. I mean, I guess the holograms need some kind of visual basis. I don't know. This one's really weird to me, but I am willing to chalk it up as just being one of those unknowable mysteries of the technology behind the Sierra Madre. It's not a plot hole or anything. I just don't get how it actually works on a mechanical level. Makes for some good moments though. This area concludes with the courier rendezvousing with Christine. Christine's voice has been permanently altered by the autodoc to resemble that of Vera Keys. Christine is a lot more transparent here than any other character in the Sierra Madre. If you've pissed her off, you'll know it right off the bat. She'll call you out and hold nothing back. If you've been nothing but friendly towards her, then she'll speak to you with a sort of warmness that is honestly very much needed in this hell. There aren't any skill checks to pass here, the player simply has to face the consequences of their decisions. And I really like that. If the courier had been hostile and conniving towards Christine, she'll attack once the dialogue is concluded. 
If the player has been friendly towards Christine, she'll help with accessing the vault, speaking the passcode herself and unlocking the elevator to the vault. However, the courier will need to talk her down from trying to kill Elijah, and although I've had issues with Christine's character up to this point, I think this is one of the most powerful story beats in Dead Money. Christine has been trailing Elijah for a very long time. She encountered him once at the Big Empty, but Elijah trapped her in a medical testing facility, connected to a machine that performed some kind of operation that damaged her brain to the point that she could no longer write, hence why she wasn't simply writing notes to the player. However, Christine was eventually saved. In fact, it was by another courier, one who claimed to know what it's like to seek another person. Eventually, Christine found her way to the Sierra Madre, where she came across Dog, who placed a collar around her neck. It's never spelled out, but I imagine that it's around this point that Dean found her and shoved her into the autodoc. Dog's struggle as a character was his inability to let go of his hunger and the desire to serve his master. On the flip side, God refused to let go of Dog in a desperate battle for control over their mind and body. For Dean Domino, the inability to let go of his petty disdain for Sinclair led to what many would consider a wasted 200 years. Christine's plight was her inability to let go of Elijah after all of the horrible things that he'd done, both to the Brotherhood as well as herself. She wants to get revenge more than anything in the world. She wants to see the Hand of Justice finally brought down on this incredibly evil person, and she finally has the perfect opportunity to see it happen. But with some persuading, the Courier convinces Christine to let go and let them deal with Elijah. Either that, or they kill her themselves. Fucking evil bastard. The only thing left to do now is take the elevator down into the vault of the Sierra Madre. And this is where the finale of the story will take place. And that's the casino. This section of Dead Money definitely has some issues, but overall I think it's a mostly well-constructed level with some tremendous character work. As for what lies ahead, we will finally get to see what it is that lies within the vault, the very heart of the Sierra Madre. I'll see you all there. Deep in the heart of the Sierra Madre Casino lies the Vault, a proverbial El Dorado of the post-apocalypse. We've been told that getting there isn't the hard part, but I'm gonna call bullshit because so far this has been a fucking brutal journey, and we still have a ways to go. The Vault isn't a particularly lengthy section in terms of gameplay. It's the climax of the story and in classic Fallout fashion, the bulk of it is dialogue and facing the consequences of the decisions that you've made in your journey through the Sierra Madre. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Upon reaching the bottom of the elevator shaft just down the hall, we find ourselves in the vault, only it's blocked off by a sort of force field. The vault is full of several security hurdles that the courier will have to overcome in order to reach that precious bounty within the heart of the Sierra Madre. Naturally, there are no ghost people down here within the vault, but that's not to pretend as if that makes things easier. The vault is littered with speakers, some of which are shielded and others that must be destroyed in order to progress, and this is where my first issue with this section comes up. There's this particular section that requires the player to go down into this passageway, through it, and out onto some stairs, where the entire trek will have the courier's collar counting down to its self-destruct. From what I can tell, there are no blind spots here. I mean, it's not as if I have a lot of time to look around and explore before I die, so the player has to get to and destroy the second speaker, which is not only quite close to a third speaker, but also tucked away rather precariously in a corner, meaning this would likely take multiple attempts to actually discover. Trial and error with fail states and fallout isn't exactly something that I enjoy, and it's almost as if this section was designed with the idea of PC players exploiting the quicksave system. Thankfully, the rest of the vault is nowhere near as egregious, and it can be exhilarating in a way to get past certain parts, most notably just prior to the final room before reaching the vault's inner chamber, which seems specifically designed with the idea of just barely managing to escape the last speaker's area of effect. Check out this agility! Oh, Mirror's Edge ain't got shit. Oh my. Oh no, 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 no. 
The final section of the vault prior to entering the chamber is a room pathed by three security holograms. In order to proceed, the player is going to need to deactivate the force field using a terminal, which is closely guarded by all three of these holograms. This makes it imperative to destroy the three security holograms so that the terminal can be safely accessed. There's also a terminal within one of the structures within the room that deactivates the alarm system, meaning that the caller's self-detonation will no longer be an issue. At least, not for a little while. The room is constructed so that the player has multiple paths they can take upon entry. The hologram on the left side doesn't cover as much ground, however the path itself doesn't allow much in terms of options for traversal. The right side has two smaller rooms that could make for great cover, however they're further away, meaning the holograms are more likely to be attacking by the time the player manages to get there. The panels that project these holograms are thankfully not too difficult to spot, they just take a bit of investigation to come across. They do, however, have very high skill checks required to deactivate them manually. This means that without having a properly specced courier, the player might have to simply resort to destroying the panels. As I mentioned before, this means making the other holograms in the area immediately hostile, which really complicates matters when trying to dismantle the other devices. This is a great example of being rewarded for how you've specced your character that I think New Vegas does a really good job at. Couriers with high sneak, or even just survivability, will fare well in being able to destroy the devices once they've figured out their locations. Couriers that have specced into more technical trees will be able to simply dash straight from one device to another and deactivate them with ease. The player also needs to be careful with how they navigate this section though, as there is a death pit that can very easily be fallen into. It's a pretty solid final section leading into the climax of this story. The finale of Dead Money sees the player coming across one of the greatest loot stashes probably within the history of this franchise. On the table to the right, along with 17 bundles of pre-war money and some Sierra Madre chips, are 36 gold bars with another one over on the desk by the terminal that's used to talk with Father Elijah. The value of these gold bars is so immense that they are the fourth most valuable item in the game, meaning that 37 of these things will have the courier set for life. However, the burden of greed bears down heavily, even upon the strongest of men. Each gold bar weighs 35 pounds. Multiply that by 37 and you have a whopping 1,295 pounds. That's more than a goddamn polar bear. This means that a courier with the maximum possible carry weight through normal means will only be able to carry a total of 10 bars without being over encumbered. This means that anyone looking to carry all 37 gold bars out of the Sierra Madre will have a very hard time escaping. On top of the literal mountain of gold loot is a locker with loads of Sierra Madre armor, police revolvers, LMGs, basically every item of value that could be found in the Sierra Madre barring the snow globe. If you're lucky, you may even get a stealth boy here as well, which is actually extremely useful for the coming fight. So yeah, this treasure room certainly lives up to its title. I think it's really cool that they made it so absurdly difficult to escape with this massive bounty of loot. It ties well back into the themes of the difficulty of letting go that are so prevalent in the story. However, I do have one very particular problem. Well, okay, actually a couple. The devil's in the details, and the details of the gold bar, frankly, make no sense. The in-game model of the gold bar has an imprint saying that it weighs 10 ounces. Now, I'm no mathematician, but I'm pretty sure 35 pounds is a great deal heavier than 10 ounces. In fact, it's about 51 times heavier. For these gold bars to be 10 ounces, they would have to be much smaller than they are. Second, the most commonly traded large gold bars are around 400 ounces, and those gold bars are noticeably larger than those we see in-game. I know that Frederick Sinclair was basically Elon Musk levels of rich, and the dude had vending machines that could literally manipulate matter, but I'm a bit confused as to why these small gold bars that are said to weigh 10 ounces actually weigh 35 pounds. Am I nitpicking? Maybe, but it's really bizarre nonetheless. Now that the security has been disabled, all that's left to get in is to go to the terminal and open the door. The terminal has a simple note for anyone that tries to use it saying, only the trustworthy may enter my vault. It's a very direct message straight from Sinclair to those he suspected may try to enter his vault. 
It's also appropriate given the themes of the story regarding obsessions and greed and how they turn people against one another. However, once the courier is inside, they won't be able to get back out without accessing the terminal, which can only be accessed by disabling the security again from another terminal within the vault. The Sierra Madre is indeed a complicated lock. The terminal has two files to read through as well as a holotape containing a file meant for Vera. The first file that can be accessed is a note to Vera from Sinclair, telling her that he understood why she was in the position that Dean put her in and that he still loves her, promising her that the vault can keep her safe should she ever need it. He also warns her not to access the next file, Sinclair's personal accounts, as it's a trap meant for Dean Domino that will seal the vault forever, killing him. Shit, could you imagine waiting 200 years only to be cucked at the point of entry by a dead man? Get fucked, Dean. The courier can actually access the file, triggering an ending that talks about how the courier could not escape the Sierra Madre and how eventually a hologram resembling them appeared within the casino. I'm honestly not sure if this is funny or just disturbing. Anyways, upon exiting the terminal, we're contacted by Father Elijah, and now that they've got the time to talk, even Elijah is feeling that things have been way too constrained between himself and the courier, given the circumstances. Elijah reveals a great deal of information throughout this conversation, including anything the player might have missed up to this point, such as his backstory, how the courier got here, and where he has been all this time. As it turns out, Elijah's previous captives actually managed to get as far as the casino, but once they were inside, they turned on one another, leaving Elijah trapped inside. The connection to the callers was too distant, so he was unable to communicate with anyone until the courier arrived with their Pip-Boy, a device Elijah could easily connect to given his history of hacking them. The arrival of the courier was a hand-given miracle for Elijah. It's kind of funny too because Elijah will shoot on the courier for relying on their pit boy to get things done when it was his very own that made this whole heist possible. Speaking of which, it's high time Elijah revealed what he is plotting to do with the Sierra Madre. As it turns out, Elijah plans to use the technology of the Sierra Madre to begin again, building his own nation so that he can wipe out the Mojave Wasteland. Using the holograms, he can build an unstoppable army. Using the Cloud and the Sierra Madre, he can establish an impenetrable fortress. With the vending machines, he'll never have to worry about supplies and rations ever again. He claims he could even build a nation from it all, using the chips as currency. While possible, it's clear at this point that Elijah is a complete and utter psychopath, and allowing him to commit a mass genocide on the Mojave accomplishes nothing. All he is is bitter against the NCR and Brotherhood for taking away his chance to use Helios 1 to establish control over the Mojave. However, perhaps one of you disagrees and have decided to side with Elijah. Perhaps you too hate the NCR and would love to see them wiped out. There's another secret ending, one that allows you to side with Elijah, provided you've learned of him from Veronica and are also unfriendly with NCR. In this ending, Elijah and the Courier succeed in wiping out the Mojave. It's simultaneously dark as hell and really cool to see. Having two secret endings is already just badass, but having one where the player can become so maliciously evil is so entertaining. Unfortunately, this ending forces the player back to their last save, as it would take a complete conversion of the base game that accounts for every decision the player has and hasn't made up to this point. Considering how rushed out this DLC was, we'll talk about that later, I won't knock Obsidian for not letting the player continue after this ending. However, I do want to praise the modding community for their incredible conversion mod that allows the player to continue after this ending. The epilogue of Dead Money takes place in the midst of the Cloud's arrival at the Mojave Wasteland, so it isn't set after the ending slideshow, but the mod itself is so impressive and I respect the hell out of its creators. I'll be sure to include a link in the description. Also check out NCR Vet's channel. He's kind of the spokesperson for the modding community, in a manner of speaking. Anyways, back to Dead Money. Elijah is as close to this treasure as he has ever been, and he's very aware of how falling victim to his own greed could screw him over here. Elijah is willing and able to wait for the courier to die in the vault, so it's up to the player to convince Elijah to come down, either by lying and claiming that they'll cooperate, threatening to destroy the vault and its contents, or threatening to steal the bounty for themselves. 
There are a number of skill checks that make these routes possible, however they all lead down the same road, and that's Elijah coming down to the vault. What distinguishes the skill check paths from the standard dialogue is how Elijah approaches the situation. If the courier promises to cooperate but can't pass the bargainer's speech checks, Elijah will only go as far as the chamber entrance before shielding himself off and activating the turrets, at which point the player will need to backtrack all the way through the vault to reach and kill Elijah. During this time, Elijah will also attempt to set off the courier's bomb collar, meaning that he must also be killed quite hastily. As you can imagine, this is the most difficult way that this finale can play out. However, when passing the speech checks, Elijah will either be more concerned and recklessly rush to the vault door, or he'll trust the courier and drop his guard, allowing the player the options to either kill him or sneak right past him. We'll talk about the latter in a moment. The final battle with Elijah is appropriately very intense and it feels like a proper culmination of the player's choices. If the players manage to help keep Christine alive, she'll hack the turrets that Elijah tries to use against the courier. If the player is on good terms with Dean, he'll deactivate the speakers so that the courier can have an easier time trying to escape. Unfortunately, Dog and God can't really do anything. Father Elijah is no pushover either, having impressive stats and even a freaking Gauss rifle. If I haven't said it before, allow me to take this opportunity to say fuck the Brotherhood and their goddamn Gauss rifles. Without Christine having survived, he'll also have a load of turrets, meaning that luring him into the vault room is all but required. However, this also means getting into a confined space with this extremely dangerous man carrying a very powerful weapon. Elijah is capable of dealing extremely high damage pretty quickly, so getting him inside the vault means that dealing incredible damage is a necessity for trying to kill him. I gotta give it to him, the old bastard's got no quit in him. It's gonna take some patience and probably even trial and error if the player didn't earn Christine's favor, but eventually, Elijah falls, losing his heart in the very heart of the Madre. After disposing of Elijah, the vault begins to implode, so all that's left to do is escape. Due to the meltdown, the security systems are completely overloaded, causing the courier's caller to trigger its countdown. The player must now backtrack through the entirety of the vault before time runs out and leave through the elevator shaft. This sequence is actually pretty great, and I'm kind of amazed how little the awkward movement of New Vegas' controls got in the way, even on console. The whole sequence has a sense of urgency to it and lasts just long enough that it's likely to have the player on the edge of their seat by the time they're looking down the hallway to the elevator. It's not exactly complicated, but I enjoy the hell out of it. It's just a really good final run. A lot of the times in games it feels like escape sequences are just kind of happening for the sake of happening, but this feels like a proper culmination of everything that's happened in Dead Money. So what if the player doesn't want to fight Elisha? This is where things get tricky, and I don't mean that in an entirely positive way either. In order to sneak past Elisha, the player is going to need to be incredibly adept at sneaking even if they're lucky enough to have gotten themselves a stealth boy. I had a lot of trouble figuring out just how the fuck I am supposed to pull this off, so after what might have been literal hours of testing, here's what I've deduced. Father Elijah's perception, despite being a very old man, is unreal. According to the wiki, his actual perception stat is 8, but when trying to sneak past him, it feels like a 10 would be underselling it. The man will detect you with even the slightest bump against a wall and immediately initiate the security lockdown if he does. Here's the thing, sneaking past him to the left, which leads back through the entirety of the vault, is actually not that difficult. However, once the lockdown is initiated, the caller will begin to beep. Typically, this means the player will actually have a head start compared to if they killed Elijah, but if they're over encumbered, that is a completely different story. So I guess that makes this the final hurdle. Trying to pull off the heist of the centuries and sneak the gold past Elijah towards the right, the very area that he comes out of as it's the most direct path from the elevator, is ridiculously hard. I am not exaggerating at all when I say that doing this requires laser precise timing in literally every single move you make. Using the generator on the right is key here, as it's the only real wall that can be kept between him and the courier. Once he begins to approach the vault from the center of the chamber, that's when the player is going to want to haul ass for the door. 
If the player is over encumbered, they'll cross the entryway just before the force field is able to go off. One strategy I have seen people use is to drop every gold bar at once, meaning the lot will be compiled into a single item, which can then be carried very easily. There's a major risk to this, however, as a single quick camera movement can leave the gold bar dropping, either down the chasm or against the surface, which Elijah will definitely notice. But overall, it doesn't sound too hard, right? Wrong. Father Elijah's AI here is honestly kind of bullshit. I have no fucking idea what his field of vision is supposed to be, because it seems like the player not being seen is more dependent on the specific location of Elijah's character model rather than what he can actually see from there, if that makes any sense. The old bastard could be looking in the complete opposite direction, but if the game decides that he detects you, there's literally nothing you can do about it, and he'll activate the force field. Stealth boys don't even seem to make the slightest bit of difference here, which is just baffling. Why would you bother making stealth boys such a rare item from this locker if they have so little value in this particular situation? It's just really weird to me. But regardless of how you choose to handle Elijah, this is where our adventure in the Sierra Madre comes to a close. Thanks to the destruction of the vault caused by the security systems overloading, the casino is no longer hermetically sealed, so the courier and all of their surviving companions are free to let go. Upon leaving the casino, the player can actually explore the villa to their heart's content and do anything they may have forgotten about, which I really like. The player can even return to the casino at will, which is really cool. I mean, hey, you gotta get that gambling in, right? I need those Sierra Madre chips. Leaving the villa through the entrance will initiate the endings, however, before we get to those, I have a major complaint. In fact, this might be my single biggest complaint with this entire DLC. Remember the radio transmissions and how you could use them to listen in on other characters, including Elijah? Well, originally, there was going to be one last transmission from his pit boy. Here's what it would have been. Now, come on. You open up. Open the vault. I can make it worth your while. Think about what you're throwing away. I have other weapons, other technology I can share with you. In the big empty, I know the way there. I know some of its secrets. If the callers, the callers were a mistake. Oh, I see that now. Why would I kill you? After all you've done, after all we've done together. Are you listening to me? Everything down here, I, I swear, so much you could see. You could rule the wastes with what's down here. Make your own army, reshape the world, and if others disagree, put collars on them. I can show you how. Don't you leave me here. You can't do this to me. Is any target here? Machines, machines losing power. No, I, I still have pit boy light. Maybe, maybe, no, 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 it doesn't work. Where, where's the door? Can't find the door. Come. But in worse situations, find a way out. Somehow. Then find that courier. Maybe Veronica. No, no, she, she thinks I'm dead. Must be someone. Maybe that other courier. One, one with a flag on his back. Maybe, no, no. no. Said he'd never come to the Sierra Madre. No way out. Can't, can't end like this. You. I know you can hear me. When you die, Korea, I'll be waiting. Your grave's going to look just like this vault. When you die, I'll be waiting here. The Sierra Madre. Waiting. This file is still in the game, however it's not coded properly into the safety deposit box challenge, which is tied to the player locking Elijah within the vault. The only way to access it now is by using console commands to trigger it, 
And let me tell you, that really fucking sucks, because this is an excellent piece of audio that provides a great closure for this particular ending. Without this transmission, all we know for sure is that we left Elijah behind. Who's to say he didn't find a way to somehow get out? I mean, it doesn't make sense that he could, but you never know until you know. I'm not normally one to complain about cut content, especially in a massive game like Fallout where there's just bound to be lots of cut content, but when it's a significant piece of an ending that is literally already in the game, what a crying shame. The safety deposit box ending is so good, and thematically it's so appropriate that I think there is an honest argument to be made that it is the canonical ending. So to sour it by leaving out this transmission really sucks. You think they would have just patched it? I mean, it's literally already an audio file in the game, but that never happened and it's safe to say that it never will. What's worse is that Elijah's signal will remain on the player's Pip-Boy indefinitely, and it will only ever play the stuff that he says when the player is in the Sierra Madre prior to entering the casino. So, not only does this screw with the ending of Dead Money, it carries over into a permanent reminder of it for the remainder of the game. So okay, with that said, let's now take a look at the epilogue of Dead Money. Upon leaving the villa, a number of possible endings will play out. Regarding Dog and God, there's a total of four possible endings. Dog's death is a sort of bittersweet ending that describes Dog as dying hungry and alone with the voice of God screaming in fury, but apparently the two personalities come to find a sort of solace in their dying moments, and in a way it's kind of really nice. On the opposite end of the spectrum, we have the ending where the two personalities manage to survive and come together, allowing the Night Ken a chance to once again begin again. He remembers the courier upon hearing word of the great battle at the Divide, simultaneously giving closure to this story and setting up future events. It's even said that the new Night Ken wished the courier safe passage from the Divide, which is really sweet. Then we have God's ending where Dog dies off and God assumes control of the Nightkin. After tending to his wounds, he heads out west looking for more of his kind and telling of the courier that saved him. It's a surprisingly good ending and I appreciate the development of God's character as not being quite as malicious as he originally came off. In the end, all God wanted was control over his life and the freedom to leave the Sierra Madre. Though I do think it's worth noting that perhaps letting a psychopathic, intelligent super mutant on the loose might not exactly result in a net positive. However, on the opposite end of the spectrum is Dog's ending. As it turns out, Dog is just a feral monster that carves a path of violence across the wasteland. I get that this is a really abused phrase, but I really appreciate the subversion of expectations with these characters. Initially, there is sort of a pity for Dog and a disdain for God that the game does a great job at establishing. God isn't always unreasonable, but he doesn't exactly make a wonderful first impression, and those can be more valuable than any other. But then the respective endings of the two show quite the opposite of what we might have thought to understand about them at one point. God was desperate and might have been willing to go to extreme lengths to escape the Sierra Madre, but in the end he just wanted what anyone wants, freedom. Dog on the other hand, despite whatever pity we as the audience may have for him, is a wolf in sheep's clothing. Well okay, not really in sheep's clothing, I mean he's still a fucking horrifying mutant, but you get the idea. And it's foolish to think that he could be anything but another feral nightkin when we set him free onto the wastes. It's fairly obvious that Dog is intended to represent Freud's concept of the id, the natural instinct people feel to follow their primal desires, while God represents the superego, Freud's concept of the mind's filter that controls one's actions. Funnily enough, the superego is more to do with the following of what is understood to be social norms, which is more in line with how Dog behaves, while the id is more about selfish action above all else, which of course is more in line with God. I don't think that's by accident though. The merging of the two voices leads to what we can only assume is the true ego, Freud's concept of the meeting of the minds to make reasonable decisions through rational thought. Obviously, I'm abridging the hell out of this for the sake of brevity, but I do highly recommend looking deeper into this theory for yourself. That Freud guy was pretty interesting. 
But anyway, that's enough about Dog. For Dean, Domino, and Christine, it's about what you would expect. If Dean is killed, then a hologram will appear at the Tampico Theater, where he'll sing show tunes until the end of time. If Dean lives, he winds up coming across the last records of Vera and Sinclair, feeling a sense of sadness that he doesn't quite understand. Holy shit, is he finally feeling some kind of guilt? The fucking psychopath? It's not entirely clear how he came across these records, but there are a number of possible explanations, including having been given them from the courier or even Christine, going into the vault and reading the entry for Vera and knowing from it not to go to the personal accounts of Sinclair, and even just finding them by hacking another terminal. After this, he sets out for Vegas with the chance to begin again. I just hope that he doesn't waste it. As for Christine, her death is a bit underplayed, but when put into context, I actually think it works. I don't mind it being a bit underplayed, I just wish there was a bit more. Her death ending reiterates the theme of obsession and being unwilling to let go, but in fairness, she was seeking revenge on Elijah and the Courier who both had done morally reprehensible things that directly negatively affected her. The Courier being a piece of shit means that Christine didn't have anyone to stop her and ask, is it all worth it? If anything, I'd say the reason she never learned that obsession is another form of greed is because she wasn't given much of a chance to do so. I suppose in its own way that that is tragic. I just wish that the ending for her said just a little bit more. I do like the bit about how she apparently never stopped to consider why she started hunting Elijah in the first place. In a way, Christine was doomed from the start. She already hated Elijah because he cut her off from Veronica, which is understandable, but given what happened at the Big Empty, and her conversations with the courier that she met there, you'd think that she would have stopped for a while to consider what she was doing, and perhaps even turned around. Maybe she did, and it's just never spoken of, but ultimately her obsession got the better of her and she persisted to the Sierra Madre, at which point her fate was sealed. Depending, of course, on the courier that the player is roleplaying as. The ending where Christine lives is pretty fucking badass, though. She stays back at the Sierra Madre to watch over it and ensure that nobody ever comes here again, and the ghost people come to see her like they do the holograms, leaving her alone to be the Madre's warden. Apparently, though, the legends of the Battle at the Divide got back to her, confirming that people did occasionally reach the Sierra Madre. This is also another tease for what's to come for the Lonesome Road DLC, but that story's for another time. But before they all head their separate ways, the Madre's quartet meet at the Villa Fountain one last time for a silent goodbye. There's an undescribed tension between them as their bomb collars go cold, not being sure if the curse of the Sierra Madre would persist to this point, but they leave amicably with the radio message from the fountain ironically serving as their farewell. If any of the companions died, then there is no final farewell. Instead, there's an intro narrated by Elijah reiterating what was heard at the start of Dead Money. This continues into the finale of the epilogue where Elijah will reiterate what was said at this point of the story. If all of the companions survived, the same lines are read, but with interjections by the various companions, and all of them repeating the final line about letting go. This ending is also possible if only one of Dog or God's personalities remained intact. So, okay. Despite my major criticism regarding the radio transmission of Father Elijah being locked in the vault, I think the ending of Dead Money is really excellent, with the themes of the story coming full circle in a way that leads ultimately to a very satisfying conclusion for every character, regardless of the outcome. A lot of the times in RPGs it feels like characters dying is more of a fail state than a branching path, but... With Dead Money, death feels more like a tragic culmination of events, and I think a lot of that has to do with just how well everything ties together. But I'll hold off on that for now. Thank you all for watching. Though our adventure may seem to have concluded, I feel there is still a great deal to discuss. The next video is going to be focusing on the world building and what we learn from the Sierra Madre through its environmental storytelling, notes and documents, and whatever else we may come across in our travels. All of the unanswered questions regarding the Sierra Madre will be answered in due time, but until then, do take care. Hello and welcome back to my review series for Fallout New Vegas' first expansion, Dead Money. 
Now that we've covered everything that occurs within the walls of the Sierra Madre, I feel it's appropriate to talk about the Sierra Madre itself. If you couldn't tell by my very own Discord server, which you should totally join by the way, being named after this very place, I fucking love the Sierra Madre. I think Obsidian did a masterful job in creating not only a genuinely terrifying place, even by post-nuclear holocaust standards, but in telling a rich but tragic tale about the dangers of obsession and greed. The Sierra Madre was allegedly going to be this sanctuary for people from the looming atomic threat, but anyone with a pair of functioning eyes can see that a lot must have gone wrong during its construction. The villa is a miserably decrepit place that, were it not for the vending machines, nobody in their right mind would want to stay, even if it were completely rid of its ghost people. The whole land is locked in a perpetual red twilight that makes it nearly impossible to tell whether it's dusk or dawn, and acidic gas leaks into the streets from a ventilation system that is in a state of complete ruin. There is nothing even remotely hospitable about the villa aside from the vending machines, but that's like saying you can find air pockets at the bottom of the ocean. Throughout the Sierra Madre's villa, we can find a number of notes, diaries, and terminal entries, primarily from the workers, that paint a very clear picture of what was going on when the Sierra Madre was being constructed. When devising the plans for the Sierra Madre, Frederick Sinclair hired a man who went by the code name of Mr. Yesterday to begin construction. Mr. Yesterday was a complete and total scoundrel, who sought to spend as little as possible while making as much as possible. He cut every possible corner imaginable when constructing the Madre, and was easily able to convince Sinclair, who was already mostly apathetic to the villa, that the project was in good hands. It would also seem that Mr. Yesterday made it a point to bring on a very crooked workforce, bribing them all with drugs and the promise of good payout, in order to keep them silent and doing whatever he told them to. These very dubious decisions would begin to catch up when workers started getting injured, most notably from gas leaks from the shoddy ventilation system. Mr. Yesterday would pay the men off to keep them quiet, get the medical records erased completely, and work would continue unobstructed. Easily the worst thing Mr. Yesterday is known for is his killing of a worker who tried to blackmail him into getting a cut of the scam. An underhanded move on the part of the blackmailer, sure, but it just goes to show that Mr. Yesterday would stop at nothing to make his money, even if it meant the killing of others. We don't know how Mr. Yesterday's story ends, but it's safe to say that he either left the Sierra Madre or ultimately became one of the ghost people. For those of you who've been wondering what the blood red cloud of the Sierra Madre is, it is in fact a scientific experiment from the minds of the think tank at Big Mountain, a collection of dangerously intelligent scientists that were given perhaps too much in the ways of resources and funding. For the sake of brevity, I'm going to keep things strictly limited to this DLC and information relevant to the Sierra Madre. The Crimson Cloud is a toxin that was planted deep in the heart of the Sierra Madre Resort and Casino, and was intended to be a preservative of sorts, which explains why the casino, various terminals, and the vending machines are all in such pristine condition. As it turns out, building the perfect apocalypse shelter is quite an expensive undertaking. Frederick Sinclair was an incredibly wealthy businessman, but was teetering on the edge of bankruptcy before construction of it was even close to finished. It was at this point that Sinclair went to Big Mountain, a wonderland of experimentation and technology that would make even Mr. House blush with envy. Sinclair needed advanced technologies, such as the vending machines that could theoretically keep the residents of the Sierra Madre supplied until the end of time itself. But this kind of technology doesn't come cheap, even in the Fallout universe, and Sinclair was out of options. He made a Faustian bargain with the scientists of the Think Tank, being granted full access to whatever resources he felt he needed, but in exchange, the scientists would place their own experimental technology, including the toxic preservative that we know as the Cloud, within the Sierra Madre. As potent a preservative as the toxin is, however, even it isn't capable of repairing what was already broken or decayed. This is why the ventilation system was still falling apart despite the gas spreading through it. One worker compared the potential of the villa after just a few years to greener pastures, a massive nuclear dump in the Capital Wasteland, then known as Washington, D.C. Funny enough, greener pastures, which can be found in Fallout 3, is a utopian wonderland in comparison to the Sierra Madre. 
It's also why the buildings of the Sierra Madre, which were also quite cheaply made, are still in states of complete ruin. One note found within the villa documents an incident where a patio and balcony within the Salida del Sol collapsed, leading to an undisclosed number of injuries that were deleted from medical records. The infrastructure of the villa is described in one note as being sand held together by spit and glue. But just as Sinclair had always intended, the heart of the Sierra Madre, his very own casino, is still preserved even after two centuries of complete isolation. Even the gala event that would open the front gates is fully operational, with enough warm bodies to pull it off, of course. The gala event was intended to be a night of celebration for the many celebrities and rich patrons in attendance, allowing them to see the opening of the Sierra Madre Casino and Resort themselves, where they would be safe from the atomic threat, should they have opted to stay. Coincidentally, and unfortunately, the gala just so happened to be scheduled to take place the very night the bombs dropped. The gala itself was just starting when the bombs dropped, cutting it short and leading to the Sierra Madre Resort sealing itself off and leaving a number of patrons locked either inside or outside. However, this was only the beginning of their troubles. For the unlucky few that were already inside the casino, the security system would activate at night, with the security holograms killing anyone and everyone they came across. The security holograms were one of many experiments brought from the think tank into the Sierra Madre, and to call them marvels of technology would be underselling them. The holograms are emitted by devices that seem to be capable of working for an indefinite period of time, and the holograms themselves are light-based constructs, capable of processing data for trade-based interactions or killing without prejudice using their powerful laser beams. They're limited in utility, lacking the ability to hear, having a tight field of view, and only being able to operate within range of their projector devices, but when it comes down to it, these things are arguably the single most deadly thing on the planet. But they aren't the only things within the Sierra Madre that could be considered a threat. As you can imagine, the Sierra Madre Villa would begin to deteriorate quite rapidly following the night of the Great War. Even though the Sierra Madre's infrastructure remained standing, likely due to it being so out of the way of prime targets, it was ultimately unsustainable due to a lack of care put into its creation. One way or another, the ventilation system would begin to collapse, ultimately leaking the crimson cloud and spreading it all over the Sierra Madre to the point that it would eventually blanket the surrounding land, blocking it off from all but the most determined individuals or the most unfortunate victims. The cloud is described as an acidic toxin that causes deterioration of one's health upon contact. Minor exposure often leads to burning of the lungs and coughing fits, while heavy exposure causes outright necrosis and rapid organ failure. There's even a medical terminal that details the horrific state a worker wound up in after a pipe burst, spitting the toxic gas right in his face. The cloud is speculated by Father Elijah to be self-replicating, however we know how unreliable he can be. And it seems that what's really going on is it's being produced deep within the Sierra Madre at such a rate that it's capable of spreading as much as it has, although the source of its creation is ultimately unknowable. The cloud has bled out into a pocket of the Grand Canyon, but that seems to be the extent at which it's able to reach. Otherwise, literally the entire world would eventually be blanketed by the cloud. Given that the cloud would have been contained entirely within the Sierra Madre's ventilation system until release, I imagine that the cloud was also quite concentrated before it managed to spread all over the Sierra Madre and out into the Grand Canyon, meaning the fates of its residents must have been quite grim. Sleeping in the cloud is a death sentence, meaning without access to the casino, the residents may have even turned violent as they sought shelter amidst the poorly constructed villa from the cloud. Standardized hazmats, rebreathers, and gas masks are also completely ineffective against the cloud. The scientists at the think tank of Big Mountain were kind enough to provide experimental dark light hazmat suits for dealing with the cloud, however it would seem that those who attempted to use them would meet with an even more terrifying fate. It's impossible to know for sure, but it seems as though once the cloud has been ventilated through the rebreathers of these dark light suits, something in the cloud's chemical composition is altered, leading to mutations in the physiology of the person wearing the suit. The cloud also causes various parts of the suit to tighten up and corrode, making it extremely difficult to remove the suit as a result. This is even detailed in the workers' notes found in the villa that talk about having to use cosmic knives to escape the suits. And this is the origin of the ghost people. 
The ghost people are a curious bunch. They seem to share something of a culture, or at the very least an understanding, almost seeming to have a sort of pack mentality where they work together to dispose of any trespassers in the Sierra Madre. Apparently, Dean Domino has even tried leaving food for them and speaking to them, but they never responded in kind, meaning they either don't understand him, simply don't care, or perhaps a combination of the two. Due to the erosion of the joints in their suits, they move very awkwardly and sporadically, but they seem to have a firm understanding of what they can and can't do within their suits, as they're never seen tripping over themselves. They definitely have their wits about them, though the true extent of their intelligence is sort of unknowable. Though I suppose being unknowable is kind of what the ghost people are all about. Dean Domino speculates that they live beneath the Sierra Madre in a system of tunnels, but whatever they're even doing down there is probably impossible to tell. Do they have pack leaders or even a culture of their own? We know thanks to the ending slides that when Christine stays behind to watch over the Sierra Madre, they actually respect her and stay out of her way. So what caused them to change their minds about her? What do they do in their spare time besides aimlessly wander? They don't sleep or eat, so I can't imagine that a trading system is necessary. Come to think of it, they don't even age. Who even was the first ghost person? They know how to set up traps, so do they know how to operate complex machinery? Perhaps even guns? Do they even care to? It's impossible to say, and I think that's the best thing about the ghost people. We know just enough about them that they can properly scare the shit out of us, but that's about the extent of it. Dean Domino even tells us that they drag their still-living victims off into the fog, presumably to stuff them into one of their suits to be transformed into a new ghost person. It's downright terrifying to try and imagine yourself at the mercy of one of these things, let alone being turned into one of them. I mentioned how it seems like the suit itself causes the body to react differently to the cloud, but to what extent and how is impossible to say. All we know for sure is that being turned into one of the ghost people is a cruel and disturbing way to go. One of the more disturbing questions surrounding the ghost people is whether or not they can even be considered alive. The fact that they can only be taken out via dismemberment seems to imply that their physiology undergoes some kind of change when they lose a limb, possibly due to the sudden exposure of the cloud or even oxygen without the filtration of their masks. One thing I can say for certain though, they don't get back up. Whether they're docile or paralyzed at this point is impossible to say, but it still gives me the creeps. Another experiment of the think tank that found its way into the Sierra Madre that I mentioned earlier was a surplus of cosmic knives. A set of blades forged from Saturnite, a chemical composition known for its ability to maintain an unbelievably sharp edge, as well as being able to retain extreme heat for hours at a time. As you can probably imagine, these make for some rather deadly weapons. They were used by the Sierra Madre workers as per the orders of Frederick Sinclair. Spared no expense. He wanted nothing shy of the best when it came to anything and everything in the Sierra Madre or at least within the casino, even though the workers themselves were not a fan of these knives. There are notes from the kitchen workers detailing how the knives would go straight through the cutting boards with no effort from the wielder, and apparently there was an accident or two where a knife slid clean through an employee's fingers, chopping them straight off. The workers did, however, make use of the knives on certain occasions where the other workers became trapped in their dark light hazmat suits due to the way they would tighten up and seal upon contact with the cloud but one can only imagine the injuries sustained in trying to get people out of those damn suits. Another experiment from the good old think tank is none other than the vending machines found throughout the Sierra Madre. These things are technological marvels. As it turns out, the Sierra Madre chips found littered throughout the villa actually contain a battery that produces incredible energy, and the vending machines are able to turn this energy into just about anything imaginable using a matter converter of sorts. The machine requires various codes in order to make them able to create certain items, but aside from that, there seems to be just about no limit to their application. I guess items of particularly large size would be impossible to make without breaking the machine, but aside from that, these things can make just about anything you'd ever want from them. Food, ammunition, medicine, clothing. They're like 3D printers, but to the nth degree, and it's a wonder how these things weren't mass-produced prior to the Great War. With all of the horrors that leaked from Big Mountain into the world, it's amazing the wonders that barely managed to get out. Though I guess there's probably a reason that these things are referred to as experimental technology. Dean Domino claims they were commonplace before the Great War, but given that they cannot be found anywhere else, this is clearly just him trying to stroke his own ego. 
I mean, that's pretty much his M.O. No doubt there's a lot of unknowns when it comes to the vending machines. After all, matter conversion isn't exactly an everyday thing, even in pre-war Fallout, despite what Dean may be trying to say to the contrary. The items these things create seem to be perfectly in line with the genuine articles, but I can't help but wonder the long-term effects of consuming food and drinks from this machine. Thankfully, once the player has left the Sierra Madre, they can still use the vending machine in Elijah's bunker. There's even a regular shipment of Sierra Madre chips to the bunker that the player can use on the machine, which is just wonderful. But this brings me back to a potential issue I have with this DLC, and that's the Sierra Madre's screening and automatic security systems. I said in my introductory video that I planned to discuss this, and I think now is the right time. There are multiple instances where the Sierra Madre security system seems capable of things that should not at all be possible given what we know. The first of these things is the way the courier's items are sent back to the bunker at the start of the DLC, or more accurately, how they allegedly would have been sent back. Elijah claims the Sierra Madre has automated systems that will ship contraband, including items touched by radiation, straight back to the person's address. However, there are a number of holes in this idea that lead me to believe Elijah is lying to us. I refuse to believe that Elijah managed to survive within the Sierra Madre upon first arriving with literally no weapons or even clothing to defend himself. This guy's no spring chicken, I mean he's got arthritis, and it's not like he has any idea of the Sierra Madre's threats prior to his arrival, let alone how to survive the cloud of all things. Also, we know upon meeting Elijah that he still has his robes, so clearly his claim that security systems will deny anything touched by radiation is complete nonsense. The Sierra Madre systems have no way of identifying anyone nowadays, let alone where they might live, so what would happen to the items? My guess is they'd be locked away in some kind of storage. I mean, that's basically what happens first anywhere else with confiscated items. But that would mean leaving a place for the player to go get all of their stuff. Christine's armor, an armor not found in the Sierra Madre I should add, was left in the clinic's emergency room. Christine wasn't kidnapped by dog until after entering the Sierra Madre, meaning that she made it here with her gear, and there was no place for it to be left behind, except within the Sierra Madre. And how would the security system handle a human being who was touched by radiation, or a ghoul like Dean Domino? It's not like there are robots actively seeking us at all times that box us up or some shit, so... What exactly is it that this supposed system is even doing? Also, how would this security system even work? Is it all handled by automated machines like drones and protectrons? I'd be inclined to believe that, after all the Sierra Madre is a host of several technological marvels, if it weren't for the fact that we never see these defenses trying to pick up and dispose of irradiated items throughout the Sierra Madre, of which there are plenty. Here's the thing, one of the terminals in the police station actually mentions that Sinclair wanted a system like this installed. However, that log isn't given a date, and there's no mention of this system ever being completed, so I can only surmise that the project was never finished. Hell, maybe that's how Elijah thought up the whole thing to begin with. But it makes no sense how such a system would work in the present day of New Vegas. Father Elijah is lying. The first counter-argument to this claim would be regarding the shipment of chips to the bunker upon completion of dead money. I simply think that that's a reward from the developers that defies all narrative reasoning. I mean, really try and think about it, why and how would the Sierra Madre be sending us these chips? Who would have set up the system to have them sent, and how would they even do that anyways? How would the chips even be sent here? The safe they appear in doesn't even have any matter-manipulating elements like the vending machines. It just doesn't make any sense. And let me be clear, I don't think this is a glaring problem. If anything, I love the reward of getting frequent use of the vending machine outside the Sierra Madre. I just wish that they'd have gone with something that made more sense. Like a chip printer crafted by Elijah himself that can produce so many at a time once every few days. The real question is why would Elijah lie about this security system in the first place? My assumption is that Elijah wanted to avoid the possibility of anyone having some kind of item or equipment that could disassemble the bomb callers, thus completely undoing his plans and putting the Sierra Madre at greater risk of being plundered by someone else. There's also the issue of someone coming in with incredible gear and kicking his ass once they finally encounter him in the vaults. 
God also suggests that the security systems took our supplies. However, we know that God doesn't know what Dog knows, which is that Dog stripped us of our supplies, meaning that it makes sense that God would be led to believe this despite Dog being told by Elijah to strip captives of supplies. As for how God came to think the Madre had systems like this in place, there are a number of potential answers, from notes to his own speculation. But the question of the Sierra Madre security system doesn't stop there. The other side of the coin is what happens within the casino upon arrival. Upon entering the casino, the courier and their companions are rendered unconscious, presumably by some type of gas agent, and everyone except the courier is moved to different parts of the hotel. The first question, of course, is... How? Again, perhaps there are machines programmed only to come out for this particular circumstance. I can actually sort of buy that since there's so much about the casino that we don't even see. But it also leaves me to wonder why these machines don't try and stop us and our companions from wreaking havoc for the remainder of the story. Then there's the holograms. We can assume that they canonically have some sort of physical presence because trying to run through them is impossible. We also know that they can open simple wooden doors, showing physical interaction with the environment. Though apparently, not all of the holograms are programmed to be able to open doors, possibly due to the nature of them being a prototype technology that's strongly suggested to be incomplete in function, primarily due to them having been made by National Electric, rather than the Think Tank, who originally created the technology but had no interest in weaponizing it. If you'd allow me to jump ahead to the Old World Blues DLC for a moment, we also know that thanks to it, the Think Tank had developed force field technology, meaning it's not out of the question to assume the holograms have a physical presence that would allow them to move our companions. It actually works as an explanation. But now it's time to discuss the Man of the Hour, the Lord of the Sierra Madre himself, Frederick Sinclair. In many ways, I feel sorry for Sinclair. As a businessman, he faced many great financial losses, but managed to remain wealthy despite them, eventually putting his wealth into a grand expression of love, the Sierra Madre. Upon meeting global starlet Vera Keys, Frederick was hooked on a feeling and couldn't let go. With the looming threat of nuclear Armageddon, Sinclair would put all of his money and resources into a grand resort, the ultimate shelter that would allow for him and his love to survive the apocalypse and spend the rest of their days in safety and seclusion. As you can tell, things did not quite go as planned. During the construction of the Sierra Madre, things became far too costly for Sinclair, and it seemed as though the whole plan was doomed to fail. In exchange for access to highly advanced technology and presumably incredible funding, Sinclair bargained with the less than altruistic minds of the think tank, ultimately turning the sanctuary to be that was the Sierra Madre into a hellish death trap. At this point, all that mattered to Sinclair was the preservation of the resort that he and Vera would spend the rest of their days within. Combine this stress with growing concerns over Vera that we'll get to shortly, and his attention would have been all but entirely diverted from the villa, allowing Mr. Yesterday to continue his scam operation. It's not entirely clear how, but eventually Sinclair learned that Vera was conspiring with Dean Domino to steal the treasure of the Sierra Madre, his stockpile of gold hidden deep within the heart of the resort in a vault. This devastated Sinclair, leading him to tell the workers to construct the vault in a manner that prevents elevator access from within the vault itself, making it a one-way trip without some form of outside assistance. The vault was now a trap that would lock both Vera and Dean inside, leaving them to die. Overcome with guilt, Vera confessed the entire plot and begged for forgiveness. As it turns out, Domino was blackmailing Vera to help him using evidence of her drug addiction. This ultimately left Vera in an impossible situation. Sinclair was still devastated, but ultimately was understanding of Vera. He decided that enough was enough, and he couldn't go through with using the vault, his own heart, to kill Vera. He retreated to the vault, erasing the terminal entry he had left for her, instead replacing it with an apology on the off chance that she would ever wander down there for safety's sake. Knowing that the elevator was a one-way trip, Sinclair would attempt to jury-rig an exit, but a leak in the pipes would lead to his untimely demise. His corpse is still in plain view on one of the pipes within the vault's inner chamber. His love for Vera led him to the heart of the Sierra Madre, and once he was there, it would not let go, just as he was unable to let go of his love for Vera. 
It's also likely that this leak in the pipes was what ultimately led to the formation of the cloud. Or at least the start of it. Vera Keys is a tragic character that unfortunately could never escape the obsessions of others. Long before meeting Sinclair, Vera was an aspiring starlet that eventually caught the eye of one Dean Domino, a man turned ghoul we just so happened to meet at the Sierra Madre. We learned through dialogue with Dean that he was the one who propelled her to stardom, but it's clear that Dean had a less than flattering view of Vera, seeing her as little more than a nice pair of legs with a pretty voice. Dean claims that he and Vera had a fling at some point during their travels, though it isn't made clear whether or not there was ever any coercion on Dean's part, let alone if it actually happened at all. It's also mentioned by Domino that her birth name wasn't actually Vera Keys, however her real name is never mentioned. As I touched before, Vera suffered from severe drug addiction, but the roots of this are perhaps the most tragic piece of this entire puzzle. Vera Keys suffered from an undisclosed terminal illness that caused her severe physical pain to the point that she had developed insomnia. We also know, thanks to the medical terminal entries in the Villa Clinic, that Vera had developed a throat infection or some kind of recurring pain in her throat. However, the link between this and her illness is never fully explained. Although unclear what the illness even was, it's clear that she needed painkillers if she wanted to keep functioning in public, let alone scoring gigs as a starlet. In terminal entries regarding Vera's medical reports, it's revealed that Sinclair actually brought in and authorized the vending machine codes for Medex, a known painkiller in the world of Fallout. It's also revealed through another terminal in the clinic that Dean was bribing the doctors to grant Vera access to unsafe amounts of Medex leading one of the doctors to recommend psychiatric evaluation on the hunch that she might attempt suicide. As it turns out, the doctor was correct in his concerns, though I doubt that he could have ever imagined the circumstances surrounding her suicide. On the night of the gala event, Vera found herself alone in her room as the Sierra Madre security systems activated. Vera was locked inside, with the security holograms massacring the unfortunate guests that were just outside. Screaming flooded the halls of the Sierra Madre as it began to set in with Vera just how grim the situation was. Vera would attempt to send out an emergency broadcast from the Sierra Madre, but due to a malfunction in the system, the grand opening broadcast was sent out instead, acting as bait for outsiders for the next two centuries. Vera, now trapped with nowhere to go, left one last message on the wall before injecting herself with the lethal amount of Medex. Though her life was overcome with tragedy and abuse, there is some solace in knowing that she was granted a fate most peaceful compared to what happened to everyone else within the Sierra Madre. Vera Keys was the only person from before the war within the Sierra Madre that learned to let go. Unfortunately for her, the Sierra Madre would refuse to let go of her. And that's the story of the Sierra Madre, or at least the lore and history. All that's left is the conclusion. Thank you all so much for watching. I know this is a pretty damn depressing tale, but I appreciate all of you who've made it this far in the series. Until next time. Welcome one and all to the finale of my review series on Dead Money. Wow, it has been quite the adventure, huh? I've had a lot to say about Dead Money, some good, some bad, some glowing, and some very critical. However, I think that Dead Money overall is a very tremendous piece of content, but the fact that the DLC was fairly rushed is incredibly apparent, at least in some aspects. It's no secret that New Vegas was a rushed game, Bethesda only gave Obsidian 17 months on the project, and Dead Money came out a mere two months following New Vegas. I'm not about to pretend that New Vegas isn't marred with technical issues. Sure, the modding community has done a great job at stabilizing it, but has anyone ever actually completed the game without encountering a bug? Dead Money has its own fair share of technical shortcomings. If you want a complete list of them, you'll have to check out the wiki because I just don't have the time for that. But just in my time playing through it for this review, which covered about seven characters, I encountered a litany of technical hiccups, such as sudden filter changes, issues with lighting, 
AI failures, a couple of crashes, frequent issues with the dialogue between characters at the Villa Fountain, being damaged through a wall by my own explosive trap, stuttering, entire models bugging out, that hilarious glitch that makes bodies fly around like some kind of pissed off eldritch horror, and god even knows what else that I've forgotten about. I've played literally over 2000 hours of this game at this point, so I won't pretend that all of this phases me anymore, but I'm also not about to give it a pass for that. It's more of an overall issue with New Vegas as a whole, but the fact that it bleeds over into the Dead Money experience means that it directly affects the Dead Money experience, just as the base gameplay and mechanics would. As far as the gameplay of Dead Money, I would consider it passable. It's not particularly good, but there's enough depth to the mechanics that it can really engage the player regardless of their build or playstyle. Besides, I've already said that I consider this a survival horror game, so as a YouTube reviewer, my job is to prefer terrible gameplay to a more polished and well-made system. After all, that's what survival horror is all about, isn't it? Having shit controls rather than a properly implemented challenge that tests the player's skills and wit simultaneously but fairly? I'm kidding. But I fucking hate it when people say that kind of shit, though, it's really stupid. Anyways, about Dead Money's gameplay, you may have noticed a couple of things about my own playstyle, or at least the footage of the series. I love VATS, and I use Quicksave. A lot. I'll spare you the video essay on the implementation of VATS, but as far as Dead Money goes, I do feel like VATS is a bit of a crutch. At least for some builds. The ghost people move around very awkwardly, and while I certainly can deal with them using the standard aiming and shooting, VATS is just far more reliable and effective, especially with accuracy boosting perks. Explosive builds, melee builds, and at points, stealth builds don't really need to use VATS that often, it's more just there to look cool. But trying to shoot these wibbly-wobbly enemies as they bob and weave using the very mediocre controls of New Vegas can just feel ridiculous when you have a literal auto-aim. And unlike most of New Vegas, Dead Money is pretty close quarters, so even without accuracy boosters, the chance to hit is rarely below the 60-70% to 70 range, unless you've just got a broken arm or skull. Or just piss poor stats, I guess. I did play through with a character that had really shit stats, so that, that that's actually kind of true. As far as quick saving goes, I primarily just do this for the sake of footage. In case something happens that I want to see a repeat of, to do something funny, try something I otherwise wouldn't do, in case there's a crash, there's a crap load of reasons. Generally speaking, I don't really abuse quick saving, but I feel like there are enough threats in dead money that, generally speaking, quick saving isn't that exploitable anyways, bar a few circumstances and perhaps deliberately exploiting glitches, which is its own thing entirely. So with that, I feel like I've covered all the ground I really can regarding the gameplay in this DLC. The moment-to-moment -moment gameplay ranges from passable to engaging, but the most enjoyable part of the experience by far is just trying to survive, trying to make sure that I have enough chips to get whatever supplies I need from the vending machines using scrap metal to make certain explosives, recycling ammo cases, all that jazz. Honestly, it's pretty damn excellent in that regard. Easily some of the most engaging hours that I've spent with New Vegas have come from dead money and trying to think about what the next step of the heist will be. As for the story and characters, I've made it no secret that there are definitely some errors in regards to the writing, ranging from the minor to the outright nonsensical stuff that I just don't really understand or at least didn't without taking a serious deep dive into this damn plot. My biggest problems include the outright nonsensical things, like how the fuck was Christine able to have a throat operation performed on her multiple times over the course of, what was it, a week? Without detonating the bomb collar tied to her fucking neck. Seriously, this doesn't make any sense. Or how Dog chewed up one of these fucking things without it exploding his face. This shit is mind-boggling to me. That being said, I think the ways in which the writing of Dead Money succeeds far outweighs these issues. Dead Money does what many stories fail to do, and that's tying the themes back into the more mechanical and literal aspects of the story in ways that make sense and are consistent. A story can say and mean whatever the hell the author would like it to provided they have the skill to convey that theme clearly enough, but when the more tangible aspects of the story don't make sense, then the audience has no reason whatsoever to take the theme seriously unless they just find some external reason to attach themselves, like relating their own life experiences to the thematic elements presented in or interpreted from the media they're consuming. 
However, at that point, you're leaving it to the mind of the audience to say your story is good, rather than developing your skills so that your story is inherently good to begin with. Last of Us 2 may have a wonderful theme about the poison of revenge and how hatred negatively affects us and those we love, but when it comes down to the story, nothing makes any fucking sense and the characters are either complete idiots or blatant plot devices I fucking hate this game. And here I had you thinking that I was going to go a whole series without shitting on The Last of Us 2. Funny enough, on the flip side, Christine's tale of revenge is human, understandable. It makes sense and has multiple endings. In a handful of months, probably a little bit less than that actually, these writers were able to do so much more with the exact same theme and even the same damn voice actress than Naughty Dog could in seven years. Get fucked, Druckmann. So the theme of Dead Money is about the importance of letting go of one's obsessions before they manifest into a deadly greed that leads to the harm of others, and each of the characters show how various kinds of obsessions can affect people. Dog and God are an embodiment of Freud's concept of the mind that have to do with control over oneself, with both personalities being unable to let go of what's hurting them, both figuratively and literally. Christine, of course, is obsessed with getting revenge on Father Elijah for the various injustices that he's committed that have negatively impacted her life. Her position is understandable, but that doesn't give it a moral pass. Domino is so obsessed with getting back at a dead man that he felt insulted by that, in some ways, Dean can be seen as a look into what Christine could have become. Elijah is a psychopathic zealot, the ultimate embodiment of the most extreme result of the Brotherhood of Steel's core values. He's obsessed with old world technology and using it for his own ends, regardless of the detriment those ends are to others. Even the courier can be characterized through the interactions between them and Christine, giving a number of reasons they just couldn't leave the radio broadcast be and stay away. Not that some of the reasons aren't justified or that curiosity in itself is inherently bad, but like Icarus, they flew too close to the sun. This theme also carries over into the lore and backstory. Frederick Sinclair's obsession was that of a woman. His heart was unwilling to let go of Vera Keys, and despite the countless troubles that came from just trying to create the Sierra Madre, he would never let it stop. He even went as far as to let others become the subjects of Big Mountain, scientists that are completely without ethics, minds without morals. Sinclair had all the money in the world, but because of his obsession, all that money brought was death and sorrow. By the time he tried to make things right, it was far too late, and in the end, he paid the ultimate price. Fallout New Vegas is a story about many things, but the need to let go is consistent from the base game through all of its expansions, and Dead Money does an exceptional job at relating its characters, lore, and plot to that very theme. The NCR, Caesar's Legion, the Followers of the Apocalypse, the Kings, Mr. House, the Brotherhood of Steel, the Boomers, Father Elijah, Joshua Graham, Daniel, the Think Tank, and even Ulysses all share a common fatal flaw, and it's that they're unwilling to let go of the past. They say that those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it, but New Vegas adds to this with an idea that those who obsess over history are also bound to repeat it. It's a fascinating topic and one of the many reasons this game is still being discussed over a decade past its release. Dead Money is the perfect encapsulation of the theme of obsession and greed, with each of the characters doing a superb job at illustrating different manifestations of those very concepts. It has its shortcomings, but the overall experience is fantastic, and to call it brilliant would honestly be underselling it. Dead Money isn't just an excellent piece of additional content for New Vegas, it's a gem of a tale that any person can learn a number of things from. How else can I describe it, but as a treasure worth holding on to? Welcome one and all to my review series for Fallout New Vegas' second story expansion, Honest Hearts. Like my Dead Money review series, this series will be a massive review broken into several videos focused on the second story expansion. Honest Hearts was something of a trendsetter for Fallout DLC, and I mean that in both positive and negative respects. Dead Money wasn't particularly well received initially, so the folks at Obsidian decided that something on the opposite end of the spectrum would be a better fit for the second expansion. Honest Hearts allows players to explore an entirely new map set in Utah, and tells the story of a faction war no doubt trying to emulate what made the base game so successful. 
At the center of Honest Heart's story is a character that, prior to this DLC's release, people were very excited to see as he had been hyped up in the base game. That man, of course, is Joshua Graham. But we'll get to him shortly. For now, I'd like to quickly summarize my approach to this DLC. I thought long and hard about this, and ultimately, I had two ways I could have gone about it. I could have either made entirely new characters that had shared similar attributes to those I used for Dead Money, but this time set to the recommended level of 15, or I could just use the characters that I used for the Dead Money playthroughs. I decided on the latter, as I felt it made more sense, being that this is the DLC that follows Dead Money. Plus, it helps to maintain a narrative throughline with my previous review series. I have allowed myself a bit more leeway, however. Unlike Dead Money, Honest Hearts allows the player to enter the DLC with whatever equipment they like, provided their loadout weight is at or below 75 pounds. This weight limit can be up to 100 by possessing certain perks or by convincing this idiot to leave the job, so I decided to take this permission to the nth. Not only did I get some of these characters significantly better weapons, but I also got them all implants, boosting special stats and granting some of them increased damage threshold, as well as a passive healing perk. Like Dead Money, there's a radio broadcast the player can listen to as they journey to the starting location of the DLC. Howdy. My name is Jed Masterson, and I'm a caravan boss for the Happy Trails Caravan Company. If you're hearing this, I have a job offer for you. Happy Trails is organizing an expedition north into Utah, off the Long 15, and we need people. We're looking for caravan guards, prospectors, couriers. If you're used to humping it across the waste, straight toward trouble, we want you. If you got a pit boy, we definitely want you. On the other hand, if you're a greenhorn or a city slicker spinning tales about your skills, you can kindly go hang. If we like your gumption, we'll pay you square and treat you fair. Find me, Jed Masterson, at the Northern Passage if you're interested. Luck to you. This broadcast is essentially a sales pitch, offering whoever joins the Happy Trails Caravan Company pay for helping them reach a place called Zion out in Utah. It's a pretty standard radio broadcast, nothing really too significant, but I don't really think it needs to be. The Sierra Madre broadcast was intentionally vague and misleading, not just to the player, but to any character that would have heard it. And there were reasons for that. This broadcast is coming from a guy in charge of a caravan company. He's giving a sales pitch and specifying the caravan company's needs. Also, you may recognize this man, Jed Masterson's voice. That, my friends, is none other than Dave Fenoy. Dave has a massive filmography, but I personally know him best as Lee Everett from Telltale's Walking Dead Season 1, Warlord O'Kear, and a handful of other minor characters from Mass Effect 2, and Howard, the guy that likes birds from Insomniac Spider-Man games. I love this guy. I love this man. I love his voice. Dave Fenoy, you are a treasure. So after arriving at the Northern Passage, the player can talk to Jed as well as one of the caravan guards, Stella, and this guy, Ricky. Stella is basically a window peering straight from New Vegas into Fallout 2. She's from New Reno and has traveled all the way from there to here. She's not exactly a complex character, but I do appreciate her inclusion and I enjoyed talking to her about her past. Ricky, on the other hand, is pretty uninteresting. He's a psycho addict that the player can convince to leave by bullying him, or they can convince him to stay by selling him drugs. Or they can just, you know, leave him alone. Ultimately, it's very inconsequential. You'll see why eventually. I actually got the idea to try and kill him with one of my morally dubious characters, and that's when a certain thing that I really do not like happened for what I think is the first time I've ever even witnessed in New Vegas, and boy was it jarring. All of the characters here are completely invincible and will not react to attacks from the player. At all. This is utterly bizarre to me. Some of you might hear that and think, well, of course, the player can't just get there by themselves, but there's no reason that shouldn't be the case. The only two things making the journey somewhat difficult would be the trek itself and needing a map to get there. I would frankly be baffled if nobody in the Northern Passage had a damn map for getting there, and we already know that the courier can walk all the way back to the Mojave from the Sierra Madre, and the journey from New Vegas to Zion National Park is almost half the distance. So there is no reason for the player not to be able to go there alone. 
Hell, the courier can even go to and from Zion after the DLC's been finished, whenever they like, and all they needed was a map. So already, there are a few things about this DLC that have rubbed me the wrong way. But hey, you know what, it's fine, I know the DLC hasn't really started yet, so I'll reserve judgment for now. But still, there's no denying that there's an immersion-breaking disconnect going on here. It's a long road from Vegas to Zion, so while I've got you here, I figure I can tell you a thing or two about everything leading up to the events of Honest Hearts. The paths we're following are slow going, so you might as well keep your ears open and listen to what old Jed has to say. A few decades back, Folks in the NCR started to hear about a community in northern Utah called New Canaan. Didn't know much about them, except that they were religious folks, sent out missionaries to talk to the tribes. We've seen our share of cults, but the New Canaanites, they were honest traders. Good fighters, too. Raiders wouldn't tangle with them. But then, the Legion appeared in Arizona. I reckon you know all about them. Turns out Caesar's first war chief, the Malpace Legate, was a new Canaanite, Joshua Graham. Legend goes that Graham was the meanest, toughest son of a bitch in the whole damn legion. The new Canaanites wouldn't talk about him. They were ashamed. Guess I can't blame them. Well, at Hoover Dam, the Malpace Legate finally met his match. Hanlon and Oliver kicked his new Canaanite butt right back over the river. Caesar had to make an example for the others, to show them that even at the highest level, failure wouldn't be tolerated. He had Graham covered in pitch, lit on fire, and thrown into the Grand Canyon. People say he didn't even scream on the way down. Not long after, some of the slaves and tribals started to talk, said Graham wasn't dead. Shouldn't have been any surprise. All this talk bothered Caesar. So he forbade anyone from speaking his name. Wanted to erase Joshua Graham from history. He got his wish. Joshua Graham disappeared. And in his place came legends of the burned man walking the wastes. Probably just a tribal ghost story. But New Canaan's been silent for a long time. Maybe it's a coincidence. Maybe the Malpace Legate is dead. Or maybe Joshua Graham did crawl out of that canyon and finally found his way back home. The events of Honest Hearts are sort of a cross between multiple subplots. However, each of those subplots shares a single point, and that point is none other than the followers of the Apocalypse. The followers of the Apocalypse are an idyllic bunch that seek to help their neighbors and build peaceful, lasting relationships with other tribes. 35 years prior to the events of New Vegas, the followers sent three men out east to study the tribal dialect so that they could start communicating with them and perhaps build from there. Utah is an interesting state when it comes to the world of Fallout because prior to the conception of Caesar's Legion, it was mostly comprised of smaller tribes that were either at war with one another, such as the Blackfoots, or just kept to themselves, like the Sorrows. These tribes even had their own dialects that greatly differ from the English-speaking many players will have come to expect in post-war North America. In order to build relationships with these tribes, the followers enlisted the help of a man named Joshua Graham, who grew up in Ogden, Utah, now known as New Canaan. Joshua was very familiar with the languages spoken by the various tribes of Utah and proved to be quite competent in his ability to translate. The men that joined Joshua included Bill Calhoun and Edward Sallow. Bill was a physician, and Edward was considered one of the brightest minds of the followers. During their expedition, the men came across an assortment of pre-war books, including The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire by Edward Gibbon, and Commentary de Bello Gallico, a work of Julius Caesar himself. Edward took to studying these books during their journey to Utah, and, as many of you know, they had quite an influence on him. Upon arriving in Utah, the group encountered a tribe known as the Blackfoot. 
a small tribe on the losing end of a war with seven others. Initial contact was actually quite peaceful and the trio were greeted with a relatively warm welcome. However, it wasn't long before a conflict arose. It's unclear whether or not this was due to a mistranslation on the part of Joshua, betrayal by the Blackfoot, or something else entirely. Regardless, the trio were taken captive by the Blackfoot. Upon realization that the Blackfoot were on the losing end of the tribal war, Edward Sallow, not keen on going down with them, took charge, against the wishes of Bill Calhoun. Edward Sallow taught the Blackfoot how to maintain their weaponry, small unit tactics, and ultimately the rule of divide and conquer. Edward was so capable that the tribe quickly appointed him their leader, and this marked a major shift in the tribal wars going on in Utah. Edward looked down on the skirmishes that the tribes had with contempt for their lack of knowledge on war, leading the Blackfoot in a total conquest of the other tribes. This conquest saw him starting with the weakest tribe and working his way up from there, eventually blindsiding the remaining tribes with a checkmate they never saw coming. To ensure his forces were continually strengthened, Sala would lay siege to the enemy tribes, enslave their strongest or otherwise most capable people, then have those not chosen to join him beaten to death by the others. Women, children, and the elderly were not excluded. The amalgamation of those eight tribes would come to be known as the Legion, with Edward Sallow taking on the title of Caesar. As for the other two men that accompanied Sallow, Bill Calhoun was luckily spared and instructed to return to the followers of the Apocalypse and inform them of Sallow's new role as Caesar of the Legion. Joshua Graham, however, went down a very different road. During the time of the Tribal Wars, Joshua Graham served as translator for Salo, no doubt eventually transitioning from this to giving orders himself, which would then of course turn into him leading the charge. Joshua Graham is an exceptional soldier and a gifted speaker and translator, and Salo recognized this, offering Joshua the position of Malpace Legate of the Legion. Joshua of course declined and, oh, what, wait, sorry, what's that? He accepted. Why the fuck would he do that? I mean, I guess it could be argued that his passion for the tribes made him feel obligated to stay, but I don't know, that feels like something worth elaborating on. It definitely wasn't a fear of Salo, since Joshua could easily deal with him while still remaining on good terms with the tribes. Hell, he could have probably taken over if he wanted to. So what the fuck was this guy thinking? He tells the courier that nobody but Caesar can lead the Legion, and he's fully aware that Caesar is a time bomb waiting to go off, so... Maybe he was afraid of carrying the responsibility of the Legion breaking down and most likely succumbing to infighting, but you think there would be mention of this. We can speculate all day, but ultimately, why Joshua Graham chose to take on the role of Mouthpaste Legate is a cold case, which is kind of a shame considering it's literally the single most important decision this character has ever made in his life. That being said, Joshua was very successful as the Legate for some time, leading the Legion to conquer a number of tribes as they carved a path across the east, not the least of which included the Twisted Hares, a tribe from Arizona that occupied Dry Wells, a patch of land along the Colorado River. Caesar would initially forge an alliance with the Twisted Hares only to break it, with Wolfus and Culta acting as his Judas. After conquering every other tribe of Arizona, Caesar turned on the Twisted Hares and enslaved them, exterminating their history and identity and crucifying all who resisted. One member of the Twisted Hares, a man known as Ulysses, would be recognized for his exceptional survival skills, eventually being granted the title of Legion Frumentarius, a unique select of men who act as spies for Caesar. As it turns out, it was Ulysses that first crossed the Colorado and discovered Hoover Dam, a discovery that would lead to the Legion's most significant conflict they ever had, that being with the New California Republic. Conflict between the Legion and NCR was all but inevitable. Caesar himself describes the Legion as the antithesis of the NCR, claiming it's inevitable that he destroy them and establishing a hold on Hoover Dam would make it all but impossible to stop his Legion from conquering the region. Things would seemingly fall into Caesar's favor with the destruction of Hopeville, an important supply line for the NCR that they relied on for sending troops and reinforcements. Following this, Caesar saw the opportunity and pushed to attack Hoover Dam, with Joshua Graham leading the charge as he always did. Unfortunately for the Legion, the NCR were more than ready thanks to the leadership of General Lee Oliver. Caesar's Legion typically carries out large-scale battles by sending wave after wave of men, with the youngest taking the helm while the veterans push from behind. 
You know, that sounds a lot like their camp culture now that I think about it. To counter this, the NCR essentially baited the Legion into points of vulnerability, with Rangers and First Recon picking Legion soldiers off at a steady pace as the NCR continued to lure the Legion further in. The culmination of this conflict occurred at a small town known as Boulder City, where the NCR had set up dozens upon dozens of C4. By the time Legion got to Boulder City, all that remained were their veterans who undoubtedly expected to have the advantage in close quarters engagement, but the NCR was long gone, and the Legion's most capable and proud soldiers fell with Boulder City. By this point, Joshua Graham was forced to retreat back to Caesar with the remainder of his men. As you can probably imagine, Caesar was furious with this defeat and was not about to let Joshua go unpunished. Caesar would take Joshua to the Grand Canyon for his execution, where Legion men covered Joshua in pitch, lit him on fire, and hurled him over the edge of the cliff, falling for over a mile to the very bottom of the Grand Canyon. However, that's not where Joshua's story ends. And I stayed in that darkness until after Hoover Dam. After I failed Caesar and he had me burned alive, thrown into the Grand Canyon. I survived because the fire inside burned brighter than the fire around me. I fell down into that dark chasm. But the flame burned on and on. The next morning, I woke up and crawled out of the northern edge of the Grand Canyon, that cursed place. It took me three months to reach New Canaan. It was as though the prodigal son had returned. They welcomed me like I had never left. Never done anything to shame them. The fire that had kept me alive was love. Their love. God's love. I will never be able to repay the debt I owe to them. But I must try. By some miraculous twist of fate, Joshua Graham would survive his fiery plunge into the Grand Canyon, waking up a day later and walking out of the chasm a burned man, reborn from the ashes of his former self. The burned man would spend the next three months traveling back home to New Canaan, where he was greeted with the love of a prodigal son. Following this, legends of the burned man would begin to make their way across the wasteland, eventually reaching the ears of Caesar, who would instigate a damnatio memoriae, where the very mention of the name Joshua Graham would be considered a capital offense. This, of course, only strengthened the myth of the burned man. Caesar would also send his frumentari to track down the burned man, but none that found him would return to Caesar. But not all of them completely failed in their mission. The Frumentarius Ulysses would lead a tribe known as the White Legs to sack New Canaan when Joshua was away, perhaps on a mission trip to establish relations with another tribe. Joshua and the bulk of the New Canaanites would flee north into Utah, specifically Zion Canyon, where they would meet the Sorrows and the Dead Horses, establishing a neighborly relationship with the two tribes as they prepared for the coming of the White Legs. And this is where the story of Honest Hearts officially begins. After setting off with the Happy Trails caravan, Jed Masterson gives a brief recount of the legend of the burnt man. Following this narration, the caravan has officially arrived at Zion Canyon, and it doesn't take long for things to take a violent turn. Immediately, the caravan is ambushed by the Whitelegs, a local tribe who possess a variety of weapons including machine guns, tomahawks, and various melee weapons including axes and even shish kebabs. We knew this was likely to happen prior to heading out of the Northern Passage, and as a player, one might think to themselves that this could play out a number of ways. Perhaps we could instruct the caravan company to lay low while we stealthily pick off the white legs. Or maybe we could find an alternate route that leads to an encounter with local fauna, such as the returning Yaogwai. However, that is simply not the case. This scenario can and only will ever play out one way. And that's with the entirety of the caravan, save for the courier, being killed off by the white legs. How do the developers ensure that this is always the case, I hear you ask? The last white leg that spawns is completely immune to all damage until they have finished off the caravan. So no matter what you do or how well you play or how quickly you destroy the white legs, it will not matter. This is pathetically cheap, and immediately detracts from the player's ability to get immersed. This is especially bad given that this is the very start of the DLC. 
Combine that with the issues I mentioned earlier about the NPCs in the Northern Passage, and already this DLC feels noticeably poorly manufactured. It's also embarrassingly easy to quite literally watch the White Leg spawn into the world as if the Thanos snap had just been undone. This whole intro is a mess. I'm fine with the generic mercs being killed off, like, whatever, but you gave me a character who seemed like she had genuine potential for some unique interactions. Not to mention Dave fucking Fenoy and this dumbass drug addict. Off the top of my head, I imagine Jed would have been great as a more sympathetic character that strives for peace and compromise, a major theme in Honest Heart's story. Or how about some more interactions with Stella? She could talk about her own experience with the Tribals and the goings-on of locations from the original Fallout games. What if Ricky got involved with the Sorrows and indulged in their drugs, allowing him some hilarious character moments not unlike what you'd expect from a game like Far Cry 3 while also developing in meaningful ways as he grows to care more for the tribe and the outcome of the conflict. Look, I get it, New Vegas had a limited budget, and the DLC is even more so. I'm sympathetic towards this personally, but that doesn't change the fact that you presented three potentially very interesting characters, then you just set them to be killed off in a way that is immersion-breaking to the point that it's actually cringeworthy. Hell, in Ricky's case, he can't even be found in the wasteland if you convince him to abandon the caravan. Once he's gone, he's gone from the game forever. This character could not possibly matter any less than he already does. He might as well not even exist. It's just mind-boggling to me, especially after them having just been completely invincible to all forms of damage. It makes these characters come off more as voiced assets than actual characters. And for a game as renowned for its characters and world as Fallout New Vegas, that is a shame. But anyways, the player proceeds across the bridge and it's here that they meet Follows Chalk, a dead horse tribal sent by Joshua to scout the land for White Legs. Follows Chalk is a great addition to Honest Hearts because he provides a window into how the dead horses perceive Joshua Graham. The dead horses aren't a warring tribe, but with Joshua's leadership keeping them strong and secured in the face of slaughter at the hands of the White Legs, it's easy to see how they would come to idolize him as they do. Follows Chalk is also just really enjoyable to listen to as he talks about the goings on of Zion. There's this adorable innocence in his perspective that you rarely see in the world of Fallout that really makes you wonder just how long such a thing can last, and if it's even worth preserving given the state of the world, but I'm gonna hold off on that for the time being. For now, I think it's time to call it a day. I hope you all enjoyed this introductory video and are looking forward to what's to come. Some of you may be wondering if I intend to cover all of New Vegas' expansions, and I'm excited to say with the release of this video that, yes, I intend to release videos on a regular basis, with the final part of the Lonesome Road review dropping on Christmas of this year. We've got one hell of a journey ahead of us, but I'm excited to see it through. But that I'll have to do for today. Thanks for watching. Hello my fellow Gentiles, and welcome to part 2 of my Honest Hearts review series. We've just entered Zion, and to say it's been a rocky start would be embarrassingly appropriate. Thankfully, what follows is pretty uphill for the most part, and it's not long before the player will be meeting the man himself, Joshua Graham. Joshua Graham is a fucking stellar character, and it only takes a handful of lines for him to grab one's attention. Knowing what we know about Joshua Graham, Caesar's Legion, and Legate Linnaeus from the base game, as well as what we've been told by Follows Chalk up to this point, one wouldn't be mistaken for thinking that the former Malpace Legate would be this absolute badass warrior of a character, and while he definitely is just that, the introduction to him as a person is somewhat surprising on a first playthrough. I am a new Canaanite. We believe we are the heirs of a spiritual tradition given to our ancestors thousands of years ago. We have made and kept covenants with our Lord God to honor his laws. In exchange, we are promised eternal salvation after this life. A day will come when our Lord returns to judge us all. Until then, we must honor his laws and start others along the path of salvation if we can. That's why we trade with others and work the tribes. We have more than food and medicine to offer. Good news is our most valuable commodity. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem, who said, Raise it, 
raise it even to the foundation. O daughter of Babylon, who art to be destroyed, happy shall he be that rewardeth thee as thou hast served us. Happy shall he be that taketh and dasheth thy little ones against the stones. Do you know what it means? I'm sure this is some sort of sin. Don't worry, God will forgive us. Joshua Graham, the legendary burned man of the Mojave that the Legion refuses to utter the name of, the man no frumentari has returned from, is in fact a good-hearted Bible thumper that merely wishes to live in peace, only killing in self-defense and looking after others. Talk about subversion of expectations. Though I have to admit that there is a certain irony to the fact that the guy who once helped lead a post-apocalyptic parody of the Roman Empire is now spreading the word of God to innocent and less developed tribes. Religion. Religion never changes. This opening dialogue with Joshua is spectacular because not only can the player respond to him a number of ways, but his responses are appropriate for his character. If the player is kind to Joshua, he'll reciprocate it in a way that's surprisingly gentle, and you can tell it's been a while since he's met someone outside the tribes of New Canaan that was so willing to help. If the player tells him to go fuck himself, he won't entirely reciprocate it, but he'll make it clear that he's unwilling to help the courier escape Zion. Joshua and the tribes have a lot on their plate, and they don't have time to help someone who won't do the same for them. He's not unreasonable about it, and it makes sense that he'd want to strike a deal with the courier given their predicament. It could be seen as opportunistic, but given the circumstances, I can't exactly blame him. Joshua and the Dead Horses, as well as the Sorrows and Daniel, have been backed into a corner by the White Legs, a tribe of what are essentially raiders with no real survival skills beyond combat and pillaging, a fact that the Legion has taken full advantage of. The White Legs are looking to be assimilated into the Legion, though their relationship with the Legion doesn't really get explored. What we do know is that they respect the Legion as the most powerful tribe east of Vegas, and the hunt for Joshua will land them a place amongst the football gear sporting LARPers, should they manage to capture him. I think the White Legs are a well-established faction and they fit well into the story, but unlike the base game of New Vegas where everything was so morally gray and up for debate when it came time to pick sides, Honest Hearts feels very lacking in moral complexity, and it's not as if they didn't try. The main conflict of Honest Hearts is about whether the new Canaanites should abandon Zion or stand their ground against the White Legs. Peace is not an option, but pacifism is, and I think there's a nugget of complexity in this theme, but it doesn't feel fully fleshed out. Joshua, unsurprisingly, wants to stand his ground alongside the Sorrows and the Dead Horses and purge Zion of the White Legs once and for all. Given Joshua's past experiences, and the love he holds for New Canaan and the more innocent tribes, as well as just how straight up evil the White Legs are, his position makes sense, and siding with him doesn't feel very morally dubious, even when he's executing the White Leg leader Salt Upon Wounds. Yeah, so there are definitely hints of the Malpace Legged that bubble up to the surface, but Joshua is still far from the monster of the East that is the Legged Linnaeus, and I won't condemn him for taking a bit of pleasure in finishing off the tribe that sought to murder both him and his fellow tribesmen after having burned his home to the ground. The other side of the coin is conveyed through Daniel, a new Canaanite who seeks to preserve the innocence of the dead horses and the sorrows by abandoning Zion alongside them. Daniel simply doesn't want to go to war, and he doesn't want to see any further bloodshed, and while I can very much sympathize with that, I mean, hey, it's war, what is it good for, he ultimately comes off as rather childish and almost willfully ignorant of the situation. Also, I just think it's funny that instead of coming up with a way of humanizing the White Legs, Obsidian opted entirely to play off the innocence of the Sorrows and the Dead Horses. Really just goes to show how lacking this entire conflict is, but... We'll get to that soon. Back to Daniel. I do think Daniel's heart is in the right place, and I think there is something to be said for the loss of innocence in a tribe that's managed for so long without being exposed to violence and conflict. I mean, two centuries is a long time to not have any conflict whatsoever. That's pretty impressive. But the hard truth is that the Sorrows can't avoid other factions until the end of time. Daniel's desire to avoid conflict is simply impossible to maintain forever. It's not a matter of if the Sorrows go to war with another tribe, it's a matter of when. If it's not the White Legs, it'll be some other tribe at some point. You just can't escape that. Once they abandon Zion, not only are they entering uncharted territory, but they remain in land primarily occupied by Caesar's Legion. 
the Legion will not show mercy on the Sorrows or the Dead Horses. If anything, Joshua Graham will always be a target on the backs of those tribes. And even beyond the Legion, this is a post-nuclear world. Raiders exist. Super mutants exist. Full-scale military organizations like the Brotherhood of Steel, the Enclave, and the New California Republic all exist. Daniel's desire to keep the Sorrows and Dead Horses from violence is a pipe dream that will only hinder them in the long run. Were it not for Joshua's leadership and teaching them in ways of self-defense, they would be captured and enslaved by the Legion in a matter of weeks following an exodus from Zion. Peace is not an option, and pacifism is far inferior to standing one's ground. Daniel is a good man, but he should never be put in a position of leadership above Joshua Graham. This conflict is just too black and white, and it's because of this that my investment in honest hearts so dimly pales in comparison to the passionate discussion that I could have over the war for New Vegas that occurs in the base game. Another point that Daniel doesn't even consider is what will happen to the White Legs should they fail to capture Joshua Graham. If they fail at their quest, Caesar will no doubt have them purged from the wasteland. Daniel claims to care even for the white legs, but he comes off with about as much sincerity as a preacher saying love the sinner, hate the sin. Daniel clearly does not care about the white legs, but even that potential character trait is left unexplored. He's just so bland. But alright, that's enough about the destination, what about the journey itself? How good is the main quest of Honest Hearts? Well, it, it ain't very good. One might think that missions to do with the faction war would have to do with calculated assaults on bases of operation where the player can go at it guns blazing or opt to take a stealthy approach. You could have some intense standoffs where every line of dialogue could be the difference between peace and war, so on and so forth. But as it turns out, Honest Hearts is primarily just fetch quests. You know what? You know, one of those things that the overwhelming majority of gamers hate, along with trailing missions and walking sections. I'm not going to pretend that these are any more fun than they are, because, well, they're not. These missions desperately hinge on the map of Zion itself being relatively interesting to explore alongside Follows Chalk and Waking Cloud of the Dead Horses and Sorrows respectively. Now I'll be the first to say, although some lines are heard a bit too much more than others, Bet they don't have anything as nasty as Yao Guai out where you come from, huh? Fuck off out there, will you? It is enjoyable to learn about Zion from these companions, and the map itself has some very good points going for it, but none of that really contributes to the main story, at least not very significantly. I love the story of the lone Zion Ranger, but the main quest is just so lacking in comparison to Dead Money. Dead Money may have had the player going a bit back and forth, but there was always a point to each of the objectives, and there were loads of smaller decisions that would add up both narratively and gameplay-wise. Here in Zion, it's literally just getting items that you'll never make use of again because they're not even real items. They're just key items that only exist to take up space in your miscellaneous tab until the quest is complete. There's an optional objective where the player can basically sack a white leg camp, but that's a single optional encounter that doesn't even last that long and it doesn't have any notable consequences. What's worse is that most other combat encounters just seem to occur at random. Sometimes you'll just stumble across a band of white legs and that'll be that. You just kill them and then you go about your day. They don't even offer up any new items or gear aside from a small handful that more or less function the same as many other archetypal gear found in the base game. It's fucking Something else I find utterly baffling is just how lacking this expansion is with its endings. Dead Money had loads of variables with its ending, with each character having multiple possible conclusions to their stories and even a couple of obscure endings. The number of endings to be seen in Honest Hearts, however, can be counted with one hand and there are very few variables that lead to different slides for the same ending. When it comes down to it, there are basically three endings. Fight back against the White Legs, help the Sorrows and Dead Horses retreat from Zion, or just commit genocide. As for the ending variables, there are a number of them that can lead to different slides and narrations in Honest Hearts epilogue, but calling them different feels really generous. There are about two to five different slides that play out for the various tribes and characters, and they're about what you would expect. 
The white legs have about five possible ending slides, but literally all of them see the white legs either being disbanded or wiped out. With the new Canaanites evacuated, the white legs don't get assimilated into the Legion. If you fight back, they die off. One thing that really surprised me though, was just how dark the writers seemed to think Joshua killing salt upon wounds really is. Letting Joshua execute him is played up as this horrific act of evil that scars every tribe involved and it's described multiple times as Joshua's darkest hour. It's honestly way too hyperbolic, and it completely ignores the fact that up to this point, Salt Upon Wounds has been established as this unforgivable monster. And it's not just the player only getting to see one side of it or something like that. We know that he has butchered, pillaged, and raped, and that he is dead set on being assimilated into Caesar's Legion. So forgive me if I'm not shedding a tear when this terrible person is finally seeing their past deeds catch up to them. It would have been one thing if, upon meeting him, he turned out to be completely unlike what he's been described as, with all of the legends surrounding him merely being hearsay. But no, he's just some shithead with a gun to his head who doesn't want to die. Quite frankly, I don't really know that many people who are keen on being executed, so yeah, I'm not really feeling sorry for the guy. On a positive note though, I appreciate the endings for both Waking Cloud and Follows Chalk. At some point during the Courier's travels with Follows Chalk, he'll ask if seeing the outside world beyond Zion is worth it, to which the Courier can either encourage or discourage him from leaving to go out and explore. Neither of his endings are made out to be good or bad, though there are potential pros and cons implied for both equally, and it was a nice way to round out his character. Waking Cloud's story has to do with the loss of her husband and the revelation that Daniel was keeping his death hidden from her. The Courier can either convince Waking Cloud that Daniel and the Sorrows were only doing what they thought was right for her, or the Courier can take her side and enable her bitterness. I can absolutely understand Waking Cloud's bitterness towards Daniel, but given that I'm above the age of 12, I don't really see much of a reason to make things worse between her and the Sorrows. Daniel meant well and just didn't know how to break the news to her, and I think that's something that anyone can sympathize with. I mean, really, who wants to tell a loved one that another loved one has died? Daniel's just a preacher, he's no soldier, and his position of influence over the Sorrows is a whole new world for him, so it makes sense that he would struggle with these kinds of dilemmas. But even though I feel this decision is pretty black and white, the story itself is really good. It was also interesting to see the Happy Trails caravan get their own ending slides. Two of the three endings see the company finding success with the new Canaanites, but there are definitely some hurdles they have to overcome if the tribes have evacuated Zion. The last ending slide for the Happy Trails Caravan Company is essentially what happens if the Courier decides to commit genocide on everyone in Zion. The Caravan Company abandons Zion and goes belly up. It does feel cut off from the main story given that the player's interactions with Happy Trails is locked to the opening minutes of the DLC. But I will say that I still appreciate that Obsidian wanted to give the group its own set of endings, regardless of how minor their involvement in the story truly was. However, there is one last, very critical flaw that does not sit well with me at all. Siding with either Joshua to wipe out the White Legs, or siding with Daniel and evacuating Zion, basically has no real consequences. If the Courier sides with Joshua and wipes out the White Legs, Daniel's like, uh, no, that's totally sucks. Okay, let's go do it. And if they side with Daniel and choose to retreat, Joshua's just kind of like, whatever. Hell, if the player straight up ignores the optional objectives in Daniel's Exodus quest, he'll be like, you didn't help anyone. They're gonna die. And then he just kind of shrugs it off and gives the player the map so that they can leave. Like, seriously? All right, so I'm willing to buy that either of them can be convinced to go with the other, but to do it so easily is just bafflingly uncharacteristic both of these characters and of New Vegas in general. In the base game, nothing is this simple, and there were some options the courier simply was not allowed. Take Mr. House and the Brotherhood of Steel, for instance. As many of you know, there was a plan for there to be content that allowed the player to convince House to spare the Brotherhood and form an alliance with them. However, for one reason or another, the content never made it into the final game. 
So as it stands, Mr. House refuses to align with the Brotherhood because he believes they are not a group that can be trusted, and they simply do not fit his mold of a future society. You might think that that sounds a bit ridiculous coming from the guy resting on the backs of tribes that engage in cannibalism, impersonate Elvis Presley, and a bunch of straight-up sexual deviants that are definitely not involved in any kind of human trafficking whatsoever, totally. But the thing to remember is that Mr. House has leverage over those tribes and he knows that he can coerce them into obeying the laws of New Vegas should they ever step out of line. House is not about to make a bet that he doesn't hold all the cards for, and this is something that he's managed to do with every other tribe around New Vegas for the past two plus centuries. The NCR is also extremely hesitant to align with the Brotherhood after their tango at Operation Sunburst, but it's actually possible to broker a truce between the two factions so long as a number of requirements have been met. I actually failed in a recent playthrough because I got Harden in the position of Elder above McNamara. Harden was willing to open the bunker to the outside world, and he seemed like a decent option to push the Brotherhood forward. McNamara, on the other hand, straight up acknowledges that his devout following of the Brotherhood code will lead to the death of the Mojave chapter, but he still follows the code regardless. So in my head, I was like, well, obviously Harden will be more willing to align with the NCR, but that was my mistake for not realizing just how militant and how proud Harden is. McNamara may be devout, but he's not opposed to an NCR alliance at a personal level. It's surprising how easy it is to make this truce a lost cause, and it helps to add to the depth of the conflict between these two factions. Honest Hearts completely lacks this kind of complexity, and it really detracts from how invested a player can potentially be in the story. After all this playtime of mine and having read every damn piece of lore that I can find, including content that didn't make it into the final cut of the game, I have surprisingly little that I can honestly tell you about the White Legs, the Dead Horses, and the Sorrows beyond what is presented at face value. It's a shame that the story of Honest Hearts is so lacking because I really think that Obsidian had a lot to work with here. You have Joshua Graham, one of the best and most interesting characters in the entire game, a tribal war where two of the tribes are quite innocent-minded, and the other is battle-hardened by its association with Caesar's Legion, and not to mention a setting that is completely new and unique to the world of Fallout. Honest Hearts could have been one hell of a story, but it's just so black and white that I can't help but wonder how things managed to become so simple. I get that Obsidian didn't have a lot of time with this DLC, but we got what we got, and what we got just don't got it. You get me? But I suppose that's all I have for today. I hope you all have been enjoying this series so far and are looking forward to part 3, where I'll be covering the general gameplay. I'll see you guys later. Have a blessed day. Today's video is going to be talking about the gameplay of Honest Hearts, but I'd be lying if I said that I felt like I had a great deal to talk about here as you've probably noticed by the length of the video. Honest Hearts does by far the least with New Vegas' gameplay compared to the other expansions. Dead Money contains a number of new mechanics as well as an added emphasis on survival. Old World Blues introduces loads of new enemies, perks, bosses, and even some uniquely designed dungeons. And finally, there's Lonesome Road, which is a brutally challenging gauntlet that only the toughest couriers will be able to endure. The primary enemy group encountered in Zion is none other than the White Legs, and they feel about as distinct from your typical fiends and raiders as Cool Ranch Smelter Demon does from its base game counterpart. White Legs are quite literally just reskinned raiders. Some use tomahawks, some use rifles, then you have the Storm Drummers that use the 45 caliber automatic. It's a cool gun, sure, but it hardly makes them stand out from your typical raider wielding an SMG. Okay, I've been holding out on drawing comparisons to Dead Money as much as possible up to this point, but seriously, what the fuck happened? Like, I understand that Obsidian wanted to play it a bit more safe after Dead Money's mixed reception and give us a more familiar to New Vegas style of expansion, but this for me is where Honest Hearts goes from bland to just fucking raw.
I spent probably three eternities going over how complex the ghost people of Dead Money were, as well as all of the work that went into devising the various environmental hazards that make Dead Money so dangerous and engaging, and while Honest Hearts has some caves to go through that at least have a little bit going on in terms of not only traps but lore findings, the caves are all very rinse repeat with nothing innovative to make note of. What's worse is that what little there is of note regarding the gameplay in Honest Hearts tends to to have their own sets of problems as well. Every now and then there will be an ambush by the white legs, and while the verticality of Zion can make positioning somewhat of an engaging factor, the absolutely buffoonish AI will see enemies either awkwardly straddling a ledge or just falling to their crippling death. And it doesn't even feel like this had to be a problem. In Dead Money, ghost people were spooked by the holograms, and their behaviors reflected that in simple but effective ways, such as how they would prioritize the holograms over the courier. The White Legs are fairly new to Zion, so wouldn't it have been interesting to see them specifically trying to avoid ledges, with their priorities being even surfaces? Not only would it make sense given the lore behind their faction, but it would make their combat encounters more functional and that extra wrinkle of complexity would be something that you could experiment with. At least a little bit. It just seems like a really simple fix that could have gone a long way. Honest Hearts does go a little bit outside the New Vegas box with its heavier focus on making use of the survival skills versus allowing the player to rely entirely on medicine, but the idea completely falls apart in practice. See, here's the thing. I play on hardcore mode, so food, sleep, and hydration are critical, and I'm constantly keeping track of those stats. However, when it comes to my actual health, I'm typically going to go to stem packs for healing as they're unmatched in their effectiveness, and they don't weigh a pound. Meaning that I can carry infinity billion of these things if the game actually let me. Honest Hearts having a weight limit for entry means that the player will only have so many items that they can take in, and on hardcore mode, this can make the process of preparing for the journey even more interesting as ammunition, food, and water all have their own weights. That's great, but stem packs not having any weight means that the player can bring in as many as they want, so the potential for having to survive entirely off the land itself is completely undercut right out the gate. The player can choose to go into Zion with only a handful of stim packs, or even none if they wanted some additional challenge, but that is a self-imposed challenge basically made for utilizing an underutilized design element. And credit where it's due, I don't even remember seeing stim packs in Zion, so the player will only be able to rely on what they brought in, but it just doesn't matter when I can stock up on a Google Plex of stim packs using the Sierra Madre vending machines and the Gunrunner's arsenal. And it's not even as if utilizing these things requires one to break the game or overly exploit some bad design element. Buy a lot of stim packs, go gamble in the casinos for a while with 10 luck, you'll be fine. What's more is that Honest Hearts isn't even a long DLC, so the necessity to survive doesn't even really come into play unless the player is just screwing around for way too long. I mean, you might take your time on a first run to explore and all that, but beyond the first playthrough there's very little need for killing so much time. Complete runs of the story alone can last anywhere from 1 to 3 hours, and since the enemies are going to be familiar to basically anyone who's even played the base game for half an hour, there isn't much straining the player's supply. The only thing about Honest Hearts that's going to cause any sort of strain on the player's supplies is the fact that you have to do so much walking for these fetch quests. Alright look, I don't expect New Vegas to be as engaging with its movement and traversal as Death Stranding, alright? Hell, I'm honestly completely fine as long as the jump, run, and turn work. But there are some frequent issues that really get in the way of my ability to navigate the map at an effective pace. I realize that sounds ironic given I just said that this DLC can last anywhere from 1 to 3 hours, but when so much of that time is literally just me walking to a location to pick up a couple of items, I think it's fair to say that it's not that engaging. The thing about the map of Zion is that it is chock fucking full of cliffs and plateaus and it becomes really frustrating just to follow a path when you have to circumnavigate an entire mass of land just to move forward 20 to 30 feet. Now look, the base game has its fair share of mountainous terrain that requires the player to step back and plot around it, such examples would include Jacobstown and Black Mountain, but those mountains always had a number of locations dotted around them that give the player more than enough to keep them engaged. Hell, the first act of the main story is basically one giant trek around Quarry Junction. I mean, you can go through it if you like, but uh, 
Uh, yeah, good luck with that one, mate. Honest Hearts just doesn't have this. The masses of land that jut from the Earth quite literally only exist to get in the way of the already monotonous fetch quests. So, in the end, the majority of one's playtime in Honest Hearts is likely to be spent navigating a frustrating environment, with the rest of the playtime being spent talking with characters and fighting reskinned raiders, pitifully weak animals in Yaogwai, which is a reused enemy from Fallout 3. This is incomprehensible to me as a fan of New Vegas. Look, I'll be the first to say that New Vegas has lots of issues when it comes to its core gameplay, but it consistently does a great job at taking the focus off the baser elements, which are pretty lacking, thanks to its use of secondary design elements such as the RPG mechanics, the map, character interactions, and so on. The map of New Vegas is outstanding, and it is littered with various events and side quests that help to ensure the player is always having something to do to keep them engaged. Even in its most isolated areas, the player can encounter a patrolling faction or a caravan. Something, anything to make them go, oh hey, let's check that out. Honest Heart simply lacks any systems to ensure that the player is engaged aside from the occasional ambush or maybe seeing a cave somewhere off the beaten path. This is not enough. And it really highlights just how many faults there are in the overall design of this expansion. Also, segue. If the player chooses to fight the White Legs, there's a fight in this narrow canyon that culminates in an optional fight with Salt Upon Wounds, who's about as distinct from the White Legs as Wolpus and Kulta is from any other Frumentari. If the player chooses to evacuate Zion, they basically just go from point A to B, occasionally fighting off White Legs, and occasionally stopping to save tribes of people that have been imprisoned, however that part is completely optional, and stealth technically makes the fights themselves optional, so really you're just going from point A to point B. You can even talk salt upon wounds into leaving you alone, which I mean hey, that part is kinda cool, but eh, I already kinda skipped so much. Do I really need to skip the final fight also? You know what, I'm gonna do that, I'm actually, I'm actually gonna do that. Teaming up with Joshua is really cool, albeit kinda bizarre given the context of the evacuation ending, but eh, yeah, whatever. Aside from having amazing stats, he might as well just be a reskin companion with a really cool gun. Though I will say, I do appreciate how trying to go through his inventory, cause, let's face it, we all want that gear, will result in him basically telling the courier to piss off. It's a nice attention to detail, but it's just not enough for me. If I'm being honest, you know, from the bottom of my heart, <laughs> this expansion is just a slog for me to play through, especially as many times as I have. I'm not about to shy away and put less work into this series than I did my Dead Money review, but goddamn have I considered it. But I'll spare you the rant and leave it at this. Honest Hearts has its strengths. I've had a lot of criticisms prior to even this video, but I also think that there's plenty to love about the DLC some of which I haven't even gotten to yet, and I feel as though I probably should stress that for those of you that really do enjoy this DLC, because there are great things to say about it. The gameplay, however, is not one of them. It's bland, monotonous, uninteresting, and the only thing it made me feel was sorrow in wishing that instead of all of this dull gameplay, we could have had so much more dialogue and narrative moments with Joshua, Daniel, Follows Chalk and Waking Cloud, and perhaps even Salt Upon Wounds had they bothered to even try and flesh out the white legs. Honest Hearts does have a couple of side quests though, which I'm going to be covering in the next video. So stay tuned if you're interested to hear what I have to say about the more secondary content on offer with this DLC. But for now, I really need a break. Thanks for watching. We've talked a lot about the main quest and general gameplay of Honest Hearts, but what about the side quests? Open world games would be nothing without a litany of side quests to keep the player occupied when they're not off saving the world. Zion is a decently sized map, and even has a pretty interesting unmarked quest involving one of Zion's first residents, and it's pretty damn impressive. I've always admired Fallout games for having unmarked quests that exist primarily to allow the player to indulge in their own curiosities of the world. I imagine one that many Fallout players have to be familiar with would be the Keller Family Refuge from Fallout 3, which involves finding a number of documents around the wasteland that allow access to a secret bunker hosting the game's most insane weapon, the Experimental MIRV, a fat man that fires eight mini-nukes at the same time. I remember having such a blast trying to find those documents, and not having it be a marked quest allowed for me as the player to become more immersed out of my own personal interest. This type of quest shows a certain confidence in the developers, and I'll always appreciate seeing them, even the smaller ones that offer very little in the ways of rewards. 
Honest Heart's most known unmarked quest involves scouting a number of caves throughout Zion that host these very small abandoned camps. At each of the camps will be a terminal with diary entries from a veteran of the pre-war US Armed Forces named Randall Clark. Just by examining the campsites, one can easily deduce that Clark was a hell of a survivalist, jury-rigging an impressive amount of traps to keep out potential intruders and maintaining a healthy amount of supplies at all times. The generally clever placement of these traps also allows the player to get a first-hand understanding of just how intelligent this man was when it came to survival. Clark's diary entries detail how exactly it was he managed to survive in Zion during the immediate aftermath of the Great War. But it's not just the sheer detail that went into telling how he survived that makes him such an interesting character. Within each of these diary entries are personal thoughts from Clark regarding various regrets involving his family that were impossible to see worked out. The man had no idea whether his family even survived, let alone what their final thoughts of him would be, and there wasn't a single thing that he could ever do to ensure that those issues would ever be resolved. Clark was a man living in regret and clearly suffered from the loneliness he faced following the dropping of the bombs. So Clark not only has a personal backstory that Obsidian put an impressive degree of thought and effort into, but he possesses a number of character traits that help to make him a sympathetic character, and it goes a long way in establishing a satisfying payoff for when the player finally does come across his corpse at the peak of Zion. This unmarked quest is brilliant, and it's easy to see why it's so commonly regarded by many players as one of the highlights of Honest Hearts. And then we have the rest of the side quests. What the frick are you guys doing? During the flight from Zion, the quest given by Daniel in the finale should the player choose to side with him, there are three optional side quests that involve helping the Sorrows and Dead Horses, specifically helping a group of them that have been captured by the White Legs and killing a group of White Legs on a bridge, and then killing another group at the Dead Horses Cemetery. Aside from an NPC that is extremely easy to overlook near the latter of those locations, these objectives are about as bare bones as it gets and offer next to nothing in terms of rewards or payoff aside from a decent amount of XP and Daniel saying, Thanks bro. Honestly, calling these objectives side quests is a real stretch, and I imagine the only reason they aren't just labeled optional objectives in the Flight from Zion quest is because all of the quest markers would make it way too confusing to try and find the primary objective for anyone not already familiar with the map. So if we're not counting those, there are really only about four side quests in Honest Hearts. One for each companion, one involving some big horners, and another involving a drug trip. Neither of the latter two are that good, and the former aren't really even side quests. Like, at all. Okay, full transparency, this expansion's side quests are about as low effort as it gets. So the first two side quests I just mentioned involve the companions follows Chalk and Waking Cloud. So remember how in the base game, after traveling so much with a companion, they'd pull you to the side and be like, Hey, Courier, I want to talk to you about a couple things. And that would lead into a whole quest involving them, some faction, and you as the Courier having to make a choice that would decide their fate. So imagine that, but literally the entirety of the quest begins and ends within a minute or two of dialogue. The player will be approached by either of the two, who will confide into the courier about an issue they've been struggling with. I've already covered what it is specifically that these two characters were struggling with, but for those in need of a refresher course, Follows Chalk is curious to see the world beyond Zion and the dead horses, and Waking Cloud is being lied to by Daniel about the death of her husband. I do like the writing behind these characters, and I appreciate them getting their own endings slides based on what the player tells them, but the fact that these are even considered side quests is really bizarre. So if we don't count those as side quests either, we really only have two. Thankfully they actually involve doing things, but they're about as bland as Long Dick Johnson's dick is long, and he's got a fucking long dick. <laughs> Hence the name. The first of these side quests involves moving a baby bighorner from one spot to another. Basically, the courier gets some fruit, feeds the baby bighorner, leads it across some cliffs, and that's pretty much it. I feel like Obsidian had this neat idea for a platforming focused side quest and then just kind of stopped the moment they found it remotely adequate. I can definitely see what they might have been shooting for here, but the end result is really unengaging. So you might be thinking to yourself, damn, these side quests sound really lazily put together, and normally I wouldn't encourage this type of criticism unless there was a particularly solid grounds for it. That being said, the last of these side quests really puts things into perspective, at least for me. 
The final side quest is called the Rite of Passage. The Sorrows have a shaman named Whitebird who, upon meeting, instructs the courier to go to a certain part of the map so that they can fight a Yaogwai spirit. The story goes that there was a Sorrows child who wandered into a Yaogwai's lair and was eaten, and the shaman believes that the child and the Yaogwai became one spirit. Also, for some reason, the shaman wants you to take a hefty amount of Datura, a drug found in the local flora of Zion. After taking the drugs, a color filter will be put on the screen that actually looks pretty nice. The motion blur is way too much, but I like the color that it adds. At this point, the player just needs to go to the designated spot on the map where they'll fight a flaming Yaogwai known as the Ghost of Shi. This quest might sound pretty cool. I mean, you take some drugs and kill a flaming Yaogwai, that's gotta count for something. But let's go back to Fallout 3's DLC, Point Lookout, for a moment. In Point Lookout, the Lone Wanderer takes a hit of that funky shroom, and you get this walkthrough of traumatic reminders of what all the Lone Wanderer has gone through with vault bobbleheads that talk down at you like you're some kind of pissant. There's really no gameplay, but there doesn't need to be because it has narrative significance and can add to the player's role-playing experience in whatever way that they can come up with. Guilt over past transgressions? Shame? Curiosity? Who knows? It's all up to the player, and it absolutely works. Could they have maybe done a bit more with it? Yeah, of course. But the creativity of the sequence helps it to stand out as a unique moment, not just in Fallout 3, but in all of Fallout. Now let's describe the Rite of Passage from Honest Hearts using actual dialogue from the game. Take drugs, kill a bear. Take drugs, kill a bear. Take drugs, kill a bear. Yeah. Yeah, that's basically it. But there's definitely more to it than that. For starters, how the fuck does this quest work? The courier is told to take a drug so that they can fight this Yagwai, but there's no explanation given as to why this drug is even necessary in the first place. Real-life Native Americans had a number of rituals and ceremonies that they would invoke in attempting to establish some form of contact with the spirit world. For example, in the late 1880s, when conditions were especially hard going on the reserves, the Paiutes introduced a ceremony known as the Ghost Dance. This ceremony began following the visions of a Paiute medicine man named Wavoka, which occurred during the eclipse of January 1st, 1889, which itself stems from a Paiute tradition that began in the 1870s following the visions of Grey Hair, who dreamt of a renewal of the earth and reintroduction of spirits into contemporary society. The ghost dance itself would occur every six weeks, and it involved the entirety of the tribe, where they would feast and dance for four consecutive nights and finally bathe in the nearby rivers at the dawn of the fifth day. What's more interesting, Wavoka resided in none other than Nevada. This tradition has a very clear and meaningful purpose, as well as an origin, and that's only one tradition that Obsidian could have drawn upon as influence for this rite of passage. Instead, the player just takes some drugs and fucks off to kill a bear. It's just so basic and uninteresting. It's a far cry from what one would expect from Fallout New Vegas. I can appreciate Honest Heart's attempt to go with a more traditional Fallout-style expansion with its new map to explore, and I appreciate Obsidian's attempt to make additional quests that don't really tie into the main story of that DLC, but in the end, what we're left with in Honest Hearts are three optional objectives in one of the final quests, two conversations, a brief walk with a baby bighorner, and take drugs, kill bear. I don't need every side quest in this expansion to be for all long sin or beyond the beef, but the oversimplicity of those found in Honest Hearts really detracts from the experience and fails to flesh out Zion as much as it could have. Hey, what's going on guys? Loveless here in post-editing, and uh, you know, now that I'm actually like listening back on this, it really annoys the piss out of me that the side quests in Honest Hearts are this bad. So, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and put about as much effort into this closing as Obsidian did with their side quests. This makes me so freaking mad! It's been a rather turbulent road through Zion so far, but we haven't taken much time to really soak in the land itself. Zion is a beautiful location. Sure, the graphics of New Vegas are, let's say, dated, but the contrast of the more reddish brown of the Rocky Canyon with the fresh water and greenery is a sight to behold after spending so much time in the Mojave Desert. I've always enjoyed the night sky of New Vegas, and how clear it is given the lack of any cities to cloak one's view. And Zion's night sky feels especially beautiful against its series of mountains and plateaus. 
I love how Zion looks aesthetically, and I think it goes without saying, but even a small handful of visual mods can make this place look downright gorgeous. The Gambrio engine gets a lot of flack, and rightfully so, but Obsidian did an excellent job at making something good with what little they were given. Obsidian are just really great when it comes to designing locations in general, and Zion's definitely no exception. Before the Great War, Zion was a national park, a place where one wouldn't find much in terms of buildings and structures, and I like how this translates to traversal and exploration because it makes every location that does host a building or structure feel like something of a landmark. I will admit though, with such a lack of man-made structures, Obsidian could only do so much with their environmental assets before they began to breach a level of consistency with their map. Thankfully, the map is very consistent, which helps to make the location feel more real, and this goes a long way in helping the player to get immersed. Unfortunately, this also makes for a fairly repetitive environment, and combining that with the amount of cliffs and plateaus that are impossible to traverse, this can make for a difficult time when it comes to navigating the terrain, as several locations look identical to one another. Credit where it's due though, Obsidian seems to have realized this, opting for a map design that helps to prevent the player from ever getting lost. The layout is pretty simple, with the center of the map serving as something of a reference point for every other location. North is where the Sorrows Camp is located, east the Dead Horses, west is where the Plane Crash is located, and south is where we first arrive in Zion. Just south of the Sorrows is a long river separating it from the rest of the map, and there are bridges connecting the center of the map to the east, west, and south. It's cleverly constructed, and even though I have a hard time personally with distinguishing certain locations, it's rarely difficult for me to get a sense of where I am, even without looking at the Pip-Boy. But what would a Fallout location be without a history for one to die? Dissect for hours on end. The valley belongs to God, but no. The dead horses live at Dead Horse Point, up the Colorado River. They came here because I asked them to. Before I returned to the fold, I visited them years earlier. I looked much different then, but I left an impression on them. I taught them how to hunt more efficiently, how to maintain their weapons and pre-war equipment. When I returned, they showed their appreciation. The Sorrows have many skilled hunters among them, but no warriors. They have not had to deal with war or raiders for decades. Even though they can hunt a full-grown Yaogwai, they don't know how to deal with the White Legs. That's why we're here. Zion is a really interesting location, being mostly untouched by pre-war civilization. Sure, it was a park and tourists would come and go, but I couldn't even tell you what the nearest city would be without resorting to Google Maps. It's the sort of pocket of nature that's bound to the fate of its residents. If the White Legs succeed in their war on the New Canaanites, it would undoubtedly be left barren, though not without potential to recover once the White Legs would have dissipated, which, as we covered, is inevitable regardless of their success. Should the Sorrows and Dead Horses remain in Zion, I'd imagine the land would remain quite preserved until a particular significant event occurs, causing a massive change in the landscape, something along the lines of a Legion invasion, or the arrival of the NCR, or even the Yonk or the Brotherhood. Zion is referenced as something of a paradise multiple times, and it's not at all hard to see why given its abundance of clean water. Zion is also quite isolated and difficult to reach. It's because of this that the Sorrows have managed to avoid conflict by living there since not long after the Great War, though not without some assistance from Randall Clark against foreign raiding parties. I already talked a bit about Randall in the previous video, but what I held off mentioning was his hand in shaping the Sorrows. Randall was a reclusive man and avoided direct contact with anyone else, save for a woman he rescued from certain death and eventually developed a relationship with before her untimely death. Randall's diary entries detail a number of visitors in Zion, including, but not limited to, the dwellers of Vault 22 and a large group of children whom Randall would lend aid to so that they could establish a home in Zion, eventually coming to be known as the Sorrows. Because of the indirect nature of Randall's assistance, the children would turn tales of him into legends of a guardian deity, otherwise known by the Sorrows as the Father in the Cave. Father in the... Oh, right. He's some spirit the Sorrows used to believe in. Watched over them from the caves in the valley. They marked some of the caves around here because they think they'll be punished for going inside. Between Vera Keys, Frederick Sinclair, and Randall Clark, New Vegas' DLCs have done one hell of a job at building completely unseen people into fully realized characters, and it goes a long way in making the world feel as real and immersible as it does. I just wish the same amount of work had gone into building on the lore of the dead horses. 
I like the dead horses overall. Their relationship with Joshua is particularly interesting, and there's a certain degree of tragedy to how quickly they take to war, but as far as history and lore goes, there really isn't that much to them. I get that sort of bound to occur with them being a fairly new tribe, but they almost felt out of place with just how little there is to say about them. The dead horses and the white legs aren't native to Zion, and their involvement is intrinsically tied to the Legion's conflict with Joshua, so it makes sense given the location and time that the Sorrows would have a much more extensive history, but I really would love to know more about the dead horses' origins and the full extent of the white legs' alliance with the Legion. I mentioned it in a previous part, but the lack of characterization for the white legs is a real shame because I feel like there's so much more that could have been done with them. We're talking about a young but very unintelligent tribe that's being used by one of the most prominent factions in Western America. There are so many stories that could have been told here. Salt Upon Wounds can be talked down in the Flight of Zion ending, but it doesn't really mean much and the consequences are practically non-existent. You know, aside from them inevitably being wiped out by the Legion for failing in their mission. What's worse is that he's the only named White Leg we ever meet, and he's the chief of the tribe, so for him to be so shallow is a real failure on the part of Obsidian here. It also seems like the link between Zion and the Happy Trails Caravan Company is grossly underutilized. You'd think being connected to New Reno, a location from Fallout 2, would make the role of Happy Trails so much more impactful, but aside from Joshua and Daniel saying they're sorry we got ambushed upon arriving in Zion, they're literally only mentioned at the beginning and the end of the DLC. How am I even expected to care about this subplot at that point? Even after the DLC is complete, there isn't a vendor that appears in the Northern Passage or in Zion to represent Happy Trails. You'd think that a vendor selling various items unique to the DLC like that amazing 45 caliber pistol as well as the SMG and its ammo would make sense, but that's just not the case. Something that really boggles my mind is the inclusion of Vault 22. In certain locations around Zion, the Venus flytraps and jolly green dwellers of the Vault 22 can be encountered, and as stated earlier, Randall Clark's diary entries mention the dwellers of Vault 22 arriving in Zion on a number of years following the Great War. We also know, thanks to the way Randall refers to them as coffers, that the Dwellers would have been carrying the spores of Vault 22's experiments, thus leading to the creation of those creatures in Zion. I think this is all fine, and it works narratively, but I seriously have to question how it is that the Dwellers of Vault 22 even made it to Zion, and let alone why Obsidian considered this something that they felt was worth telling in the first place. Honest Hearts is very clear that the journey from Vegas to Zion is a long and difficult trek, so how is it that of all the places the Vault Dwellers could have ended up, they wound up in Zion? I'm not even saying it's impossible, but there's a great amount of detail missing from this bit of lore, and the implications of it are completely ignored. The experiments of Vault 22 are legitimately terrifying and have the potential to completely overrun the Mojave if left unchecked for too many years. Zion is especially vulnerable given the clean rivers its residents so heavily rely on and the lack of sophisticated medical practices that could even combat the spores. This feels like a plot point that they really wanted to include but didn't bother to flesh out. I can only guess for the sake of making it feel more interconnected with the Mojave, but they didn't even need to given the significance of Caesar's Legion in the main story of Honest Hearts, so in the end I'm just sitting here scratching my chin wondering what the hell these things from Vault 22 are even doing here. It just feels like there's so much missing in Honest Hearts, and it doesn't really make any sense to me given how stellar Dead Money was with its world building. The history of the Sierra Madre is littered with complications and little details, and while it certainly has its fair share of missing pieces and unsolved mysteries, it never felt like an incomplete work. Honest Hearts is just so lacking when it comes to the finer details, and while I think there's a fair amount of positives that help to make the experience, there's just so much missing that it becomes extremely difficult for me to become as immersed and invested as I was with Dead Money. In the end, I think Honest Heart's world building is overall pretty mediocre, with several very critical plot points feeling like they should have been way more fleshed out than they were, like the White Legs and the remnants of Vault 22. But others feel really well done and thought out, such as the Sorrows who feel like they have a complete enough history that helps to understand and sympathize with them more, thus become more invested in the plot, even if the main quest is primarily just stupid fetch missions. I'm going to be going into a more in-depth breakdown of Honest Hearts as a whole in the next and final part of this series, so I hope you all are looking forward to that. Thank you all so much again for watching, and I'll see you next time.
Hello, my fellow Gentiles, and welcome to the finale of my review series for Fallout New Vegas' second story expansion, Honest Hearts. This review series has been something of a turbulent road, and to say that I've had a number of issues with this expansion would be something of an understatement. If I haven't made it clear by this point, let me just say that I love Fallout New Vegas. I think it's the single best written game the West has ever produced, with a world, characters, and history that are endlessly engrossing, not once hesitating to use this rich and complex world to ask even more complicated questions that remain relevant to the real world over a decade after the game was released. New Vegas is a landmark title in video games that deserves every bit of craze that it's ever gotten. That being said, Honest Hearts is easily the single weakest aspect of New Vegas by a significant margin. I understand that there are some people who adore this expansion, and I definitely think it has some major positives going for it, the most significant being Joshua Graham, who is easily one of the most fascinating characters in the entirety of Fallout New Vegas' roster, right up there with Mr. House, Ulysses, Edward Sallow, and Frederick Sinclair. Joshua is one of the most brilliantly subversive characters that I think I've ever even seen in fiction. For the entirety of the base game, you catch wind of these legends of a burned man that Caesar has forbade his legion from even uttering the name of. Ah, uh, yes. We are forbidden from speaking his true name. He was a shaman of some kind before he met Kaisar, a holy man from out of the Utah. The burned man proved dangerous, unpredictable and impossible to kill. He helped Kaisar form the Legion, but almost led it to destruction. The Burned Man was Kaisar's advisor and general when the Legion was originally formed. The Burned Man led us to a disastrous defeat at the dam. On Kaisar's orders, the Burned Man was covered in pitch by the Praetorian Guard, lit on fire, and cast into the Grand Canyon. Kaisar has forbidden us from ever speaking his true name again. And so we simply refer to him as the Burned Man. He's made out to be this complete and utter monster of a character, but upon meeting him, you see a man covered in bandages that preaches the gospel every chance he's given. One would be forgiven for thinking at this point that he himself can and will no longer fight, at least to the extent that he did when commanding Caesar's legion as the Malpace legate. Joshua is complex, desiring a life of peace, but seeing war as a necessity for maintaining that peace. His past still haunts him both physically and mentally, and they will for all of time. And the man has endured more than most ever could imagine. You are kind to offer, but no. There's nothing you can do. We don't use chems. But I learned long ago that I'm immune to their effects. It never stops burning. My skin. Every day I have to unwind the bandages and replace them with fresh ones. Exposing my body to the air is like living through it again. But it's better to be clean than comfortable. But he's no saint either. We warned you at Syracuse. And you persisted. You took advantage of us at New Canaan to drive us out. And like the dogs of Caesar you are, you followed us to Zion. And now you stand on holy ground, a temple to God's glory on Earth. The only use for an animal in our temple is sacrifice. Kale Wachene conserva O. You understand me, don't you? Don't you? Then there are the Sorrows, a tribe that have been lucky enough to experience multiple generations of peaceful living and now are being forced to face their first true conflict. I said in one of the previous videos that I think Joshua Graham is absolutely right in teaching them how to defend themselves, but that doesn't mean that there isn't a sense of tragedy in the loss of their proverbial innocence. I do. A fine husband and three children. I miss them each day, but I take comfort in knowing they are safe. When we learned that Salt Upon Wounds had defiled Zion with his presence, Daniel ordered the children, the old, and the sick evacuated from the camp. My husband volunteered to lead the hunters that went with them for protection. I try not to worry about them, but we have had no news for so long, and Daniel seems sad when I ask him about it. Sad and... A little frightened. What? No. You must be mistaken. 
Daniel would have told me. How? How dare he? What gives him the right? I thought Daniel was my friend, but he cares nothing for the sorrows. About Daniel? I don't yet know. But I am a woman of the sorrows, and I will have restitution for my husband. Just talking to Waking Cloud about the loss of her husband is enough to make one ponder the tragedy that is their role within the conflict. And even with Joshua looking after them, the endings make it clear that this conflict will have an everlasting effect on the tribe. It's one thing to see war, but it's another to see it for the first time. And I think Honest Hearts does a really good job at putting this into perspective. Conflict is inevitable, but that doesn't make it any less unpleasant. But for every Joshua, there is assault upon wounds. Going into this DLC for the first time in so long, I was really excited to see what I could learn about Zion, and I was disappointed in a number of its aspects. I appreciate the dynamic of the dead horses and Joshua, but the lack of any real compelling backstory for the dead horses makes it really difficult to care about them to the same extent that I do the sorrows. I like Follow's Chalk, and I think his sense of curiosity is a great platform for his character work. I also love that his curiosity came about from an encounter with a wandering musician who prompted Follow's Chalk to wonder about a world where a man can make a living just off of performing. I like Follow's Chalk, but there's just not that much to get into and dissect when it comes to him or the dead horses. But even they cannot compare to the White Legs when it comes to how little there is to talk about. The White Legs do become a bit more fleshed out in the Lonesome Road expansion where Ulysses describes how he managed to align them with the Legion, but that's two whole expansions from now, and even then I wouldn't say this makes them that complex so much as it gives them a history. I can appreciate that, but there's still just a bunch of rapists, pillagers, and murderers with no real survival skills that are poised to die out in a matter of years, if not months. I think Salt Upon Wounds really exemplifies everything I find wrong with the White Legs and even Honest Hearts as a whole. Daniel tries telling the player that even the White Legs deserve mercy and prayer, and the game tries to establish some degree of sympathy for Salt Upon Wounds in Joshua's ending where Joshua intends to execute him, but it feels more like character work for Joshua than it does for Salt Upon Wounds. I get that letting Joshua indulge in his more sadistic tendencies can be harmful to his character, but I don't have much of a sense as to what Salt Upon Wounds' execution means for himself, or even for the White Legs aside from him just being dead. I don't know what Salt Upon Wounds is like as a leader outside of being the strongest of the White Legs. What character traits do I have to latch onto as the neutral party? For Salt Upon Wounds, the answer really is none. But Honest Heart's failures aren't just limited to the writing and world building. Gameplay is always going to be something of a hurdle for New Vegas, even when it's been heavily modded, but it's on the developers to use what systems they have to create engaging scenarios. Dead Money tackled this brilliantly with its emphasis on survival in a brutally difficult environment that forced the player to seriously consider each of their options. The closest that Honest Hearts really gets to trying anything fresh is the Ghost of She and walking a baby big corner across some elevated rocks. Not exactly what I would call a step up. And then there's the general frustrations, like dealing with all of the cliffs and plateaus that make traversal more of a pain than it needs to be. Combine that with the samey environments that lack any notable locations and those that do also feeling very samey, such as the caves, and what you ultimately have is a map that, while having some pluses going for it, is ultimately not very enjoyable to explore, which is one of, if not the most significant perks to having an open world setting. Obsidian had an opportunity to add so much more to New Vegas' map, but what we got from Honest Hearts feels more like a shallow leftover than a whole new body of water. Personally speaking, playing through this expansion as many times as I have recently for this video was a real slog, and bear in mind this DLC can be completed in a matter of 10 minutes. All you have to do is go straight to the Sorrows Camp, kill Daniel, grab the map, and leave. In fact, that brings me to what is probably my very last issue with this DLC. I do want to make it clear that I really like that there's this sort of secret speedrunning strat to finishing this DLC. 
I think it's a fun little option for people not looking to do that serious of a playthrough. It's a really cool plus. However, there's no way to access the map prior to the final story quest of Honest Hearts without killing someone and initiating the quest Chaos in Zion. How cool would it be to just be able to grab the map and leave without having done a thing, thus initiating a whole new ending that gives a natural outcome to the conflict in Zion, one where the courier never interfered? It really feels like a missed opportunity. And I really think that's about how I would summarize Honest Hearts. A lot of missed opportunities. It's a real shame too, because what is good in Honest Hearts is really damn good. Joshua is fucking amazing, alright? Seriously, I can't gush about this character enough. But the expansion as a whole lacks a solid foundation, and as strong as Joshua Graham may be, even he cannot carry this DLC on his back. Honest Hearts may be a beautiful and honest story about the tragedy of the loss of innocence and how war and violence affects people and cultures, but it lacks the heart to elevate it to the level of dead money both with its narrative and with its gameplay. For those of you watching that really love Honest Hearts, I totally get why you do. Like I said, there are things to like about it, and there are some really damn good things to like about it. But if we're being objective, overall, this DLC is extremely lacking. But hey, if you think I'm wrong, feel free to tell me, man. Leave a comment. Let me know. I know that someone's going to want to argue about this, so I mean, hey, I might, I might as well welcome it, you know? I really appreciate all of you watching. I hope those of you that like Honest Hearts aren't too upset with me, and that whether or not you did, you learned something new from this series. These videos have been a lot of fun to make, and I can't wait to put out more. If you'd like to chat with me personally, as well as others who are interested in the media I discuss, hop on over to the Sierra Madre Discord server. But I suppose that's all I've got for today. I'll see you all at the Big Empty. Old World Blues. This has to be one of the weirdest and yet most beloved DLCs in all of Fallout. Old World Blues did a lot right, both for hardcore fans like myself who love Dead Money for the more unique design choices, and the more casual fans who enjoyed the more standard approach of Honest Hearts with its open map design. No doubt Old World Blue struck a chord with Fallout fans of all kinds, and I can easily see why it's the favorite New Vegas expansion for so many players. So with that said, how good is Old World Blues, really? It's not uncommon for something beloved to grow less popular as the audience begins to take a more critical eye to it. Hell, just look at the reception of Bioshock Infinite when it first released compared to how it's often regarded now. It's reasons like this that I've been so excited to review this DLC. No doubt a lot of you watching will have strong thoughts regarding this DLC, and I'm sure that some of what I have to say will get me some heat, much more so than what I got with Honest Hearts. Probably. Like with Honest Hearts, I went into this expansion with all the characters I made for the Dead Money review, this time starting at level 40 as that was the level cap for players with Dead Money and Honest Hearts. At this point, each of these builds is pretty well put together, which is good because boy oh boy, Boy, does this DLC ramp up the difficulty, or at least the enemy health. And of course, like with the previous two reviews, the only mods I have installed are basic fixes like the 4GB patch, anti-stutter, and so on. This DLC, like those before and that which will follow, starts off with a sudden appearance of a quest marker on the Pip-Boy. There's also a mysterious broadcast playing some nice vintage tunes, but that's about the extent of it. There's definitely nowhere near as much of an incentive to check out this spot, which makes sense for story reasons, but definitely lacks the immediate appeal and grip that Dead Money and Honest Hearts offered with the Sierra Madre and Happy Trails Caravan broadcast respectively. Upon arriving at the drive-in at midnight, a creepy eye can be seen projecting from a mysterious device which, upon being interacted with, will initiate the cutscene that precedes Old World Blues. In the years before the Great War, Big Mountain had been the home to the brightest minds of the 21st century. Scientists of vision were drawn to the facility to tackle the greatest technological challenges of the era. They sought to create a new world, fueled by technology for the benefit of all mankind. Sonic emitters, space-age alloys, DNA hybridization, force field particle research, Autodoc advances in cranial, cardiac, and trauma surgery. The hopes and dreams of a century became realities in the electronic forges of Big Mountain. 
The nucleus of this research was the dome. A huge stone facility that held the labs of every science known to man. It was a think tank where no problem could not be solved, where no question could not be answered. The Great War brought a new energy to Big Mountain and its scientists. Although sheltered from the front lines, the scientists waged their own war fighting their battles at the atomic level. Equations and calculations marched endlessly across chalkboards and computer terminals toward one solution, winning the war. For years, the minds and computers of Big Mountain were a blaze of trajectories, weapon schematics, and nuclear theories. The problems began to outpace the solutions, first geometrically, then exponentially. As the war escalated, so did the questions. On the night of October 23rd, 2077, the scientists received an answer that put all their questions to rest. In the aftermath, Big Mountain's silent experiments went to sleep, their creators slowly dying in the new world that had been left behind. And the great stone in the middle of the Big Empty lay untouched, filled with countless technological wonders. Wonders that, in the end, had been answers to the wrong question. I think what makes this cutscene so interesting, and perhaps even a bit lacking compared to those that start Dead Money and Honest Hearts, is that this DLC is taking us to a location that's only been teased in Dead Money, whereas Dead Money and Honest Hearts had to do with plot threads teased in the base game. Admittedly, this makes it very difficult for the writers of Old World Blues to grip the audience to the same extent as its predecessors, but I do think they did an alright job with what they had to work with. I say alright because there are certainly issues in the opening half hour, but we'll get to those soon. The cutscene here introduces the player to the land of Big Mountain, a place full of wondrous technology, the likes of which exceeded what people understood were even possible even in Fallout's highly advanced pre-war age. Being that so few people in the post-nuclear world are even aware of the existence of the Big Empty, and Father Elijah mentions in Dead Money the sheer wonder of the technology there, the player can infer that this must be quite the treasure trove for any wastelander, and while that's certainly true to an extent, it won't be long after we arrive there that it'll be made quickly apparent why no one has managed to return. The courier then awakens in a patient gown overseeing a balcony, definitely not where one would expect to wake up given that there's a room with a bed right next to us, but I suppose I'll leave that one be. There's a force field preventing the player from escaping off the balcony, and only one door to enter. Inside is a pretty nice area with a bedroom, some fancy technology, a small farm, workbenches, and a variety of devices that are currently inoperable. It's a pretty nice living space, all things considered, downright incredible by Wasteland standards. Across from the door going to the balcony, there are two more doors, one of which is currently inaccessible, meaning that there's only one way to go. And this is where the real Old World Blues begins. Behind this door is a small room leading into a massive chamber full of screens and all kinds of techno-whatevers that a layman such as myself couldn't even begin to fathom the purpose for. Most notable, of course, is a line of brains with computer screens depicting eyes and lips attached to the various suspended vats that they reside in. Definitely one of the more bizarre and punfully intended jarring visuals in any Fallout game. Approaching the Brains initiates a conversation with one Dr. Klein, a somewhat aggressive individual who appears to be the head honcho of this collective. What follows is a half-hour conversation, no I am not joking, full of exposition, humor, and a couple of speech checks. Alright, before we get into all of this, I'm gonna lay down some issues I got with this introduction. Dead Money and Honest Hearts struck a good balance with the pacing of their openings that I feel Old World Blues is sorely lacking. Both had radio broadcasts to offer a basic introduction to the story premise. Both started off with a fair amount of dialogue expositing about where the courier was or was headed, and could even be cut short with dialogue choices. Old World Blues gives the player nothing going in, brings them to a location with no idea of what's going on, and throws an unfocused half-hour of conversation at them. 
To call this pacing horrendous would be putting it very mildly. There's also the issue of the dialogue system itself. Prior to Fallout 4, Fallout dialogue was only ever fixated on one character at a time, making any sort of interaction with multiple characters at once basically impossible without some rather jarring cuts. For the most part, Fallout 3 and New Vegas both handled this pretty well, making it a point to avoid those types of scenarios. Here in Big Mountain, however, the player talks to all five of the brains at once, and not only does the camera not jump from one brain to another, instead always focusing on Klein, but the name at the top right doesn't even indicate which of the brains is speaking at a time. It just stays on Dr. Klein. Alright, so the camera not moving is bizarre because they do the exact thing when Mobius interrupts, but also, you can change text on the screen. So just do that, but over here. I suppose to their credit, Obsidian tried to work around this by stylizing the dialogue text to fit specific brains, which can help. Dr. Klein is in all caps. Dr. Boros has specific words fully capitalized with hyphens bookending his text blocks. Dala, being a woman, has the most unique voice of the four that can speak, so she just gets regular text. Dr. O has asterisks bookending his text. And Dr. 8 is just completely unintelligible, with text that's just random assortments of symbols. No doubt he's speaking an ancient and forbidden dialect that would melt our brains should we try to even comprehend a syllable of it. So I'm just gonna leave him be. Unfortunately for people just starting this DLC, the quirks Obsidian opted for in distinguishing the brains aren't going to be immediately clear. To my knowledge, Fallout's never really done this kind of playing around with text before, so it's not something a typical player can just immediately be expected to pick up on. I won't disrespect the intelligence of people and assume that everyone failed to catch on, but I know I did when I first started, and were I not so familiar with this content, I'd probably still struggle with it to some extent. Now, this isn't the most egregious issue in the game, but it's definitely exacerbated by the sheer length of the dialogue and just how much ground it seems to be trying to cover. I say seems to be because, in actuality, the player is being told where they are, what the situation is, how they can fix it, and perhaps getting additional help from the brains should they pass some speech checks. New Vegas isn't typically this long-winded. Sure, Caesar and House like to hear themselves talk, but even they aren't about to just waste your time. In fact, they get pretty annoyed if you try to do just that. Hell, the first minute or so of this exchange is the brains basically ignoring the courier. They don't even establish a proper conversation with the courier until five minutes into the conversation. Being condescending is one thing. Elijah and Dean Domino were exemplars of the deferring ends of that spectrum, with the former being a malicious prick and the latter just being a snarky but not unreasonable cunt. But the brains just dilly-dally for far too long and it makes the humor come off as very try-hard the more you hear it. Sometimes they stick it. After that, the brain lost itself. Not in the metaphysical sense. I'd have gotten flushed into one of the pipes. Actually, that's pretty likely. If so, it was flushed all the way to Mobius. Flush! That is the sound of flushing. Others, not so much. Oh, I don't think so. Wait. What is he doing? I think he's sunjaculating into the gun, getting it warmed up. Ding! Turkey's done. You give it to the lobotomite. I'm not touching that thing. Oh, I don't think so. I'll do it if you two are going to be ashamed of your own technological needs. Let me give it a little sonic sterilization first. Ooh. All right, all antibacterial fresh. And believe me, I recognize the irony in me saying that this dialogue is long-winded given my track record as a long boy, but at least I make a concerted effort to only say what I feel needs to be said and occasionally just because I want to. Otherwise, these DLC review series would be several videos longer, and the DMC video would have also tackled the shit gameplay and been at least two and a half hours long. Same with the Last of Us 2 video, by the way. And the Demon Souls video that I'm working on would have also included a probably multi-hour rant about Elden Ring and how dimly it pales in comparison to Demon Souls, Bloodborne, Dark Souls, and Dark Souls 3. 
so you're welcome. This conversation also has some major fucking bombshells in it that leave most players saying, I'm sorry, what the fuck? Which can make it really difficult to focus on other subjects over the period of time this conversation takes place. Sorry for the attention deficit, but I find it a bit difficult to listen to these idiots ramble on about pylons and other sciences in the Forbidden Zone when I've just been nonchalantly told that my brain, spine, and heart have all been removed. Add to that the amount of humor that's being incorporated into this scene, and the whole thing becomes really difficult to keep track of. Alright, so here's the rundown. The courier was teleported, I think, by the device at the Mojave Drive-In. And it's here that Dr. Dalla used the autodock in the sink, the nice little area upstairs, to remove the courier's brain, spine, and heart, replacing them with devices that serve as cybernetic substitutes. This is a procedure that has been performed on numerous wastelanders over an unknown length of time. At some point following the brain extraction, Dr. Mobius, a scientist in another part of the Big Empty, gained access to the think tank and brought the courier's brain to the Forbidden Zone, where Mobius resides. The courier needs to gather technology for the scientists of the think tank, a sonic emitter and an upgrade that runs on a specific frequency, a transmitter antenna that accelerates and focuses brain waves, and a stealth suit fitted with AI as well as body-altering capabilities, though the true purpose of the acquisition of these items is currently unknown, which makes it difficult to feel at all engaged with what is ultimately just a fetch quest opening the DLC. When pressed about it, the brains basically tell the player, shut the fuck up, we don't need to tell you. Which, not gonna lie, it's kind of a weak cop-out. If their intentions were pure, they wouldn't care to tell us, but if they were malicious, you'd think they'd at least try to mislead the courier. Hell, it'd probably be more effective on a comedic level to see them stammer to come up with some smart-sounding explanation. Couriers with high intelligence could call them out, and that's when the brains would just say, Oh, shut up, go do what we told you if you want to get out of here. Couriers with low intelligence could just marvel at the nonsense in an even more comedic way. Alright, so, elephant in the room, brain removal. I feel like there's an understood rule in fiction that the more significant or distinct a plot element is, the more elaboration and focus it's gonna need. For instance, the mass relays of Mass Effect are colossal machines that allow for travel throughout the galaxy, enabling the very possibility of Mass Effect's world to exist as it does. The mass relays are crucial to the plot of Mass Effect in each of the games. In the first game, the very first thing we see happen is a jump through a mass relay. And from the opening minutes to the story's conclusion, their significance is constantly being referenced by the characters, with one of the most pivotal scenes in the game having the secondary antagonist reveal that the Reapers actually created the mass relays so as to accelerate and manipulate the very way galactic civilization would evolve between the 50,000 year cycles of extinction, giving the Reapers an enormous advantage when the time of their invasion would arrive. The finale of the game also centers around the Citadel being a super mass relay and and the use of a smaller mass relay in order to reach it in time. In Mass Effect 2, the entire plot revolves around trying to make the jump through an anomalous relay so as to destroy the enemy faction. The Arrival DLC of Mass Effect 2 focuses on the Reapers trying to use the Alpha Relay at the edge of the Milky Way galaxy. That way they'll have near instant access to the majority of the galaxy, rather than having to slowly traverse the galaxy one system at a time from dark space. It was basically their contingency, should the Citadel plan with Sovereign not work out. In Mass Effect 3, the Reapers use the Relays to dominate one solar system at a time in a drawn out but still completely one-sided invasion. In Mass Effect Andromeda, the lack of Mass relays prevents travel beyond the Helios Cluster, allowing the Milky Way pioneers, and thus the players, a chance to get a more focused introduction to what Andromeda has to offer, all the while establishing building blocks for the story to expand upon in follow-up titles that unfortunately might never happen because the development of Andromeda was botched harder than CM Punk's buckshots. Probably doesn't help that the conversation surrounding the game was more polluted than the fucking Ganges River. Anyways, going back to New Vegas, the game opens with the courier being shot in the damn head, dug up, and resuscitated. This is an extremely unlikely scenario, but not completely outside the realm of possibility, and it's constantly acknowledged throughout the game as something that was absurdly improbable to survive. Not only that, but it helps to establish the Courier as a force to be fucking reckoned with, adding to the believability of everything the Courier accomplishes throughout the New Vegas story. So here we are in Old World Blues, and it's been established that the Courier's brain, heart, and spine were removed during a 
super advanced surgical procedure, and to their credit, Obsidian does provide some explanation of how the operation went. Following the removal of the courier's brain, their organs went on the fritz, as is to be expected in the absence of one's brain. So Dr. Dollar replaced the spine and heart with devices that would compensate and keep the other organs in check. You might be wondering how it is that the courier is able to walk around and talk as if all was normal. The answer? Tesla coils! So apparently Tesla coils put in the courier's head allow for a maintained connection to the brain, despite it being on the other side of Big Mountain and not physically connected to the rest of our body. Uh-huh. To say this begs several questions would be underselling it, but I'm gonna leave that alone until we've reached the necessary point in the story that we can properly dissect it. But for now, I can say with confidence that this is extremely jarring. I'm gonna be completely transparent here. This intro is bad. Yes, it establishes the tone of Old World Blues pretty effectively, with its blend of over-the-top, wacky sci-fi shenanigans and underplay darker elements. But it's severely marred by some of the worst story pacing to be found in New Vegas, an extremely long and unnecessarily convoluted opening dialogue, unclear stakes, and a vague plan of action. In Dead Money, the stakes were very clear, with all pertinent information being made clear to the player, and the dialogue could be anywhere from a couple of minutes to 20 minutes, depending on what the player felt like asking about. For all of its problems, Honest Heart's opening effectively establishes the conflict the courier is about to find themselves amidst, and just about anyone interested in the goings-on of Caesar's Legion will be glued to their seat the moment they meet or even hear about Joshua Graham, which won't take long. Old World Blues just doesn't seem to have any idea how to properly grip the audience, and its efforts come off as very scrambled, lacking the focus that made its predecessor so effectively engaging. Now, I know this probably sounded extremely negative, but worry not, we've got plenty more to cover with Old World Blues, and the review is still young. Once again, and as always, I appreciate your support and hope that you're looking forward to what's to come. As divisive as it may be, I think this is going to be one of the more enjoyable dissections I've done of a New Vegas DLC, and I hope my content reflects the enjoyment that I've had in doing so. But that's all I've got for today. I'll see you again soon. Today we're going to be covering the gameplay of Old World Blues, and so far this has been one of the more interesting sections for me with my previous DLC reviews. Dead Money had a lot going on with its gameplay, to the point that I had to use a completely different format with that review series, dedicating a whole video to the combat and covering the more environmental and tertiary aspects throughout the adventure. Meanwhile, there was so little to say about Honest Hearts that I reconsidered even making the gameplay section its own video to begin with. Also, I'm just now realizing that I've switched the gameplay play and main quest parts in this series from how I had it with Honest Hearts. You will never be able to unlearn this. Gameplay is a fickle thing in New Vegas. The game fluctuates from having so much to so little to say depending on what exactly it is that's being analyzed, and the overall quality is a mixed bag of extremes, from stellar RPG mechanics and clever design choices to downright archaic combat systems that leave a lot to be desired. Old World Blues is very much in a similar ship in that certain aspects of it stand out is pretty damn good, while others, well, we'll get to that. Starting out with what might be the single best facet of the gameplay, the variety and quality of the loot puts all three of the other expansions to absolute shame. Dead Money had some really cool gear, from the unique assassin suit to the common but still incredibly useful police pistol. Honest Hearts mixing quality is exemplified in the armor, from the pathetically unlikable armors of the different tribes to the unique and utterly kick-ass ranger set that can be found in one of Randall Clark's campsites, and not to mention Joshua Graham's outfit. Lonesome Road has some pretty badass gear, such as the Rocket's Red Glare and the unique Riot Gear variant of the Ranger armor, but it's also pretty limited, not offering quite as much as Dead Money in regards to the more basic weaponry. Though I suppose in fairness, Lonesome Road is meant to be an endgame gauntlet for only the toughest couriers, but we can't talk about that yet. Old World Blues, on the other hand, has a lot to offer in terms of loot with a wide variety not only mechanically but aesthetically. Let's say you're a melee and unarmed focused courier. I'm going ahead and lumping them both together, since most players are going to be extremely high level by the time they reach this DLC. That is, assuming they're playing them in order. There's the Saturnite Fist, a variant of the Power Glove which can be heated up using the world's angriest toaster to deal bonus damage resulting in the world's hottest and most painful fisting imaginable. There's the Antenna Array for those of you looking to go full Unga Bunga, the Proton Axe which might just be the most badass melee weapon in all of Fallout, and the Scientist Glove. It's 
literally just a glove. That is the joke. There's also a baker's dozen of energy weapons to find throughout Big Mountain, including a sonic emitter which can be modified to have a variety of effects, and even a variant of the Tesla cannon for those looking to make a big splash. But for those with a less sophisticated palette, rejoice, for we have the K9000, a machine gun with a dog brain connected to it, and even a damn voice box that will growl at the presence of enemies. Oh, what's that? The dog's gun is just not good enough for you? Alright, asshole. How about a variant of the sniper rifle? once belonging to Christine Royce. Wait a minute, I thought she specialized in energy weapons. Then there's the armor and clothing sets. The Valence Rad Eye Accentuator grants healing at a rate of 1 HP per 5 minutes or 12 HP for every in-game hour, as well as an endurance boost. That might seem like rather slow healing, but it's worth noting that the healing also occurs during sleep and waiting, and it can synergize, at least somewhat, with other methods of healing such as the solar-powered perk and the healing implant. The stealth suit looks good, has solid stats, and can grant additional bonuses by having completed the optional stealth missions. Hell, you can even find the Ghost People's Hazmat suit, and the headset has its own visual filter. Thankfully for us, we can't wear this in the Sierra Madre, so erosion of the joints is a non-issue. I mean, I guess you could add it to your inventory via console commands while in the Sierra Madre, but... That's cheating. I could keep going, but I think I've made it pretty clear that Old World Blues has some pretty excellent gear. That is, unless you're playing an explosive character build. Hopefully this doesn't make me sound like too much of a boomer. But I love to turn one enemy into a hundred enemies. My explosive character build was a blast pun fully intended, to use in dead money. And I thoroughly enjoy terrorizing Zion, whose residents had no way to defend themselves whatsoever. So I was excited to use an explosive build in the Big Empty given the tougher enemies of the DLC. But before I started the DLC, I took to the wiki to see if there were any unique DLC exclusive explosive weapons that would suit this build. Much to my dismay, there were none whatsoever. Thankfully, Old World Blues lets the players start it with whatever gear they want, so I at least had the freedom to start with whatever weapons and ammo I wanted. I chose the grenade launcher, and of course the fat man. Unfortunately, with explosive ammo being rather heavy in hardcore mode, I could only go with so much, but the added difficulty to resource management felt appropriate for hardcore mode. What didn't feel appropriate was the amount of ammo I had to expend in each encounter. Alright, look, I get it. I'm at a high level. I'm playing at the highest possible difficulty. Enemies are going to be tougher than your average bloatfly. But the Fat Man is supposed to be one of the most powerful weapons in the game. Well hey, that's the final boss of the DLC I hear you say. Okay fine, even if I were to grant you that, watch this footage of me fighting the most common enemies of Big Mountain. I understand that due to the nature of RPG mechanics, enemies on these settings and at these levels are going to have a shit ton of health. I don't need the game to play like Hitman where a single headshot from any weapon means an immediate kill. But when it starts taking this many explosives to kill basic enemies, the combat is going to become more monotonous than anything. At least with melee you can incapacitate enemies, but then it's just a matter of wailing away at a ragdoll incapable of defending itself and that gets pretty tiring, regardless of how hilarious New Vegas' ragdolls are. Dead Money's Ghost People were an awesome set, but the lack of variety was noticeable and there was definitely a sense of repetition to the encounters, even with that consistent tensity. Honest Hearts was just plain boring with its selection of enemies, basically utilizing reskinned and repurposed assets from either Fallout New Vegas or Fallout 3 for the entirety of the DLC. It's so refreshing to have such a wide variety of enemy types in Old World Blues. You have plenty of reuses from the base game, such as the Protectrons, the Spore Carriers, Cazadors, Ghouls, and the Lobotomites are basically just reskinned raiders. But then you have the new enemy types, such as the Robo Rad Scorpions. Sure, they're technically reskins of Rad Scorpions, but they also have fucking laser beams, and they explode on death, so you can at least give them that. They also come in packs, typically in an ambush where the player reaches specific points of progress in the main quest meaning they'll often be encountered amidst other enemies as well. Also, not every creature in the Big Empty is a friend of Mobius. Sometimes even hostile enemies will fight alongside you against the robo Rad scorpions, which is a pretty cool way of keeping the combat relatively fresh. Having the perk Animal Friend guarantees this as well, as there are a number of Night Stalkers prowling the Big Empty. One issue I do have with the robo Rad scorpions though is just how damn perceptive they are. It was really jarring. I wouldn't call this a flaw, but... Holy shit. I'd get it if these were a specific kind of enemy like the Coursers in Fallout 4, but 
how exactly do these things catch me so easily? Then there's the kick-ass Y-17 trauma override harnesses, which have to be among my favorite enemy designs in all of Fallout. Remember the astronaut suit with the skull from The Thing's promotional material? This is that, but red. They come packing a variety of energy weapons and can prove pretty dangerous in numbers. What's interesting is that they don't count as robots or power armors, so EMP weaponry doesn't have any unique effects on them. They're just a bizarre group of enemies, and they do a stellar job at illustrating the darker elements of Big Mountain's research, and I fucking love them. Add to that the unique enemies such as Stripes, this adorably small Deathclaw Alpha, the giant robo rat scorpion with way, way, way too much health, and a goddamn legendary bloatfly, and what you ultimately end up with is a healthy and varied selection of appropriately challenging enemies. Or at least they would be if their health pools weren't the size of fucking kaiju. Look, I'm cool with the legendary bloatfly having a shitzillion health, it's appropriately silly for a hidden boss in a DLC as wacky as this, but common enemies? Maybe chill out a bit. Something I have to credit this DLC for would have to be the map itself. Big Mountain is very much structured like a theme park, with the pace of exploration basically boiling down to going from one laboratory to another to see what wacky and horrifying experiments that location contains and looting it for some unique gear. I'll hold off on talking about the locations themselves in detail for later parts, but what's important to note here is that this establishes a rock-solid pace for exploration, allowing players to explore each location to their heart's content before deciding on where else they would like to visit. The map itself strikes a fine balance with its size. It's not so big that the downtime spent between areas will bore the player, but it's not so small that everything feels awkward and too cluttered. Even the edge of the map has a purpose. Typically in Fallout, the map is edged with an invisible wall to prevent players from going out of bounds. It's an understandable concession, but feels low effort to say the least. Old World Blues takes full advantage of its science fiction roots and surrounds Big Mountain with these electrical pylons. Canonically, these pylons futz with the Tesla coils that were used to replace the lobotomite's brains, so when a lobotomite would wander outside Big Mountain, they'd be rendered unconscious and teleported back to the think tank. This, of course, applies to the courier, giving the player a method of fast travel back to the think tank aside from the typical fast travel method via the pit boy That might sound redundant, but what's important to consider is that the player can't fast travel during specific circumstances such as an over-encumbrance of their inventory and being near enemies, which will be a recurring thing given that Mobius sends his robo rad scorpions to ambush the player whenever they finish a main quest objective at the facilities bordering the Big Empty. This is great for any player struggling to survive and needing a quick method of escape, and the placement of the three main quest facilities ensures that this is a viable option for players that learned it through their dialogue or through the gameplay and thought to use it to their advantage. Not only is this useful for the player, but it's a clever way of repurposing something that the base game struggled to account for. Dead Money and Honest Hearts were smart enough to have canonical reasons for the player's inability to travel out of bounds, the former's being the structure of the villa itself and the latter being the fact that it took place inside of a canyon, one that exists within the real world that you can go and visit for yourself. Old World Blues could have very easily settled on just having a wall surrounding the map. After all, Big Mountain's a crater. But Obsidian opted for a more unique and clever approach this time around, and it really paid off. Big Mountain also plays around with verticality, not quite to the extent of Honest Hearts, but I would argue more effectively. Throughout Big Mountain are these pipes connecting various facilities to one another, and these can be used to gain some elevation that's inaccessible to enemies. Of course, this also means leaving oneself open to ranged attacks from enemies wielding guns, so it's not guaranteed that the player can get out of harm's way completely unscathed. It does ensure, however, a strong vantage point for players looking to pick off targets with a rifle or with explosive artillery. That being said, one strong suit the New Vegas AI does possess is the ability to recognize when the player has reached an inaccessible elevation, as enemies can't jump and they need a way to account for this. This means that most enemies will retreat, either to find a vantage point to attack or to find cover should they lack any ranged options. This means that couriers looking to fight back will need to be able to effectively pick off their enemies or be able to fly flush them out of cover. Couriers looking to retreat will be in luck, though this does mean sacrificing potential loot and XP, which is always worth considering. 
On the north end of the map is the Botanical Garden, a plateau surrounded by cliffs with caverns that go quite far down, allowing for a number of different methods of approach. One could simply follow the caverns, or one could make their way down the cliffs by falling onto the rocks and crystals jutting from the walls. Next to the little Yangtze camp is a perfect vantage point to snipe nearby enemies. However, this also means leaving oneself in a position that has little to no methods of escape and is noticeably cramped. Little Yangtze is also filled to the brim with ghouls, an enemy that is known for rushing the player down. One of the first locations that many players are likely to visit is the X2 array, a tower with a spiraling staircase with an exit running along the neighboring cliff, allowing the player multiple options for handling the Robo Rad Scorpion ambush that occurs during the main quest. The legendary Blowfly's Cave is structured like an arena with the player entering from the topside walkway, thus granting them a vantage point that also permits maneuverability should the player need to take cover at a new spot. All of these examples aren't particularly strong on their own, but they add up to make for a fun, well thought out, and varied experience. And that's probably the best way I can describe the gameplay of Old World Blues as a whole. It definitely isn't without faults. The absurd amount of health enemies possess is egregious and infuriating and kills the pacing of fights, but the more positive qualities of the overall experience do a pretty good job at offsetting the more frustrating aspects, so I can't exactly call it subpar. In fact, I'd say it's pretty good. Not great, but definitely good. The next video is going to be covering the main quest, a topic that I've been eagerly anticipating as the story of Old World Blues is... well... Let's say interesting. So far, I've been enjoying this, and I hope you all have as well. I'll see you again soon, fellow lobotomites. So, we've already gone over the intro of Old World Blues, but now it's time for us to look at what lies beyond. Though it doesn't necessarily do very much for a while, which isn't doing the pacing of this DLC any favors. I've mentioned before that the Big Empty is full of places to explore and learn about. That's certainly true, and I'll be sure to praise those aspects when necessary in later parts, but the main quest itself starts off very lacking even beyond the prologue. Following the very lengthy, and at times redundant, introductory dialogue, Old World Blues kicks off with... a fetch quest. <laughs> Alright, so there's a bit more to this mechanically than the term fetch quest may let on. I'm not at all trying to be a reductionist in saying this, but in terms of narrative development, there's very little more than just getting these devices that other people want. The brains of the think tank outright refuse to even elaborate on why the devices are needed in the first place. It'll all become clear. If not, at least we will have the technology here at the Dome, where all technology belongs. There is logic and purpose in it. If these technologies are needed to pierce the Forbidden Zone, so be it. All we have is the motivation of wanting to not be trapped in Big Mountain, which might have worked if the story had more of a focus on the darker elements at play here, but the overabundance of humor makes it very difficult to get into the mindset of feeling like I'm in danger. In a meta sense, why would we even want to leave this DLC? We just started. So, as a player, I'm not really engaged. As a character to roleplay, I'm not really engaged. Sure, as a player, I can infer that these devices must be some unique loot, given that Klein says they only need the schematics and not the items themselves, but given that the player won't even know what these devices do at this point, the level of investment is going to be quite shallow no matter how you look at it. Once again, and I hope you're not tired of hearing this, Dead Money and Honest Hearts did this so much better. The Sierra Madre is fucking terrifying. So while the player will generally want to keep playing the content they paid for and experience this gripping tale of survival to its conclusion, they very much understand why getting the fuck out of here is several magnitudes of priority more important than whatever loot this place may house, or whatever curiosities the player wants or may still possess. Honest Hearts opens with the player being involved in a group, then suddenly they're isolated upon arriving in Zion when their group is murdered by tribals, and then they go on to meet a spectacular character that's brilliantly voiced with more draw than a banned Exodia deck. Sure, there's some stuff worth looking into here, and a conflict that a good-hearted individual may feel compelled to resolve. 
but escape was always the priority. The caravan is dead. The goal to establish a line of trade for the Happy Trails Caravan Company is out the window for at least the time being. This is a matter of survival, and it's natural to want to repay the favors granted to you by the dead horses and Joshua while still trying to leave. In Old World Blues, the very reason one would want to escape this place is undermined by the non-stop barrage of humor and downright bizarre plot points that will leave a player too perplexed to even have a solid grasp on the stakes to begin with. This is not a strong way to start this DLC, and the areas we're told to visit do very little to improve upon it, though I'm only referring to those that are mandatory, as several other locations are suggested for acquiring even more technology for the sink though that will have to wait for the next part. For the main quest, there are three areas that must be visited in order to proceed. The X-2 Antenna Array, the X-8 Research Center, and the X-13 Facility. Of these locations, one offers a genuinely interesting and compelling look into the mind of one of the brains of the Think Tank. One is a series of increasingly complicated objectives that grant additional rewards for completion, and the last is a simple area with next to nothing in terms of rewards and even less in terms of lore. I'll start with the latter since it's consistently the one that I do first, mostly just so I can get it out of the way and be done with it. The X2 antenna array is a small tower with some protectrons, at the top of which is the item you need to collect. After acquiring it, an ambush of robo rad scorpions appear, and the player must escape the area, either by force or with stealth, neither of which are very easy to manage. And that's it. Like, share, and subscribe. You know what annoys me the most about the X2 objective? Right next door, not even 10 feet away from this antenna array, is an area that is significantly more interesting. The antenna array itself is the epitome of what makes for an uninteresting fetch quest, with so little going on that I'd be surprised if anyone even remembered this part of the quest without having played this DLC multiple times. Then there's the X-13 facility, and while there's little in the ways of lore to discover, there's a decent amount of rewarding gameplay to be had here. The highlight, of course, is what the actual quest requires of the player, and that's to acquire a stealth suit and use it to complete a stealth training program that'll grant it an upgrade, or several. The stealth program, at least at the start, is simple to the point of hilarity. All the player needs to do is sneak by some robo-brains into an office and access the safe. This is the only mandatory objective here, and it is laughably easy. On the bright side, there are a few more stealth programs to play out, each with an increasing level of difficulty, and while not particularly hard, they do make for one of the more engaging stealth sections of a Fallout game. And the upgrades to the stealth suit are absolutely worth trying for. I also think it's funny how the whole section can be trivialized just by killing the robo-brains, at which point the player just needs to be on the lookout for the laser wires, which can also be disabled permanently, and the mines, which are pretty easy to avoid and have a generous telegraph. Disabling the lasers permanently requires a high repair skill, and the robo-brains are docile, meaning the average player has no incentive for attacking them during this stealth-focused set piece. It's pretty clever design, all things considered. robo rad scorpions also invade the facility following the only mandatory run, helping to ensure the player remains engaged even in this slower part of the DLC. It's a bit forced, but by no means frustrating or annoying. Then we have the X-13 Research Center, which is by far the most intriguing of the three. X-13 is the laboratory brainchild of Dr. Boros, with the main part of the facility being a recreation of his old primary school, now used as a playground for various experiments, such as cybernetic doggos that, good lord, just put an end to their suffering already. Whilst exploring the school, various pre-recorded announcements by Dr. Boros exclaim passive-aggressive digs at people that we can infer bullied him while he was in school. Can you spell detention? I'll tell you how I spell it. Death tension. Call me pinko traitors. No, I will send vicious cybernetic cyborg dogs through the corridors to weed all you traitors out. They will sniff out which among you have chosen the Kami path. Especially you, Betsy Bright, who turned me down to the high school dance so you could smoke with Richie Marcus. All monitors will also be vigilant. Step outside during class, and they'll make sure you make a speedy jump back to your desk. Hold your urine and wait for the proper bathroom break time. 
This is probably one of the best examples of this DLC absolutely nailing its comedy. Boros has a very entertaining voice. He has a very exaggerative inflection with words of emphasis, standing out perfectly so as to nail the timing of the delivery. The recordings here also put into perspective why Boros specifically would be such an oddball and how socially inept that he is. It's simultaneously entertaining and informative, and it goes a long way in making Boros more likable as a character, not necessarily as a person, but as a character. That being said, I think it's worth saying just how glad I am that they didn't go the route of trying too hard to humanize him. Keeping in line with the tone of the DLC, while the brains may have personality traits that any number of players could gravitate towards, ultimately they are horrible excuses for humans that will do the most unethical things imaginable for the sake of an interesting experiment. Ethics be damned, reasons be damned, they will take any idea they have for something crazy and just roll with it. The fuckers are responsible for the creation of Cazadors, so it's blatantly apparent that Obsidian did not want us liking them as people or sympathizing with them to the point of feeling sorry for them. So instead of playing up Boros being bullied as a child as something to pity him over, they play it up purely for laughs and treat it as this downright silly thing that he's been petulant about for two centuries. It's not like they beat you over the head with how he was beaten up every day and forced to drink from a toilet or some horrid shit. No, another kid put pudding in his pants. All things considered, he kind of had it easy. To further prove how clearly the writers did not really care for the players to like the brains, this section in the school is immediately followed up with a downright absurd set piece revolving around Boros's experiments on dogs, the most significant being his own pet Gabe, which Boros kept drugged for basically the entirety of its life, all the while performing cybernetic surgery and who even knows what other experiments on it. Not only is this beyond forgiving, but the way it's played up for laughs with Boros's ridiculous reminiscings of Gabe is fucking insane. Players with the wild wasteland trait will also see a room full of cyberdoggos playing poker. This whole thing is weird as hell, and I fucking love it. This area is capped off with an encounter with Gabe. No, not that doggo. The goal is to search the piles for the device needed to modify the sonic emitter. Killing Gabe isn't too hard, however doing so means triggering the bomb inside of him, yes really, which will explode after a comically slow countdown from Dr. Boros. Stealth, of course, is the best go-to here. That or just being a really fast courier who can bounce from one mound to the next very quickly. After acquiring the device, robo Scorpions will appear and most likely take out Gabe, making it all the more imperative that the player get out as soon as possible. But even in the first room of the facility, there will be a number of robo Scorpions ready to take the player out. And even outside there will be a number of not just robo Scorpions that will hone in on the player. It's a pretty tough area, and it makes for a pretty exciting uphill battle. Upon returning to the sink with the devices, Dr. Klein will direct the player to the Forbidden Zone, where the courier can retrieve their brain and put it into the evil schemes of Dr. Mobius once and for all. But before we go to the Forbidden Zone, we're given a chance to talk a bit more with the brains and learn not only about the goings-on of Big Mountain, but about them as people as well. None of the character work really stands out as exemplary, but there's enough here to help the player make an informed decision by the time they've reached the finale of this DLC. All the brains have their own little quirks. Dala misses having a human body so much that she's become insatiably horny at the thought of a human so much as breathing. Don't start wiggling your fingers in front of her, oh god. Dr. O, or Zero, is so pathetically nerdy that he considers the toes of the courier to be larger than what he assumed to be the average length of the penis. Eight is what I assume to be the courier. Wait, what? Eight is what I assume to be what happens when a voice actor or two decides to fuck off to another job. Boros is an actually mentally unstable psychopath. Path, and Dr. Klein is an insatiably curious sociopath with no regard for ethics or morality. I mean, really they all are, but since Klein is the big boss here, that means Big Mountain is his own personal sandbox, which is pretty terrifying to imagine. 
All of this dialogue pretty much reinforces the notion that these scientists are utter vermin. They'll also recount to the courier how Big Mountain became a crater. Apparently a failed experiment by one Dr. Klein resulted in the mountain itself being vaporized. What the hell this test could have even been is anyone's guess, but the fact that it happened in the first place is certainly bizarre and a bit alarming. However, there is one particularly interesting bit of information that I feel is worth mentioning. Apparently the scientists of the think tank are completely unaware of the Great War that occurred two centuries ago. The scientists make very little effort effort to look beyond the walls of Big Mountain, and their ignorance to what goes on outside their bubble is fascinating. What's especially peculiar is how Klein recounts the encounter with Elijah, Christine, and another courier, noting how peculiar it was for them to have gotten in and escaped as they did, but that is a discussion for another time. So onto the Forbidden Zone. Right out the gate, literally, there are a lot of robo rad scorpions. like, holy shit, these things are not even worth fighting given how many resources the player's gonna need for the next fight. Upon entering the Forbidden Zone, Mobius summons his most powerful monster, the A to Z robo rad scorpion Buster Cannon. Okay, that's not what it's called. This is one of the most dangerous enemies in New Vegas, regardless of your build, level, or playstyle. As it turns out, the real big mountain was the health bar we had to deplete along the way. But for those of you wishing to retain your sanity, or just simply lacking the ability to kill this thing, i.e. anyone not role-playing the mole for this thing's whack-a-mole as you poke in and out of cover for the next 15 minutes using your entire arsenal of ammunition, you can make your way around the room and hack the terminal that allows for the shutdown of the god of big mountain that this thing is. Destroying it is optional, but considering the amount of times this thing has one-shot me, the last judgment draweth not and his name is Mr. Big Fister. For those of you not really sure of what I'm saying at this point, allow me to simplify. Fuck this fight. So after suffering through that abomination of a fight, it's time to meet Dr. Mobius. And this might just be one of the best plot twists in New Vegas, which is really saying something. As it turns out, Dr. Mobius has actually been ensuring that the scientists of the think tank remain trapped here within Big Mountain. Their memories, knowledge, and even curiosities of the outside world expunged from their databanks. The reason Mobius did this was because he wanted to protect the outside world from the threat of the think tank's scientific hubris. And it wasn't until, something that we're going to cover later, that the think tank finally became aware of the outside world. And as it turns out, this happened some time ago, meaning that the brains of the think tank were lying to the courier. Now, given that these are the bastards responsible for Cazadors, I can't exactly blame Mobius for doing this. That being said, Mobius basically brainwashed the Think Tank and has been tripping on Mentas and Psycho for the past two centuries while the Think Tank continues various other unethical experiments. He's also been tormenting the player for the entirety of their quest in the Big Empty with those goddamn robo rad scorpions. It's also worth noting that, rather than actually putting a stop to the Think Tank's experiments, Mobius opted to let them continue in isolation, resulting in who even knows how many people wandering into Big Mountain and having their brains scooped out, so it's not as if he's entirely innocent either. Whether or not he had the power to stop them is completely up for debate, but his lack of efforts or even attempts to do so, as far as we know, are definitely a cause for caution. But before the courier can decide the fate of the Big Empty, one last loose end must be tied up. The Courier's Brain Apparently, it's been chilling in a vat over here in the Forbidden Zone with Dr. Mobius having delightful conversations over rounds of Mentats, and this is where Old World Blues goes from campy and weird to bordering on Hideo Kojima levels of kooky. So, yeah. The player begins a conversation with their very own brain. It's one of New Vegas' most memorable moments for sure, and the sheer insanity of it is enough to entertain just about any player. I mean, for God's sake, the voice box it's been given sounds like Stewie Griffin, and if that's not comedy, then I don't know what is. Ah, lovely. Figure that out, have we? Would you like a cookie? Yes, well, believe me, the opposite is equally true. Good lord, have you bathed at all since they pulled me out of you? This is indeed a Family Guy funny moment. Unfortunately, nothing about this conversation makes any kind of sense, and the implications are something of a detriment to the entire game. I think the one issue that consistently baffles me when it comes to this dialogue is the fact that the brain's personality doesn't even change based on the type of character that the player has been role-playing. 
Sure, there are some funny moments for low intelligence couriers, the Cher Chez La Femme and confirmed bachelor perks make for a funny moment, and having a certain level and various combative stats help to convince the brain that you can take on the think tank, but nothing about the brain or the dialogue sees any significant change. Karma, special stats, reputation, past decisions, build, perks, none of these things have any particular effect on the conversation aside from a couple of funny non sequiturs and... That's really a shame. Genius savior of New Vegas? Mass murdering psychopath? Dumb as hell NCR apologist? Even more stupid Caesar's Legion apologist? Doesn't matter, cause Stewie Brain has been enjoying those mentats, so it's a smart brain now with only a single possible personality. And yet, despite how smart the brain universally is, it's too stupid to realize that it's the primary source of glandular impulses? I'm not the one that makes us clamber around technus infested ancient vaults or go charging off to New Vegas on missions of ill-conceived revenge. And have we forgotten who got us shot in the head and buried in a shallow grave? Hmm? Do you think I enjoy that little moment? I most certainly am not. I am the seat of all reason and logic in our little partnership. All those feelings that motivate you, that sense of righteousness and that rush you get when you help someone, do you know where those come from? Glands. They come from glands. Free of the tyranny of your ape-like and primitive endocrine system, I can see how foolish your motives are. I... well... look... It's all a very complex system of biofeedback and other things I wouldn't expect you to understand. Like, I get it, being shot in the head sucked, but this thing's ability to argue is surprisingly vacuous. Also, the brain makes it clear that the device it's using to speak is connected to the prefrontal cortex, confirming that this is the unconscious part of the brain we're speaking to, which does explain how it can talk about not having been in proper control and preventing us from doing things that it did not want. But this presents another issue. Shouldn't this brain sense of self be at a peak? It's been separated from the courier's body, granted increased perception and intelligence by the Mentats in the vat, and it's had time on its own, which it has specifically used to read and converse with Mobius. Why wasn't the brain sense of self even referenced beyond just wanting to be away from the courier and the dangers of the wastes? It doesn't take that much to convince the brain that roaming the wastes and going on adventures was and is actually a ton of fun. But what about the fact that this brain will no longer be able to function as a self once it's been reintegrated in the courier's head? Sure, adventuring is fun, but the prefrontal cortex lacked the ability to stop the courier from doing things that it found either reprehensible or reckless. This thing should honestly be downright terrified at the prospect of reintegrating with the courier. Remember that episode of House where the patient's prefrontal cortex had control over his arm and would downright abuse the poor guy? And the solution was for him to learn to live in harmony with his other self? That kind of shit is so interesting, but Old World Blues doesn't really do anything with it. When it comes down to it, the only consequence of choosing whether or not to take the brain back is what perk you get. But the player can remove or reintegrate it literally whenever they want after the main quest, so there's not even a consequence. The courier's body is also apparently so damn tough that it can handle having its brain removed and reintegrated ad infinitum. Come on, Loveless, it's meant to be wacky and irreverent. You're not supposed to take it that seriously. Just turn your brain off and enjoy the lulls. Sorry, but my brain runs with extensive and hyperactive cognizance over a five-dimensional plane of existence and is not only impossible to turn off, but it would drive anyone who attempted to do so into a heretofore unseen madness comparable to that of men who lay their unenlightened eyes upon the eldritch truth that is but yeah this whole thing with the brain is really silly and i enjoy it but it also makes no fucking sense which is objectively bad given that fallout especially the first two in new vegas are quite well known for their logical consistency minus the unavoidable ludonarrative narrative dissonance that comes with these games being stat based role-playing games but that's a concession that you have to make when interacting with this game in the first place Following the conversation with the brain, the last objective is to go to the think tank, as we can now circumnavigate the pacification field 
that's prevented players from going full Abby Miller on the brains upon realizing they were responsible for creating Casadors. The fucking bastards, I'll never forgive them. Killing Mobius is entirely optional, though the question of whether or not he deserves to die is definitely up for debate. I honestly don't think there's a wrong decision here. Sure, Mobius has prevented the brains from experimenting beyond Big Mountain, but he's also allowed for the experiments within to go on for far too long, and the effects of this go as far as the Sierra Madre. It's an interesting dilemma that the game doesn't impose directly, and I really appreciate that. Hell, some players might not even think to try and kill him after having talked to him. There are no long-lasting consequences to killing him aside from the implication that he'll never be able to change the way Big Mountain runs again. I actually really like this, though. There didn't need to be a major consequence to his death. It's all about what the player feels is right or wrong, or simply justified. As for what happens next, well, it's pretty clear where things stand. Upon arriving at the think tank, the brains don't even make an attempt to withhold the fact that they plan to go beyond the dome. Their hubris knows no bounds, and it's clear that the technology they have access to is beyond dangerous. The player has two options here. They can either kill the brains and put a stop to all the senseless experiments for good, or they can convince the brains that Mobius has swapped brains with the courier and intimidate the think tank into foregoing any plans to go beyond the dome. Uh, alright then. Alright, look. While I can agree with the notion that anyone who thinks the brains deserve to live would probably be stupid enough to try and convince them of something this ridiculous, I just don't think it works for every kind of character that the player might be role-playing that would want to spare the brains. Why not have an option for the courier, without the comedy, hear me out, to intimidate the brains with threats of violence. I mean, for God's sake, there's literally a perk for this. Or how about convincing the brains that they should stay within the dome as the wasteland offers too little in the ways of scientific potential? Like the other expansions, the main quest of Old World Blues ends with a summary slideshow to detail the consequences of the courier's decisions. I won't go into all of this just yet, but overall I think it's pretty well done. There are even multiple slides for nearly every facility in Big Mountain should the player have visited them, and that alone gives the exploration a sense of satisfaction that, come to think of it, hasn't been present in any of the other DLC slideshows. But even without the ending slides, Old World Blues definitely has its fair share of exploration to indulge in. But that's gonna have to wait till later. This is a beloved DLC, and I get why. I do. It's downright fucking hilarious at times, and the characters are pretty entertaining. Hell, even the stealth suit AI is fun to listen to. But there's also a number of writing issues that permeate the story, primarily to do with the main quest, and I'm not gonna post a review without talking about these issues as they come up. How these issues impact the experience is up to the individual, but the fact remains that these issues do exist, and they deserve to be scrutinized just as much as the higher quality elements deserve to be praised. And that's really all I have for today. The next couple of videos will be covering the side quests and world building, which I'm pretty excited to get to myself, as I consider both to be among the higher quality the elements of this DLC. So until we meet again, take care. Welcome one and all to what is probably going to be the shortest video in this particular DLC review series. This is a weird subsection of Old World Blues to have to cover, because even though the expansion itself is generally packed with content and places to explore, there's basically only one side quest. And it's a fetch quest. <laughs> For anyone unfamiliar with Old World Blues that's bothered to take to the New Vegas wiki, you might be tempted to try and correct me, saying, What are you talking about, Loveless? There's 13 side quests, that's more than all the other DLCs combined. Alright, so, uh, first of all, that's not an accomplishment, considering that Honest Hearts is the only other expansion with any side quests, having a total of seven, multiple of which were just brief dialogues with different characters. Second, Old World Blues has even more of these dialogue-only quests, and they're somehow worse, or at least on par with those of Honest Hearts. The dialogue-only side quests of Honest Hearts at least provided interesting dilemmas for the player to consider, and they were tied to the companions whom the player would naturally feel some connection with after having traveled together, which is how you unlock these quests to begin with. Deciding whether or not to tell Waking Cloud about the death of her husband, the decision to either influence or dissuade follows Chalk's curiosity of the outside world, even though these choices didn't have any notable consequences outside the ending slideshow, the dilemmas themselves still had enough complexity to them to make the player stop and think. 
Of the 13 side quests, Old World Blues has a total of 6 that are only dialogue, and literally all of them are with the brains of the think tank. That means that nearly half of these supposed side quests in this expansion are just conversations. When it comes down to it, these quests serve to expand on the story of the scientists of the think tank. And for what it's worth, what the player can learn from these exchanges does feel like necessary information. Not even just because it alludes to the overarching narrative of the other courier that's been teased since before Dead Money, but because they collectively build on the mystery of what exactly is going on at Big Mountain, and effectively builds to the twist that Mobius has been keeping the brains confined to Big Mountain. It also adds some much needed character to these brains. Like I've said previously, by no means are they redeemable, but it's also not that difficult to find some level of pity for them, or at least a couple of them. Poor Dr. Raid is an audio specialist that has a broken voice box and can't communicate. Dala longs for the days of her humanity. O, or Zero, has been a pushover beta male his entire life. Klein is pretty irredeemable, but he's clearly not all there either. The same applies to Boros, though to a lesser extent, as Boros is far less cognizant of his surroundings, not even realizing that Cazadors can reproduce and have escaped Big Mountain. Like I said, it doesn't make them misunderstood villains or any cliche like that, but it does add to their depth adequately enough to earn those moments where the player may stop and go, huh, that really kind of sucks. I think the inclusion of all the dialogue that pertains to these quests is very good. It helps build on the lore of this already fascinating location and it ties into the overarching story of the other courier that'll conclude with Lonesome Road. That's all fine and great, but why did they feel the need to turn these exchanges into their very own side quests that altogether can yield a pretty sizable chunk of XP? I could actually understand making a side quest out of the dialogue that pertains to the Courier and Christine if it was obscure enough. It would almost be like its own little easter egg, something that's really difficult to find but then you look on the wiki and you're like, oh, wait a minute, what the fuck's that quest? I didn't see that. But I don't really understand why they felt the need to qualify this stuff as side quests. And look, not every side quest needs to be as expansive and non-linear as Beyond the Beef or as involved as One for My Baby. I get it, the devs only had so much time and so many resources, but it's not as if the DLC's lacking content. You don't need to slap a side quest label on all these menial conversations. The next four side quests I want to discuss are all associated with the main quest objectives. Upgrading the Sonic Emitter, upgrading the Stealth Suit, and putting down Gabe. But Loveless, I hear you say, that's only three objectives, but you said four side quests. You are correct, dear viewer. Two of these side quests are to do with upgrading the Sonic Emitter. This goes beyond pointless, and I genuinely have no idea what I'm expected to assume that Obsidian was thinking when they structured things this way. All four of these so-called side quests could have been streamlined into optional objectives for the main quests. Hell, I've seen optional objectives in the base game side quests with more depth and engagement than these so-called side quests. What else is there that I can even say? It's just so pointless and not to mention confusing as to why they would dedicate side quest marks for these random objectives. The last three side quests are similar to the Sonic Emitter quests in that they all really should have just been merged into a single, longer quest. Unfortunately, this is just a series of fetches the player must do in order to unlock more techno personas in the sink. So it's ultimately very shallow and pretty lacking in creativity. All the player does is go to different parts of the map and grab a holotape. It's not even particularly interesting locations, it's just like, oh hey, it's in a little fucking cave here. Oh, there's a couple enemies, oh, oh god, oh gee whiz. Though to be fair, this is the location of the best one, so, you know, I'll give you that. It's really about as simple as it gets. However, even with all of that said, I loved the end result for this quest. The personalities of these machines are some of the most enjoyably silly characters to ever come from a Fallout game. The Central Intelligence Unit acts as a vendor for the courier, and it's this gaudy butler that lacks an upgrade that would allow it to refer to female characters as ma'am, instead only being able to refer to the player as sir regardless of their gender. The Autodoc is this charming but straight shooting doc with a southern drawl, and he's probably the kindest of the bunch. He's a cool dude, I like him. The biological research station is this smooth talking hunk with a deep voice whose dialogue is riddled with innuendo about the insertion of seed. 
The two light switches act as jealous dames that like to gossip about one another and will openly flirt with the courier. The jukebox is oozing with charisma and sounds like a jazz musician straight out of 1950s Harlem. The book shoot is a shameless anti-commie red-blooded imperialist that's keen on the eradication of all literature so as to prevent free thinking that leads to sedition. Muggy is a comically tiny Securitron that has a built-in obsession with coffee mugs. His existence is pain, though not as painful as the sink, no not the entire area, I mean the actual faucet, which is not only painfully obsessed with cleanliness, but is revolted by the idea of dirt going down its drain, which I actually kind of understand that. And finally, easily the best of these personalities, is none other than video gaming's most violent kitchen appliance, the toaster. This thing is fucking amazing. It's a narcissistic toaster with a Napoleon complex so extreme that it legitimately believes itself capable of being a death ray and wants to bring about a second Armageddon. It honestly doesn't get any sillier than this, and I'm all for it. These little characters are probably the peak of this DLC's attempts at comedy, but the personalities aren't just here for laughs. They have their own functions, albeit varying in their significance. The light switches, for instance, change the lighting of the rooms that they're in. Yeah, it's not exactly a game changer. The most useful of the lot, barring the autodoc, because, well, Duh, is probably the sink, which will fill empty bottles with purified water, a resource that's useful regardless of whether or not hardcore mode is turned on. The majority of these devices, however, focus on rather specific forms of item conversion that feel a bit too niche to pay consistent mind to. The book shoot, for instance, will turn ruined books into blank books, which can then be turned into skill books at a workbench with the right crafting materials. I suppose this could be useful for some scenarios, but by the time the players reached Old World Blue, unless they've come here extremely early on, most builds will be realized enough to lack for any need of this mechanic. The biological research station doesn't really do much on normal difficulty, but it can be really useful on hardcore mode. By using salient green, which is found around the big empty, the player can grow different plants in the sink garden, including but not limited to the flora required to craft stem packs. The player can also exchange a number of plants to the station for salient green, so if you have some jalapeno peppers but you want maize, for instance, you can now turn one into the other fairly easily. And finally, there's Muggy, who turns coffee mugs, coffee pots, and plates into various crafting materials such as lead, scrap metal, and so on. How that physically works, I have no fucking idea. This is a bit niche, but he can also supply the player with 50 energy cells, 50 microfusion cells, and 5 pieces of scrap electronics. This is all after he's been upgraded, which you can do to all of the appliances throughout the sink. And that's a pretty sizable chunk of daily ammo for energy spec couriers. So even though the quests to do with the sink appliances are just fetch quests, the rewards for gathering the personalities as well as their upgrades are honestly very much worth it. Between the spectacular funny dialogue and the albeit rather niche utility of the appliances, the end result far exceeds the journey it took to get there. It's just kind of a shame that the side quests overall for this DLC are pretty lacking. I don't think it would be very reductionist of me to say that half of these were just dialogue, the following quarter were basically just optional objectives for the main quest, and the last quarter was just fetch quests. That's honestly pretty damn disappointing, and I can't believe I'm actually saying this, but it's about on par with how Honest Hearts handled its side quests. Honest Hearts side quests were very much lacking, and Old World Blues doesn't exactly set the bar going forward itself. But I guess that's all I have to say for the side quests. I apologize for the shortness of this video, but I really just don't have anything else to say about the side quests of Old World Blues. Thankfully, the next part of the series will be covering Big Mountain itself and the various elements of world building that litter the crater, which I actually consider one of this expansion's greatest strengths. So I'll see you then. Take care. Welcome back, lobotomites, to Big Mountain, known colloquially to many post-nuclear American residents as the Big Empty. It's not a racist thing, I assure you, they love mountains. Anyways, this has been a part of each DLC review I've looked forward to each time, because I fucking love the lore of Fallout New Vegas and Obsidian's Fallout in general. It's such a fascinating world to go and explore with so much to learn about both it and perhaps even our own world through it and the various factions and conflicts that litter the map. 
Similar to how Metal Gear introduced me as a young lad to the complicated nature of culture and ideologies, New Vegas played a significant role in the formative years of my adolescence in introducing me to the complicated nature of civilization and the issues that underlie various approaches to governing groups of people. This stuff is fucking fascinating to me, and I enjoy the more critical but not necessarily nihilistic nature of New Vegas' approach to these various subjects. In regards to the DLC, Dead Money was fairly unique in its subject matter, because it dealt more with a universal struggle that all people face in various forms of obsession, be that control, greed, or a desire for vengeance. The focus was more on individuals rather than the collective. Honest Hearts was somewhat iterative of the base game in its general focus on tribal warfare, but instead of focusing on systems of government, it took some time to explore spiritual and cultural beliefs, and how they can misguide people into the unnecessary and detrimental. Old World Blues goes back to the Fallout basics, with a heavy emphasis on technology, and how dangerous it can be when allowed no moral or technical restraints. Except this time, the emphasis isn't so much on the problems caused by technology, but rather the source of such technology. Old World Blues isn't afraid to portray things as more black and white than one might expect from Obsidian's usual work. However, this is something that seems to be very intentional, and I think it works for the story they're trying to tell. The whole point of the think tank is to illustrate what anyone can become capable of when left completely unobstructed, and it's something I think any person could quite easily fall victim to in the right circumstances. After all, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. A perfectly good man could single-handedly cause the end of the world given the right circumstances. The ultimate failure of Big Mountain was the think tank's ambition outpacing their morality. The think tank is filled with a number of laboratories that all house incredible technology, admittedly some less than others, but there's a consistent theme that all of these technologies led to a significant detriment to the surrounding world. Take for example the Z38 Light Wave Dynamics Research Center. Just one look and anyone who's played Dead Money should be able to see exactly what this place was used for. Z-38 was the facility that experimented with the light-based constructs that litter not only Big Mountain, but the Sierra Madre as well. It's the origin of several extremely powerful technologies, including the force fields of the Big Empty and the holograms of the Sierra Madre. As it turns out, the holograms weren't even intended to act as weapons. In fact, it's not entirely clear what their original purpose was beyond, perhaps, force fields. It wasn't until Frederick Sinclair made his Faustian bargain with the think tank that the holograms had to be retrofitted with the laser beams and the defensive AI, something the Big Empty's workers found quite infuriating to try and compound with the technology. Having to design a hologram model to look identical to Vera Keys was another part of the deal with Sinclair that the workers apparently found quite infuriating. Sure, Dead Money shows us that the hologram technology can scan a person and replicate them fairly easily, but I think it would be safe to assume that Sinclair wasn't about to have Vera sent off to Big Mountain, where she would likely be experimented on, especially given her sickly state coupled with Sinclair's overprotective nature. Big Mountain also houses a botanical garden where biological experiments were carried out, most notably to do with the spores that infested Vault 22 near Vegas. The Botanical Garden of Big Mountain is the origin of the spore that was eventually handed over to those devising Vault 22, which can be explored in the base game of New Vegas. The implications here are immense because it's possible that many of vault experiments originated in the Big Mountain, making the think tank responsible for a number of atrocities that we as the player can explore firsthand. This of course is only speculation, but given just how unique some of the vault technology appears to be, it shouldn't be disregarded as a possibility that Big Mountain could be responsible for a number of the experiments that took place within them, including the cloning technology of Vault 108, the hallucinogenic drugs used for Vault 106, and perhaps even more frighteningly, the forced evolutionary virus that was developed by West Tech and further experimented with in Vault 87. Hell, even the little neighborhood at the southern end of the map bears some resemblance to Tranquility Lane. I would like to reiterate that this is only speculation, so don't think of this as concrete canon because there's no evidence of these particular examples to be found in Big Mountain. In fact, I imagine if Big Mountain were involved in something as colossal as the FEV, Obsidian would have made it a point to include a much more significant reference to that. 
However, it's also important to bear in mind that a lot of Big Mountain has been destroyed, meaning a number of experiments have simply been lost to time and have likely been forgotten even by the scientists of the think tank. We know that West Tech has ties to the US government, which Big Mountain worked for, and it's clear that the existence of Big Mountain itself is a secret that was kept extremely private due to the dubious natures of the experiments that occurred there. So it makes sense that even the Enclave wouldn't have known about Big Mountain and that there would be no reference to it in places like Mariposa. I'll say it one more time just to be extremely clear, this is only speculation. It's an inference I made that led to a potential possibility. The reason I bring this up isn't to illustrate my own headcanon, but to illustrate just how potentially dangerous and far-reaching a place like this is and could be. Not even just in Fallout, but in our world as we know it. This is a recurring element in Obsidian's world building and one that continues to impress me even to this day, allowing the player to understand just how dangerous this place is not only by direct reference, but also potential inference, intentional or otherwise, to what they've already come to understand about the world is excellent writing. It establishes just how morally repugnant this place is and why it's critical for we as people to understand the significance of not letting technology break ethical boundaries. After all, that's essentially what happened with the creation of the atom bomb, technology very much at the core of Fallout's world building and lore. But that's enough speculation, now we're going to talk about these fuckers, goddamn Cazadors. I imagine they need little introduction. But for those somehow unaware, Cazadors are mutated tarantula hawks that not only carry a potent poison, but also move quite fast and hit really hard. They also travel in packs and can be pretty hard to kill, making them one of, if not the most dangerous thing you can encounter in Fallout. Players dread the existence of these fucking abominations, and Obsidian were clearly aware of this and thought it'd be cute to show us their origins at Big Mountain as a botched experiment. As if there weren't enough unforgivable sins at Big Mountain to cast judgment for, you'd have to be the most forgiving of saintly figures to not feel an inclination to go full Doomslayer on the think tank after discovering this. Apparently Dr. Boros intended to prevent the Tarantula Hawk from being able to reproduce, but as is apparent to anyone that's come across a nest of these things, he fucked up somewhere along the way. Boros is adamant that they can't reproduce, which certainly doesn't help to endear him to the player, but the question going through my mind is how Cazadors reproduce. It's obvious that Cazadors lay eggs, but the real question is whether or not the methods they use are identical to those used by the Tarantula Hawk, because Jesus fucking Christ that would be terrifying. For those of you so blissfully unaware, allow me to ruin your day. The tarantula hawk's method of reproduction involves a female hunting a tarantula spider that she can paralyze with her venomous sting and then lay eggs on the tarantula's motionless body. The eggs then hatch and feast on its organs while it's still alive. Yeah, nature is fucking metal. Bear in mind the tarantula hawk's sting is considered one of the most painful stings from an insect that can ever be experienced. Full-grown men can be paralyzed for minutes by a single sting and suffer excruciating pain. So imagine being as small as a fucking tarantula and getting stung by one of these fucking abominations. Now imagine this abomination is several times larger, mutated, and hunting in packs. If these things reproduce the same way they did prior to mutation, then that is a terrifying and morbid way to go. And to round out this exploration into just how despicable the folks at Big Mountain are, we have Little Yang Zi, a concentration camp for the Chinese to be experimented on. I honestly think this element of Big Mountain deserves more attention than the game gives it. It's an entirely optional area, and there's very little concrete lore despite the incredibly dark implications. But here's what we do know. The US government would round up literal truckloads of Chinese Americans to be sent off to internment camps, one of which being none other than Little Yang Zi at Big Mountain. We can also assume, with confidence, that Chinese POWs were brought here as well. These people were kept in a pretty small fenced-in area where they were experimented on, typically having their brains extracted and used to power the robo-brain technology. At first, workers were needed to work triple shifts so as to ensure that prisoners wouldn't escape. However, the scientists eventually developed bomb collars to ensure the prisoners would never leave even if they had a chance. Following the Great War, 
Little Yangtze and Big Mountain as a whole was abandoned by the U.S. government and military, leaving the prisoners of Little Yangtze trapped within the camp with no chance of escape due to the bomb callers still being active. The fallout from the Great War bled over into Big Mountain and would lead to the ghoulification of the prisoners. This meant that they couldn't even grow old and die from natural causes. After two whole centuries, the former Elder Elijah would infiltrate Big Mountain, using Little Yang Z as a base of operations for various experiments of his own, with the bomb callers of his prisoners being his primary focus. By the time we as the courier reach Big Mountain, the prisoners are still there, unable to leave. To call this fucking bleak would be an astronomical understatement, and it's no surprise that the prisoners have gone completely feral by the time the courier arrives. Hell, it's likely that they were even going insane before succumbing to ghoulification. However, there is a significant issue with Little Yang Z that I feel not only undermines the lore, but contributes to one of the most inconsistent elements of Fallout's world as a whole. And many of you have probably guessed where I'm going with this. Do ghouls need to eat, drink water, expel waste? Well, according to Raul in the base game of New Vegas, yes, they do. Ghouls still need the nutrients of food and water to sustain their body, and naturally, this means that they would expel the waste of whatever they consume. In Fallout 2, there's a settlement of ghouls called Gecko, and they grow crops and raise livestock. So, yeah, ghouls do need to consume nutrients in order to survive. Don't get me wrong, Little Yang Z is nowhere near as stupid as Billy in Fallout 4, but it's still a plot hole and one that I feel severely undermines the story that Obsidian was trying to tell here. The problem here is that what's being presented comes off as something trying to evoke very strong emotions, but not putting forth the work to legitimize that kind of reaction as grounded and justified. While it could be argued that the ghouls might be able to feast on the occasional lobotomite, night stalker, or even each other, none of those would be able to sustain the Yangtze population for that long. Lobotomites weren't prominent within Big Mountain for at least several decades following the Great War. Night Stalkers are shown to be quite capable at adapting and would know to steer clear of Little Yang Z, and I refuse to believe with this many ghouls remaining that they were able to fit enough in this camp to last 200 years feeding every single surviving ghoul. As for water, at best, you could argue that the rain might sustain them given that ghouls don't have much of a concern for irradiated water, but let me also remind you that Big Mountain is in the middle of a desert, one that, according to the people that I talked to at Hoover Dam when I visited Vegas, is in the middle of a multi-decade long drought as of 2022. So no, there is quite literally nothing to suggest how these ghouls have survived for as long as they have. They can't even leave the camp to get food and water because of the bomb collars, and they can't survive without food and water. But the problem here isn't just the inconsistency with the prior world building. Writers need to be extremely careful when tackling certain subject matter, because a failure to put in the necessary legwork to justify it can make the use of certain real-world topics come off as very exploitative. Concentration camps, and especially systemic racism, are subjects that have been relevant to America for a very long time. And I wouldn't blame anyone for feeling insulted by the lack of substance here, depending on how it pertains to them personally. That being said, I do feel the need to reiterate that this game and its DLC were subject to rather extreme time, budgetary, and resource constraints. The primary reason for me highlighting this is that I feel doing so can really help to illustrate just how much the rest of the game gets right when tackling similarly grim topics, and just how much work Obsidian generally puts into their projects, even with such immense constraints to their development cycle. Let's be fair, Obsidian has a very strong track record, even just within New Vegas, of handling darker subject matter with a great deal of respect. Slavery, rape, even fucking genocide. I don't think it'd be remotely fair to accuse Obsidian of lazily throwing in a concentration camp with a horrific backstory just for the sake of getting a reaction from its audience. I imagine with more time, money, and resources, they not only could have ironed out the details, but perhaps expanded even further on the idea presented here. But unfortunately as it stands, this is an objectively lacking use of a rather serious subject. I don't want to harp on for too long, I'm quite comfortable in assuming that this issue stems from the limited production, and that's not something worth getting heated over. But it is an objective issue. 
One last bit of world building I'd like to cover is that which pertains to the second courier. In the base game of New Vegas, there were occasional references to another courier that was asked to deliver the platinum chip, instead opting out and passing the mission onto the player character. In Dead Money, Elijah and Christine both mention another courier they encountered prior to reaching the Sierra Madre, though both are quite vague when referencing him, barring a description of him wearing the old world flag on his back and having saved Christine at the Big Empty. Joshua Graham in Honest Hearts briefly mentions another courier that Joshua understood as being sent to assassinate him, hinting that this other courier could be a member of the Legion. In Old World Blues, this subplot is given much more focus. We had to take precautions after the last visitors. They caused a great deal of damage in a short time. Should have made sure they couldn't mention Big Mountain once they left. An oversight. Dr. Eight and Dr. O could tell you more. Dr. O more than Eight. The battle against the visitors damaged Eight's voice module. Suffice to say, those visitors are unwelcome. They stole a great many secrets and much technology. Impertinent. They also broke one of my trains. No! Beyond is death. Despite mounting evidence to the contrary. No matter where these strange humans wander in from with their ideas and new brains, there is nothing beyond Big Mountain. Enough! Stop filling my precious brain cell units with irrelevant data! You sound like the other visitors, making wild claims of a world beyond, where there is a war beyond war. It is unproven and unthinkable. I don't like to talk about it. Eight, he can't talk about it. They fried his voice module. Something good. It wasn't all the visitors, though. Only one of them got out of control. He's the one that took control of Little Yangtze, our old human farm. This human. I can't believe it. He broke out of the think tank in seconds. Then he went for Yangtze, got bomb collars, and started practicing on the subjects that were still there until he got the right frequency. We were sending robots to stop him, and he was slicing and cutting through their shells with some souped-up laser gun like they were cheese paper. When he hacked into the mainframe, A tried to stop him and got fried. Me? He rerouted my processors to take control of the train network here. If you see the tunnels with the trains plowed into them, you can thank our visitor for that. He wrecked the whole place. While we were trying to keep containment on the surface, turns out he used one train to punch out a tunnel and escape. Sealed now. But... Two other human specimens. One arrived not long after the troublemaker. And the last one, not sure when he showed up, thought the first one was going to be lobotomized in Y-17. She got out somehow. The last subject, Klein might know more. He talked to him and let him leave the think tank. Hope he knew what he was doing. Klein knows things we don't. And I think he told some of those things to the last visitor. Dangerous things that they ever got out. Oh, a mailman. A delivery man. Someone who takes parcels from place to place using their primitive feet or similar conveyance. You are the second one I've met in recent times. Very different specimens. Of course. You must have met others in your travels. This one had met other couriers, too. Although it sounded as if he hadn't met the correct one. He asked us all many questions, and then he asked a most perplexing one. We had to segment the event out of our memories for safety. I do not know, nor should we try to access it. Perhaps Klein has the logs. My evaluation would be to let your own curiosity go. I do not think that Klein remembers the conversation as being satisfactory. Hmm? Oh yes, the last visitor. Well, the one just before you. Had an interesting name from some language that's almost impossible to speak. What 
did we speak about? Melancholy fellow. Had questions about uh, history, but our conversation got interrupted. Twice, I believe. Once when the trains got derailed, and then a second time. Oddly enough, now that I'm accessing my databanks, I don't recall what the second time was. Mobius's incessant transmissions keep distracting me. Also, we didn't brain scrub the visitor. He may have left with some knowledge he shouldn't have. I believe, maybe. Oh well, I'm sure it's of no consequence. I don't make many mistakes in calculation or perception, so probability favors me. There are also a number of hollow tapes that can be found throughout Big Mountain, with these tapes finally giving a voice to the ghost that's been Ulysses. Don't want to argue philosophy with you. Brotherhood are preservationists. Tech in the wrong hands, it's dangerous. Mojave's proof. No denying that. Proof's here in this crater. All around us. Your tribe, the Brotherhood. Haven't met many of you. Wanted to. Thought you might be the last chance for the Mojave, the West, the East. But you're all the same mind. Obsessed. Elijah is obsessed. He's mad. It's why they ordered his execution. Two are more alike than you know. Two wrapped up in the wrong bits of history to see ahead. Not judging. I know how it is. People are like couriers. You and him. Sometimes don't even know the message they bring. You all had a new flag. Thought maybe new ideas along with it. What you believe isn't any better than the bear or bull. No future in either. So says the man with the old world flag on his back. America, the Commonwealth, burned away. America sleeps. And until it's dead, I carry it. Just like I carried you. More than hope. Belief. There's voices here in the big empty. I want to talk to them. Not like your Elijah did. Got questions. Want to hear history give its answer. Didn't think you'd make it back. Almost didn't. Got my answers. Your Elijah... He met the gods in this place. Did a good job of making them question the way of things. Do you know where he went? He's gone to the Sierra Madre. That's a special kind of hell. He won't come back. Someone smarter and tougher is going to kill him. If the Madre doesn't. I have to go after him. Not going to talk you out of it. Know what it means to track someone you share history with. Got a meeting of my own. That courier? Get him to come to me. Got a message for him. Like the message he had for me. Make them walk the road west, straight and true. Sink their feet in old world ash. Let storms tear at them. See the divide. See what happened. The Divide? There's nothing there. Nothing there. Like the big empty. The Sierra Madre. No. The old world sleeps there. Sure as the flag I carry. The courier knows the way. And at the Divide, he and I, there, we'll have an ending to things. He talks in a very awkward manner. Sentences incomplete, lacking conjunction, sudden starts, only necessary words. Given what we understand about the various tribes and Caesar's legion from Honest Hearts and the base game, players paying close attention will start to unravel that this Ulysses must be or must have been a member of Caesar's legion. But this character is very distinct from what we understand about your average legionnaire. Though there are certain exceptions, most notably Wolpus and Colta, who is notably intelligent compared to almost every other member of the Legion, Ulysses also scolds Christine and the Brotherhood of Steel for being no different than other groups such as the NCR and Legion that cling to the old world, confirming that this man is no longer associated with the Legion. Christine responds with a remark about the old world flag that Ulysses bears on his back, but he retorts that America isn't dead but that it sleeps, and he's here in the big empty to hear history give its answers to his questions. 
How and why Ulysses came to bear the Old World flag isn't concretely answered, but it doesn't really matter for the time being since we're only learning about him pretty indirectly. We can also infer from all the Old World flags littering the surfaces of the Big Empty that Ulysses explored it pretty extensively. There's also the reference Ulysses makes in his conversation with Christine to the Sierra Madre, implying he's also survived a trip into the villa. So it's pretty clear through all of this that Ulysses has been around the block, and he's extremely capable as a survivor, which makes sense given that he's a courier and his past job was delivering items from place to place across the wasteland. With that, it can be pretty intimidating to hear Ulysses tell Christine that he plans to wait for and eventually meet the courier. What he truly means by this is unknown for the time being, but it's an effective setup for the next DLC nonetheless. Moving on from that, the conversation with Klein confirms that Ulysses did make it into the think tank, and it was through his line of questions regarding the old world that the think tank became fully aware of the world outside Big Mountain once again. But apparently, certain questions bothered the think tank to the point that they were willing to scrub their memory banks of that moment in the encounter. As to whether or not Ulysses got his answers, or what his questions even were, well, I guess we'll just have to wait and see. This was a really fun one for me personally, because I took a pretty lengthy break from New Vegas after finishing the script of the side quest video. I had other videos in mind that I really wanted to get around to finalizing the scripts for, plus I was spending a lot of time with my family and indulging in other hobbies of mine that I kind of put to the wayside for a while now. But the moment I finally got back to writing this script, I just couldn't stop. And I hope the enjoyment that I had in writing this particular part has shined through. Old World Blues is a very up and down expansion for me, but barring Little Yang Zi, I found the world building of Big Mountain thoroughly enjoyable to dissect. It really is impressive just how massive an effect this one location has had within the world of Fallout. Be sure to stay tuned for my final thoughts of the Old World Blues DLC that'll be provided in my concluding piece. I'll see you in two weeks. We've been at this for a little while, huh? Well, I have. For all two dozen of you keeping up, it's been about a two-week wait per video. For those of you in the future, I hope you've been enjoying yourself and I hope the world hasn't nuked itself yet. For me, it's been several months, but a fun several months to be sure. And it's always nice to get to this point in the project where I've hit yet another milestone. Sorry if that sounds a bit sappy, but it really is so satisfying to see each of these reviews come to their conclusions. Old World Blues is definitely a mixed bag, and while I know I've been pretty harsh with some of my critiques, I want to reiterate that I absolutely understand why anyone would consider this their favorite DLC for New Vegas. Old World Blues is by far the most lighthearted of the DLCs despite its darker implications, and it's really easy to just hop into and have some fun with. The map's fun to explore, there's a ton of loot, cool secrets, there's a lot going on for it as far as fun factor. Even if fun is ultimately subjective, there's a lot of different elements to have fun with. The highlight of Old World Blues is easily the world building. Sure, Little Yang Zi is a bit undercooked, but by and large, the world building here is really damn solid. The world of Fallout is incredible, and visiting a location with such a lasting impact on the world around it is a great way of keeping the player engaged. As many of you know, the Sierra Madre is one of my favorite locations in New Vegas, hell, probably in fiction if I'm being completely honest, so getting to see the origins of the technology behind it while also learning new things about two of the major characters of Dead Money, that is fucking awesome for me. The whole map of Big Mountain has something of a theme park feel to it, where different people are likely to find different parts of it more appealing to go check out. This isn't just a structural gimmick though, it serves a legitimate purpose. It never feels aimless, which was one of the major weaknesses to Zion in Honest Hearts. And whenever a location isn't tied to that side quest or the main quest, you can be certain that there will be something to do with Ulysses, some interesting loot, or a fucking legendary bloat fly. Old World Blues does have one major issue though, and that's enemy health. Again, I get it, very hard plus hardcore mode equals tougher enemies, yeah yeah yeah, but when enemies start requiring multiple nuclear detonations to kill, I think it's fair to say that their health bars might just be a teensy bit bloated. Health has always been something of a divisive subject in modern Fallout because you don't want the game to feel too video gamey by having it so stat oriented that it kills any sense of realism, but you also want those stats to have a significant enough impact to ensure that the role playing experience remains engaging throughout. There needs to be a sense of balance. I think the base game actually does a pretty good job of just that. And although the enemies of Dead Money and Honest Hearts were definitely starting to push what I would consider a fair health pool, it never got too crazy. 
And hey, when playing on the standard difficulty, things are pretty well balanced for the most part. I just play on very hard mode because I've been playing this game for so many years that it's the only way I'll get any kind of challenge. Old World Blues just takes things way too far though. This shit honestly started to remind me of Borderlands 2's Ultimate Vault Hunter mode with overpowered level 10. Thankfully, enemies didn't automatically heal like in Borderlands 2's UVHM, but those of you who have played Borderlands will understand just what I mean when I say you need to have a really damn well built build for this DLC. To put this into proper perspective, I did a little test run of Old World Blues with my most overpowered character that I used console commands to basically give everything I could ever want to, and I was having to put about as much effort into the normal difficulty of Old World Blues as I was for very hard mode in Dead Money, with normal characters at level 20. That is fucking insane. I wouldn't say it makes the game unplayable, but it's really fucking tedious to say the least, and it can make combat feel incredibly monotonous when you're putting shell after shell into the most common and basic enemies. And it's a shame too, because the enemies encountered in this DLC are really fucking cool. Fucking robot scorpions, dude, that is fucking sick. And look at these motherfuckers with their skeleton heads being all like, Wah! Unfortunately, the story itself isn't that strong either, with a number of holes in the script that don't quite make sense, and possibly the worst pacing of any story in Fallout, or at least in Fallout New Vegas. I get that this is a place of wondrous technology, but that doesn't mean the human body can suddenly cope with the loss of the brain, spine, and heart as easily as Old World Blues makes it out to be. I'm not saying I don't buy it being possible, but holy fuck, the courier is right back up and at it without any struggle to speak of, and it puts a major strain on the suspension of disbelief. Hell, you actually get perks from it, meaning you're better off from the moment you've woken up. That's not really how transplants work. Now, maybe you weren't bothered by this, and that's perfectly fine, but there's still an objective issue with the consistency of the writing and not to mention some major ludonarrative dissonance. I can buy that the courier survived being shot in the head, given enough time to recover, and under the right circumstances. It's incredibly unlikely, but having it occur right at the start of the story allows for a degree of leniency we as the audience can feasibly permit. People have survived being shot in the head before, both in the real world and in Fallout, so it's not an impossibility. I don't know a single person that's ever survived with an artificial heart, brain, and spine, so you need to put a hell of a lot of legwork into convincing me that that is even remotely possible if you intend to keep me engaged, and Old World Blues simply refuses to do that. No amount of Tesla coils can hand wave something this insane. It also doesn't help that this DLC starts with one of the most asinine dialogues I've ever seen in a video game. On a first playthrough, it might get a good laugh out of the player here and there. It certainly did for me. But beyond that first playthrough, several cracks will already be showing. The first several minutes of this conversation are just aimless bickering between the brains and aside from the occasional speech check, there's nothing to distinguish this dialogue between playthroughs. I played through this game with seven characters for this review, and it was the fucking same every single time. Why? Why game? To say this utterly murders the pacing of the narrative would be an understatement like no other, and I'd be lying to you if I told you that the pacing begins to pick up even slightly before finally reaching the closing of the story. Even skipping this dialogue takes well over a couple of minutes. As far as characters go, the only one I really cared for, not counting the brain, Christine, or Ulysses, would be Dr. Mobius. I think the twist with him being a chill guy just trying to keep the think tank from discovering the outside world was really well done, and I appreciated that even his side was pretty morally gray. That's not to imply the other brains were though, oh no, far from it. These eggheads are fucking monsters that deserve no mercy and are about as morally repugnant as it gets, to the point that even the writers aren't going to bother trying to justify them in any way, but I also think that's the point. The whole point of Big Mountain conceptually and canonically is science without limits. No ethics whatsoever. These characters may very well have once been good people. We get hints as to who they once were throughout the DLC, but that doesn't justify them or make these experiments okay. 
It illustrates how far gone they've become at the loss of moral boundaries, and that is some damn good writing. It's honestly kinda tragic to see Dala express her regrets after being in this state for two plus centuries. That's a long time to live with that kind of regret. In the end, Old World Blues doesn't always knock it out of the park, but when it does, it's pretty damn good, and overall, I would rate it quite positively. It's a significant step up from Honest Hearts, but it's not quite at the level of dead money. For simplicity's sake, if I were to put a number to it, I'd give Honest Hearts a 4 out of 10, Old World Blues a 7, and Dead Money a 9. I don't really like using numbered scores in my videos, as is probably apparent at this point, but there you go. Taking your chances coming here. Just like bringing the Lord of Vegas his tribute, bending your knee to old world ghosts. You and that chip deserve each other. Twenty-nine less coins than other traitors have carried, if history's true. Now see the road the old world paves, and what the lights of new Vegas promise, if they haven't blinded your eyes. Wow. Holy crap. We're down to one last expansion. Been a hell of a ride so far, hasn't it? I'm sure there'll be some people who see this and think that I'm just shitting on Honest Hearts or Old World Blues, but I think it's fair to say at this point that I'm not afraid to criticize media that I genuinely love, as well as media that I genuinely hate. On an unrelated note, the last part of my Lonesome Road review series will be going up on the 31st of December, and I think that's pretty cool. Originally, I had it slated for Christmas, but... I have a much larger project planned for that, so stay tuned. I have a feeling that some of you are really going to enjoy that one. But that's all I've got for now. I'll see you all next time when we enter the Divide. And we finally arrived. Gotta say, when I first started drafting that Dead Money review back in the dusk of 2020, I hadn't imagined that we'd come this far in a complete Fallout New Vegas DLC review series. Funny thing, that. Lonesome Road is a fascinating DLC to me for a number of reasons, and it's had a strangely mixed reception amongst players over the years, far more so than any other DLC in New Vegas, and that really is saying something. More casual players of New Vegas and the newer iterations of Fallout in general didn't quite gravitate towards the brutality of Dead Money and its focus on survival. Honest Hearts was the complete opposite, with casual fans taking to the more open-world design but hardcore fans not really being quite as engaged with it. Old World Blues, while solid, was trying for a more Futurama-style narrative with a comedic surface underlied by darker elements. And while it certainly got its share of laughs out of the players, the consensus of its objective quality was still fairly mixed though it was overall more positively received than Dead Money and Honest Hearts at the time of release. Lonesome Road, however, is a very different kind of beast. Now I will say, I'm not personally privy to the reception of Lonesome Road at the time of its launch. Lonesome Road dropped on September 20th of 2011 after multiple delays, two days before the launch of Dark Souls. At the time, I was wrapped up with games like Uncharted 3, COD Zombies, Demon Souls, Telltale games, and the best generation of Pokemon, so unfortunately I just don't have the same grasp of its reception at the time as I do the other DLCs, though I can say that it was the least talked about, at least among the general Fallout player base that I interacted with at the time. But as time's gone on, more and more people have covered the New Vegas DLCs, and it's interesting to see just how different certain takes on it are. Some people think that Ulysses is a long-winded lunatic and ultimately uninteresting, others find him pretty fascinating. Fascinating. Some think the combat is excessively brutal, others find it to be an engaging challenge, some think it's the weakest DLC, some think it's the strongest. It's really interesting to me as someone who really loves this game to see such a split consensus on this expansion, and I'd be curious to hear what you think about it in the comments. A lot of YouTubers that I follow, or at least have occasionally listened to over the years, have also had pretty mixed takes on Lonesome Road. Oxhorn seemed to think that it was pretty good from what I remember, though he did have his reservations. Fither was fairly mixed, primarily
clearly due to Ulysses. Salt Factory and Private Sessions both thought that Lonesome Road was pretty damn excellent as a send-off to New Vegas. Charlatan Wonder thought that Lonesome Road was up there with Fallout Brotherhood of Steel and Fallout 76 as one of the worst pieces of content ever featured in the franchise. Slipmaker was very mixed, enjoying the gameplay, but finding Ulysses to be a shameless self-insert for Chris Avalon that, while fascinating in regards to the lore, ultimately fell flat in regards to his interactions with the player. And to be perfectly clear, these are very general summations of the thoughts these YouTubers presented. If you want a full understanding of their content, perspective, and arguments, I implore you to check out their content for yourself. Links will be in the description of this video. Lonesome Road is a DLC with a much more subtle setup that juxtaposes a number of the elements found in setting up prior DLCs. Dead Money's setup revolved entirely around a broadcast alluding to some great treasure and the introduction of a character teased in the base game. A character that players knew about from his ties to one of the major factions of the franchise and how he disappeared after a significant event prior to the time of the base game of New Vegas. Lonesome Road, however, suggests very directly that the player shouldn't even come here to begin with, both by the antagonist Ulysses and by the game itself. And this continues late into the DLC, with Ulysses reminding you that you didn't have have to come this far, and the option to turn around is available even just before the very end of the story. The setup of Honest Hearts revolved around a character that players would be excited to finally meet, as he was regarded almost as a legend pertaining to one of the game's major factions and was involved in one of the most significant events leading up to the time of the base game. Meanwhile, the character Lonesome Road revolves around has only been subtly alluded to in drips throughout the base game and prior DLCs as someone who's just happened to be where the player character has also ventured, but with no grasp as to what exactly it is that he was doing there, and more or perhaps even less importantly, why. The setup of Old World Blues sort of went back to Fallout's roots, with the focus being on a pre-war facility with deep ties to the US government and military that could potentially house wondrous technology, the likes of which had never even been seen in these games. Lonesome Road doesn't make any such promise. As far as you can tell, you're just going to be walking down the road to have a chat with a fellow courier. There is no expectation being established here aside from meeting a guy that you've heard of in a handful of references, potentially. There's an element of mystique at play here, but it's a very grounded kind, one that beckons through sheer curiosity of what it could all mean and what the teases have been leading up to. There's no great promise of treasure, no prominent legend to follow, no allusion to the very history of the series, just a road that's been subtly constructed through drip-fed allusions to a ghost that we've yet to meet that seems to carry a disposition for the player character across the base games and the previous DLCs. You know that it's going to go somewhere, but you don't really have any clue where that is. In the base game of New Vegas, all we really know about this courier is what we're told by Johnson Nash at the Vicky and Vance Casino in Prim. Before us was another courier who'd been chosen to carry the platinum ship to Mr. House, but upon seeing our name next down on the list, he cancelled. Why he chose to leave the delivery to our own character is unknown at the time. This is a job that anyone would have been wise to pass on, but nevertheless, it's peculiar that he reacted to our name as he did. Nash also suggests that the courier traveled west to the Divide after turning down the job, though what exactly the Divide even is isn't really known at the time. In Dead Money, Elijah and Christine allude to another courier that they met at the Big Empty. Although he's not directly referenced as the same courier who turned down the delivery of the Platinum ship, references to other couriers are surprisingly scarce throughout New Vegas, so it's likely that many players would begin to wonder if perhaps this courier that Elijah and Christine met was the very same courier that Nash referenced back in Prim. The epilogues which see Christine surviving the Sierra Madre and Dog and God finally uniting also reference word of two couriers meeting in the Divide, confirming that this courier is in fact the one who refused the Platinum Chip delivery and left for the Divide, setting up an inevitable meeting between the two of them in the future expansion of Lonesome Road. Joshua Graham mentions that he's been waiting for a courier to come for him, but he makes it clear that he wasn't referring to the player character, implying that he knows this other courier in some way. Again, there's no telling if it's the same courier, but anyone paying attention at this point is likely to assume this to be the case, and they'd be correct. Old World Blues is the first we hear of Ulysses' voice, and it's through the holotape of his conversations with Christine that we learn he does in fact have some sort of score to settle with Courier 6. 
the player character. We also learn by talking to the brains of the think tank that it was through a question posed by Ulysses that they came to remember the pre-war age and recognize the world beyond Big Mountain, which Mobius had forced them to forget previously by tampering with their memory in their databanks. This means that Ulysses is responsible for the events of Old World Blues, as the knowledge of Mobius's brainwashing is what allowed the think tank to begin plotting to push beyond the boundaries of Big Mountain. From all of these references, one can deduce that Ulysses is very much on the same level as the Courier as far as his impact on the world around him. This is something that will be reinforced as time goes on, but as it stands, the player is very much in a similar position as someone like House, Caesar, or Oliver, in that they've witnessed firsthand the effects this character's had on the world without actually having met the man. The question then becomes whether or not the man is of altruistic principles, or is perhaps an unknown threat to the Mojave. Nothing about what we've been told prior to Lonesome Road suggests either way, so it's up to the player to find out for themselves. And that's exactly what this setup hinges upon, player curiosity. The only way to figure this guy out is to go and meet him for yourself, and if you don't care, then you don't have to bother with it. We're told from the start and on multiple occasions throughout the expansion, both by Ulysses and the in-game text boxes, which sort of implies that the courier is also considering just turning around, that we do not have to do this. There is no other incentive besides our own sheer curiosity to walk this road, at least beyond the meta context of wanting to play the DLC that we paid for, and that unwitting curiosity will become an integral component to the conflict and themes presented in this expansion. But the differences between this and past expansions don't stop there. Up to this point, each of the New Vegas DLCs and even the base game have kicked off with a slideshow narration regarding the premise of the story to give the player context for what's about to happen. The base game establishes the conflict between the NCR and Caesar's Legion, informing the player of how they got caught up in this debacle. Dead Money's narration was from Elijah describing the legend of the Sierra Madre and why it's so special in the context of the pre- and post-apocalypse. The narration of Honest Hearts was a recounting of the story of Joshua Graham by Jed Masterson, and Old World Blues opened with the narration by Mobius introducing the player to Big Mountain. But when the player steps into the Divide, the game just continues as if you were exploring any other part of the Mojave. Don't get me wrong, the opening narrations of New Vegas, Dead Money, and Honest Hearts were pretty solid and there is value to them, but the way that Lonesome Road starts more organically really is a nice change of pace, at least in regards to optional content. And in the context of Lonesome Road's setup, it's a great method of presentation. Even simple juxtapositions like this can add a certain eyebrow-raising intrigue to the presentation that makes players feel more inherently curious, which again is what this whole setup has been about. It's not until some ways into the DLC that the player will receive their first bit of expository dialogue, and it's here where things really begin to pick up. After entering the Divide, the player steps into a military bunker where they discover an ED iBot, not to be confused with ED from the base game, which is a different machine and AI, sort of, altogether. Though it is worth noting that all of the upgrades and even audio files from this ED get transferred to the ED of the base game after Lonesome Road is complete. This ED is essentially a robot clone, as a low intelligence courier would describe it, made by the Hopeville Silos automated systems after scanning the original ED, the one back in Prim, sometime after it was shot, and using scrap parts to recreate it in a pod. This isn't out of the question by any means, and I can buy that a scavenger from Prim would be willing to get this close to the divide if it meant getting some valuable scrap or gear. Using ED, we make our way through the military bunker and eventually step out into the ruins of the small town of Hopeville, and it's here that Ulysses is finally able to connect to ED and begin speaking with the player. Taking your chances coming here, just like bringing the Lord of Vegas his tribute, bending your knee to old world ghosts. You and that chip deserve each other. Twenty-nine less coins than other traitors have carried, if history's true. Now see the road the old world paves, and what the lights of New Vegas promise, if they haven't blinded your eyes. Power isn't strength. Power can wall off someone when they believe it's freed them. House's power. You've seen the wall around Vegas. He gains more power. That wall will grow. The Mojave will become Vegas. But it's more light than strength. You'll see 
the way of it soon enough.
Let's death move a little faster without me pulling the trigger. Promises to keep to others. And the mile he's dangerous enough left to the land. The land has its way. If I wanted you dead, we would have met sooner. Not sure that's the way this ends. Might be that history needs to have its say. If not, then messages will do. The Divide. This place is a slice of it. Old military. Can still smell the pride. And the fear. Hope of the old world. Wrapped in fencing. Covered in storm. Got new inhabitants now. Other than ghosts. More recent. Recruits. America sleeps in the divide. Giants beneath the earth. You saw one locked in the silo beneath you. There's more. Only takes a few of them, locked below ground, to tear apart the earth and cast dust, sand, ash into the skies above. You'll see the extent, the miles of it, soon enough. You need to see it. Walk it. For now, eyes alert. Watch the streets below. There's still life in the divide. Threats other than the storms and wind. New inhabitants. These new inhabitants, not natives, most of them, came with duty, purpose, ready to kill each other. The divide was stronger. Left marks on them, too. Not bear, not bull. Now, radiations marked them, made them equal in history's eyes. As vicious as the storms are, these shadows of legion, of NCR, silhouettes of things to come. If you saw their corpses, you saw mercy, got what they deserved, coming to the divide. The bear and bull, NCR legion, came in waves, before and after, right into the invisible fires, the wind ground collapsing beneath them. Once under different flags, now they are equal in their hatred of the trespassers. You and I. Even as the fires here burned them from within, the winds of the divide tore their skin, exposed them, screaming to the sky. And just as the divide tears at them, so they tear at each other for sport like some tribal scarification. Falling back to their history, maybe. No matter what they suffer, the radiation, fire of the divide, sustains them, makes them stronger. There's truth in your words, in what I've seen of their tactics, movements, recovery. Those wounds, they couldn't live otherwise. The divide winds have torn the skin from many of them. Maybe the radiation is the only thing keeping them walking. They camp near silos, warheads. No way to cleanse the radiation. Makes them hard to kill there. Have to draw them out. The robot with you. All of them are machines. Radios, old world tech reshaped with new hands, historians, couriers carrying messages. Seen them as I've walked the divide, tending other machines. That one, sealed inside the Hopeville silo. Sign America is waking up. It will follow you, obey you, carry it until we are face to face. Then there'll be no more need for it to carry my words. America's 
sleeps ahead of you. It's nightmares filled with quakes, storms. You'll need to find your own path. That means waking America's spears up from their slumber. There's ways. Warheads set off collapse. Warheads could open the gates again. You're resourceful. That machine, robot with you, can help you find the warheads you need to destroy. And their trigger, the detonator. The way ahead is below. The tools are there. The rest, up to you. Who are you who do not know your history? You came all this way for answers. Only currency I have. Nothing else to be gained. Could turn around, walk away at any time. If history matters to you, you'll need to earn it. Any laws of mine, I have already cast away in the divide. They're lost to you. For now, find the trigger for the warheads buried in Hopeville. Use it to keep moving and keep alive. The divide will send its worst against you. It may break you. We'll see if you're stronger. Road gets rougher from here, courier. Left marks for you. Colors will tell the way if you're smart. They'll lead you to your home one more time. Lead to the ending of it. Maybe remind you why you wander. I'm not going to go into a full-blown breakdown of Ulysses as a character yet, but I want to cover what the game is doing with this dialogue and how he's being used to exposit information in this opening speech. Ulysses makes his disdain for Courier 6 abundantly clear right out the gate, and he makes it a point to comment on the player's most favored reputation with the primary factions of New Vegas. Players aligned with the NCR will be met with a verbal scowl, with Ulysses referring to the NCR and all of its followers as weak and sick with a very condescending tone. Players going the independent Vegas route will be talked down to for not following a flag of their own, as well as lacking principles and purpose. Players aligned with House are looked down upon for being a tool for an old world ghost. Male Legion couriers are questioned for their loyalty as if to imply they're not true Legion through blood or tradition. The same goes for female Legion couriers, which offers its own unique dialogue where Ulysses is somewhat perplexed by the female courier's role in the Legion. These comments on the courier's alignments, or lack thereof, make for a great way to get some quick insight on Ulysses as a character. As it turns out, Ulysses is a former member of the Legion, and despite being dissonant from them, he still carries some level of respect for them. But when it comes to the couriers aligned with NCR or House, Ulysses scoffs, having zero faith in either to rebuild civilization and no respect for their customs. His condemning of a courier seeking Vegas' independence also shows a certain devotion to his character that will remain fairly relevant throughout Lonesome Road. Aside from commenting on the player's reputation with the base game's major factions, the first thing many players are likely to notice is the way Ulysses talks, though many will have already noticed this just from listening to the holotapes from Big Mountain. Descriptive. That's the word. Long speech. Dragged syllables, all leading into a burst of emphasis gripping the player's attention even as it teeters off. When referring to the NCR, the Courier, and even Edie, there's a certain scowl to his verbose, but when it comes to Legion, his tone borders on melancholy and disappointment, as if to sigh in retrospect of the doomed faction that he once followed. It's this simultaneously vague but unashamed way of speaking where he makes his feelings abundantly clear while remaining fairly cryptic about his actual goals with frequent use of metaphors. And when he does speak directly, his demeanor becomes notably more aggressive, helping to add further emphasis to whatever answer or revelation that he has to offer. The voice direction here is outstanding, with a great deal of effort being put into every single syllable of his speech. Given how much dialogue there is with this character, it really is insane to see the effort that goes into quite literally every syllable that he speaks. He's very thoughtful in how he talks, with a surprisingly refined vocabulary for a former member of the Legion, and it goes a long way in commanding a certain level of respect from the player. Also, he's kind of hot. I understand that some people don't care for the more long-winded dialogue, but thankfully for players like that, there are dialogue options every time you encounter him to tell him just, hey, 
shut the fuck up, I don't care. And it's not as simple as a skip to the closing dialogue where he says, okay, get a move on, enemies here are gonna find you. Ulysses scoffs and looks down on you for your lack of caring, which makes sense given certain plot details that will become more apparent as time goes on. Ulysses then goes on to reveal that he was Courier 6 before the player character, but that he figured the platinum ship delivery would lead the soon-to-be Courier 6 to a certain death. Ulysses wants the Courier dead, however the why of it is going to be left up in the air for some time. What's more interesting, I find at the moment, is the fact that he actually doesn't care to go kill the Courier himself. He has more on his mind than simple vengeance, and if he wanted to, he would have met the Courier long before now. Ulysses then acknowledges how impressive it is that Courier 6 has managed to evade death for as long as they have. Couriers are some of the most important people in post-war America, and it requires a hell of an ability to survive to be able to traverse the wastes as a career. You need the strength to carry all your supplies. You need the perception to keep from unknowingly treading upon dangerous territory. You need endurance to survive the harsh conditions. You need charisma to talk your way out of any deals gone wrong. You need intelligence to comprehend all that goes into your deliveries. You need agility to sneak past an enemy that would otherwise kill you. And last but not least, you need a fair bit of luck to not fall victim to some unforeseen circumstance. Ulysses even claims that couriers have the power to help build or destroy nations. And he's not wrong. Couriers are the very embodiment of one's ability to bring about change, be that intentional or not, because they're people whose lives center around the ability to bring others together, deliver supplies that the lives of communities hinge upon, and they're typically not even limited by borders, as most civilized factions need to take advantage of couriers in order to thrive. But Courier 6 stands amongst the best of them, and Ulysses is fully aware of that, remarking that typically, the land itself would decide the fate of people like Courier 6, and that the Divide may very well still. The Divide has been referenced only a couple of times at this point, and this conversation with Ulysses will be the first as far as solid details regarding it. According to Ulysses, the Divide was destroyed sometime in the past when missiles beneath its surface were detonated, cracking open the earth and becoming highly irradiated, turning what was apparently once a thriving nation into a nuclear hellscape. The mass amounts of radiation coupled with the violent winds turned the Divide into a place where one would be lucky to die, as its new residents were not given such a luxury. Those who were unlucky to be caught in the Divide apparently found the winds flaying their skin, the radiation infecting them beyond ghoulification. It's theorized by Courier 6, provided they have a high enough medicine skill, that the radiation is perhaps the very thing keeping these marked people alive. And Ulysses seems to concur with the possibility of it, though even he can't say for certain. Certain. With Ulysses being revealed as the antagonist and the road ahead finally being established, we can forge on with the goal of meeting Ulysses and settling this grudge that he bears against Courier 6, though there are still many questions to be answered along the way. Why does Ulysses hate the Courier? What exactly is Ulysses' history with Caesar's Legion? What is Ulysses' plan anyway? What did he learn from Big Mountain? What's his connection to the Divide? What awaits us in the Divide? All of this will be answered in due time, but for now we have all that we need to push forward. Of all the DLCs beyond Dead Money, this is by far the one that I'm most eager to dissect given its overall mixed reception, and I've got a hell of a lot to say myself, especially after having replayed it as many times as I have recently. At the time of writing, the plan is to have this video up by October 22nd, and hopefully by then I'll finally be done with the goddamn Demon Souls video, but if I haven't, well, hey. I'm making a Demon Souls video, but for now I think it's time to step away from the divide and save the discussion for later. The next part is going to center around the gameplay of Lonesome Road, and beyond that will be a two-part analysis of the writing followed by the conclusion. I hope you guys are looking forward to this coverage even half as much as I am, but until next time, have a wonderful day. I don't think it would be unfair of me to say that Fallout isn't exactly known for its incredible gameplay, mostly because it doesn't have incredible gameplay, or even particularly good gameplay. At its core, New Vegas' gameplay is, at best, mediocre, and at worst, a bit of a train wreck. Animations don't always play out as they should, 
Aiming is a bit finicky. Hit detection doesn't seem particularly accurate. Enemy AI is often more inept than a Disney executive. Even VATS is buggy as hell, and it basically exists, at least in modern Fallout games, as a means of bypassing the awkward gunplay. Sometimes the courier will just start rapidly firing all the remaining shots from VATS and miss every single one of them despite your chances of hitting the enemy having been 95%. With longer rifles and heavy weapons, enemies that are too close will basically become impossible to hit because of how VATS locks the player character onto the enemy models. Even the damage VATS tells you will be dealt with your shots isn't always accurate. And there isn't even a proper visual to account for standard damage versus potential critical hits either. This game's combat is a fucking mess, but that isn't exactly breaking news to anyone who's remotely familiar with these titles. So, what exactly is it about New Vegas' gameplay that appeals to people as it does? Well, the answer is simple, but also kinda complicated. New Vegas boasts a wide variety of tertiary gameplay elements and scenarios to bolster the gameplay beyond the sum of its parts. When you're in combat, you're constantly taking into consideration the various skills you've invested in, the condition of your weapons, your action points, your limb condition and health, status conditions such as poison, buffs, and debuffs, and you're often going to have to consider the very same points regarding your enemies, at least in tighter encounters. Hardcore mode adds even more to consider with healing being an overtime effect, stim packs being unable to heal limbs, ammo having weight, and even more stats to manage including sleep, hunger, and hydration. This is also why I recommend playing on hardcore mode by default, even for casual players, as the experience will be far more engaging than what's on offer in normal mode. If you're playing on hardcore mode and need to heal in the middle of a fight with a deathclaw, your best method for achieving a successful heal is to either cripple its legs with the best single fire or explosive weapon at your disposal, or stagger the deathclaw into a ragdoll with either a riot shotgun, a powerful explosive, or a melee technique of which there are plenty to find throughout any run, even for non-melee oriented characters. On normal mode, you can just kind of spam stim packs for instant and massive bursts of healing, and to be clear, I'm not saying that you won't get an engaging experience on normal mode, but that hardcore mode has more for you to consider at any given time, and thus is far more engaging of an experience as a whole. But the variables that need to be taken into consideration by the player during the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay don't just stop at the stats. Environmental factors are also a great way of maintaining player engagement beyond the combat, even in a game with relatively mediocre movement and traversal as New Vegas. The amount of areas, characters, and events that you can happen upon while exploring ensures that the player will always be contemplating what's around the next corner. What kind of loot does that building over there hold? What's the deal with this guy? Will this lead me into another quest that I've yet to discover, or will it pertain to a quest that I've started but yet to complete? Dead Money also did an excellent job of showing how the developers could work with a significantly more limited setting. Throughout the Sierra Madre are a number of hazards to take into consideration. Cloud pockets can either be avoided or charged through, but either choice could lead the courier into an unforeseen circumstance. Speakers need to either be disabled or ran past very quickly. Trip wires and grenade bouquets and pressure plates are also all over the place and can either be disabled, avoided, or even used against your enemies. And any of these hazards could be found in conjunction with one another. Players who take the time to explore are likely to come across an abundance of useful resources, but further exploration also means dealing with more of the Sierra Madre's relentlessly hostile environment, so players need to be considerate towards every potential give and take. Old World Blues also did a really good job of maintaining player engagement with its amusement park structure that streamlined the exploration to consistently indulge the player's curiosity. After all, this place is full of wondrous technology and you might get some pretty damn good loot. All done? Cool beans. Why not go check out that place next? Rinse repeat. Lonesome Road, similarly to its story, feels like a culmination of all the tertiary modes of engagement explored in the base game and even prior DLCs. Level design with an emphasis on verticality, previously explored in Zion and the Big Empty, feels especially well crafted throughout the Divide. From Hopeville to Ashton, there are all different kinds of collapsed buildings and structures to ascend or descend while you engage with enemies. When staring down enemies from the high ground, you'll have the option to either take your shots from this advantageous position, attempt a flank, or even fall back into a hidden state, allowing you another chance to attempt stealth, provided the enemies don't have fast access to the player's position as the marked ones are pretty damn aggressive, and not to mention perceptive. 
When dealing with enemies at a higher position than the player character, positions of cover and alternative paths are readily apparent, allowing for the player to decide for themselves how they would prefer to approach or escape the situation. But that's not all the player has to consider. There's also a number of warheads to be found throughout the divide that can be triggered to create a sizable explosion that will blow enemies away, even on higher difficulties. Despite nukes being among Fallout's signature iconography and being so pivotal to the lore, the use of nukes nukes throughout the games has been surprisingly tame, and it's interesting to see warheads turned into an actual game mechanic that not only allows for dealing massive damage to enemies, but also is used as a means of exploring the environment. And some of these are used pretty creatively too. In one case, an entire cave with a unique alpha death claw opens, with the entrance collapsing behind the player and only being destructible by detonating another warhead. Between the player and the death claw is a rocky structure for the player to hide behind, but in order order to detonate the nuke safely, the player is going to need to come out of hiding in order to create the necessary distance between them and the nuke in order for them to survive. Since the laser detonator takes a bit of time in order to trigger each warhead, this means that the player, even with a stealth boy, would undoubtedly be exposing themselves to the death claw. In other cases, triggering a warhead can lead to a barrack filled with enemies, but also pretty valuable loot and even a commissary, or perhaps a small cave hosting a handful of goodies behind an enemy encampment. Detonating these warheads is required to progress, but doing so also alerts nearby enemies, and players that understand this can work stealth into the scenario, or just throw down with the enemies. Lonesome Road also makes use of something that I think is grossly underutilized in both the base game and other DLCs, and that's radiation. Canonically, it makes sense that very few areas in and around New Vegas would host much radiation, as Mr. House defended the city from incoming missiles during the Great War through his various security systems, but not long after the Great War, radioactive fallout swept through the Mojave through natural causes like wind and rain, and it was more than enough to kill the survivors in Las Vegas, so you'd think that there would be a bit more in terms of radioactivity, at least on the outskirts of the map, but that just doesn't seem to be the case. There are some radioactive hotspots and there is Camp Searchlight, but the amount of radioactive hotspots is noticeably sparse compared to games like Fallout. Fallout 3. Dead Money opts to utilize the cloud instead of radiation, which makes sense given the lore of the Sierra Madre, Zion was pretty far out of the way as far as potential targets for nukes, and Big Mountain was one of the US government's most classified projects, so I can buy that information regarding it never made its way into the years of enemy nations. There are explanations for the lack of radiation in New Vegas and its DLCs in the lore, yes, but you'd think that they'd have done a bit more with it given the title of the game. Lonesome Road, on the other hand, makes radiation a far bigger threat than any other part of New Vegas, barring perhaps Camp Searchlight. There are several locations throughout the Divide that will quickly fill that radiation meter, and detonating warheads means having to walk through another radioactive pocket, so the player needs to be swift and careful in how they navigate the Divide's more radioactive hotspots. Though I do feel compelled to point out that the radiation could have played an even bigger bigger role in hardcore mode. In fact, I'd say it probably should have, but not as an environmental hazard. What I mean to say is that there is a bizarre amount of purified water throughout the divide, which makes no sense whatsoever. Why on earth is a marked man, an enemy type described as being kept alive solely through the strength of the radiation? The radiation, what in the fuck? Why on earth is a marked man? An enemy type described as being kept alive solely through the strength of the radiation that was also strong enough to flay their body in a location that recently had multiple nuclear warheads detonated beneath it, carrying purified water. Having only dirty water in the divide would have greatly complemented the amount of radiation that exists in this area, because it would have added an extra wrinkle of complexity for hardcore players such as myself. If you're strained on supplies while simultaneously dehydrated and suffering from radiation sickness, having a drink of that water is a legitimately tough call to make, especially for newer players that have no idea how much longer they have left in the DLC, let alone how much more radiation, rat away, and sources of water that there are to even come across. I wouldn't consider this a huge knock against the DLC, if anything it is kind of a nitpick, and it only really becomes apparent in hardcore mode when you pay a lot of attention, but it also feels contradictory to the idea that 
that this place was utterly scorched with radiation after having been nuked to kingdom fuck. Food is also a bit of an issue as well. Now, as far as standard food items go, Lonesome Road does a pretty good job. You'll find all kinds of snacks and the occasional Salisbury steak if you look around hard enough, but you're not going to find any fresh and clean-cut steaks lying around this hellscape. What you will find, however, are a few dozen meals ready to eat, or MREs for short. Here's a fun fact about your favorite YouTuber. Yours truly, of course. I went to military training for a while. Unfortunately, I was medically discharged, but I had a pretty good time while I was there. During my time in training, I had a couple of MREs, one that I had to eat cold due to circumstances that I'm not going to bore you with, I was an idiot is the answer, and one that was heated up proper. They were fine, not exactly a meal that you'd get on a cruise or out of Hell's Kitchen, but compared to the powdery slops of nutrition that we were typically being fed, it was a really nice change of pace. I would not, however, describe them as being able to resolve critical starvation. Now, don't get me wrong, your standard military MRE can be a nice pick-me-up, even with the stress of battle being taken into account, and the whole point of them is to keep a soldier from going hungry over a roughly 24 hour period depending on the ration being consumed but being able to bring you back from the brink of starving to death to only mildly hungry i'm pretty comfortable in saying that uh yeah i don't think they're really that good the fact that this thing cures more hunger than well-cooked brahmin steaks is utterly baffling to me like I know this is the future and all, but this isn't as simple as, well, of course a plasma rifle is going to be more advanced in 2077 than the M1911 or the M4 carbine in the early 2000s. Now, in fairness, MREs have had an ongoing development since about 1963, so I can buy that in 2077, especially with the world being enveloped in war, that the MRE would be pretty damn effective at curing one's hunger. But I'd also like a bit more to go on here, and there's no document in the game that I'm aware of that explains why these MREs are so fucking incredible. Now, you're probably thinking at this point, this guy's been on for a bit about military rations, like, what is the big deal? So, alright, maybe the specifics of the MRE aren't exactly critical to the plot of Lonesome Road, but it all goes back to the point that I was making about purified water, just from a different angle. Having an abundance of purified water in a place like the Divide makes about as much sense as having an abundance of female warriors in the Legion or competent leaders in the NCR. Having MREs so potent that near-fatal starvation can be turned into mild hunger is gonna take a bit more than, well, they're MREs from the future. And the effect that this has on the gameplay is that it causes the management of hardcore stats to become a complete non-issue, despite this supposedly being one of the harshest environments in post-atomic North America. I'm a bit more generous to the base game and even the other expansions to an extent for having the potential to keep the player stocked up on every bit of food or water that they could ever ask for because I've put nearly 3,000 hours into New Vegas since it dropped in 2010. I have an extreme understanding of where just about everything in the base game is, especially after the recent seven playthroughs that I did for this DLC series. The Sierra Madre has the vending machines which can supply the player, but only if they they're finding enough Sierra Madre chips, which I can because I know the villa inside and out, and the casino is full of loot, which makes sense given how well preserved that it is. Honest Hearts is generous on water with its clean rivers, but when it comes to food, it's up to you to keep yourself stocked, either by bringing in a ton of food with you to Zion, or by living off the land, which makes sense. Big Mountain isn't exactly overflowing with resources, but there's enough to carry you through the pretty short main quest after which you can go right back to the Mojave and then come back whenever you like. Plus, you could bring in as many items as you like to begin with, at which point it's on you to maintain your inventory. Lonesome Road isn't the longest DLC ever, and you can bring as much as you like, just like Honest Hearts and Old World Blues, but there's also a fair amount of very heavy loot to find in the Divide, even as early as Hopeville Silo. Now sure, you can leave and come back whenever you want, but even with a PC that loads fast travel within a matter of frame, Games, going back and forth would be pretty obnoxious after a while given that you'd have to go all the way back to the canyon wreckage, step out, fast travel to whatever home base you're using for that character, drop off your items, fast travel back to the canyon wreckage, step in, then fast travel one more time to your most recent area. I imagine that most players aren't going to bother doing that as it would basically be sabotaging your own pace of progression unless they are in a serious pickle, in which case I don't exactly 
we blame them, so for the most part, players are going to find themselves edging their weight limit pretty frequently unless they just really feel like doing a lot of fast traveling, but at that point, it's kind of on them. The excess weight of loot would complement a heavy tax on one's resources pretty well, but that's typically not going to be the case since the divide is practically overflowing with MREs and purified water. Those of you who don't play on hardcore mode are probably thinking that I need to just shut the fuck up already, but even without it directly affecting the gameplay as it does in hardcore mode, you gotta admit, it's fucking weird seeing so much purified water in this atomic hellscape. I think we can agree on that much at least. It's not a world building killer or anything, but it's pretty fucking jarring to say the least. The last hardcore stat is of course sleep, which Lonesome Road doesn't really play into. Barring the inclusion of an item that lets you sleep anywhere, which I think is a great reward for players who've come this far. I will say that, in fairness, it's not like it would have made much sense to do much with sleep anyways given the length of the DLC, like those before it, is only a handful of hours. Even for players completely getting turned around, none of these DLCs really go on for long enough that the player is going to be struggling to maintain their sleep, and there's plenty of beds throughout all of the expansions to keep the player healthy should they ever need them. I don't consider it a flaw that the main quests of these DLCs are fairly short. In fact, I think that Dead Money and Lonesome Road do an alright job in telling their stories with a succinct pacing, so it doesn't really feel right to criticize them for not being longer just because sleep isn't as big of a factor as it could be in this optional game mode. I guess the only thing that I really could say is that I appreciate the inclusion of the beds throughout these expansions, as they are generally well placed throughout the maps. In regards to Lonesome Road, you'll typically find at least one bed per area, so it's unlikely that you're going to feel strained on sleep in a way that feels unfair. But ultimately, that is the extent of it. One thing I really appreciate about Lonesome Road, though, was the higher skill level requirements for just about everything in the Divide. When it comes to Ulysses, the one character you'll be conversing with, options beyond basic exposition typically require very high speech checks, some of which actually require high levels in medicine or survival. There is the occasional easy lock pick or hack, but most of them are actually set to hard or very hard, which requires levels of 75 to 100 respectively. Hacking or shutting down Ulysses' drones in the final battle, uh, spoiler, requires 100 in repair or science. The reason I like this is because it makes the DLC feel like a proper culmination of not just the narrative with Ulysses, but also one of my courier, or couriers in my particular case with making these reviews. The game recommends being at least level 30 before tackling Lonesome Road, and it's really not hard to see why. It's also appropriate given that this is the last DLC that was released that so many skill checks would require mastery of said skills. Now sure, you could tackle this DLC before any other, hell you could walk straight to the divide from Good Springs at the very start of the game pretty easily too, but I imagine the great majority of people that will do this will be people who've already played the game at least once. I don't imagine very many new players are going to beeline to this spot and proceed with it suggesting they be nearly 10 times their level. That would be a pretty odd decision, especially if they actually stuck it out. The first enemies you encounter are goddamn sentry bots. Though I suppose this is a good time to start talking about the enemies and the general combat of this DLC. Lonesome Road does not piss around when it comes to difficulty. The first enemies you fight are sentry bots, inarguably the toughest machine enemies barring special cases like the giant robo rad scorpion. But what's even more terrifying to consider is that the encounters with sentry bots are among the easiest in this expansion. The marked men will be the most frequently encountered enemies here, but they aren't your typical raider reskins that you've likely come to expect after playing Honest Hearts and Old World Blues. No, no. These fuckers are mutated NCR and Legion soldiers with very high stats and a pretty varied but consistently powerful arsenal. Plasma casters, Gatling lasers, tri-beam laser rifles, anti-material snipers. There are even encounters with marked men using the signature weapons of this DLC, the rocket's red glare fully automatic rocket launcher, the flare gun, and the shoulder-mounted 10mm machine gun. Many of them even pack melee weapons including thermic lancers, bowie knives, fire 
fire axes, chainsaws, and even Blades of the West, this DLC's variant of Legate Linnaeus' Blade of the East. Marked men also sport heavily degraded reskins of NCR and Legion armor, with a handful of unique enemies sporting metallic recreations of Legate Linnaeus' signature helm, which Ulysses will even comment on if you bring it up with him upon reaching the high road that precedes Ashton. Hell, some enemies even use stealth boys to try and catch you off guard. The marked men work so much better than the white legs or the lobotomites, because not only are they visually distinct, but there's a shit ton of variety in their weapons and gear, thus ensuring that every encounter feels feels like it requires a fair amount of focus from the player, lest they run the risk of getting caught off guard. Hell, even the placement of these enemies throughout the divide has a clear purpose to them. Enemies at high ground have a strong overview of the terrain, so it's on the player to either try and engage with them from the low ground, or try to sneak around them to gain the advantage. Multiple ambushes occur not just along the main path, but also in areas that genuinely caught me off guard. I thought going into this building with a very hard lock on the door would just yield a bit of loot but I nearly jumped out of my seat when I turned around and saw two marked men in the corners pouncing me. Well played, Obsidian. But it's not just the marked men and a couple of bots that litter the divide. There are also death claws. Anyone who's familiar with Fallout at this point knows the deal, and anyone who's played on very hard difficulty knows how genuinely terrifying these fucking things are. For those unaware, even my level 50 melee build, which had incredible defensive stats, was getting one shot by these things, because their attacks completely ignore both armor and damage resistance. The first encounter with Death Claws occurs on the high road leading to Ashton, and it's no joke. Across the highway, you'll likely see two Death Claws roaming near a warhead. Setting off the warhead is unlikely to kill them, at least on higher difficulties, and especially if your character is a high level since enemies scale with you, but it can be a great way to get some solid damage in right out the gate. Unfortunately, that also means alerting them to your presence, and if you're not prepared to handle these two overgrown lizards charging you down, you're going to want to consider alternative approaches, perhaps sniping from afar to cripple their limbs, or using a Stealth Boy or even Stealth Critical with a powerful explosive like the Fat Man. There's even a Death Claw ambush at one point, though it doesn't always... function? Alright, so the build-up here is really damn solid. Just before the two Death Claws is a small trailer with a lot of ammo in it. Oh boy, that's wonderful. Wait, what's that noise? That, my friends, is a Death Claw on top of the trailer. Not really sure how it got there, but you are now trapped. Still undetected, but in extremely close proximity to this enemy that can kill you very quickly. Fairly alarmed here. At least, sometimes I was. Other times, well, I'm not sure if it's an issue with the AI or the Deathclaw character model, but uh, I don't think this is normal. Well, it may be normal in New Vegas, because it's a really glitchy game, but you get the idea. But as terrifying as Death Claws usually are, the true terror of the Divide lies further in the depths. These creatures are known as Tunnelers, and I have a fair bit to say about them. So the idea behind these enemies is that they come from underground and attack in swarms while also being pretty damn strong. They come in a total of four variants, the Standard Tunnelers, the Venomous Tunnelers who can poison the player, the Hulking tunnelers which move slower but hit really damn hard, and the tunneler queen, heavy hitting and quite fast. On paper there's a healthy enough variety for this single enemy type, but things don't quite translate in practice. The issue for me is one of balancing. All variants of tunnelers are capable of killing a player very quickly, and their damage resistance is nothing to scoff at either. This causes the gameplay to feel very restricted regardless of the tunneler variant that's being encountered because what separates them isn't even being given a chance to stand out. No matter what tunneler you're facing, the strategy is basically always going to be the same. Try and keep a distance while dishing out as much damage as possible, typically to their limbs, or just sneak by. This feels like a bit of a downgrade when compared to an enemy like the Ghost People. Now sure, the Ghost People weren't the most significantly varied bunch, but they did a great job at facilitating certain actions to be taken by the player upon being encountered, which would help to maintain a sort of structure to the combat which players could work out in their heads. If you saw a Harvester or a Seeker, you knew that you'd have to work around its throwing spears and potentially a gas bomb, and that if you did close the distance, you would then need to act very quickly in order to keep it from overwhelming you with its melee knife spear. 
If you saw a trapper, you knew that distance was vital as it could cripple your limbs very easily and it moves pretty slowly barring its relatively fast attack animations. However, you would also need to keep in mind the environment around you so as not to accidentally stumble into any traps or potentially a cloud pocket. Combine all of that with a focus on limb dismemberment and what you end up with is an enemy that was easy to grasp, but pretty difficult to manage. So when scenarios would present themselves to the player, the player could then begin to consider these differences between the ghost people variants and work from there. Going back to what I said about New Vegas' combat earlier, even though the core combat is pretty weak, the tertiary elements help to keep the player engaged and active in their play. Tunnelers have basically identical attacks and behaviors, and given how quickly they can kill the player, nothing about stat differences or the inclusion of poison gets much of a chance to be taken into consideration beyond, the queen might one-shot me and that's not exactly healthy for player engagement. They can go into these holes in the ground to come out somewhere else in the environment, but this feels more like an opportunity for the player to score some free damage or potentially heal or reload. Beyond that, they just swarm you and swipe for massive damage. It's painfully simple. Crippling their limbs doesn't even seem to do that much to slow them down or weaken their strikes either. What's really weird is how they don't take extra damage to the head, which is fucking bizarre to me given how sensitive their senses supposedly are to external factors such as light. The game provides the player with tools like the flashbang and flare gun to scare off the tunnelers because the idea is that they evolved deep underground, so light can really throw off their senses, and that's pretty cool. I like it as a mechanic, even if the AI doesn't always seem to respond to these weapons properly. So why do their heads seem to be insanely resistant to damage? Wouldn't headshots, especially from explosives, completely discombobulate them? I will say I like their visual design, even if the only difference I can really find between the four variants is the size of the models, and they're pretty damn interesting as far as the lore of the divide goes, but mechanically speaking, the tunnelers are more than a little lacking, and in one particular case are fucking dreadful to deal with. I'm talking, of course, about none other than the set piece which follows the courier's arrival to the Ashton Missile Silo. After triggering a missile over the divide, the player makes their way into the silo where they take this sort of elevator down to the bottommost floor while explosions go off left and right and tunnelers swarm the platform. This felt so goddamn stupid that I audibly groaned when I first played through it. The issue here is that this set piece leans completely on the core combat in a way that does not complement the mechanics which the combat is built upon. You can have all kinds of different combat scenarios, even with New Vegas' gameplay, but shoving a player into a small area being swarmed with enemies that not only hit really hard, but are faster than the player, is not the kind of combat scenario that works with these systems. Since the enemies move faster than the player, the player is forced to try and dish out as much damage as possible the moment enemies spawn in. However, the player can't do much until the tunnelers are on the platform, at which point the player will need to kill them with extreme speed just so they can survive. This essentially acts as a stress test of New Vegas' gameplay, as well as a sort of DPS race, which makes it incredibly frustrating when any one of the various issues that I mentioned at the start of the video rears its ugly head. Having trouble aiming because acceleration is non-existent, bad hit detection, awkward model animations, all of that makes this whole set piece plenty annoying as is, but combine it with the constant explosions that mess with the camera, obscuring the player's vision, and making it impossible to tell where where your bullets are actually going to travel, and what you ultimately end up with is a section that's only remotely tolerable on lower difficulties. This set piece is also extremely unfriendly to any build that doesn't have a massive amount of straightforward damage burst. Stealth isn't an option, explosive builds will frequently cripple your own limbs, snipers struggle to work at such a close range, melee players are alright on lower difficulties, but in the end if you're not rocking a riot shotgun, this set piece is a fucking nightmare to get through, and I genuinely would love to see a mod that just deletes it entirely. Beyond this set piece though, I do feel like it's important for me to acknowledge just how build friendly this DLC generally is. There's a lot of fun to be had in the divide for all different kinds of couriers. Now granted, if you're even close to level 50, it's unlikely you won't be able to use basically whatever weapon you want, but for those couriers not quite that high leveled or even just willingly dedicating to any single build, there is plenty to work with here. Guns and energy weapons both get plenty of support here, with ammo for both being fairly common, which is nice 
guys given how tanky enemies can be, and all kinds of weapons to pick up, from anti-material rifles to heavy plasma casters. Melee builds would seem to struggle a bit more than others, though it's worth noting that every enemy in the Divide is capable of being knocked off their feet, barring the final boss, because he's the final boss. Hey, I don't make the rules, okay? Explosive builds have the rocket's red glare fully automatic rocket launcher, which is pretty damn powerful, although admittedly struggles a bit on the higher difficulty settings. But hey, who cares when you can just nuke the fuckers into oblivion anyways using a fat man? Stealth builds are also in for a treat, because although stealth is still quite powerful, Lonesome Road seems to have a really solid grasp as to how the stealth gameplay works, and is designed in ways that establish a pretty solid challenge for stealth players unlike the other 80% of the game. Dead Money does alright though. In New Vegas, stealth is very much intended to be a high-risk, high-reward playstyle. You build your courier to be fairly fragile, but capable of dealing extremely high damage for stealth criticals, which do seem to be much stronger than standard critical hits. The reason that most of New Vegas doesn't really do well to handle this kind of build Build is primarily due to the fact that the player just has so many options for taking out their enemies. In more cramped areas, players can utilize melee or silenced weapons so as not to attract attention. They can opt not to engage with the enemy at all, or they can put live grenades into the pockets of enemies to take them out instantly regardless of how much health or damage resistance they have. You don't even need a high explosive skill level, it's just an insta-kill by default. In more open areas, you can typically dispatch enemies that are so far away that other enemies simply won't detect you. And even if you are finally detected by an enemy, you're rarely going to struggle to dispatch them as long as you have a decent critical hit rate, which you typically will, especially if you have perks like finesse. It also doesn't really help that stealth can utterly shatter the enemy's AI. Like, seriously, being able to just sit in front of an enemy in plain sight without being seen is something to behold. I don't think I'd be wrong in saying that stealth is by far the best build in New Vegas, at least to my knowledge. The drawbacks are quite minimal, damage output is high, you typically aren't in any kind of danger since enemies aren't aware of you most of the time, and you have a number of options to fall back on in the event that an enemy even manages to detect you in the first place. Plus, you can opt for any kind of weapon style, from melee to standard firearms to energy weapons, to even explosives, and there are perks that benefit these subcategories of stealth builds. In Lonesome Road, however, enemies are highly perceptive, so unless you've got a stealth boy, you're really going to want to stay out of sight, which isn't always easy given the enemy patrols that cover wide ground. The high damage output of these enemies reinforces the idea that stealth builds are glass cannons, high enemy health and damage resistance prioritizes sneak crits, ambushes challenge the player's ability to act on their feet while attempting stealth rather than approaching a scenario with the freedom to analyze the situation from a safe distance, radiation pushes the player to keep from hiding in certain spots for too long, exploding warheads means the player needs to be extremely cognizant of their surroundings if they want to proceed undetected and without engaging in combat. But it doesn't work entirely against the player either, barring the shitty Ashton missile silo set piece which is a slap in the face to any build not properly dealing massive damage at short range. The player has a lot of ground to take advantage of as a sniper, lots of potential cover on the low ground, and plenty of distance to work with should enemies become aware of them for any reason. So Lonesome Road does a pretty great job at complementing just about any build the player could be working with, especially this late in the game. On the flip side though is the crafting mechanic which has been all but completely absent since Dead Money. Honest Hearts gave about as half-assed an effort as possible by saying, hey, you can live off the land in Zion, and the only crafting areas you'll find in the Big Empty are in the sink, which you typically won't even need to visit barring the retrieval of the AI in the side quest. There are a couple of stations for crafting, reloading, and cooking to be found throughout the divide, but they're about as useful as a rebreather in the Sierra Madre. Given that you can go into this DLC with however much gear you want, the fact that you can leave whenever you want, and the sheer abundance of resources if you can be bothered to explore any given area for all of a minute, the idea of taking the time to go craft in Lonesome Road isn't exactly an exciting one, and that's kind of a letdown. You'd think that crafting in a post-nuclear setting would be pretty damn useful to indulge in, but really it's just just an additional and unnecessary addition that accomplishes very little that can't be done using more convenient mechanics. Need more ammo? Just go buy some. Can't afford it? Just go gamble. Low luck? Sell the gold bars of the Sierra Madre instead. Didn't get them? Farm some loot, or maybe steal something. Need food? Just stop by the Ultralux. Can't afford it? Go to Zion and hunt some Yalgwai. Too hard? Get good. All of that is much more engaging for the player to indulge in than just 
wandering around and looking for miscellaneous items listed on some crafting recipes. There's just no real reason to resort to crafting or cooking, and there's not much in the ways of appeal given how tedious picking up these miscellaneous resources can feel. This kind of issue isn't as frustrating as something more intrusive and in-your-face like the Ashton Missile Silo set piece, but it's still disappointing in its own way. Not a deal breaker by any means, just a bit lame in retrospect. I suppose the last thing worth bringing up would have to be Edie, or Eddie, which, uh, he's kind of forgettable. I'll hold off on the story details for now, but as far as mechanics go, Edie doesn't really bring much to the table aside from being an occasional distraction and damage sponge for enemies. Aside from that, he won't really be doing much else given his weak damage output and slow rate of attack. At one point in the DLC, he's taken from the player, but his absence doesn't really do anything to increase the tension given how little of an impact that he's had on the general combat. The biggest issue for me really is the fact that Eddie can't even be destroyed while playing hardcore mode since he is an essential NPC. This feels like a major missed opportunity. Jumping ahead in the story, the courier bringing Eddie to Ulysses' temple is an essential part of Ulysses' plan to burn away the flags, begin again. And having a potential exclusive to hardcore mode of Eddie not arriving at the temple could have made for an interesting branching path that not many people would have known about. Within Eddie is a piece of technology that Ulysses needs, so if Eddie was destroyed, the player could potentially still bring that part, loot it off of Eddie to Ulysses, at which point he would scold the player for their inability to let go. If the player chose not to, then Ulysses' plan would be foiled and he'd have to fight the courier in order to go back into the divide to retrieve the part. Or perhaps the player would be able to convince him to stop by showing how they let go willingly of a piece of their past, and Ulysses could too. As for how Ulysses would communicate with the courier, maybe he'd just send another iBot. After all, he can basically produce however many he wants. This isn't an egregious problem, but it does feel like something of a missed opportunity. Though with that said, I can absolutely give Lonesome Road a thumbs up in regards to the gameplay. It certainly has its problems, but overall it does a lot more than either Honest Hearts or Old World Blues to facilitate and maintain player engagement. The loot is great. The enemy set is strong and decently varied. The exploration was satisfying. It's about as build-friendly as dead money, the warheads were a pretty strong mechanic, and some of the scenarios were genuinely very tense and challenging. I don't think it reaches the heights of dead money, but it definitely comes close in various aspects, and I would even say exceeds it in some cases. And wowzers, would you look at the time. It's kind of fascinating how there's so much to say regarding gameplay in these linear expansions versus the open worlds of Zion and Big Mountain. That's not even to suggest the gameplay of Old World Blues is bad, barring the ridiculous enemy health, but just to say that there's so much to analyze and dissect in these handcrafted levels and encounters versus the more basic, hey, sometimes you'll run into enemies. Or maybe it's not even an issue of linear versus open world. Plenty of more open world games have fantastically crafted levels and encounters, like Assassin's Creed Origins, The Witcher 3, Horizon, Legend of Zelda, and so on. Maybe the issue is that Obsidian put all their eggs into certain baskets. Maybe it's an issue of time. After all, Dead Money had a bit of work done prior to the release of New Vegas, and Lonesome Road came out not only last, but after multiple delays. Who's to really say? I suppose that in the end it doesn't really matter, but it is interesting to think about. Thank you all once again for supporting my content. The next part of this series will be a deep dive into the lore of the Divide and the story leading up to Ulysses' Temple, which we'll be covering in its own video afterwards, following which will be the conclusion. It's been a hell of a road so far, but we've got a lot more ground to cover. I'll see you all there. Take care, friends. They say that with great power comes a great responsibility. So surely in a world where one person can make a difference, everyone must face the consequences of their actions and their inactions. Sometime before the events of New Vegas, the player character, Courier 6, was hired to make a delivery to a growing settlement known as the Divide, located between Vegas and California. The Divide was a settlement that served as a supply line between Southern California and the various communities to its east, not the least of which being Vegas. The Divide, contrary to what the name would seem to imply, was a route that allowed for a relatively safe passage between Southern California and settlements further east. When the NCR first began its incursion of the Mojave in 2274, the Divide and the Long 15 were pivotal for ensuring a consistent flow of troops and resources to the Mojave from out west. From this, the Divide began to flourish and grow as a community, even showing potential to become a nation of its own. 
Of course, the NCR would eventually come into conflict with the tribe known as Caesar's Legion, with which tensions would escalate over the following several years as they both sought to claim the relic of the old world known as Hoover Dam. Hoover Dam, like the Divide, was an invaluable resource that would simultaneously enable further expansion whilst providing all the support those out west would ever need. Conquering the dam meant an abundance of electrical power and clean water, both of which any post-apocalyptic nation trying to expand further would need. But unlike the NCR, which is likely the largest of the very few existing post-nuclear nations, especially in North America, if the Legion ever wanted to stand a chance against the NCR for control over the Mojave, they would need to cut one of the NCR supply lines between Southern California and the Mojave. But given that the Legion was already struggling to make its way as far west as the Colorado, sending a military force strong enough to conquer a territory as far out as the Divide was a mere pipe dream. So instead of an entire platoon of soldiers, the Legion would send only the occasional frumentari, and perhaps a handful of veterans that they held the utmost confidence in to infiltrate the depths of the NCR's territory in search of a weakness to exploit. One of these frumentari was none other than a man named Ulysses, who once stood alongside the twisted hairs of dry wells before being assimilated into the Legion and going on to discover Hoover Dam. Though at this time, he hadn't taken on the name Ulysses, instead being known by another name which will likely never be remembered by anyone but himself. As for when he took on the name of Ulysses, it seems that he took it during his time at Big Mountain. Upon arriving at the Divide, Ulysses found something he'd yearned for since his time in the Twisted Hairs, and that's a people that he believed in. Ulysses respected the Divide, and in time began to recognize its potential as a new nation, free from the vices that bound NCR and Legion both to their inevitable dooms, perhaps even with the potential to unite them and others under a single flag. Seeing this place changed him. It gave him a renewed hope for a future. The Divide was also a community founded upon the ruins of a pre-war military compound, with technology, food, water, and weapons seemingly in abundance. In many ways, the Divide was an even greater Hoover Dam, though to call it a blessing would be ignorant of what else came from these military ruins. In the year 2277, about three years after the Divide had been founded, a nameless courier was contracted to deliver a parcel from the new California Republic Territory of Navarro across to the Divide. Within the parcel was a device that, upon being activated, transmitted signals to the depths of the military facilities beneath the Divide. Within these facilities was a number of nuclear missile silos that had yet to be fired. Given that the operation of multiple nuclear missile silos requires far more management than the simple press of a button on a single device, these missiles would detonate simultaneously beneath the surface of the divide, cracking open the earth and annihilating whatever hopes to build a nation that once stood there. Despite this, Ulysses managed to survive, with what might be the greatest stroke of luck in the history of Fallout's canon. And to be clear, that's not a criticism. This possibility was actually set up as far back as the reveal trailer for New Vegas. Sometime before the destruction of the Divide, a friendly little iBot by the name of Eddie, or Edie, would begin to make its way from Adams Air Force Base on America's East Coast all the way out to Navarro. This iBot would manage nearly 2,500 miles of travel, stopping at one point in Chicago at another enclave base for repairs and upgrades, before finally suffering major damage from a raider wielding what we can assume was a hunting rifle. Eddie would eventually crash somewhere outside of Prim, likely near Hopeville, where it would be scavenged by a courier working for the Mojave Express and brought to Johnson Nash, but not before being remotely scanned by the Hopeville silos computer systems. How exactly that even works or happened is ultimately unclear, though. It's not that I don't buy the tech for this exists in Fallout's world. There's just nothing to suggest how it works beyond what it accomplishes. In any case, what remained of the Divide's military computers would use the scans from Eddie to configure its own iBots, which would find and heal the wounded Ulysses. Ulysses saw the courier deliver the device. He knew of its origins, and this knowledge would leave a lasting impression on Ulysses as he left the Divide and returned to the Legion. Ulysses would continue in disillusionment with Caesar's Legion, crushed that he'd bore witness to the eradication of his familial tribe as well as the Divide. Sometime after the Divide's destruction, he followed the strange weather patterns of the desert to Big Mountain, where he met Elijah and Christine. He led the White Legs to war against the NCR and eventually to sack New Canaan. 
but didn't care to ensure the execution of Joshua Graham. Although Ulysses was loyal to the Legion, his devotion never went beyond his faith in them. As a frumentarius, Ulysses would also act as a courier so that he could traverse the Mojave with relative ease, at least as far as dealings with NCR and Vegas went. During this time, Ulysses would turn down the job for the Platinum Chip, suspecting that it might lead to the death of the courier responsible for the destruction of the Divide, but word would eventually get out that the courier survived and it was likely at this point that Ulysses would once again make his way to the Divide, leaving but a single transmission for the Courier's Pit-Boy. Ulysses' plan is for the Courier to use the iBot in Hopeville, a recreation of Edie using the scrap from the device that triggered the missiles beneath the Divide, to navigate the Divide as they make their way to Ulysses. This is so that Ulysses can use the parts from Eddie to launch the remaining nukes within the Divide at NCR territory, cutting off their supply lines and preventing further expansion by the NCR leaving them to a proverbial death by starvation. As for the Legion, Ulysses is fully aware that they will eventually crumble. In his mind, both sides need to go in order for humanity to have a chance to begin again, and the nukes are his tool for both wiping the slate clean and enacting revenge upon the courier that destroyed his life and future. The story of Lonesome Road is a complicated tale. Ulysses is a very thoughtful and methodical character who spent a great deal of time pondering the future of post-nuclear America and its various factions. His experience as both a tribal assimilated into the Legion and a courier wandering between developing nations gives him a very unique insight that's really only shared by the player. Ulysses' grudge against the courier is pretty damn justified. Although the courier didn't understand what the package they were delivering would cause, they still delivered the package. It was by the courier's boots that the package would arrive at the Divide, and it's on their shoulders that this burden is bore. Ulysses saw a hope for the future, a hope that he found absent in the NCR, Legion, and even House in Vegas, and I can only imagine how scarring it must have been for him to see all of it go up in flames. I think where Lonesome Road loses a lot of people, though, is the focus on Ulysses' grudge with the courier rather than his desire to, in his own words, burn away the flags, begin again. Now, don't get me wrong, I do think his grudge against the courier makes sense, and it can work as a central conflict. Even if one's involvement in an event is indirect, unintentional, or even coerced, there is a strong argument to be made that they are in some way culpable due to their role in the causation of said event. Joshua Graham didn't intend to get his and Ulysses' Legion brothers killed at Boulder City, but that's what happened. NCR troops didn't intend to slaughter elders, women, and children at Bitter Springs, but that's what happened. The followers of the Apocalypse never intended for one of their own to become the most savage tyrant ever seen in post-nuclear Western America, but that's what happened. Ulysses is also defined by his ability to recognize the power that one person has to bring about change, so it absolutely makes sense that he would carry his resentment for Courier 6 after what happened at the Divide. Even if you disagree with the idea that the Courier should be held accountable for the destruction of the Divide, Ulysses' point of view is very clearly defined and makes sense for his character given his experiences. And it's not at all difficult to feel for Ulysses regarding the loss of the Divide when you begin to explore his backstory and learn about his disillusionments. Having witnessed the assimilation of his tribe into the Legion and how the White Legs cluelessly adopted Ulysses' dreadlocks, reducing the signature iconography of his old tribe to what was ultimately an insulting parody must have been utterly crushing. He's been alone ever since, and just as he was beginning to find hope in a new nation, it was snuffed out. All of that works pretty damn well, but what doesn't work is how the entire conflict with Ulysses prior to reaching his temple is completely defined by his disdain for Courier 6, or rather how the audience is led to believe that's what this is all about. There are two reasons that I believe this particular plot point doesn't completely stick. The first is that the player did not deliver the package, instead they're told that the courier did. People don't like being accused of things they didn't do, especially by people they don't even know. So already the player is almost being prompted to put up a wall of, what the fuck is this guy talking about? I never agree to this, why has this been decided for me? Being told that, 
hey, you were delivering a package and it led to you walking into a trap that you never could have anticipated at the very start of New Vegas is a perfectly fine setup, and the player has no reason to really do anything else but go along with it. But when you tell the player, hey, you did something that led to the complete annihilation of a settlement and you should feel bad, then they're almost definitely going to look at you with something of a furrowed brow. The second issue is that it distracts from Ulysses' plan beyond the courier, which would have worked perfectly as the core pillar of this conflict. Instead, Ulysses' disdain for the NCR and Legion is fed somewhat passively through the exposition, and it's only at the very end of Lonesome Road that it's revealed what he's actually doing in the Divide, which leaves it feeling a bit sudden. Like, oh, that's what you're doing here? I thought this was just something between the two of us. I'm sorry, you're going to nuke the West? Well, that escalated quickly. It doesn't really work as a subversion of expectations either because all of the buildup was centered around the conflict between Ulysses and the Courier, with very little in the ways of foreshadowing regarding Ulysses' plan to bomb NCR supply lines. He does talk about how cutting supply lines can be an effective way of killing such a widespread faction as the NCR, but I don't think that single line of dialogue does enough to justify this entire twist. On paper, this whole conflict makes sense, but the way it's presented is more than a little messy, and it's no wonder why so many players come away from this DLC scratching their heads and wondering just what the deal was with Ulysses. The problem with the presentation isn't even that it stems from a large amount of exposition from Ulysses, but the fact that so much of this exposition is rooted in his hatred for the player character, rather than a dissection of the NCR, Legion, and Vegas and why Ulysses wants to see them burn. It makes Ulysses come off as more of a rambling lunatic with a grudge than a man with a warped perception looking to hit the reset button on post-nuclear Western America. What makes this storytelling especially strange is the fact that Ulysses doesn't seem to hold the NCR and Legion as accountable for what happened at the Divide as the Courier, which is especially strange given how muddled the details regarding the delivery of the detonator have turned out. What Ulysses fails to consider is that the Legion does have moles in the NCR, Frumentari who've infiltrated their ranks. We know that this has happened before, i.e. Camp McCarran, but Ulysses writes off the possibility of Legion being responsible for the destruction of the Divide completely, claiming a no true Scotsman for anyone with the Legion that makes it out as far as the Divide, let alone California. I actually understand how he would think this given his own disillusionment with the Legion, but I feel it's a questionable assumption to make given that marked Legion troops within the Divide crafted and sport gear reminiscent of the Legion's like at Linnaeus, which Ulysses will even comment on saying that the Legion hold their symbols with a great reverence, whereas the NCR doesn't really have such iconography besides their guns and flag, the latter of which I imagine is little more than something maintained for the sake of old American tradition. Ulysses will even remark that this type of attack, the cutting of a supply line, is just the kind of thing that the Legion would perpetrate. That's not to suggest that the NCR wouldn't be so incompetent, though. I can absolutely buy that they'd mistakenly trigger a nuke. Hell, it's a miracle that this fantastic idiot didn't bring down a blast of gamma radiation on Helios 1. But again, the issue is that there is no way to know for sure. Ulysses does seem to be somewhat aware of this, and his ultimate goal is the death of both the NCR and Legion, the latter of which he knows is inevitable, but the fact that it feels so secondary to his grudge against the Courier feels like a mistake in direction. There's also a certain other element of the story that feels like it's not being explored as well as it could and should be, and that's the Tunnelers. After the first encounter with the Tunnelers, the player can ask Ulysses about them, at which point he'll exposit that they are perhaps Vegas' greatest threat, even before the NCR and Legion. So, going out the game itself for a moment, many have speculated that this was supposed to lead into the plot of a sequel to New Vegas, should that ever happen. And while I think that's a great concept, what bothers me is that this plot point is put down almost immediately after it's brought up. I feel like there is a lot that could be discussed regarding the Tunnelers between the Courier and Ulysses. A Courier aligned with the Legion could raise the point that the Legion specializes in CQC and could potentially overpower the Tunnelers, especially given enough strategic planning. A courier aligned with the NCR could bring up the fact that the NCR, unlike the Legion, is more than willing to use technology to their advantage, and that they possess so much territory that the defeat of the Tunnelers is all but inevitable because of that. Couriers aligned with either House or Vegas could point out that the numerous lights of Vegas would give a colossal advantage against any Tunneler that shows up there. 
Of course, arguments could be made by Ulysses to counter these points, and from there the dialogue would continue to explore the threat of the Tunnelers. I think the Tunnelers plot point works and makes sense to use as setup for a sequel, were it to ever happen, but it feels like this very real threat just gets put away far too easily. Hell, the Tunnelers don't even show up at Ulysses' temple, and you'd think that as part of his contingency, having Tunnelers as well as marked men would be pretty smart. It would also make for a unique gameplay scenario, but uh, we'll get to that in the next video. Going back to the Courier's alignment with the various factions, while I really enjoyed that these reputations were integrated with the dialogue of Ulysses, the system itself is more than a bit finicky. So here's the rundown. If you have a positive reputation with the NCR, it will override all other reputations, and Ulysses will speak to you as if you're aligned with them. Otherwise, if you have a positive reputation with the Legion, Ulysses will assume that you're aligned with them. If you have a positive reputation with the Strip, he talks as if you're aligned with House. Positive reputation with no faction opens the independent Vegas dialogue. There are two major problems with this. The first is that a positive reputation with the NCR overrides the House or independent Vegas routes. The issue with this is that you can have a positive reputation with the NCR just from doing side quests, and fooling them into considering you an ally is actually possible for the entirety of both the House and Independent Vegas quests, up until the final battle of Hoover Dam, at which point the game ends. This was an issue for multiple of my characters which were taking the House and Independent Vegas routes, and I had to use console commands to lower my rep with the NCR just so I could get those dialogue paths. Some might say that it makes sense that Ulysses would hear via word of mouth that the Courier is aligned with NCR, despite them being with House or going the Independent Vegas route, falling for the ruse just as the NCR has been this whole time. That would make sense, but what doesn't is the fact that the player doesn't have the option to correct Ulysses on their true allegiance. This leads me to believe that Ulysses believing the Courier is with the NCR despite them not actually being aligned with them is an unintentional issue, and a really irksome one at that. The second issue is that the player's reputation with the Strip is what makes Ulysses think they're with House. This doesn't make sense for multiple reasons if you're taking the path of Independent Vegas. For starters, when you kill House, everyone in Vegas learns about it one way or another because House programmed a transmission to go out in the Mojave at the event of his death. So how is it that Ulysses would still be scolding me on aligning with House when everyone knows that House is dead and the news leaked right as my courier was leaving his casino? But also, gaining a positive reputation with the Strip is something that you can do in the independent Vegas quests. In fact, you're actually encouraged to do that by Yes Man. So you could very easily end up playing Lonesome Road and being talked to as if you're aligned with House, despite having murdered the guy. And none of the remaining dialogue would give you the option to cut Ulysses off and say, Dude, I went full Abby on that motherfucker and ate his three-century ass like one-of-a-kind beef jerky. So yeah, those were some really damn annoying issues to deal with, and they didn't need to be. They could have just as easily made it to where Ulysses speaks to the Courier based on their progression in the main quests. Since House and Yes Man's quests both progress simultaneously, so long as House is alive, just have Ulysses' dialogue paths work the same, with the independent Vegas dialogue opening up when House is dead. That would have saved a lot of people a lot of headaches myself included. Putting the issues with its implementation aside though, I really enjoyed the faction-based dialogue with Ulysses. Hearing his insights on the four paths the Courier could take was especially interesting, even if ultimately he believes they're all doomed. The NCR is pretty obvious, especially given Ulysses' history with the Legion, and he will roast the shit out of the player for being aligned with them. Players seeking the independent Vegas route are scolded for lacking purpose in their pursuits, much the same way the destruction of the Divide lacked any purpose. At first, it might seem almost petty of him to scold the player for not aligning with any of the three factions that he transparently believes are doomed to fail, but for him it's more about the fact that the Courier continues to lack purpose in what they do regardless of the power they possess to bring change. Sure, they could put an end to House, they could put an end to Caesar, they could put an end to the NCR, 
But what happens after, when all of them and the courier are gone from Vegas, players siding with House are mocked for being his pawn, apparently Ulysses has been to Vegas before, and even if its walls continue to expand, all that it would eventually lead to, in his mind, is a future as an image on a screen in a dead casino. Ulysses doesn't believe for a moment that Vegas will help anyone but House, so long as it's ran by House. And that is an interesting point to consider. It's also worth noting that Ulysses doesn't know about House's plan to eventually colonize space. After all, he hasn't even spoken to House, so it wouldn't make sense for him to even be aware of this plan. But it is interesting to consider what Ulysses might have to say were he ever told this. And then we have couriers aligned with Caesar's Legion, which I think makes for some of the most interesting dialogue with Ulysses. Ulysses makes it abundantly clear that even he understands that the Legion is doomed, although he is generous enough to assume that they'll make it as far as the sea before they finally collapse. What makes this interesting though is how transparent he is in his respect for the Legion. In many ways, the Legion represents what Ulysses believes makes people strong. Unity through undying devotion, reverence of symbols to bolster loyalty and morale, and a deep-rooted respect for battle. The Legion has its issues, but its people, and by that I really just mean the men, are very clearly united and loyal to the cause they fight for, and they will happily die for it. If there's anyone besides Joshua Graham who understands the Legion more than Caesar, it's Ulysses. But despite the respect that Ulysian Ulysian? What the fuck? But despite the respect that Ulysses holds for the Legion, even he can't deny that they will eventually crumble. And you can hear a sort of melancholy in his voice as he talks about it. Ulysses also mentions that the Divide could have potentially united both the Legion and the NCR under one flag. Which is really interesting to consider a possibility, but might also just be wishful thinking that gave him a sense of hope in knowing that the death of the Legion meant the eradication of his tribe was ultimately for nothing. In fact, the more I think about it, the more that I'm sure this is the case. Now, granted, very little is known about the settlement that was the Divide, but how on earth could one settlement along a supply line broker peace between the NCR and Caesar's Legion? For starters, the NCR has another supply line, the Long 15. Now granted, the use of it as a single supply line causes a major strain on their stations in the Mojave, but it's more than enough to keep them from agreeing to a treaty with Caesar's fucking legion. Even if all of the chips fell into place for the supposed treaty to benefit both sides, I highly doubt that the NCR wouldn't stubbornly refuse all the same. And to be fair, who could really blame them when it's the Legion that we're talking about? Speaking of which, Ulysses, my brother in Kaisar, surely it hasn't been that long since you've last interacted with the Legion. You honestly think that this merry band of psychos would legitimately back off from a conflict and settle on a peace treaty that doesn't recognize them as the supreme and dominant faction? You really think that Caesar or Linnaeus would allow for the defeat of the NCR to not include the massacring of their military and the enslavement of their women? Brother, you better check that gas mask. Cause you've been huffing a bit too much of that divide stank. It's also interesting to see Ulysses' response to a female Legion courier. Let's face it, a woman soldier in the Legion is about as weird as it gets, even for Ulysses. And he's actually impressed the Legion would even allow it, but it's not as if this progress is in any way indicative that the Legion would evolve into a more capable nation. Even Ulysses knows that much. Being with the Legion also adds a nice wrinkle of complexity to the relationship between these two couriers. Now before we go, I want to take a listen to Ulysses' audio logs that can be found throughout the Divide and discuss their contents. Back again. Left that crater behind. Got a few holidays left. Ones from the medical center. The woman, she fixed the recorder, said it wouldn't last. Repayment for me, fixing her. She doesn't like debts. Can respect that. Payment enough. Just to hear someone who believes in the Brotherhood of Steel. Not Elijah. Different view. Same madness. She answered me on their philosophy. Their way of seeing. The roads they walk. Dead ends. Empty. As if technology can solve anything. Big empties proof where that road leads. 
just like the divide and all the roads that lead to it. The first audio log is basically a direct follow-up to the one that we found in Big Mountain. Apparently, as a way of repaying him for saving her, Christine helped to fix Ulysses' holotape recording device. Ulysses respected this, but he also considered it payment enough to hear her answers about the ways of the Brotherhood of Steel. Ultimately, to Ulysses, it was just a different form of the same madness that Elijah echoed, implying that he actually spoke with Elijah sometime before meeting Christine. Emptiness here, like the sands of the great salt lake, echoed the beating in the divide sky, like storm drums of the white legs, ran with them on the salt beds at Kaiser's command. Cut the throats of the two-headed bear. Cut all communities off. You storm, sky, disease, fire, starvation, and the violence of the ignorant to ruin all who could, might stand against him. But the white legs, they couldn't live on their own like most scavengers. So gave them purpose, turned their hunger into a weapon. The wall of New Canaan, too high for Kaiser, too proud maybe, or maybe something there from his past that needed killing, memory of Graham, help them dig out Canaan's supply caches and other secrets the sands hid, bunkers filled with powered weapons even the Brotherhood might desire. They call these new weapons storm drums in the firing of shells. Taught them the power in the casings to channel the spirits in their guns. Me. They called me the flag bearer. Glory in my hand, in my staff that still bore the weight of the old world, just as the symbol on my back did. I learned their weapons as a means of respect, and when it came their turn to pay respect to me, history came rushing back. Can't escape what's been done. History's there, no matter how far you walk. The second holotape is a reminiscing of sorts with Ulysian- Ulysian. Again, what the fuck am I- what am I saying? The second holotape is a reminiscing of sorts, with Ulysses comparing the sounds of the divide storms to the beating of the storm drums used by the White Legs. He then recalls his time with the White Legs, where Caesar commanded Ulysses to take the White Legs under his wing so that he could carry out a number of attacks on the NCR around Utah's Salt Lake. This was, of course, the prelude to the attack on New Canaan, where Ulysses originally wondered why Caesar was so dead set on its destruction before realizing that within its walls was the former Malpace Legate. Big, empty. There's something hidden there. A crater. Past wind and sand. So deep in the desert, there's no turning back. Finding the crater was an accident. Was following the weather patterns. The divide sky torn like that. Man's violence, not nature's. That violence in the sky had a source. Tracked it, like following a river current. Left the colors to mark my way, like always. In case someone finds them, learns the pattern. A courier might. But I thought sand and wind would never end. Came to the crater. And there, there was an old world facility. A weather station, at the edge, still raking the sky with electricity and generators. And beyond it, saw the rest of the old world hell there, all carved up like garden plots. Had to see what was there. Couldn't leave it be. Things sleep in the big empty. The Brotherhood woke them up. Can't move quiet any more than the two-headed bear can. And when they woke up, it was like all of history waking up at once. Almost didn't make it out. Almost. Left with answers I never intended. The third holotape has Ulysses reflecting on his discovery of Big Mountain. Sometime after the destruction of the Divide, Ulysses began to recognize anomalous weather patterns deep within the desert that reminded him of the winds of the Divide in that they seemed unnatural. Eventually, after traversing the desert, he came across Big Mountain where he of course met Elijah and Christine. 
Ulysses confesses that it was his curiosity that got the better of him when he proceeded to explore the Big Empty. He also compares the awakening of the Big Empty's various facilities by Christine and Elijah to the incompetence of the NCR, likely in reference to their orders to deliver the detonator leading to the complete destruction of the Divide. Apparently this made it extremely difficult to navigate the Big Empty, and Ulysses almost didn't make it out alive. I also think it's worth noting that this speaks to Ulysses' better nature and that he was still willing to help Christine despite the dangers of the Big Empty. Apparently he also left with answers that he never intended, though what this means has yet to be made clear. I walked the Great Salt Lake as Kaiser's eye, then his hand, mongrels there, two legs and four. Saw the walls of New Canaan and the scavengers circled, and the strength or fire to take, too high. Too strong. White legs. They were born for war. They run to it, hungry for battle. Yet their hunger is to be a part of history, something larger. Like the Legion, as always, brought them a message from Kaiser. If New Canaan burns, Kaiser might see them. Might. Even the chance was a lie. To honor Kaiser, destroy the history of New Canaan and the way they carry it in their generations and family. Kaiser respects such strength, I told them. That, that was truth, even if strength wasn't the word. Obedience. You must be willing to kill anyone. Children, mothers, the weak, elders. If these new Canaanites value the generations, that is what you must kill. It was like Wolpus was speaking through me. Use the night, silence, and fire to change their words to pleas, to screams. No need for bombs, when hate will do. I asked the White Legs to destroy a people with ancestry going back thousands of years. Another death of history, lost to time. The new Canaanites. They supplied medicine, food traded with others. Civilization, a hand from the past, not history. But maybe a past deeper. Farther than that to a place where this God really exists. If so, his handiwork and people belong elsewhere, not in this place. Another symbol like bear and bull with no meaning in the present. The fourth hollow tape is a somewhat lengthy breakdown of the plans to sack New Canaan. Ulysses manipulated the White Legs by convincing them that Caesar would respect the strength to do so, though obedience would have been a more accurate word. Of course, the chances that they'd ever see a proper alliance with the Legion was a total farce, just as it was with all other 87 tribes before them. Ulysses also seems to show a bit of regret in how he instructed the White Legs to destroy the ancestry of New Canaan that stretched back many thousands of years. This, of course, is in reference to Christianity, which we know thanks to Joshua and Daniel was prevalent in New Canaan's culture. However, Ulysses resolves that in a world like this, there is no place for such beliefs as they're ultimately meaningless. The white legs, meant to show respect, bribe me for Kaiser's favor. Echoing mannerisms and words, showed them tech gashes, taught them the workings of chamber and powder, spoke of Kaiser's pride in those that used such things. Lies. And... And then... They tried to honor me, not the Legion. They brought me before the campfire one night. Showed me how they changed themselves, how they wore their hair now. It was like my entire dead tribe in the firelight. Teeth grinning red in the dark. Eager corpses, blood-covered ghosts. They had taken my braids, the way of the twisted hairs, as if it showed they were like me, of me, while every knot in their braids spoke of raping, violence, and ignorance of what the knots meant. They thought to show respect, defiled it, lost myself in truth. 
trying to read the braids they wove. When I remembered, they had put no meaning in it. They had no history of what it meant. They didn't even know the insult in the twists, knots. And the dry wells came rushing back. The white legs circled like that. It was like looking at the dead of my tribe, reborn as ghosts, hateful, hungry, bowing to Kaisar. Another history, gone, carried by me alone. The fifth hollow tape is easily the most depressing of all. As mentioned previously, the White Legs sought to honor Ulysses by adopting his braids into their own iconography. Ulysses was insulted and tried to make sense of the knots in their hair, before ultimately realizing that they had no meaning like those of the twisted hairs. All of a sudden, Ulysses' trauma at seeing the assimilation of his tribe into the Legion came rushing back. And I think it's safe to say that this was the moment where it really set in for Ulysses that he no longer had a place in the Legion. Ulysses' sixth and final holotape details his last interaction with the brains of the think tank. He describes an incredible anger that he felt at their ignorance, eventually channeling that rage into one last question. Who are you that do not know your history? And it was at that moment that they remembered. The effects of Dr. Mobius's brainwashing tapering off as the memories of America came rushing back. They then told Ulysses all about it, their pre-war lives, the days before the Great War. As they spoke, Ulysses began to think back to the Courier, and how they too had no knowledge of their hand in destroying the Divide. Ulysses then asked the Brains if there was anything left of America that he could find, at which point the Brains would reveal that the Divide still contained within it undetonated ICBMs. In order to detonate them, Ulysses would need the device that detonated the first set of missiles once housed beneath the Divide. And it was at this point that Ulysses started to devise his plan. If Ulysses wanted to simply kill the Courier, he could have done just that. But his hatred runs far deeper than that. 
Ulysses instead plans to use the missiles of the Divide to annihilate the NCR supply lines, which would leave the Legion free to swarm both California and New Vegas before inevitably collapsing in on themselves. In one fell swoop, Ulysses would single-handedly annihilate every bit of progress that Western America had made since the bombs first dropped, reducing it all to ash and forcing civilization to begin again. Regardless of whom the courier aligns with, this would be catastrophic to let happen. Again, I think what ultimately makes a lot of players lose interest in Ulysses, beyond superficial criticism such as Long Man Bad, is the fact that the story doesn't really do much to convey Ulysses' plan regarding the Divide's nukes. Sure, you get plenty of exposition regarding his disdain for the NCR and Legion, and he's characterized pretty effectively throughout this exposition, but it's not even clear what he plans to do prior to reaching the end of Lonesome Road, and because all that focus prior to the climax is on his grudge against the Courier, despite simultaneously claiming that this isn't about killing the Courier, Ulysses tends to give off the impression that he's more of a raving lunatic than anything which is understandably reinforced the moment the player finally reaches him and sees that he plans to launch the remaining set of nukes in the Divide. However, I'm going to hold off on talking about this final confrontation until the next video, because there is a lot to unpack from this finale. Overall, I would describe the story of Ulysses and the Divide as one that's pretty damn strong, but not told as cohesively as it deserves to be. The conflict here is among the most fascinating to be found in New Vegas, with Ulysses' motivations being simultaneously warped, but sympathetic when looked at from his perspective, and serving as an excellent platform to further discuss the potential of the NCR, the Legion, and Vegas. The lore of the Divide is fascinating as a sort of what could have been for post-nuclear Western America, and it's interesting to see the ruins of what many would consider a rival to Hoover Dam, at least as far as its utility and potential societal impact. But it's also kinda lame that the tunnelers get made out to be such a massive threat, only to be immediately put to the wayside. But hey, when the story is this damn good, and the lore is this fascinating, I'm perfectly content with forgiving a couple of blunders here and there in the storytelling. That's not to excuse them, but to say that the high quality aspects far outweigh these issues. But that's all I've got for today. Until next time, take care. Ulysses has already initiated the missile launch, and should the courier still not understand why it is that Ulysses has gone through all this trouble, they'll get the most transparent scalding possible from Ulysses. You've answered your own question, and you'll die with that question on your lips. You don't see, listen, even when it's all around you. No matter if I nailed it into your head like a gift from Kaiser. The answer is in the question. The courier doesn't understand. They failed to see, failed to listen, just as they unwittingly brought the destruction of the Divide so long ago via the package, now too they have brought the destruction of the West via the very same machine used by the Divide to construct this seemingly inoffensive iBot. When told that what Ulysses is doing is madness compared to the failure of the Courier, Ulysses' response is the verbal embodiment of the theme of Lonesome Road. No, now there is purpose. I believe you when you say you were careless. The divide, the chip, the machine you brought here. Many messages can be taken from that, intended or not. What I do now is an act of conviction. Now there is purpose. It's a strong illustration of why Ulysses is the antithesis to Courier 6, an incredible likeness to Caesar's very philosophy regarding conflict and the inevitability of war. From here, there are a handful of options for the player in how to resolve things with Ulysses. The first, simplest, and easiest to achieve is to simply kill him. Failure to convince Ulysses that what he is doing is wrong, or simply opting to attack him will lead to the final battle that, uh... Yeah, it's, uh, it's a little hard. 
All right, so Ulysses has max special stats and skills. His health goes just over 1,000. He has a damage threshold of 18. He possesses the Finesse perk, which grants a 5% critical hit chance, as well as toughness for an additional 10% damage resistance. His Duster grants him 13 damage threshold, as well as a bonus 5% critical hit chance. He has two Stealth Boys to stealthily flank the player when enough distance has been created between the two. He has a Flashbang, which he'll typically utilize at the start of the battle to try and gain a quick upper hand on the player, six stim packs for healing as well as an additional medical iBot, a second iBot to help dish out additional damage, three uses of medex to further increase his damage resistance, six frag grenades, an anti-material rifle, a 12.7mm SMG, and his signature melee weapon, Old Glory. A melee weapon with a 50% boost in critical hit chance and critical hit damage that deals triple damage, rather than the usual double. The arena has a number of dips that lead into cover which can be useful for buying time to heal or even just reload. To the left and right are also paths to computers which can be hacked to disable Ulysses' iBots, preventing further respawning and taking both of his supports out. However, doing so requires either 100 in science or 100 in repair, though at this point if you haven't maxed either I think it's fair to say that you've come here a bit underleveled. Oh, and the paths to these computers are also littered with powerful traps that will almost assuredly insta-kill the player. One could opt to just jump down to the computer, however doing so means having to backtrack through these traps so you can escape the disadvantage of low ground. Enemies can also be baited into triggering these traps, potentially killing them or even injuring Ulysses. Oh, and did I mention that the marked men will also begin storming in after a short period of time? Yeah, this shit ain't easy. On paper, I think the structure of the fight is sound. There's plenty of tertiary elements to consider while working towards the goal of taking down what is essentially a foil to the player character. That much I can respect, but the fight inevitably buckles somewhat under the underpolished combat of this game. Without VATS, this fight would be a fucking nightmare to try and deal with. Thankfully, it's not impossible to talk Ulysses out of fighting, though it is extremely difficult. In total, there's about four different means of talking him down. Speech checks, reputation, his holotapes, and through Edie. Of course, the player must continue to cooperate with him once he's been convinced, but by then it should be pretty apparent what dialogue will lead where. The first is as simple as it sounds. Mechanically, that is. If you have 100 speech, you can remind him of the history between you two and convince him that all he's done is repeat the very mistakes that he condemns you for. Putting a magnifying glass to his hypocrisy and the lack of a difference in your actions, purposeful or no. The second way to talk Ulysses down involves having a high faction reputation with either the NCR, Caesar's Legion, Vegas, or House. This dialogue tree centers around the courier's conviction in whichever nation they've chosen to bear the flag of, ultimately contradicting the very motivation behind Ulysses' actions. Ulysses respects these convictions and recognizes the sincerity of the courier, opting to stand down and allow them, should they manage to escape the divide, to continue on to Hoover Dam. The third method of talking Ulysses down is only available to players who've managed to find all of Eddie's upgrades throughout the divide. Doing so gives you the opportunity to show Ulysses that Eddie is in fact one of the only things left with records of pre-war America, a concept with which he is very familiar with in his glorifications of its symbol. The final method is to use his holotapes to remind him of the very question that he posed to the think tank in Big Mountain. That question. Either you walked the big empty, you found the last of the holotapes. Through this dialogue, you can convince Ulysses that to kill a symbol is to not give history a chance, and that it's on people like yourselves to change those symbols and bring new life to the places that you visit. I think that all of these endings do a great job at illustrating two of Ulysses' most pivotal character traits, his ability to listen, and his glorification of symbols. Now sure, plenty of characters can be convinced to do something, to stand down, to consider an alternative, and so on, but Ulysses is the first character that feels truly defined by his receptiveness to information as a character trait specific to him, with it playing a major role in his development prior to and during Lonesome Road. It was this receptiveness that allowed him to ascertain such a complex understanding of the Legion's philosophies and their traditions despite not personally believing in them, or so we can at least infer. 
It was this receptiveness that made him such an effective scout in Frumentarius, which also led to the Legion's discovery of Hoover Dam, as well as the knowledge that Joshua Graham miraculously survived his plunge off of the Grand Canyon. Even long after the destruction of the Divide, upon meeting Christine in Big Mountain, Ulysses is seeking to understand both the Brotherhood of Steel and pre-war America. Even though Ulysses holds a profound grudge against the Courier and what they caused at the Divide, he's not so petty that he completely refuses to understand that he could be in the wrong. In fact, I think the sheer number of ways in which he can be convinced to step down is proof enough of just that. Though he will initially refute all of these reasonings, that's not to say that he'll continue to deny them when faced with a convincing enough argument. Because Ulysses never lacked the ability to listen. That was Courier 6. What Ulysses lacked was the willingness to do so, at least regarding Courier 6. But what I believe to be Ulysses' most fatal flaw is his glorification of symbols. Ulysses is a man who puts a lot of value in the meaning behind symbols and how they can unite people to form entire nations and ideologies. To him, symbols are representative of the actions its followers take, and he seems to think that they become more and more concrete as they take shape. The NCR's two-headed bear is a symbol of a people that continue to fail despite how well-meaning they may be. The Legion's bull is a symbol of a people that continue to charge headfirst into conflict with no respect for history and a lack of perceptiveness regarding the future. Vegas is a symbol of a bygone era that's going nowhere. However, the most important symbol to Ulysses is undoubtedly that of the pre-war American flag. It's his attachment to this symbol that's the very driving force behind his character. To Ulysses, this symbol is a representation of history that was wrongfully taken away through fire and destruction. Initially, the symbol was one of the divide, a nation taking its first breaths. A representation of hope that one day, surely things would become better and people could be united. Ulysses would then begin to understand the history of this symbol even more after listening to the think tank's descriptions of America, many of which we can assume were being conveyed through rose-tinted glasses given their characterization in Old World Blues. The fact that the history of this symbol was so remarkably similar to what he understood about it would begin to shape Ulysses into a symbol of his own, whether he recognized it or not. Now bearing the old world American flag on his back, Ulysses stands as a representation of that which will not be snuffed out. America sleeps, the divide sleeps, and it's he that will carry those nations beyond the grave. To kill Ulysses means to kill not just what remains of the Divide, but America as well. Or maybe this is just me falling victim to the very way of thinking that Ulysses himself abides by. The point here isn't that Ulysses oversimplifies others by reducing them to their symbols, but that the very act of reducing one to a symbol they bear further deepens existing division. If the courier is associated with the bear, the bull, or even the lights of Vegas, Ulysses will create a link between their history at the Divide and the failures of those who stand beneath the flag they bear. If the courier stands for an independent Vegas, Ulysses looks down at the courier with a sneer for lacking any conviction, a trait not too dissimilar to the unwitting of the courier which led to the destruction of the divide. And it's by recognizing the courier's ability to bring about positive change, be that through the NCR, Vegas, the Legion, or even something entirely new, that Ulysses is finally willing to listen and step down. These two character traits are what define Ulysses, and their significance to this final confrontation cannot be understated. Ulysses is stubborn, he speaks with conviction and has a complex understanding of post-war Western America, both through his own experiences and by the acquisition of knowledge that very few will ever have access to. When speaking with the Courier, Ulysses is firmly rooted in not only his hatred for the Courier, but his disposition of the very symbols that dominate post-nuclear Western America. But Ulysses isn't so stubborn as to deny the truth in opposing perspectives, and he's perfectly capable of recognizing the importance of change. With enough conviction, the Courier can dissuade him, and he'll admit the truth in their words. Without that conviction, Ulysses doesn't believe that the Courier can bring about good change and all that's left to do from there is fight. But regardless of whether or not Ulysses falls at his temple, the missile launch has already been initiated. 
At this point, it's on the courier to decide where those missiles go. They can be fired at either the NCR's only remaining supply line, the Long 15, the Legion Occupy Dry Wells, or they can fire at both. Though neither has particularly noteworthy in-game consequences, barring impacts on the player's reputation, which doesn't really make sense because how on earth would anyone else know that the courier launched those missiles? The implications are very much worth considering, even if there isn't additional ending slideshows to account for those bombings in the conclusion of the base game. Without the Long 15, the New Vegas chapter of the NCR is just as stranded as the Mojave chapter of the Brotherhood of Steel. Vertebrates can help, but it's going to take a long time to discover and develop a new path to run supplies between the Mojave and California. Assuming the NCR even managed to succeed at holding Hoover Dam against the Legion, and even with House out of the picture, maintaining that control over Vegas is going to be ridiculously difficult. Even if we assume that the Courier is some kind of bipolar flip-flopping freak that decided to be as helpful to the NCR as possible before abruptly bombing them, and then going on to help them claim Hoover Dam. Without a consistent source of supplies and reinforcements, even at its most efficient, the NCR will become even more reliant on Mojave locals for basic necessities, locals whom were already hard-pressed to even begin to tolerate NCR policies and many of whom will continue to do so regardless of the efforts they make. This would ultimately lead to a great deal of infighting that would in turn most likely cause the entire operation to completely dissolve especially if the Brotherhood and the Enclave are still around. And if we're assuming that more missiles were fired into deeper stretches of NCR territory, then it becomes all the more unlikely that they're able to reinforce and resupply Vegas for what is surely an indefinite period of time. The NCR is beyond fucked if this happens. As for Caesar's Legion, it's pretty easy to imagine how difficult things would become for them without Dry Wells. Dry Wells is the Legion's primary route from the eastern states towards the Colorado River. The Legion is already spread way too thin and another massive strain on resources will only make further expansion even more difficult. The only way this countdown can be stopped is if the player saved Edie prior to reaching Ulysses. By sacrificing Edie, the countdown can be stopped, the machine that destroyed the divide preventing the very same scar of land from creating yet another. The dialogue options here are a bit melodramatic, but it's a nice scene nonetheless. But regardless of whether or not you launch the missiles, Ulysses' temple will begin to explode. For some reason. I guess he rigged it to explode? Following this is the ending slideshow, which is relatively brief, but does a nice job at wrapping up the tales of Ulysses, Eddie, the Divide, and the Courier. There's even a cool Planet of the Apes easter egg for those with the Wild Wasteland trait, though I will say it's more than a little bizarre how the Tunnelers, you know, the Mojave's greatest threat, apparently began to act docile towards the Courier following their trek through the Divide. Weren't these things supposed to be a greater threat to Vegas than the NCR and the Legion? I was able to buy the ghost people behaving this way towards Christine because of how strangely intelligent they are, but the tunnelers are never characterized as having sapience, so what the fuck is going on here? Also, why the fuck do I need closed captions turned on to get a translation of what the fuck Edie is saying in his ending slides? Like, could you folks at Obsidian seriously not be fucked to just give a translation regardless of subtitles or closed captions being turned on? I'm sorry, but I don't speak Morse code. In any event, Edie essentially has three different endings. If the player saved Edie and fired the missiles, Edie continues his journey to Navarro, though it's implied that Navarro would have been obliterated by a missile from the Divide. If Edie sacrifices himself to stop the missiles, his data is transmitted to the iBot found in Prim. If Edie was never rescued from Ulysses' temple, then he's simply left to be destroyed along with the rest of the facility. Though it is worth noting that the first two endings I mentioned have a greater sense of optimism should the Courier have found all of the upgrades, with Edie pressing on with the strength and hope granted through his memories. Alright, I've been holding off on talking about this one for some time now, but it's time we finally tackled it. Edie is cute. Its innocence is a nice reprieve from the otherwise bleak setting that is the Divide. I like Edie, and I think most others do too. He's not much for combat, but being able to repair items, hold hundreds of pounds of equipment, and that adorable little beep boot makes him pretty endearing. But is it not strange the level of sentience that this thing seems to possess? Ignoring Fallout 4 because holy fuck does it eradicate any potential sense there was to be made regarding the sentience of robots, I don't think I can recall any other instance of sentient machines in this franchise. Securitrons operate using actual brains, so that's a bit ambiguous, but none of the 
the purely synthetic machines in these games possess any degree of sentience beyond the illusions of sentience that personality modules would work to mimic. This is also why I'm disregarding androids, as they are very much in their own category of being. Ah! Robots like Mr. Gutsy and Liberty Prime were designed by red-blooded anti-commie Americans, so it makes sense that they would possess hyper-patriotic personality modules. The devices of the sink were designed by the madmen of the think tank, so yeah, that checks out. Mr. Handy's, no, not you, Cotsworth, get out of here, are meant to behave like a proper butler, so it makes sense that they would speak with an eloquence that gives off an aura of class and politeness. This brings us to Edie. On the surface, it would seem that Edie has simply been outfitted with a personality module to behave almost like a house pet, responding happily to positive reinforcement and cowering in fear at danger. That's all well and fine, but then there's the audio logs of Dr. Whitley, an enclave scientist who seems to be under the impression that Edie is in fact a sentient being. How on earth does an enclave scientist come to believe that an iBot possesses sentience unless Dr. Whitley himself in fact programmed the iBot to be sentient? But if he did, that opens up its own rabbit holes of questions regarding Whitley, so... Uh, but seriously, do you mean to tell me that Dr. Whitley found a way to give machines sentience? It's alive! Are we just going to pretend that that doesn't have insane implications regarding what could or could not be in this world? My brother and John Henry Eden, we have already faced nuclear Armageddon. We don't need a fucking Terminator situation leading to another. Moving on from that, after the ending slideshow, one last package can be found from Ulysses gifting a number of DLC items to the courier, as well as one final holotape. Last tape. Last message. In case... You best me. If you're hearing this, you have, through blood or word, this message and all that lies with it. It is for you, Courier. If you want to know the why of things, this world, I've walked a good part of it. I stopped only because of you. What you did gave me pause. Long ago, I crossed the Colorado, the first among the Legion to see Hoover Dam in all its glory, an old world wall, yet bridging two sides, and beyond it, a symbol of a two-headed bear, an idea great enough to challenge Kaiser himself, might kill him taking it, whether he won or lost, the bull needs to fight, needs the challenge. Without it, it falters, dies in the dust. Might be a lesson there in you and me. Leave the thought behind the message to you. My message is this. The destruction that has been wrought at the Divide or elsewhere, if you can stop me, it can happen again. It will keep happening. If war doesn't change, men must change, and so must their symbols. Even if it is nothing at all, know what you follow, courier. Just as I followed you to the end, whatever your symbol, carry it on your back and wear it proudly when you stand at Hoover Dam. If the player convinced Ulysses to stand down, they'll be able to find him overlooking the Divide just before the entrance to Hopeville Silo. Ulysses talks a great deal about the Legion as well as the coming battle for Hoover Dam. The most interesting bit of dialogue, I think, is when he talks about what it might take to convince Legate Linnaeus to stand down, as Caesar will undoubtedly be calling on him for this second battle. And this actually opens up an entirely new dialogue tree when the player does come face to face with the Legate himself. Though Ulysses does plan to stay for a while longer, where he goes from here is entirely on him. Just the same as his fellow courier after Hoover Dam. This final lesson in the power to bring about change now weighing on the minds of both couriers, all that's left to do is part ways. Perhaps finding new homes for themselves somewhere out in America.
25 videos, over 8 hours of content, and one whole year of bi-weekly uploading. This series has been pretty damn awesome to produce, and I've learned a lot from it not just regarding video production, but how and why I like to make videos. As many of you know, the original plans were just to make a series on dead money, but the more I got to working on it, the more I wanted to keep making more and more to do with New Vegas, and it only made sense to keep going beyond dead money and all the way to Lonesome Road. I've said it before, but New Vegas really is one of my favorite games of all time, and I've really enjoyed this deep dive review series into the various DLCs. Not only has it been really cool to discuss the pros and cons of each expansion, but I've learned so much not just about even the DLCs, DLCs, but New Vegas as a whole since starting this series. I've spent 12 damn years playing this game, and yet I still find myself learning more and more as I continue to play and analyze it. If that's not the mark of an intricate world brimming with detail, then I honestly cannot say that I have any idea what is. Lonesome Road is a piece of content that I feel does a great job at capping off the player's journey up to Hoover Dam. It really feels like a proper culmination of everything the players work to achieve throughout the base game, as well as all that you've learned throughout prior expansions. Just about every side quest in the base game ties back in some way to the final battle for Hoover Dam. The faction or independence that you've chosen to fight for is bolstered or weakened by just about every decision that you make throughout the base game. Ulysses is then the ultimate test of your loyalty to that faction and just how far you'll go to ensure their victory at Hoover Dam and beyond. And Ulysses really is the perfect character to test that resolve. Barring the awkward sense of presentation that perhaps is too poetic for its own good and just vague enough to confuse a great many players, the writing behind Ulysses is pretty damn excellent. He really is the ultimate foil to the player character, and I think that's why the dynamic here works so well. He's simultaneously the embodiment of everything the courier could be, while also being the very result of the courier's unwitting actions. One seemingly simple delivery, a job that the courier took for any number of reasons resulted in the death of countless people and the complete annihilation of a newborn nation. Now sure, most would argue that the blame can't be placed on the courier, at least not by many objective metrics for what constitutes guilt. How could they have possibly known what that package would do when nobody else did? As far as the courier knew, they were just delivering a parcel to a community, no different than any other job. But that's not what matters here. What matters is that Ulysses believes the courier is responsible and it's understandable why he would. Ulysses saw the courier deliver the package, he witnessed the destruction that package unleashed, and he understands arguably better than anyone how a single person can bring about change. This isn't about Ulysses being right or wrong, it's about him believing that he is right and he does, and in some ways, he absolutely is. The Courier is the very exemplar of how a single person can change an entire nation for better or worse, unite people or divide them, enforce order, or bring about chaos. At the start of New Vegas, the Courier was little more than someone who happened to be picked for a delivery that was far more significant than they'd ever know. But by journeying through the Mojave, by speaking to its residents, picking and choosing their fights, the impact that they have begins to grow more and more as time goes on. In the opening hour, you're settling a dispute between a town and a gang, but by the end, you're playing the wild card in a major war for a nation. The courier assigned to deliver the platinum chip could very well have been anyone. And it was. And that anyone would go on to have a massive effect on the world around them. And let's go just a step further into what-if territory. Let's say that Benny was never there to intercept the courier. By delivering the platinum chip, successfully and without issue, the courier would never have learned of its significance prior to meeting House, and the choice to bring it to him or not would have been completely out of the courier's control. But the responsibility of delivering the chip was still on their shoulders regardless. And it wouldn't be difficult to understand why those who suffered from this nation-making delivery would be spiteful to the courier that made it possible. And it wouldn't be unreasonable of an altruistic courier to feel some regret for that delivery if they saw the negative effects that it had on the world around them. At that point, the only people saying that it isn't the courier's fault are those not involved or affected to begin with. But who's 
to say that their verdict is worth considering when they're not the ones paying the price or bearing the responsibility. To further explore this link between causation and responsibility, let's turn the discussion around to Ulysses. One day, on a regular scouting mission not unlike any other, Ulysses discovered the one and only Hoover Dam at which point he reported back to Caesar, who then became fixated on taking the dam for himself. Ulysses had no way of knowing what all of this would lead to, but it's perhaps the single most important event leading up to Fallout New Vegas. Without the Legion's incursion of the Mojave, who even knows how things would have played out? I certainly don't. Would it be unfair of somebody like Boone to hold Ulysses accountable for what the Legion's discovery of Hoover Dam led to? The power to bring change is perhaps the greatest power that any person can possess. And with that power must surely come a great responsibility. Many events in our own history came about from an unwitting decision, a seemingly harmless discovery. Actions that nobody could have known would lead to where they did. Are those who caused it not to bear that responsibility? Are those responsible not to be held accountable? This is a complex issue, and I commend Lonesome Road for its exploration of that theme. The gameplay overall, despite its rougher edges, is pretty solid. Though not quite as well-rounded as Dead Money, Lonesome Road does a pretty damn good job at providing the player with a solid challenge and a decent variety of mechanics to work with. The difficulty is at a peak when traversing the divide, and it does put a bit of a strain on the core mechanics at times, but overall, Obsidian did a great job at crafting a linear series of appropriately challenging encounters. Barring that god-awful Silo set piece. Since I did it last time, I suppose I'll go ahead and do a final ranking of Fallout New Vegas' DLCs here. At the bottom of the list is Honest Hearts. I can't imagine this will come as much of a surprise to anyone who's listened to my series covering it. Joshua Graham is a fantastic character, and I enjoyed what little there was to learn about Waking Cloud and Follows Chalk, and the unmarked quest revolving around Randall Clark was great. But aside from that, this DLC doesn't really have much in the ways of positives going for it. Fetch quests, unimaginative and low effort side quests, a boring enemy set, and pretty lackluster storytelling place this DLC for firmly at the bottom of the list. Next up would be Old World Blues, which is a major step up. Though the main quest and plot suffer from major pacing issues and perhaps too heavy a focus on humor that's pretty hit or miss, there is a lot of fascinating story details and bits of lore to be found throughout Big Mountain. Gameplay is overall solid, with a healthy variety of enemies, tons of loot, and well-structured exploration. Enemy health is more than a bit ridiculous on higher difficulties, but it's not a game-breaker. The last two I struggled to rank for a while because, for me, what it comes down to with Lonesome Road and Dead Money are the themes and settings. Dead Money is a tale of obsession and greed, universal emotions that all people come across at some point in their lives, set in perhaps one of the most fascinating locations ever constructed in a Fallout game, with a mountain of lore to dissect and analyze regarding both the pre- and post-war of this universe. Lonesome Road, on the other hand, was sort of an inverse, with the Divide being perhaps the most brutal location ever seen in a Fallout game, and the theme being one so fascinating that you could easily dedicate many hours to discussing it. Both do an excellent job at exploring their themes and building on the lore. Both have occasional flubs in their storytelling, but you'd be hard-pressed to find any major plot holes or lore contradictions. So, which is better? When it comes down to it, I think Dead Money just manages to beat out Lonesome Road. Both have fantastic themes, characters, and lore, but as far as gameplay goes, Dead Money is hands down the peak of these expansions. Like I said in the Dead Money review, New Vegas' gameplay is at its best when it's offering a variety of tertiary design elements to consider, and I think Lonesome Road leans a bit too hard on the combat to carry the experience. The combat of Dead Money is very aware of the strengths and weaknesses of Fallout's core mechanics, and it does a superb job at building around that foundation rather than strictly upon it. The Sierra Madre is by far the most well-designed environment to be found throughout these expansions, and the Ghost People do a great job at complementing the various hazards that litter both the villa and the casino. There's certainly some missed potential here and there. More encounters with the Ghost People and holograms would have been pretty cool to see, but when my primary complaint is that I wanted more, I think it's fair to say that they did a pretty good job with what they had. But hey, that's just my own ranking of these expansions. Feel free to let me know your own rankings down in the comments. And with that, we're finally done. Well, we're done with the DLC.
That's right, ladies and gentlemen, starting in 2023, I'll be reviewing the base game of Fallout New Vegas. This will be a 10-part review series that I'll be releasing on a monthly basis. Of course, I do have other videos in mind for next year, but the New Vegas review series will be the primary focus of the channel throughout the year. Like I said, this series will be broken down into 10 parts, which will consist of the following. Starting the series out will, of course, be the intro. This video will be a relatively simple look at the lore of Fallout prior to the the events of New Vegas, as well as what will need to be understood leading into the review series. Following this will be a video discussing the role-playing elements of New Vegas, breaking down all the various stats, perks, builds, and so on that allow for one to shape their character however they see fit. The next video will be a deep dive into the game's economy, including currency, resource management, and so on. The primary focus here will be to determine the overall stability and balance of these systems and how they contribute to the betterment or perhaps worsening of the game as a whole. The next part will be discussing the general gameplay, the very core mechanics that are utilized when interacting with the world, from simple elements such as movement to the very combat itself. Following this will be a video covering the many, many technical issues of Fallout New Vegas, both on console and on PC. This will be a massive breakdown of the various bugs and glitches that can occur as well as an observation of their frequency and impact on immersion. This will undoubtedly be the most critical video of this entire series, including the DLC reviews, so fair warning to those who wish not to attend a roasting of New Vegas. After this will be a sort of transitional video where we begin to dissect the world building of New Vegas. World building is something that occurs both in text and dialogue as well as gameplay, so this will be a great way to start getting into the more narrative elements of New Vegas. Similarly, the next part will focus on the companions and their quests. Of course, there will be some gameplay being discussed here, for instance the perks and general quality of companions in combat, but the focus will undoubtedly be on the lore and the development of these characters. The sort of penultimate video in this series will be a deep dive into the side quests and minor factions of New Vegas. This will probably be the first particularly long video in this series, as we'll be getting into a wide variety of topics and quest lines and the various nuances about them. After that will be what I assume is the longest video in this review series, covering the main quests and major factions of New Vegas from their lore to the Second Battle of Hoover Dam and all of the major players in those factions and quests. This video will also include a massive dissection of the philosophies of these factions as well as potential futures and their overall viability. And finally will be a conclusion video where, similar to this one, I'll be giving my final thoughts on Fallout New Vegas, reviewing a handful of key points, and of course announcing a series of videos that'll be coming out in 2024. But for now, I think it's time we took a bit of a break. From the bottom of my heart, thank you all so much for your continued support. This series was a blast to make, and I can't wait for the next. I'll see you all next year. Take care.